Hello, my dear students. Hope you guys are all doing good. Hope you guys are all perfectly fine. So finally, the thing which you have been asking me from a long period of time. So when the marathon for May 2024 attempt you are going to upload. So, so many people, so many students are actually texting me. They are commenting on the social media platforms. Some people have even called me personally and asked me, so when you will upload the marathon for May 2024 examination. I'm extremely sorry, guys, for the delay in uploading of marathon. So the thing is, uh, why there has been this much delay for uploading the marathon for this attempt is, as you all know, May 2024 examination is going to be the exam under new scheme. And this is going to be the first exam under new scheme. So that's why I have been doing a lot of work to make sure that whatever marathon which I will bring before you, that has to be the best one, that has to cater to your exam needs, that should be a value addition in your preparation and uh, that should help you to fetch good marks in the auditing examination. So I want to make sure that all these objectives are met. So that's why I have done a lot of I have done a lot of background work at so many concepts uh, in to make to make you understand and to make you revise a few complex topics very quickly. I have even drafted uh, charts. I have prepared the charts. I have summarized the content in very uh, in very comfortable manner. In very understand in very in a very understandable manner. Actually, you will uh, feel that. Actually, you will get to know that effort whatever I have put when you start watching the content from this marathon. I can assure you. You will really be surprised to see the way in which we have summarized a few chapters. So you will really be amazed to, amazed to see it and I know you guys will definitely like it. So to make sure all this happens, I have taken all this amount of time for bringing this marathon before you. Hope you guys will understand. See before I actually go into the topics, before I actually go into the chapters and explain the chapters, I have a few things to share with you. So please uh, don't skip this and directly start watching the content of the lectures. So what I will uh, request you is I will not take much of your time. Hardly 5-10 minutes of time I will take and I will try to bring a few points before you so that uh, this marathon will be even fruitful. So please don't skip this uh, intro part whatever I have been uh, telling you now. So just spend uh, give me your valuable 5-10 to 10 minutes of time. I will try to clarify a few points. Once those points get clarified then you can happily go and watch the chapters. Right. So first, I would like to thank each and every one of you. The previous version of the marathon, whatever we have uploaded on YouTube. Guys, you all know my YouTube channel is such a YouTube channel where I deliver the content on only one subject. That is audit that to at the CA inter level. Soon, very soon. In the coming, uh, I don't know, I can't uh, say how soon this is going to happen. Very soon, you are going to even uh, get the content for CA final audit also. You're soon, very soon you are going to get the content for CA final audit also. So everything has been done. All the arrangements for that CA final audit has also been done. Soon you will get the content regarding that also. But being dealing with only one subject, the last version of the marathon, whatever we have uploaded for May 2023 and November 2023 attempt, that marathon has got uh, close to 2 lakh views guys. I'm surprised to see that. And uh, this all has happened only because of you. This all exclusively being dealing with only one subject running the YouTube channel on only one subject and uh, the video in that channel getting 2 lakh views is really something uh, very great for me. It is actually uh, your uh, support. The thing has happened because of your support. I am really grateful to you all who have subscribed, who have been watching the content, who have been posting the comments. Uh, so trust me guys, whatever support you are showing to me, that is giving me even more motivation, that is giving me even more energy, that is giving me even more, uh, uh, that is giving me even more uh, motivational support uh, so that I can deliver even uh, much more quality content, much more valuable content uh, which will help my students. Uh, so this has been a great response from you all. Thank you so much. So this is uh, one thing I want to share. Few more things I will tell you which will help you to enjoy the marathon in a much more better way. So those things are, see throughout the marathon, uh, whatever lectures you are going to watch uh, for this marathon. So throughout this marathon, I will be going to make use of various material. I'm going to make use of various material. Number one, we are going to use something, one main material we are going to use. So you will get the material uh, something like this. So this full fledged material you have. So that main material will be using and throughout this marathon to make you the concepts understand in a much better way. I will be preparing some running notes and all I will be writing the content. I will be summarizing the content. So running notes and all will be there. So this running notes, this main material and whatever other uh, thing, whatever we are using throughout this marathon lectures, 
sir where we can get all this content from where we can get all this content from you need not worry guys this content is all free soft copies you can get it free of cost but where can we get it sir you can get it in two ways number one is either you can get it from app number two you can get it from our website see the links to download the app will already be given below the description of this video so there you can get the links to download the app how you can download the app for android how you can download our app for ios the links will be shared in the description you can download from there from that apps you can download that content what one more thing we can do what one more thing you can do is see recently we have uh, launched our website our website is ready now so the website uh, address is the address of the website also i will uh, uh, write it here so just visit the website www.wingainsacademy.com so just visit this website so once you visit this website you will land on this page in this website if you see at the top at the top right uh, at the top right corner you will be able to find something called resources able to see here so there will be something called resources just go and click on that resources if you go and click on the resources you will be directed to some g drive folders in that g drive folders you will be able to find all this content like you will be able to find the main material something called supplementary material is there hardly some 10 pages is there so that content also will cover in the marathon you need not worry about it and there will be something called mcq or true or false uh, statement booklet also will be there and i will i'm going to add few more things here test your knowledge question compilation from ICA sources whatever test your knowledge questions are there so that compilation also I will post it here and also uh, once the recordings of this marathon gets completed whatever running notes we have used throughout this marathon that running notes also I will keep it in this folder so all the content whatever we have been using throughout this marathon lectures all you can download it freely either from our app you can download it or from our uh, website also you can download it okay so this is one thing which i would like to bring it to your attention and one more thing i want to give a clarity on the material whatever we are going to use throughout this marathon and whatever you can download it from the app and the website see whatever material you are able to see here this material has been prepared to meet the exam requirements of your may 2024 this material is as per new scheme only you need not worry about it this material contains the content relevant for may 2024 examination this material is a drafted in line with new scheme material which has been released by ici auditing and ethics they have released a new scheme of material now so this material has been drafted in line with may 2024 study material which has been released by the institute so what is the only change we have done is we have done the rearrangement of the chapters some chapters we have clubbed together some chapters we have divided into multiple chapters so that you can have a better logical flow of the discussion see if i start teaching the chapter as per the order given in the study as per the order given in the study material that discussion will not be smooth so to make the understanding of the concepts much easier to have a logical flow in the discussion so what we have done is we have done the rearrangement of the chapters like if you see here in the second chapter you will be able to find nature objective and scope of audit and also ethics so in this chapter what actually i have done is i have clubbed together two chapters from the study material one is nature objective and scope of audit and the other one is ethics both the chapters i have clubbed together and created one single chapter nature objective and scope of audit and ethics and in some cases i have divided some chapters like for example audit sampling you will be able to find it as a part of audit evidence chapter only in the study material but audit sampling is a different concept in itself so what we have done is we have taken out that chapter audit sampling and gave it as a separate chapter so like this we have done the rearrangement of the chapters which will help you to have a better logical understanding of the concepts that rearrangement we have done and talking about one more thing sir is this material contains a new content yes this material is going to contain the new content as per the new study material so most of the students will have a confusion this might be a old study material looking at the order of the chapters you might think this is the content for old syllabus no sir no this is the content for new syllabus only we have done a lot of changes guys one simple example if i have to show you so if you have a look at this inherent limitations of audit inherent limitations of the audit you will be able to find some content in this inherent limitations question which is completely as per new scheme this content whatever is there in my material under this inherent limitations question this content this content is not as per old scheme this content is completely as per new scheme 
not just that you look at the questions you look at the other questions so if you take one for example this one how the auditing is related with other disciplines this content is as per the new scheme and also in each chapter whatever new concepts are there that we have added so if i show you a few examples you will be able to find something called what is an assurance engagement this concept is not there in your old scheme this is a concept added in new scheme what is the example of assurance engagement right and also this question who appoints an auditor to whom report is submitted this is something which is exclusively there in new scheme which is not there in the old scheme and also a lot of examples i can give you so like this what is the only thing which i want to clarify here is whatever material that is there in the app whatever material that we are going to use throughout this marathon this material is relevant for may 2024 examination may 2024 examination we have actually revamped the material have actually revamped entire material to make it in line with may 2024 examination so you need not have any second thought about it clear everybody uh, and students will generally have one doubt sir this material looks little bit smaller when compared with the ICI study material i will tell you the logic why see if you have a look at ICI study material if you have a look at ICI study material let me write it here see if you look at the ICI study material in the ICI study material what they have given is they have given all the content first the material which is the content which is applicable the content which you have to prepare they have given all the content in the ICS study material after that in the same chapter they have given something called case scenario based mcqs and after that they have given some test your knowledge questions like normal mcqs true or false statements test your knowledge descriptive questions so like this in the ici material lot of content will be there so what i actually have done is the main content itself i have given it in the main material the main content itself i have given it in my material so whatever material i am showing it to you that contains the main content see case scenario based mcqs and this normal mcqs and this true or false statements what i have done is instead of adding it in the main material i have separated it and gave a separate booklet mcq and case scenarios MC, uh, case scenario based mcqs and normal mcqs true or false statements and test your knowledge questions from the ics study material what i have done is i have separated it and given a separate booklet See, if I include all this case scenario based MCQs, if I include all the test your knowledge questions in my main material itself, then the material will look for 500, 600 pages. It will look so bulky, the student looking at that only, they might get shocked. Half of the confidence will get over there only. But in the study material, you will have a content which is main content will be there. But in the study material, there are case scenario based MCQs, true or false statements. Everything is also included. If you open the study material and see the case scenario based equation, each case scenario will run for 300, three, four pages will be there able to understand so what i have done is main content whatever is applicable for the examination that will be there in the main material whatever case scenario based mcqs are there whatever true or false statements are there whatever test your knowledge questions are there that we have given a separate separate booklet able to understand so that all the main content will be there in the main material and for your testing you know if you have to test how much understanding i have in this chapter what you can do is you can simply download the case scenario booklet or mcq booklet true or false booklet or test your knowledge questions booklet and test your understanding able to understand so if i would have added all this case scenario based mcqs or test your knowledge questions or true or false statements in the same material my material would, would run for some 500 or 600 pages but all that is not something which you have to read completely. You have to read only the main content, test your knowledge questions, MCQs, true or false statements. Those are for your practice. Able to understand? So that's why my material will look a little bit smaller when compared with the ICI sources. But we are exhaustively covering everything. What is the only thing we have done is we have divided. Main material we have divided. MCQs we have divided. True or false statements we have divided. Test your knowledge questions divided. So separate separate booklets we have given so that you will have ease in access, ease in reference and ease in preparation. Clear everybody? So that's what I wanted to bring it before your notice. So the material which we are going to share here with you that is applicable for may 2024 examination and whatever marathon that you are about to watch throughout this uh, series that is also going to contain the content for may 2024 examination and trust me guys whatever new concepts that have been added under new scheme on that i have spent more time whatever new concepts that have been added under this new scheme of syllabus that on that concepts i have spent more time like if you watch the chapter nature objective and scope of audit at last i've spent a lot of time on one thing even though this is marathon there is one concept called assurance engagement which is actually a new concept that assurance assurance engagement concept alone i have explained it for 15 minutes even even after knowing that this is a marathon 
so i wanted to make sure that whatever new content which has been added in the new scheme that requires a lot of time why because there might be a student under old scheme who might be giving their examination under new scheme so i want uh, this marathon to be useful for them as well so whatever new concepts were added on that also we have spent a lot of time clear everybody so these are all the points which i thought of clarifying before going into the marathon uh, lectures and all hope you guys will find this uh, marathon lectures very much interesting very much engaging very much helpful for your preparation so i hope you all will enjoy the lectures you all will learn a lot from it thank you guys have a happy learning so first we will try to begin our discussion with the chapter introduction to the audit so we are going to start our marathon with the chapter introduction to audit so as you could see in the material we have an index here so as per our material there will be a total of 15 chapters so as per my material which i told you to download from the app in that in that uh, material you will be able to find a total of 15 chapters see when it comes to segregation of the chapters it's going to be a little bit different when you compare it when you compare uh, with the ICS study material the chapter segregation is going to be different see the overall the content is there in my material which has been exclusively taken from ICS study material only but the only thing whatever I have done is I have changed the chapter arrangement I have arranged the chapters in a proper sequence which will make sense in understanding the concept so if you follow the chapter arrangement which was given in the study material so things go out of place some chapters uh, are required to be discussed earlier some chapters are required to be discussed later so in accordance with the concept so what i have done is i have did the rearrangement sometimes i have clubbed two chapters together in some cases i have uh, taken out a part of the chapter and given it as a separate chapter so at respective places whenever we take up each and every chapter for discussion i will let you know so where you will be able to find the content in this chapter in the study material so first we are going to start our discussion with the chapter called introduction to the auditing see before we go into the concepts of the auditing first we should understand what is the basic term what is the meaning of the term audit so in this paper paper number five the chapter title so the subject title itself is what auditing and ethics so basically mostly we are going to talk about auditing uh, we are going to talk about auditing majorly in this particular chapter so before we talk about the concepts of the auditing first it becomes necessary for us to understand what is the meaning of the audit so in this chapter introduction to audit we are going to basically understand what is the meaning of the audit what are the basic terminology used in the audit see once we become familiar with this chapter if we become familiar with the chapter then only the further discussion will start making sense so if we don't get a proper understanding of the chapter introduction to audit then even though we discuss the remaining chapters that will not make that much sense so to have a better understanding of the overall concept the most important thing is first we have to get used to the terminology which is used in the auditing subject what is the meaning of the term audit so all these things if we become familiar then only the remaining discussion is going to make a complete sense so without any delay further let me try to explain to you what exactly is the meaning of the term audit see we all know for all the things there will be certain textbook definitions will be there even for the term audit also there is one literal textbook definition has been given there is one literal textbook definition has been given even for the term audit so let us try to understand what exactly is that textbook definition which is given to the term audit so if you if we have a look at the definition audit it says that an audit is independent examination of financial information of an entity whether or not profit oriented or whether profit oriented or not irrespective of its size or legal form when such an examination is conducted with a view to express an opinion thereon so this is how basically the term audit has been defined so this is what the textbook definition is but if we read the entire definition in all uh, at one go we will not be able to make the complete sense of the definition so what we will try to do is this definition we will try to understand in different parts first of all we will try to understand what are the key terms which are used in this definition audit so once we understand the meaning of the key terms which are used in this definition then automatically the definition of the audit also becomes very much clear so what is the definition of audit sir once again i will repeat it then we will focus on the key terms so they say something like this an audit is an independent examination of financial information of an entity whether profit oriented or not 
irrespective of its size or legal form when such an examination is conducted with a view to express an opinion there on guys one of the most important skill which you all must possess is the way how you have to read the sentences the way you have to read the paragraphs where to take a pause where to interpret so these kind of things you have to learn it why because the way you read the paragraph the way you read the sentence it will it is going to make a bigger impact on your understanding also so when you find any lengthy paragraph don't read that entire paragraph in all in a single stretch without giving pauses then you will not be able to understand it. So if you find any lengthy sentence or lengthy paragraph, try to give pauses at appropriate places, interpret that part, then mix it with the next part. So this is how you have to read it. So here also the definition is very lengthy. We will not make an attempt to understand the entire definition in one go. So what we will try to do is we will try to divide this entire definition into different parts. Each part we will understand so that we get a complete clarity of the entire term audit. So what they are trying to say. So I have already at the time of reading the definition only I have highlighted the important terminology here. Let me highlight it once again here. So the key terms which are used in the definition of audit are number one independent examination. Number two, they are using something called financial information. Number three, they are telling profit whether profit oriented or not. Then they say irrespective of size or legal form. Then they use the term something called expressing an opinion. So these are the key terms which are used in the definition of audit. If we get to understand the meaning of these terms, then obviously the entire definition of the audit also becomes very clear. So what they are actually trying to say here. First thing they say audit is an independent examination. What is the first term they are saying here? What actually happens in the audit? In the audit, examination is going to happen. What exactly is going to happen in the audit? Examination. If I say I am doing audit, I will do examination there. Sir, what is the meaning of the term examination here? The meaning of the term examination could be verification. You are actually trying to verify something or you are trying to inspect something. You are trying to check something or inspect something or you are checking something or you are scrutinizing something. So when I say I am executing a function of audit, so basically what is the major activity that will happen in the audit is verification, examination, checking, scrutinizing, inspecting. So basically audit involves examination, checking or verification. And that is not an ordinary examination that is an independent examination. What kind of examination it is? It is an independent examination. Sir, what basically is the meaning of independent examination? Sir, what is the general meaning of the term independent? The term independent means free from influence. See, we often use this term independent or independence in our in our common conversations also. Like I say, if I am an independent person or so and so person is independent, I am very I am independent on my own. So these kind of things we often hear. We use the term independent or independence in our common conversations also. But from the perspective of the audit, the meaning of the term independent is free from influence. What is the meaning of the term independent? Free from influence. That means independence is, I can call it as, it is an ability, it is a characteristic, it is a nature of a person to be free from influence. That means, especially when you are taking decisions, you should not change your decisions being influenced by others. So the ability to take the decisions without any influence of other parties. So that quality, that nature, that characteristic of a person, I am going to call it as independent. I call that person as independent. Like for example, if I am verifying something, if I have to give my opinion on something, if I feel something as right, I have to say it as right. If I feel something as wrong, I have to say it as wrong. Before taking my decision, before saying something as right or wrong, I should not think what other person will take my opinion as. If I give, if I say something is wrong, the other person might take me for wrong. The other person might get hurt. The other person might not receive it properly. So the moment you are, the moment that kind of thought is coming to your mind. So if I give this opinion this way, how the other person will receive it? The other person will get affected. The other person will feel bad about me. That's why I will not give what is the correct opinion. I will give, uh, I will, I will say something which I don't agree with. So then you are not independent actually. So the ability to take the decisions without any influence from the third party, if you feel something as correct, you have to say it as correct. If you feel something as wrong, you have to say it as wrong. Before saying your opinion, you should not get influenced by other party. 
so that ability to take the decision without coming under influence of anybody that we call it as independent like for example if i have to express some opinion about my father if i have to express some opinion about my father if i have to say something about my father i feel that if i say something bad about my father he might feel bad he might get hurt so i will say some inappropriate thing even though if i have to say something as wrong because i have something in my mind that my father will feel bad about whatever i am trying to say i will change my opinion then i am not independent why because while taking while taking decision i am under influence of another person i am not independent so if i am free from influence while taking decision i am not giving importance to other person's wishes feelings or directions whatever feels correct to me i am saying that that nature i will be calling as independent so when i say audit what actually happens in the audit is audit is going to involve examination examination of examination means verification checking or scrutinizing and that is not an ordinary examination which happens in the audit it is an independent examination sir what is an independent examination free from influence ability to take the decisions without any influence of others that nature we are going to call it as independent okay so we understood what is an audit what happens in the audit so audit in audit independent examination is going to happen sir but what is the thing you are going to examine agreed in the audit you are going to verify and that verification you are going to do it independently but what is the thing you are going to verify that is addressed in the next part of the definition they say it is an independent examination of financial information of an entity so what exactly an auditor is trying to verify financial information so let us try to understand what is the meaning of this term financial information let us try to understand what is the meaning of this term financial information see we often hear the term financial statements we often hear the term what financial statements and even there is one important inclusive definition for the term financial statements under companies act 2013 see generally definitions can be divided into two categories exhaustive definitions inclusive definitions exhaustive definition like audit you can say so audit is an audit could be an exhaustive definition because they are exactly telling what is included or what exactly happens in the audit so some definitions could be inclusive definitions also where they don't define what is exactly the term but instead they say what will be included in the term so you might have seen those kind of definitions inclusive definitions at various places in your accounts in your taxation so at various instances you might see so financial statements is also inclusive definition given under companies act 2013 and it is one of the famous and popular definition of the term financial statements so if i ask you what is financial statements so the definition as per the companies act is they say financial statements includes they are not telling what exactly is the meaning of the term financial statements but instead they are telling what will be included in the financial statements they say that in the financial statements it will include the balance sheet it will include the statement of pnl it will include the statement of cash flows it will include the statement of changes in equity it will also includes notes to accounts it will also include what notes to accounts so financial statements includes these items so what will be included in the def what will be included in the term financial statements it includes balance sheet which shows financial position it includes statement of pnl which shows financial profitability it shows it, it it also includes cash flow statements which shows uh, whether you had a net cash outflow or cash inflow during the year similarly we have statement of changes in equity which will show you the reasons for increase or decrease in the equity balance during the you see equity means simply the share capital along with the reserves and surpluses that cumulative balance we are going to call it as equity so simply what the statement of changes in equity will show is the reasons for difference between opening and closing balance of equity see like the way cash flow statement what does cash flow statement show the the cash flow statement shows the reasons for difference between opening and closing balance of cash and cash equivalents and that differences will be divided into three categories cash flow from operating activities cash flow from financing activities cash flow from investing activities right so cash flow statement is showing is showing the reasons for difference between the opening and closing balance of cash and cash equivalents similarly the statement of changes in equity is also a statement which will explain the difference between opening and closing balance of equity sir what is equity the cumulative balance of share capital along with the reserves and surpluses that only we call it as equity for example open equity balance for the financial year 22 23 so as on 14 2022 the opening share capital was 
the opening reserves and surpluses was 50 the total opening equity was 150 as on 31st of march 2023 the share capital was 120 the reserves and surpluses was 70 the closing equity was 190 so we have a total increase of 40 crore rupees in the equity balance now i will present one statement which will explain me what are the reasons for that increase of 40 crores in the equity balance that statement which shows the reasons for difference between opening and closing balance of equity that only i call it as statement of changes in equity then we have something called notes to accounts notes to accounts contains all important disclosures related to the financial statements relating to the balance sheet p and l cash flow statements etc and also the notes to accounts contain breakup of the information which is there on the face of the balance sheet and p and l for example on the balance sheet you are able to find something called inventory inventory 100 crores is there now i want to know in this inventory of 100 crores how much is raw material how much is work in progress how much is finished goods how much is stores and spares i want to know the breakup sir where i will get to know the breakup that breakup you will get to know it in the notes to accounts Similarly, the client while preparing the financial statements, the management while preparing the financial statements of any entity, what accounting policies they have followed. For example, revenue, for recognizing revenue, what policy they have followed. For charging depreciation, what accounting policy they have followed. How they have valued the inventories, how they have valued their fixed assets. So, whatever accounting policies which the client has followed, whatever accounting principles which the client has followed in the preparation of the financial statements, all that accounting policy policies also will be disclosed in the notes to accounts all those accounting policies also will be disclosed in notes to accounts so this is what will be included in the term financial statements which includes five components balance sheet p and l cash flow statement statement of changes in equity and notes to accounts first of all why we came to financial statements why we understood financial statements where our discussion started from so we are actually discussing something called definition of audit in that definition of audit we understood one part in audit what will happen independent examination will happen of what in the definition they told the uh, in the audit we are going to independently examine financial information but i did not explain you the definition of the term financial information i told you or i in fact reminded you what is the definition of the term financial statements but the term financial statements what was not used in the definition the term which is used in the definition of audit is financial information sir you told financial statements but the definition used in the but the term used in the definition is financial information are both one and the same the answer is no financial statements and financial information are not one and the same in fact financial information is a very broader term financial information is a very broader term in that one of the component is financial statements in that one of the component is what financial statements if i put it in other way around there are financial statements now to this financial statements if you add the source data to this financial statements if you add source data see for the preparation of the balance sheet for the preparation of the p and l for the preparation of the cash flow statements there will be some source data no on the basis of which these financial statements are prepared sir what is the source data for the preparation of financial statements from what source you will prepare this balance sheet p and l cash flow statement statement of changes in equity simply on the basis of books of accounts so this financial statements added to their source which is books of accounts this entire collective information we are going to call it as financial information so actually financial information is a very broader term which includes financial statements as well as the source data which is used for the preparation of financial statements that is the financial statements along with the books of accounts that complete comprehensive information i am going to call it as financial information so why we understood financial information why because our objective is to understand the definition of audit yes or no so why we understood financial information why because our objective is to understand the definition of audit so one thing got cleared sir what we are going to verify in the audit we are going to verify financial information of any entity so any of the entities financial information we are going to verify and that verification we are going to carry out independently so till here this part of the definition till here everybody clear so what they have told the definition of audit and audit is an independent examination of financial information of an entity till here i hope everybody is comfortable now let us address the next part of the definition sir what is the next part of the definition now this is something called whether now this is something called whether profit oriented or not 
what is the next term they are using whether profit oriented or not that means now in this part of the definition they are talking about the profit orientation of that entity whose financial information you are verifying and they are using the phrase whether profit oriented or not which indicates that or let me ask you the question when they say whether profit oriented or not what do they mean are they telling the profit orientation of the client matters or the profit orientation of the client doesn't matter they are telling the profit orientation of the client doesn't matter sir what is this very simple see any entity any entity in this world you can divide it into two categories whatever entities are there be it business entity uh, whatever entities are there whatever organizations are there we can divide them into two categories one is profit oriented entities other one is non profit oriented entities sir what are profit oriented entities those entities which are in which have which have been started with the intention of making profits those entities we call them as profit oriented entities take for example reliance industries limited profit oriented entity tata group of companies profit oriented entity so like that you take so many organizations 90% of the organizations in the world will be started with the intention of making profits now not every organization will be started with profit intention there might be some organizations which might not have any objective of making the profit take for example charitable institutions or take for example old age homes or take for example uh, this orphanages or take for example political parties political parties some people might contradict with me but theoretically when we talk theoretically even political parties also might be started with non profit orientation so i know most of the people will not agree with me but uh, let us keep that discussion aside so there will be some kinds of organizations which will be started with the without any profit orientation also so now they are using the phrase in the definition of audit whether profit oriented or not which means the entity whose financial information you are verifying independently whether that entity is a profit oriented entity whether that entity is a non profit oriented entity that is not going to change my audit that means the profit orientation of my client doesn't matter which indicates that if i am conducting audit of a profit oriented entity there also i will do independent examination of financial information if i am conducting audit of a non profit oriented entity there also i am going to independently examine financial information only see if i am appointed as auditor of reliance industries limited which is a profit oriented entity what i will do reliance industries limited is going to maintain some books of accounts they will have their financial statements i will go independently examine this financial information similarly if i am appointed as auditor of some charitable institution or if i am appointed as auditor of some religious institution there also what i will do there also that respective charitable organization or non profit oriented entity they will also maintain books of accounts they will also prepare financial statements might be the financial statements prepared by the reliance industries limited they might include balance sheet statement of p and l etc whereas the financial statements of charitable institution might include the balance sheet income and expenditure receipts and payments account but whatever it is if i am getting appointed as auditor of reliance industries limited i will verify the financial information of reliance industries limited if i am conducting audit of any charitable institution there also i am going to independently examine the financial information only so the profit orientation of the client is not going to have impact on my audit is not going to change altogether my audit whatever i do in the reliance industries limited audit the same thing i will do it in the case of a non profit oriented entity like any charitable institution also so the point is the profit orientation of your client doesn't matter for the audit understood so till here everybody clear with the definition so what we have understood till now the definition of audit an audit is an independent examination of what financial information of any entity whether profit oriented or not that is whether the client is a profit making entity non profit making entity that doesn't matter for audit next one irrespective of size or legal form what is the one more term they are using irrespective of size or legal form so two terms they are using size legal form size legal form and they are telling irrespective of size or legal form see you tell me when they say irrespective of size or legal form what do they mean do they mean size and legal form will have a impact on the audit or doesn't matter for the audit 
once again they are telling the size of the entity the legal form of the entity doesn't change altogether my audit so size of the client legal form of the client doesn't matter for the audit sir what do they mean let me try to explain it with the help of example take for example india's biggest conglomerate we have reliance industries limited which is making 6 lakh plus crores of turnover see if i am appointed as auditor of reliance industries limited what i will do so this reliance industries limited which is having a turnover of 6 lakh plus crores of uh, revenue and having lakhs of employees if i am conducting audit of this reliance industries limited what i simply do is i will verify their books of accounts which is financial information uh, financial information and books of uh, financial statements and books of accounts i am going to verify their financial information assume that there is one small company x limited in my locality wherever i stay there one small company is there at the corner of my residential house so now that small company x limited is hardly making a turnover of 1 crore for the entire year their revenue is 1 crore there are only two employees and they hardly make a profit of 10 lakh rupees now if i am conducting if this company has asked me to act as their auditor what i will do this company will also maintain books of accounts. This company also will be, will prepare financial statements. This financial information I am going to verify. So, whatever I am going to do in the audit of the client X Limited, which is a small size of company, the same thing which I am going to, the same thing I will do even in the audit of so-called biggest conglomerate of India, there also I am going to do the same thing, verify their financial statements and books of accounts. So, I will not do something extra in Reliance Industries Limited, which I will not do in the case of X Limited. So, in both the cases, my objective will remain the same, do the independent examination of that particular client's financial information be it a small sized organization be it a biggest organization so size of the client doesn't matter doesn't have a big impact on my audit clear next one so what is legal form now they are telling irrespective of legal form even legal form of the client also doesn't matter even legal form of the client also doesn't matter sir what do you mean by legal form of the client doesn't matter sir first of all what is a legal form legal form is a legal structure legal form is a legal structure nothing but a legal validity given to some client how the entity is legally recognized for example if i want to start my business i can start it as a sole proprietor if i have enough of capital if i have, if i know i could manage everything i will start it as a sole proprietor if i have, want to take the help of my partners or relatives i can i can start a partnership firm or i can take up the route of llp or i can start a company or i can start a society so nothing but the legal structure how my organization is legally recognized that i call it as a legal form now they say irrespective of legal form which means what even legal form of your client also doesn't matter for the audit for example if i am doing the audit of a sole proprietor for example i want to carry out this coaching activity so i want to carry out i want to conduct some classes so i want to start this organization i am starting it as a sole proprietor i am starting it as a sole proprietor so being a sole proprietor what i will do i will record these lectures i will sell them i will have employees i will manage the business Similarly, if I if I've started this coaching organization as a company, there also what I will do, there also what I will do, I will record the lectures, I will sell them, I will have employees to manage them. So the activities will go, will remain the same. So irrespective of the legal organization, or or you take another example. For example, if someone is start if someone is starting a uh, garments business, if they are starting as a sole proprietor, what they will do, they will buy the garments, they will sell the garments, make money, run the business. If a company is carrying out the garments business, then also the activities are going to remain same. See, if I am if I am appointed as auditor of a sole proprietor, what I will do? So this sole proprietor will maintain books of accounts. This this sole proprietor will prepare financial statements. Those books of accounts and financial statements I will verify independently. See, if I am conducting audit of a company, there also what I will do? This company will maintain books of accounts. From that they will prepare financial statements. That I will verify, and uh, I will do that verification in an independent manner. So might be in the case of sole proprietor, the format of the financial statements might change. They might prepare a T format of balance sheet and PNL. In the case of company, they will prepare financial statements, but there you might be able to find a vertical format of the balance sheet. But whatever I do in the case of a sole proprietorship firm, that is independent examination of financial information, the same activity even I will do it in the case of a company also. So you tell me, is a legal firm altogether changing my scope of the audit? No. So whatever I do in the sole proprietor, the same thing I will do it in the case of company also, verifying the financial information independently. So that's why the phrase irrespective of size or legal form, which means even size of the client doesn't matter, legal form of the client also doesn't matter. Understood? 
clear and comfortable everybody so that is what the that part of the definition which is saying irrespective of size or legal form till here everybody clear with the definition so what they have told audit is an independent examination of what financial information of an entity whether that entity is profit oriented or not doesn't matter what is the size of the entity doesn't matter what is the legal form of the entity that is also doesn't that also doesn't matter for the audit sir when you are doing all this independent examination you told audit involves verifying we are going to verify the financial information and all but what is the ultimate objective of doing it see when we do any activity we need some outcome out of it so if we are doing any activity there should be some ultimate outcome out of it similarly if we are doing audit if we are doing independent examination of that financial information there should be some final outcome of that entire audit process see we are not doing the audit for time pass definitely no we are not doing the audit for time pass so when we have done the audit there should be some ultimate outcome of the entire audit process sir what is the ultimate outcome of the entire audit process that is addressed in the last part of the definition which says when such examination is conducted with a view to express an opinion thereon so why are we doing this entire process of audit what is the ultimate outcome of the entire process of audit what is the ultimate objective of the entire process of audit they simply say the ultimate objective the ultimate purpose of the entire process of the audit is to express an opinion they are on sir on what you are going to express the opinion so you are going to express the opinion on whatever you have verified so they are telling with a view to express opinion thereon. So ultimate objective is to express the opinion. On what you are going to express the opinion, whatever you have verified, on that only will express the opinion. And what you have verified, financial information you have verified. So you are going to express an opinion on financial information only. So the ultimate objective, the ultimate outcome of the entire process of audit is to express an opinion, to give an opinion on what you will give opinion on the financial information you are going to give the opinion on what you are going to give the opinion on the financial information you are going to give opinion because that is the thing you have verified now we need to go a bit deeper into this opinions see you take any opinion in this world not just the opinion in audit you take opinion regarding any object any person anything any place we can have only two kinds of opinion so you take any opinion regarding any object, anything, any place, any, any situation, you will have only two opinions. Either you will have a good opinion or you will have a bad opinion. Either you will have a good opinion or you will have a bad opinion. That's it, no. Like for example, you are watching my classes. Someone asked you, boss, how did you feel the lectures of this faculty? If you like the lectures, you will say the classes are good. If you don't like the lectures, you will say the classes are bad. So either a good opinion or bad opinion. Or if I put it in other way around, so there will be only two kinds of opinion, either good or bad. If I put other way around, you can also call it as positive opinion. You can also call it as negative opinion. Or take for example, if I ask, if I gave you some food, asked you to taste it and tell me your opinion. What opinion you will give? If you like the food, you will say the food tastes good. Good opinion, positive opinion. If you don't like the food, you will say, no, the, this food tastes worst. Bad opinion, negative opinion. Or if a friend asked you how he or she is looking in a newly bought dress. So if you like her, if you like her or him in that dress, you will say, yes, this dress is looking very good on you. If you don't like it, you will say, no, this dress is not suiting you. It's looking very bad. So any opinion regarding anything, any subject, any object, any situation, any place can be only of two types, either a positive opinion, negative opinion, either a good opinion or bad opinion. Even audit is also not an exception for it. Even audit is also not going to be an exception for it. Even whatever opinion that has been expressed in the audit will also be of only two types. Either a positive opinion or negative opinion. Sir, what is positive opinion? What is negative opinion in audit? Very simple. What you have verified? Financial information. See, whatever financial information of the client that you have verified, if that financial information does not contain any mistakes, if that financial statements have been correctly prepared, if that financial statements are not misleading, verified the financial information you found that the financial statements are prepared properly they are prepared as per schedule 3 they are prepared as per accounting standards the profit is correct total assets are correct depreciation is correct all the calculations are correct notes to accounts are correct everything is correct there is no wrong information getting conveyed they are not misleading to anybody then you will say yes financial statements are okay financial information is okay they are not misleading they give a true and fair view what you will say they will give a they are giving a true and fair view 
so when you verified the financial information and when you are satisfied with it that it is not misleading it is correct it is containing correct information there are nothing wrong there and it is not misleading then you will say something called financial statements will give a true and a fair view that is actually a positive opinion i am giving a good opinion a favorable opinion i am giving favorable opinion i am giving i verified financial information they are not misleading in every aspect they are fine However, if you verified financial information and in that financial information, you are not satisfied. Like profit is calculated wrongly, assets are not totaled correctly and the format is not as per schedule 3. Some disclosures required by accounting standards are not given and you concluded that financial statements are actually misleading. They are not showing a correct picture. They are giving a wrong picture. They are giving a misleading information. If you found that, you will say the financial statements are not giving true and fair view. We say the financial statements does not give true and fair view. They are misleading. So that opinion, we call it as a negative opinion, bad opinion or unfavorable opinion. Understood? So, but actually this is not actual terminology, positive opinion, negative opinion. This we have used it for the sake of our convenience. But in fact, there are technical terms, technical names associated with this positive opinion and negative opinion. That technical names, we will actually learn it as a part of our audit reporting chapter. So, when we take up the audit reporting chapter, then we will get to understand the technical terms. But for the time being, we will remember for our continuation of the discussion, we will remember it in a simple terms. You remember either as a good opinion or bad opinion or positive opinion or negative opinion. So, the ultimate objective, the final outcome of the entire process of that independent examination is to express an opinion. Who will express opinion? Whoever has verified the financial information, that is simply auditor. That person will express the opinion. On what he will express the opinion? On the financial information he will express the opinion and that opinion can be of how many types two types either a positive opinion or a negative opinion so with this we have completely understood the definition of the term audit by now i think you would have already memorized the definition of the term audit so tell me guys what is the definition of audit an audit is an independent examination of financial information of any entity whether profit oriented or not irrespective of its size or legal form when such an examination is conducted with a view to expressing an opinion there on as simple as that so by now we have we have become clear with what is the definition of what is the meaning or definition of the term audit as a part of that we have understood independent we have understood what is financial information we understood what is financial statements and books of accounts we understood what is profit orientation size what is the meaning of the size here what is the meaning of the legal form here and also what is the ultimate outcome of the entire process of the audit so all the basic terms associated with the definition of audit also we have got a good and clear understanding which i hope so Clear everybody? So now we will proceed ahead and try to understand the next part of the chapter. So now let us come, let us proceed further with the next part of the chapter. So the next part of the chapter which we are going to discuss is what are the overall objectives of audit? So what is going to be the overall objective of audit? So that we are going to expand it a bit further. See, just in the discussion, whatever we are done with, I have already explained the ultimate objective of the auditor is to express an opinion. Sir, on what he is going to express the opinion? On the financial information, he is going to express the opinion. So, the ultimate objective of the audit or auditor is to express an opinion. And that opinion, in fact, is required to be expressed regarding two matters. The ultimate objective is to express an opinion. But that opinion is required to be expressed regarding two matters. Sir, which two matters? The two broad objectives of the auditor are to express an opinion whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements and also whether the financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework. So these are the two objectives of the auditor to express an opinion and that opinion about two things whether financial statements are free from material misstatements and whether the financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework. See in each of the objective if you see here once again we are stuck with new terminology. So in, in the first objective the first objective they are trying to say something called material misstatement so to understand what is this first objective first we need to understand what is the meaning of this term material misstatement now in the second objective they are telling whether financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework in order to understand the second objective first we need to understand what is applicable financial reporting framework so now we will be shifting our focus to understand these new terms so that our overall understanding of the objectives becomes very clear 
So first I will start with the second objective. In the second objective also, first I will try to understand what is the meaning of the term applicable financial reporting framework. Applicable financial reporting framework, what is the meaning of the term that we will try to understand. See, we will try to divide this term also into different parts. First, what is the meaning of the term framework? Have you heard about this term framework? You might have seen, you might have already come across this term framework earlier. So, could anybody tell me what is the general meaning of the term framework? So, the general meaning of the term framework is rules and regulations. A set of rules and regulations to do some activity, to do some process. That set of rules and regulations, I am going to call it as framework. For example, if I, if I am telling you to watch this marathon, you have to follow a set of instructions. So, that set of instructions or that set of rules and regulations to watch the class, I will call it as framework for the class understood so simply the term framework means set of rules and regulations then what is the meaning of the term financial reporting see the term financial reporting means the process of preparation and presentation of the financial statements that entire process i am going to call it as financial reporting so what is the meaning of the term financial reporting the process of preparation and presentation of financial statements we call it as financial reporting just an other name for the accounts only accounting process so framework means set of rules and regulations financial reporting means the process of preparation and presentation of financial statements then you tell me what could be the meaning of financial reporting framework what could be the meaning of the, what could be the meaning of the term financial reporting framework very simple we have to join the we have to join the two meanings so if the financial reporting is a process of preparation and presentation of financial statement framework is a set of rules and regulations financial reporting framework means simply the set of rules and regulations which are required to be followed in the process of preparation and presentation of financial statements that's it the set of rules and regulations which you are required to follow in the process of preparation and the presentation of the financial statements, I am going to call it as financial reporting framework. Sir, any examples? Very simple. If you have to prepare the financial statements, will you follow certain rules and regulations? Yes. Take for example, I will follow something called accounting standards. Accounting standards are nothing but a set of regulations which you are required to follow the preparation of financial statements and books of accounts so accounting standard is an example of financial reporting framework or you take schedule 3 schedule 3 is also an example of a financial reporting framework nothing but it is a set of rules and regulations which will be followed so that is what the meaning of financial reporting framework rules and regulations which you are required to follow in the preparation and presentation of financial statements but they use the term something called applicable financial reporting framework we understood what is financial reporting framework but the term which they are using is applicable financial reporting framework so now what is the meaning of the term applicable financial reporting framework let us try to understand it see before i explain what is the meaning of applicable financial reporting framework i have a question for you all so my question is who will prepare financial statements preparation of financial statements is whose responsibility will the auditor prepare the financial statements never so the preparation of financial statements is actually the responsibility of the management the management of the organization is responsible for the preparation of the financial statements like if you take reliance industries limited the financial statements preparation and presentation is the responsibility of management of reliance industries limited so always remember the preparation of financial statements is the responsibility of the management auditor is not responsible for preparation of the financial statements theoretically auditor is not responsible for preparation of financial statements sir then what then what auditor will do sir so once the management has prepared the financial statements then the auditor is going to verify them and the auditor is going to verify them so one thing i want you all to be clear it is whose responsibility to prepare the financial statements it is always the management responsibility to prepare the financial statements clear everybody now the meaning of the term applicable financial reporting framework is depending on the depending on the nature the purpose of the financial statements depending on the purpose and also depending on the nature and purpose of the financial statements the management of the organization will adopt a set of rules and regulations which will be suitable for them that adopted rules and regulations by the management in the preparation of financial statements will be called as applicable financial reporting framework so what they are trying to say here once again i will repeat depending on the nature of the financial statements depending on the purpose of the financial statements 
the management of the organization will adopt that is they will choose which framework will be suitable for them and they will adopt that framework that framework adopted by the management that we are going to call it as applicable financial reporting framework let me give you examples to make you understand in an even better way take for example the management of reliance industries limited who is responsible for preparation management so the management while preparing financial statements keeping in mind the nature of the organization they thought that the nature of our organization is company so since the nature of our organization is company we will follow schedule 3 and accounting standards in the preparation of financial statements who adopted management themselves adopted auditor will not adopt guys who has to adopt management of the organization themselves has to has to adopt they themselves has to choose which set of rules and regulations they have to follow and on what basis they will uh, they will choose on the basis of nature and purpose of the financial statements so the management of reliance industries limited depending on the nature of the organization they have adopted schedule 3 and accounting standards they told they will follow schedule 3 and schedule 3 and accounting standards in the preparation of financial statements so this becomes applicable financial reporting framework for reliance industries limited now another example sbi the management of the SBI is responsible for preparation of financial statements. The management, while deciding to prepare the financial statements, keeping in mind the nature of the organization, the nature of the organization is banking company. Since the nature of the organization is banking company, the management of SBI thought that we will follow a banking regulation act in the preparation of the financial statements. Then banking regulation act becomes applicable financial reporting framework for SBI. Now, Max Life Insurance Company, keeping in mind the nature of the company, the management, since it is an insurance company, the management has chosen, they will follow IRDA rules and regulations in the preparation of the financial statements. Now, IRDA rules and regulations will become applicable financial reporting framework for Max Insurance. So, like this, depending on the nature of the organization and the purpose of the financial statements, the management themselves will adopt a framework which will be suitable for them. That adopted framework, we are going to call it as applicable financial reporting framework. Very, very important, guys. They might ask you a true or false statements. So, if you have a look at the material, you will see the definition of what is applicable financial reporting framework. So, if you see this phrase, in view of nature of the entity and purpose of the financial statements, the management of the entity will adopt applicable financial reporting framework. This is what the correct statement. In the examination, they will ask you a true or false statements. What they will do, you know, they will say, in, listen carefully. In view of nature of the entity and purpose of the financial statements, the auditor of the entity will adopt applicable financial reporting framework. So, they will just replace this word management with the auditor and pose a question as true or false statement. So, you have to write, you have to read the question, especially true or false in MCQs, you have to read it minimum twice. Minimum twice, then only you have to answer. So, auditor will not adopt the applicable financial reporting framework. The management of the organization themselves will adopt the applicable financial reporting framework. And on what basis they will adopt, sir? On the basis of nature of the entity and the purpose of the financial statements. That adopted framework, we are going to call it as applicable financial reporting framework. Everybody, clear about this? Right. So, this is what the meaning of applicable financial reporting framework. Now, we have to extend our discussion to understand something called, uh, to understand the discussion relating to types of framework. Now, we are going to proceed ahead and understand the most important concept, various types of frameworks we are going to understand it. Okay. So, without any delay further, let us try to understand various types of frameworks. Once again, I am telling you, this is going to be the most important discussion. If you are not focusing carefully, you will not be able to understand it on your own. So, very, very important concept here. Okay, so let us try to understand it. So now coming to the types of frameworks. So first, we will try to understand the frameworks on the basis of purpose. So first of all, on the basis of the purpose of the financial statements, financial statements can be broadly divided into two categories. So for, we are going to talk about various types of framework. The first categorization which I am going to explain is the frameworks, the division of frameworks on the basis of their purpose. So on the basis of purpose, so, on the basis of purpose, financial statements can be divided into two categories. Number one, general purpose financial statements and number two, special purpose financial statements. Sir, what is general purpose financial statements? They simply define that financial statements which are prepared as per general purpose framework will be called as general purpose financial statements. So, then what could be the definition of the special purpose framework? See, when they have defined general purpose financial statements are those financial statements which are prepared as per general purpose framework. 
what would be the definition of special purpose financial statements you're all smart enough to guess no so they have simply told the financial statements which are prepared as per special purpose framework that we will call it as special purpose financial statements very very simple definitions no so general purpose financial statements which are prepared as per general purpose framework special purpose financial statements which are prepared as per special purpose framework everybody understood you understood nothing to understand first we need to understand first first we need to understand what is the meaning of the general purpose framework and what is the meaning of the special purpose framework that we have to understand so if we understand what is the meaning of general purpose framework and what is the meaning of the special purpose framework then our discussion gets complete so let us try to understand what is the meaning of general purpose framework and what is the meaning of the special purpose framework that we will try to understand it so they say that general purpose framework is a framework which fulfills financial information needs of various users of the financial statements how is the term general purpose framework is defined they defined it in such a way that the framework which fulfills financial information needs of various users of the financial statements so to understand what is the meaning of the general purpose framework first we need to have a look at who and all are various users of the financial statements see i told financial statements will be prepared by management but its use is done by so many people sir who and all are various users of the financial statements take for example shareholders <coughs> so sorry guys so first example the first user of the financial statements will be shareholder sir why the shareholder will use financial statements because the shareholder is a person who will invest his money in the company he wants to know whether the shares will increase in price or fall in the price and whether the shares will increase the price or decrease the price that will depend on performance of the company so the shareholder wants to know about the performance of the company and how the shareholder will come to know about the performance of the company the only source which is available for him is financial statements so shareholder is a user of the financial statements prospective shareholder sometimes the people who are who want to invest not at invested they want to use the financial statements to know the uh, track record of the company government will make use of financial statements to know whether the ssc's are making the proper payment of the taxes next one and even banks and financiers will use the financial statements to determine whether the borrower will be having a repaying capability or not. so even management themselves will make use of the financial statements for their decision making purposes so management also will be making use of financial statements for their decision making purposes so management will prepare financial statements and it will be used by different different people for different different purposes now if i follow one single set of rules and regulations and prepare the financial statements and if that framework and if that set of rules and regulations whatever i have followed if they are going to fulfill financial information needs of various users simultaneously that framework i am going to call it as general purpose framework so once again if i put it in a simple sense management will prepare financial statements there will be different users if i follow a set of rules and regulations and prepare financial statements those financial information those financial statements will fulfill financial information needs of all the users or various users simultaneously such a framework we call it as general purpose framework if i give you an example as i have told the financial statement users are so many shareholders will be users government will be users prospective shareholders will be users sometimes research analyst will be users who prepare the analyst reports on the companies so like that different users are there now do you think every company will prepare different different set of financial statements separate set of financial statement for shareholders separate set of financial statement for government separate set of financial statement for prospective shareholder do you think for separate separate entities separate separate financial statements separate separate user separate separate financial statements no if you pay attention practically the companies will generally prepare one set of financial statements using the rules of schedule 3 and accounting standards and they will follow this framework and prepare financial statements if i go and give it to shareholder will he accept yes if i go and give it to government will they accept yes if i go and give it to prospective shareholder will his information needs be fulfilled yes if i go and give it to research analyst will his information needs be fulfilled yes 
So here the company is following one set of rules and regulations in our example schedule 3 and accounting standards and that framework is fulfilling financial information needs of the shareholders also it is fulfilling information needs of the government also it is fulfilling information needs of the prospective shareholders also it is also going to fulfill the information needs of the research analyst also so one framework is uh, one framework is followed and it has fulfilled financial information needs of various users simultaneously now can i call this framework as general purpose framework yes why because a single framework is trying to satisfy information needs of various users of the financial statements sir how general purpose framework or why general purpose framework will fulfill financial information needs of various users why because it follows certain characteristics why because it follows certain characteristics so since a general purpose framework follows certain characteristics that's why it is having the capacity to fulfill information needs of various users Sir, what characteristics general purpose framework will have? It will have four characteristics. Number one, it will follow generally accepted accounting principles like prudence, concept of prudence, concept of materiality. So those kind of general purpose, generally accepted accounting principles will be followed in the case of general purpose framework. And also the general purpose framework will follow accounting standards. They also will follow fundamental accounting assumptions. We have three fundamental accounting assumptions. What are they? going guns and accrual consistency so this general purpose framework will also fulfill these three fundamental accounting assumptions also and general purpose financial general purpose framework financial statements will be prepared periodically for a fixed period general purpose financial statements will be prepared like if you take company's financial statements they will be prepared for a fixed duration of one year the company will not prepare financial statements for five months seven months nine months etc they will prepare financial statements for one entire period that is for one entire financial year they will prepare the financial statements and then they will release it so they will be prepared with a fixed periodicity so since general purpose framework will have these characteristics they will be accepted by all so what are the four characteristics of the general purpose framework or general purpose financial statements they follow generally accepted accounting principles they follow accounting standards they follow fundamental accounting assumptions and even they will be prepared periodically and that fixed periodicity in india is eo and that year in india starts from 1st april to and ends on 31st of march understood so this is what the meaning of general purpose framework which fulfills financial information needs of various users sir now what is the meaning of the term special purpose framework they define special purpose framework something like this they told that the framework which fulfills financial information needs of specific users of the financial statements that means if we are following a set of rules and regulations and that set of rules and regulations will fulfill information needs of only one or two specific users not for all users we follow certain set of rules and regulations to fulfill information needs of only one or two specific users such a kind of framework we are going to call it as special purpose framework so let me give you an example to understand take for example very certain company x limited or there is certain company X Limited. Now this company X Limited went to the bank manager and they asked, sir, you take our last three years financial statements. We prepared the last three years financial statements using our general purpose framework. So last three years financial statements we are giving to you on the basis of that, you give me the loan. Banker told something, sir, whatever general purpose financial statements you have given, that I will keep it aside. But if you want, if you expect me to give the loan for you, you do one thing. What you do is you prepare the financial statements on cash basis. You prepare the financial statements on cash basis then i will give you loan then i will give you loan so why the banker is asking is why because the actual repaying capability will be determined by cash profits not on the basis of accrued profits see whatever general purpose financial statements they have brought to the banker they have been prepared on accrual basis but the banker wants to know the real repaying capability so the real repaying capability of the loan depends on cash profit for example, if you have 10 crores of accrued profit, there is no guarantee whether this 10 crores is realized in cash or not at realized in cash. So accrued profit will not determine your true repaying capability. Cash profit will determine your true repaying capability. So that's why the bank manager has asked this company to come back and prepare the financial statements on cash basis. On that basis, he will give you the loan. So this company came back, prepared the financial statements on cash basis, gave it to the bank manager. Bank manager was happy. He gave the loan to the company. Now, if the company takes this financial statements, which are prepared on cash basis and give it to shareholder, will it satisfy the shareholders needs? That is, will they accept it? No. 
if they go and give it to the government and say on this basis only we will pay the taxes will the government accept no if they will go and give it to the research analyst and ask them to prepare the stock market report will they use it no so here the company has followed a framework that is cash basis of financial statements they have prepared and this framework is fulfilling only information need of a specific user who is that specific user whose financial information need has been fulfilled so that specific user in our example is none other than banker it is fulfilling the financial information needs of only one user which is banker it is not fulfilling information needs of other users so that framework i will call it as special purpose framework or if i give you one more example take for example a company has been approached by uh, yeah let me put it this way there is some company x limited okay this X Limited company want to be acquired by Y Limited. That means Y Limited wants to acquire this company X Limited. Y Limited wants to acquire this company. Let me put it this way. So there is a company X Limited. There is another company Y Limited. So this company Y Limited wants to acquire X Limited. So they want to determine the purchase consideration. So what this company Y Limited, this is acquirer. So this company wants to purchase. So this company is the buyer. This company is a seller. So what this company told is, okay, boss, I want to buy your company, but I will pay the consideration on the basis of financial statements, which you prepare for the recent nine months. The year has not yet got, not yet got over. So April, 2023 is a starting year. So the acquisition was supposed to happen in the month of December 23. So what the company Y Limited told us, I will buy your company. But I will pay the purchase consideration which will be determined on the basis of financial statements prepared for this 9 months only. So the management of this company prepared 9 months of financial statements to help this Y limited company to help the buyer to determine the purchase consideration. Okay. So the management has prepared financial statements taking the duration as 9 months to fulfill the information needs of only one user. If the company takes this 9 months duration of financial statements and give it to the shareholder, will they accept? No. If they go and give it to the government, will they accept? No. If they go and give it to the banker, will they accept? No. So these financial statements which are prepared for a duration of 9 months, it will fulfill information needs of only one specific user. This also I can call it as special purpose financial statements. So special purpose financial statements are prepared as per special purpose framework and the special purpose framework is a framework which fulfills financial information needs of specific users of the financial statements. Clear everybody? So I have given you examples also here. Clear and comfortable everybody? So these are the two types of frameworks on the basis of purpose of the financial statements. So now let us try to understand there is one more categorization of the frameworks and that categorization is on the basis of the presentation. See whatever the categorization of the frameworks which we have done now. So general purpose framework and special purpose framework. So those have been divided on the basis of purpose. So generally general purpose framework is such framework which fulfills financial information needs of various users. On the other hand special purpose framework fulfills financial information needs of specific uh, specific users. So that classification, whatever we have done, that is on the basis of purpose. Now, on the basis of presentation, the frameworks are once again divided into two more categories. On the basis of presentation, the frameworks are once again divided into two categories. Number one is compliance framework and number two is fair presentation framework. So let us try to understand what is this compliance framework and what is this fair presentation framework with the help of examples. Okay, so we are going to have very important discussion for the coming 10-15 minutes. Please pay full attention. So in order to understand in a detailed manner, what is this compliance framework and what is this fair presentation framework. So first I will start my discussion with what is the compliance framework. So we'll try to read the definition from the material. So they say compliance framework is a framework in which the financial statements are prepared as per the requirements of such framework without any deviation. The most important term here is without any deviation. So what they are trying to say here, compliance, the name itself says, what do you mean by compliance? To comply with something. So compliance framework refers to such a kind of framework, such a kind of framework in which you are required to prepare the financial statements as per the requirements of that framework. That means whatever rules and regulations which are given in the framework, you have to prepare the financial statements as per the set rules and regulations. And most important thing here, without any deviation, deviation will not be permitted. You are not supposed to deviate from the requirements of the framework. 
So whether by following that rules and regulations, financial statements, give it true and fair view, doesn't give it true and fair view, all that is not going to matter. In the case of compliance framework, you are strictly required to adhere to whatever requirements given in the framework. Deviation is not at all permitted. You are not at all permitted to deviate. Whether it gives a true and fair view, does not give a true and fair view, all that doesn't matter. You have to strictly follow the rules and regulations given in the framework without any deviation such a framework we are going to call it as the compliance framework clear everybody like if you take for example in the previous when we are understanding the general purpose framework and special purpose framework as i have told the banker is asking the company to prepare the financial statements on cash basis see company knows that if they prepare the financial statements on cash basis that doesn't give a true and fair view but still after knowing that also the company has prepared the financial statements on the cash basis to satisfy the banker to get the loan from him yes or no so this is an example of compliance framework where the entity knows that by following the certain set of rules and regulations a true and fair you will not be there but still deviation is not permitted if you want a loan from the banker you have to compulsorily prepare the financial statements on the cash basis so such a kind of framework in which the deviation is not at all permitted where you are required to strictly comply with the rules and regulations given there without any deviation such a framework we call it as compliance framework now let us talk about fair presentation framework sir what is fair presentation framework so if we come back to the material here again so let us read the definition what they are trying to say here so fair presentation framework is the framework in which the financial statements are prepared as per the requirements of such framework if you see here the financial uh, the fair presentation framework also till here the definition will look similar to compliance framework only so here also what they are telling in the fair presentation framework also we try to prepare the financial statements as per the requirements of the framework only and and the definition will not stop here the definition also says and may provide additional disclosures beyond the requirements of the framework or may even deviate from the requirements of such framework for what purpose so as to achieve the fair presentation so as to achieve fair presentation frame so as to achieve the fair presentation sir what exactly they are trying to say see in the case of fair presentation framework also there will be certain framework there will be certain rules and regulations there also we try to prepare financial statements as per the requirements of such framework whatever has been mentioned in the framework that we will try to follow but here we are given some freedom in the case of fair presentation uh, framework the user will get a freedom we get a option we get a choice sir what freedom we will get so what freedom the fair presentation framework will give is so you try to prepare the financial statements as per the requirements of such framework only but we will give you some freedom we will give you some extra permission what extra permission will be given option number one we will give you permission to provide additional disclosures may contain additional disclosures which are not required as per the framework or we will also give you permission to deviate may deviate from the requirements of such framework altogether here also you try to prepare financial statements as per the requirements of the framework but we will give you option what option we will give you you can either provide additional disclosures you can either add extra explanation in your notes to accounts or in some circumstances we will also give you permission to deviate altogether that means to do don't follow the framework and follow something out of your own choice but why this permission we are giving you why we are giving you the permission to provide additional disclosures why we are giving you the permission to deviate from the requirements of the framework the ultimate objective is to achieve fair presentation so what is the ultimate objective so we are giving you that permission to provide additional disclosures or we are giving you the permission to deviate from the requirements of the framework to uh, to achieve fair presentation able to understand see the name itself says fair presentation framework you are required to uh, ensure that the financial statements give true and fair view so in the case of fair presentation framework the focus is on true and fair view whereas in the case of compliance framework following strictly is the objective so I will try to give you example to make you understand this compliance framework and fair presentation framework. We will do one quick example. Take for example, there is an entity X Limited. There is a company X Limited. Now this company X Limited has bought some plant and machinery. This company X Limited has bought some plant and machinery. The total cost of the machinery is 1 crore rupees. What is the total cost of the machinery? 1 crore rupees. Now, if when an entity has bought a plant and machinery, when an entity has bought a fixed asset, they are required to charge depreciation. They are required to charge depreciation. So now for charging depreciation as per the company's act, as per the schedule three. So the financial reporting framework says for charging depreciation, two of the methods are allowed. 
either the client can follow SLM method or the client can follow WDV method. So the company has bought a plant and missionary and on that they have to charge the depreciation and as per the framework as per the company's act either of the two methods are permitted either charge the depreciation on SLM basis or charge the depreciation on WDV basis and even you are well aware under the company's act they have even given the percentage of depreciations also rates of depreciation also they have given take for example as per the company's act if you follow SLM method the depreciation rate is 15 percent if you follow WDV the depreciation rate is 20 percent so if it is a compliance framework it is a compliance framework then you need to strictly follow either slm or wdv so if i follow slm the depreciation will be 15 lakhs if i follow wdv the depreciation amount will be 20 lakhs so if it is a compliance framework deviation will not be permitted you are required to follow either slm or wdv as given in the framework but now let me add some extra information so when it comes to usage of this plant and machinery, this plant and machinery was designed in such a way that, that it is going to exactly produce 1 lakh units and after producing 1 lakh units, this machinery will stop working. This plant and machinery has been designed in such a way that this will exactly produce 1 lakh units. After that, it will stop functioning. So such a machinery it is. So, and if you look at the consumption pattern, if you look at the way the machinery is getting used, some more method of depreciation looks more appropriate. Apart from SLM and WDV, when we look at the consumption pattern, the machinery is designed to exactly produce certain number of products or units. So, keeping in mind the consumption pattern, some more method of depreciation will be more suitable. Sir, which method will be more suitable? Production units method will be more suitable. Production units method will be more suitable. That betterly reflects the consumption pattern. So, assume that in year 1, the using that machinery, some uh, 25,000 uh, 25, units were already manufactured. In the year one, using that machinery, 25,000 units were already manufactured. So, if you tell me, if you follow production units method, what will be the amount of depreciation? The amount of depreciation will be 1 crore into 25,000 divided by 1 lakh units. So, if you calculate it, 25 lakhs will be the amount of depreciation. Yes or no? So, now we have three options. Applicable financial reporting framework says either follow SLM or WDV. Whereas, if you look at the consumption pattern, some more method of depreciation is looking appropriate. Production units method will be more appropriately reflecting the consumption pattern. If we follow production units method, the depreciation amount would be 25 lakh rupees. So, if it is a compliance framework, irrespective of whether the financial statements give a, free, uh, give a true and fair view, doesn't give a true and fair view, we will straight away charge the depreciation either as 15 lakhs or 20 lakh rupees. No deviation is permitted. However, if it is a fair presentation framework, here, the if it is a fair presentation framework, the client will be given two options. Number one, if you want, you can provide additional disclosures. If you want, you can provide additional disclosures. Or an option will be given to you to deviate altogether from the requirements to achieve fair presentation. So, if it is a fair presentation, how we can give additional disclosure? Let us have a look at it. So, what do you mean by giving additional disclosure? See, in this case, what I will do is, in my statement of P&L, I will charge a depreciation either on SLM or WDV. I will show depreciation as either 15 lakhs or 20 lakh rupees. I will follow the requirements of the framework. I will, in my statement of P&L, I will charge a depreciation either as 15 lakhs or 20 lakhs. But what I will do is, in my notes to accounts, I will add an extra explanation. In my notes to accounts, what I will do? I will add an extra explanation. What I will say is, since the requirements of the framework are there, so I have charged a depreciation as per SLM or WDV method. But depending on the consumption pattern, some more method of depreciation is appropriate, which is production units. If I would have followed that production units method, the depreciation would have been 25 lakhs. The profit would have been come down by 5 more lakhs. So I will try to comply with the requirements. But what I will do? I will be given a freedom to add disclosure, to add an explanation in the requirements, which is beyond the requirements of the framework. You see, the framework is not asking you to give this disclosure. But still, I am at my choice to add extra disclosure in the notes to accounts. For what purpose I am adding this extra explanation? I am adding this extra explanation in the notes to accounts to uh, achieve the fair presentation so that users will get a better presentation of the information. Able to understand? So, this permission will be given. So, we try to comply with the requirements, but we will be given a permission to add extra disclosure in the notes to accounts for achieving fair presentation. Option number one. See, one more option will be given in fair presentation framework. We are also permitted to deviate from the requirements of the framework. 
we are also given the permission to completely deviate from the requirements of the framework sir what do you mean by deviation if i want to go for the second option what i will do is in my statement of p and l itself directly i will charge the depreciation as 25 lakh rupees in my statement of the PNL, I will directly charge depreciation as 25 lakh rupees. That means I have deviated. I am ignoring whatever has been mentioned in the framework and I am following something else. According, uh, I am following something else. I am ignoring whatever has been mentioned in the framework. I am deviating from the requirements of the framework. Sir, why are you deviating from the requirements? Here? Why am I deviating the requirements? Is Why? Because this 25 lakhs will give me more fair presentation. Understood? So, in the case of fair presentation framework, to the extent possible, we try to prepare the financial statements as per the requirements of such framework. But here, in this case, we will be given an option. Sir, what option will be given? What option will be given is, what freedom will be given is, either we will be given a freedom to add additional disclosures, which are not required. And also, we are given a freedom to deviate from the requirements. Either we can provide additional disclosures beyond the requirements of the framework or we are given a freedom to deviate altogether the requirements of the framework and follow something else also. Sir, ultimately, why the freedom has been given? What is the purpose of giving this freedom of providing additional disclosure or deviating from the requirements of the framework to achieve fair presentation? To achieve what? Fair presentation. The focus is fair presentation. So, on the basis of presentation, these frameworks are divided once again into two categories, compliance framework and fair presentation framework clear everybody now sir where there will be true and fair view where we can guarantee always true and fair view see in the case of fair presentation framework there will always be true and fair view in the case of fair presentation framework there will always be true and fair view in the case of compliance framework true and fair view might not be guaranteed true and fair view can be there may not be there we can't guarantee but there will always be a true and fair view in the case of fair presentation framework and one more thing here, most of the special purpose financial statements will be prepared as per the compliance framework and most of the general purpose financial statements will be prepared as per fair presentation framework. Most of the compliance, most of the special purpose financial statements are prepared as per compliance framework and most of the general purpose financial statements are prepared as per fair presentation framework. And even if you pay attention, every listed company will release the financial statements in the public domain, no? So you will be able to download that financial statements of every listed company on their websites. What do you, uh, they are actually general purpose financial statements and those financial statements which every listed company is releasing on what framework they have prepared. They have been prepared on compliance framework or fair presentation framework. They all follow a fair presentation framework. They all follow a fair presentation framework. Why? Because section 129 of the Companies Act asks if you read the provisions of section 129 of the Companies Act which is talking about the financial statements. It says financial statements shall give true and fair view and comply with the standards and uh, schedule 3. So which means in the case of section 129 the more focus has been given on true and fair view. So that's why whatever financial statements which the companies are preparing, which listed companies will prepare and make it available in the public domain, they all follow fair presentation framework. Clear everybody? So that is what the differentiation. So once again, if you see here, true and fair view may not be guaranteed where in the case of compliance framework, but in the case of fair presentation framework, there will always be a true and fair view. Next, most of the special purpose financial statements are prepared as per compliance framework. Then they say most of the general purpose financial statements are prepared as per as per fair presentation framework. So with this, we are done with the discussion relating to types of frameworks. So how many frameworks totally we have seen? Four frameworks we have seen. Two on the basis of purpose. What are they? Fair, general purpose framework, special purpose framework. Two on the basis of presentation. What are they? Compliance framework and fair presentation framework. Why we have come to from where our discussion started? We have understood types of framework, but where this discussion has actually started? We are discussing something called objectives of the audit. So we told that the objective of the auditor is to express an opinion. That opinion needs to be expressed on two things. We came on the second objective, which says whether financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework. So first we understood what is financial reporting framework. Then we understood what is applicable financial reporting framework. Then we understood various types of framework. So what is the second objective on which auditor has to express the opinion? So as an auditor, you have to express the opinion whether financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework which means the management of the client's organization depending upon the nature of the entity purpose of the financial statements they will select which framework will be applicable for them as an auditor my responsibility is to verify whatever financial statements which the management has actually prepared whether they have prepared it on the basis of applicable financial reporting framework 
Like for example, if I am conducting audit of a company and if my client company has adopted Schedule 3 and accounting standards as their applicable financial reporting framework, as an auditor, my responsibility is to verify whether really the client's financial statements are prepared as per Schedule 3 and accounting standards. If I am conducting audit of SBI, the SBI has adopted Banking Regulation Act as their applicable financial reporting framework. If I am an auditor, my objective is to verify whether the financial statements of SBI have really been prepared on the basis of the Banking Regulation Act. So, one of the major objective of the auditor is to express an opinion whether financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework. Clear? So, we are done with the second objective. Now, let us come back to first objective. Sir, what is the first objective? The auditor is required to express an opinion whether financial statements are free from material misstatements. So, now we need to understand, in order to understand the objective, first objective, first we need to understand the meaning of the term misstatements. Sir, what is the meaning of the term misstatements? So, if we understand the meaning of the misstatements, then if we understand what is the meaning of the material misstatements, then the first objective also becomes clear. So, what is the simple meaning of the term misstatement? Statement means what? Conveying something. Misstatement means what? Conveying something in a wrong way. So, simply a misstatement in the financial statements means a mistake in the financial statements. Simple language. What do you mean by misstatement, misstatement in the financial statements? A mistake in the financial statements in a very simple common language. But as we all know, simple things don't work in the examination. They will give complex definitions for the terms. Similarly, for the, for the term misstatement also, a complex definition has been given. First, I will try to read it. So, if you read the definition of the misstatement, what they are trying to say here is the difference between the difference between amount, classification, presentation and disclosure, which is there in the reported financial statements. And the amount, the classification, presentation and disclosure, which is required as per applicable financial reporting framework. This is what the definition they have given for the term misstatement. I know you would not have understood anything. But this is what the complex definition. So even after analyzing all this definition also, ultimately we will come to the conclusion, sir, this is nothing but a mistake in the financial statements. Yes. But as I have told, simple things don't work in the examination. They will always try to complicate it. So let us try to understand what exactly they are trying to say with the help of a few examples. So they say that if there is a difference between amount, classification, presentation, disclosure, which is, which is there in reported financial statements. Reported means what? The financial statements which are already prepared by, by the management. And amount, classification, presentation, disclosure required as per applicable financial reporting framework. If there is a difference between the two, the difference only we call it as misstatement. The difference between amount, classification, presentation, disclosure in the reported financial statements and amount, classification, presentation, disclosure, which is required as per applicable financial reporting framework, the difference only we are going to call it as misstatement. Sir, what is this? Let me give you examples. Take for example, some accounting standard as per AS9, the client is required to recognize the revenue as 90,000 rupees. So, as the amount required as per applicable financial reporting framework is 90,000. But in the financial statements which are prepared, already prepared by the management, the management has recognized the revenue as 1,50,000. So, there is a difference in amount, amount which is there in the reported financial statements and the amount which is required as per applicable financial reporting framework. There is a difference. This difference we call it as what? Misstatement. This difference we are going to call it as what? Simply misstatement. Understood? Or there might be a difference in classification. As per applicable financial reporting framework, certain item is required to be treated as capital expenditure. But the management in the financial statements, whatever they have prepared, they have classified it as a revenue expenditure. Difference in classification. This also we call it as misstatement. Or sometimes there might be a difference in the presentation as per applicable financial reporting framework like schedule 3 if you take. So in the schedule 3 you are required to prepare financial statements in a vertical format. But the client has prepared the financial statements in horizontal format, in T format. There is a difference in presentation. The difference also we call it as misstatement. Or there could be a difference in disclosure also. Sir, what do you mean by disclosure? Disclosure means an explanation in the notes to accounts. So, some accounting standard is asking you to give some explanation. Whereas, in the financial statements which are prepared by the management, either that disclosure is not given or the disclosure has been given in a wrong way. Either some explanation has not been given or that explanation has not been given in a 
correct way so that difference also we call it as misstatement so that is what the different that is what the definition they are trying to say the difference between amount classification presentation disclosure which is there in the reported financial statements and the amount classification presentation disclosure which is required as per applicable financial reporting framework if there is any difference in any of these items that difference we are going to call it as a misstatement Understood everybody. So once again, simply nothing but a mistake in the financial statements. See one important concept which I would like to focus here that will help you to understand the remaining chapters also. See generally whenever we say mistake in the financial statements, if I say there is a mistake in the financial statements, what generally people will assume, what the perception a student will have is, okay, there is a mistake in the financial statement means there is a prop, there is a mistake in the profit, there is a mistake in the assets, there is a mistake in the liabilities. So we all think in numbers. We generally have a preconception that when I say there is a mistake in the financial statements, we always think that there is some mistake in the numbers of the financial statements. I want you to change that perception. When I say misstatement in the financial statements, that means that means uh, that misstatement need not always be there only in numbers. The misstatement can even happen in the notes to accounts also. The misstatement can even happen in notes to accounts also. So change this perception going forward when I say there is a misstatement in the financial statements don't just imagine a mistake happening in the numbers amounts balance sheet etc. A mistake can also happen even in the explanations to the notes to accounts also oh, if the management tries to give a wrong explanation or if they omit some explanation in the notes to accounts that also constitute a misstatement. They want you to change that perception now. So, misstatement need not always happen in numbers or figures. Misstatement can even happen in the explanations given in the financial statements also. Clear everybody? So, this is what the meaning of misstatement. And a misstatement can happen because of two reasons. A misstatement in the financial statements can occur, be can occur because of two reasons. Number one is error or other one is fraud. Error or fraud. So, a misstatement in the financial statements can happen because of two reasons. Either error or fraud. Sir, what is the differentiating factor between the two? Fraud is something which is done intentionally with a willingness, with a with a understanding that the person is committing wrong, still he commits it. So if something is done intentionally, that we are going to call it as fraud. Whereas if something happens by mistake, unintentionally, that will call it as that we call it as error. So a misstatement can happen because of two reasons, either on the basis of uh, either that could be because of error or that could be because of fraud. And uh, the differentiating factor between the two is the underlying intention behind doing that act. Clear, understood everybody. So this is what the uh, uh, this is what the source from which a misstatement can happen. And if you pay attention to the first objective, they just don't use the term misstatement. In fact, they use the term material misstatement. So if we come back to the first objective, they use the phrase whether financial statements are free from material misstatement. So we understood the term misstatement. Now we have to understand what is the meaning of the term material misstatement. So sir, what is the meaning of the term material or materiality? Say this term material or materiality is having a lot of significance in our auditing subject. The term materiality is having a lot of significance in our auditing subject. We are going to come across this term at various instances and it is one of the most important fundamental concept in the audit. So now we will just try to introduce you the term materiality. Later we try to understand in a deeper manner about that materiality. But now we will just understand the basic meaning of the term materiality. See the general meaning of the term material or materiality if I call certain item as material. So what do I mean by that? So material means something which is very significant, something which is very important or something which is very major item. So the general meaning of the term materiality is something significant, important or material. So they say that the first objective they say as an auditor you are required to express opinion whether financial statements are free from material misstatements. Which means that the auditor need not be concerned about each and every minute misstatement. He should be concerned only with material misstatements, significant misstatements. Sir, how to define which misstatement is material, which misstatement is not material? See, there is no hard and fast rule there actually. The term materiality is a very subjective term or relative term in when it comes to audit. It is not an absolute term. So the term material or materiality is a subjective term or it is a relative term. What is material in each circumstance that will depends on the facts and circumstances of each and every case. We may not say this amount will be material in all the circumstances. We can't say something like that. Materiality is something which is a subjective decision. It changes from entity to entity, industry to industry, audit to audit, client to client. It changes. It is a very subjective or relative term. 
Like if I give you an example, take for example in the Reliance Industries Limited, which is having six lakh plus crores of turnover of company. In that company, you came to know that there is a error worth one. Uh, there is error worth ten lakh rupees. In the Reliance Industries Limited, which is having a turnover of six lakh plus crores, you found that there is a misstatement worth. There is a error of ten lakhs happened in Reliance Industries Limited. Do you think it is material? No, it is not material. Why it is not material? It is very sign. It is very insignificant. See, even the financial statements of Reliance will be rounded off to the nearest to crores. So this ten lakhs will not even come as a rounding of error also. So this ten lakh rupees is not material in the case of Reliance Industries Limited. However, if the same ten lakh rupees of misstatement is happening some another company X Limited, which is had which is hardly having a turnover of one crore rupees, if in that company you came to know there is a misstatement of ten lakh rupees, is that material? Yes. See here how subjective the term materiality is. Same misstatement, you did not call it as material in the case of Reliance Industries Limited, whereas the same misstatement of ten lakhs, if it has happened in a small company X Limited having a turnover of one crore rupees, then you are saying it is going to be very material. So, what is material? What is not material? It all depends on facts and circumstances of each case. But if we have to give one general definition, the Act or the standards have given definition something like this: a misstatement will be considered material if it could influence the decision of users of the financial statements. What general definition they have given? A misstatement will be considered material if it could influence economic decisions of users of the financial statements. Because of a misstatement, if the users' if the users' decision is getting affected, then only we call that misstatement as material. There is a misstatement, but which is not influencing the decision of users of the financial statements. We don't call it as material. Take this example only. Assume you are one of the user, Reliance Industries Limited. You are user of the financial statements of this entity. You are a prospective shareholder. Depending on the performance of the company, you want to invest your money in the Reliance Industries Limited. You downloaded the financial statements, and while looking at the financial statements, you came to know that in this Reliance Industries Limited, you there is a ten lakhs worth of error. You want to invest one lakh rupees of money in the Reliance Industries Limited. By coming to know that there is ten lakh rupees worth of misstatement happened in Reliance Industries Limited, will you stop yourself from investing your money in the Reliance? No. Why? Because looking at the size of the company, ten lakhs is not at all significant. So even though I came to know there is ten lakhs worth of misstatement, that is not influencing my decision. That is not having any impact on my decision. It is not material. So a misstatement will be considered if it could influence the decision of users of financial statements. Take for example, I am a prospective shareholder of the client X Limited. I want to invest my some ten thousand rupees of money in this company. Before I make an investment, I came to know that this ten lakhs uh, misstatement ha has happened in this company. The turnover of the company itself is one crore rupees. Now you tell me, will I stop myself from investing my money in the company? Yes. When you came to know there is ten lakhs worth of misstatement, will you stop yourself from investing your money in the company? Yes, here you will stop investing your money in the company. So now there is a misstatement in the financial statements which influenced, which has influenced the decision of user of financial statements. So in this case, I can call this as material. So what is material? We can't define exactly. We can't determine a particular amount as material in all the circumstances. It depends on facts and circumstances of each and every case. But the general meaning is a misstatement will be considered material if it could influence the decision of users of the financial statements. Because of a misstatement, if the decision of a user is getting influenced, then that uh, misstatement we are going to call it as material. Able to understand everybody, clear and comfortable. So this is what the meaning of the term material misstatement. And as an auditor, you are your first objective is to express an opinion whether financial statements are free from material misstatements. Sir, what do you mean by free from material misstatements? Should the financial statement contain a misstatement or should not contain a material misstatement? The financial statements should not contain a material misstatement. Regarding that, you have to verify and express the opinion. So with this, we are done with the objectives of auditor also. So what basically auditor will do is he will try to verify for this two things whether financial statements are free from material misstatements whether they are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework if he got satisfactory answers for both the questions yes the financial statements are free from material misstatements and yes with and yes they are also prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework to both the questions if the auditor got satisfactory answers he will give positive opinion either to one of the question if he got negative responses either for first objective he got negative answer or for the second objective he got negative answer or for both the questions he got the negative answer then he is going to give a negative opinion
understood everybody comfortable so this is what regarding the objectives of audit or the objectives of auditor so we understood the definition of audit and all the associated terms with it and also we understood what is the objectives of the audit and as a part of that discussion we understood various terms like applicable financial reporting framework various types of framework misstatement material misstatement all these things we have covered clear everyone so now i will try to cover one more last point and we will uh, wind up this chapter introduction to audit so one more important fundamental concept which i want you to remember is what is the meaning of the term auditor what is the meaning of the term auditor so we understood what is audit we understood what are objectives audit now let us try to understand the term auditor so who, what is the meaning of the term auditor generally a person whoever does the audit we call him as auditor Generally, whoever a person whoever does the audit that person will be called as auditor the person whoever is doing that independent examination we call him as auditor but now we need to understand this auditor term in a detailed manner see take for example there is an audit firm there is an audit firm so take for example uh, i am a practicing chartered accountant i have started my office so in my office i will be there a practicing chartered accountant who is ultimately responsible for all the works which my firm is doing so when I say I have an office, in my office staff also will be there. In my office staff also will be there. Sir, which staff will be there in my office? So basically, article assistants will be there. And in the article assistants also two categories will be there. So there will be senior article assistants, there will be junior article assistants. Sir, what is a senior junior? Senior article assistant is a person who has completed one year of articleship. Junior article assistant who is still in the first year of articleship, two year ex uh, in case of senior article assistant, there will be 2000 rupees of extra strife, extra stipend. So like this in my, in my office, there will be senior article assistants also, there will be junior article assistants also. Take for example, there are some two senior article assistants in my office and there are some three junior, uh, junior article assistants in my office. Sir, who else could be there in my, st in my office? So what I have done is, see these senior article assistants, junior article assistants, these are not permanent employees, these are all temporary employees. You will stay with me till the time your article ship is there, after that you will leave. I needed some, some permanent employees also. So what I have done is, I have I have recruited one person who has completed his BCOP. I have recruited a person who has completed his BCOP. I have recruited one more person who is a, uh, who did not complete the chartered accountancy course in full. He completed a CA inter, he did the article ship, but he did not clear the CA final. And that person also, I have recruited him as an employee, full-time employee. So when you recruit these kind of people, generally the designation given to them will be paid assistance. Generally, what designation will be given to them? Paid assistance. So I have recruited two paid assistants also. One become qualified person, other one is a semi-qualified chartered accountant. See, this term semi-qualified chartered accountant is something which we have given. There is no legal recognition called semi-qualified chartered accountant, something like that. This is something which we use it in the common parlance. So my firm is expanding. I'm unable to handle all the works on my own. So what I have done is I have recruited another chartered accountant or, and also I have recruited another cost accountant as my employees, not as partners, guys. My business is expanding. I can't manage everything on my own. So I recruited, I have recruited a chartered accountant, a cost accountant as my employees. So when you recruit qualified professionals as your employees, generally we give them a designation audit manager. Generally we give them a designation audit manager. So this is what my entire uh, office is. These many people are there. So how many staff are there? So I have a, uh, being the head of the firm, I'm a practicing chartered accountant or in case of partnership firm, there will be two or three partners also. So head of the firm will be there. Then in my office, there will be senior article assistants, there will be junior article assistants, there will be paid assistants, there will be even audit managers also. So all these people are there in my office. So now assume that one day a client, some ABC limited, a client has approached my firm and asked me to do the audit for them and asked me to do the audit for them. So I, I uh, am the engagement partner. I, I am the head of the firm. I'm a practicing chartered accountant. I thought, okay, sir, I gave the acceptance. We will do the audit for you. I gave the acceptance. We will give the audit. We will do the audit for you. I gave the acceptance. So after I have accepted this audit, one fine day, I have to go to this client's premises and start doing the audit now. One fine day, I have to go to the client's premises and start doing the audit. So now you tell me when we have to go and do the audit as an engagement pack, as a head of the firm, will I single handedly go and complete the audit or will I take my staff also along with me? I have to start doing the audit. Just see, just accepting will not give you the fees. You have to go and actually conduct the audit also. 
So when I have to actually go and conduct the audit as the head of the firm, will I single-handedly go and complete the audit or will I take my team also along with me? I will take my team also along with me. I have so many staff in my office. I am not giving them salary for time pass. I have to use them for my work. So I have to take along with me all my team also for audit. All my team also for audit. But I will not take all the staff. I will not take all the stuff. Why? Because I will not just have an audit of one entity. I might be having various others, other works which I have to take care of. So I will not take all my engagement team members. I will choose. I will decide whoever is free and take only limited number of persons for this particular assignment. Why? Because I will be having multiple assignments. I have to divide all my team on different, different activities. So what I have done is I have decided, okay, I will take this one senior article assistant. I will take this two junior article assistants. I will take this paid assistant. I will take this audit manager. So myself engage uh, myself practicing chartered accountant along with one senior article assistant, two junior article assistants, one paid assistant, one audit manager. So totally how many people? One, two, three, four, five plus one, six. So totally six people, including the head of the firm. So we six people collectively as a team, we go to the audit of ABC limited and we will complete the audit. See, generally, we call this as audit engagement, we call it audit engagement. Sir, what is the meaning of the term engagement? See, this term also, we use it very frequently. We six people as a team, being a practicing chartered accountant, one senior article assistant, two junior article assistants, one paid assistant, one audit manager. We six people as a team, we go and complete the audit engagement of ABC Limited. Sir, what is this engagement? What is the general meaning of the term engagement? I'm asking you, what is the general meaning of the term engagement? You will say, sir, something which happens before marriage. Agreed. Agreed. That is what you know. Agreed. But some that is not the only engagement. Agreed. Something which happens before marriage is an engagement. But that is not the only engagement. See, the general meaning of the term engagement is a mutual contract in which there are mutual promises. That we call it as engagement. Take for example, if I agree to provide some service, you agree to pay me consideration. There is an engagement. A mutual contract in which there is a mutual promise. See, even the engagement in which uh, engagement which you know also happens the same thing. Bride will agree to marry the groom. Groom will agree to marry the bride. There is a mutual promise that we call it as engagement. So engagement is a very broad term which includes any contract in which there are mutual promises. That broadly we call it as engagement. Right. Take for example, there is a doctor who agreed to provide the treatment to his patient and the patient who agreed to give the fees to the doctor. There is an engagement between doctor and the patient. That doesn't mean doctor and patient are going to marry. That is one engagement actually. So there is a lawyer who agreed to fight the case for the client and the client agreed to pay the fees to the lawyer. Engagement between lawyer and the client. So auditor agreed to do the client, agreed to do the audit for the client. The client in turn agreed to pay the fees. There is an engagement between auditor and the client. So, we six people, we collectively go and complete the audit engagement of the client ABC Limited. So, we six people will be collectively called as engagement team for conducting audit engagement of ABC Limited. We six people will be called as what? Engagement team. We six people will be called as what? Engagement team for completing the audit of ABC Limited. So why I am telling you this is, why I explained you about this term engagement team is, whenever I say auditor, auditor doesn't mean one single person, this entire engagement team collectively will be called as auditor. When I say auditor, auditor includes not just one person. Auditor means the entire engagement team. That entire engagement team will be collectively referred as auditor, not just one person. Sir, who will be there in the engagement team, sir, being a head of the firm, being the person who signs the report. I am the practicing chartered accountant. I will sign the reports. I am the person ultimately responsible. So I will be called as generally engagement partner. I will be called as what? Head of the firm who signs the reports and all that person will be called as engagement partner. So in my engagement team, engagement partner will be there. Paid as uh, sorry, senior article assistants will be there. Junior article assistants will be there. Paid assistants will be there. And even audit managers also will be there. So when we say auditor, we are collectively referring to entire engagement team, not just one or two persons. So that is what the point I want to make here. When we say auditor, auditor means entire engagement team, except in two circumstances. So generally when I say auditor, auditor includes entire engagement team. But in two circumstances, auditor means not entire engagement team. Auditor means only engagement partner. 
generally when i say auditor auditor includes entire engagement team but in two exceptional circumstances when i refer to the term auditor i refer only engagement partner not the entire engagement team sir what are the two what are the two circumstances very simple when it comes to acceptance of responsibility when it comes to acceptance of responsibility and also when it comes to accountability before regulatory authorities when it comes to accountability before regulatory authorities in these two circumstances when we say auditor auditor means only engagement partner not the entire engagement team i will give you example take for example somewhere it was mentioned auditor has to sign the financial statements in some standard in some law it was written auditor is required to sign the financial statements one day a client came to the office auditor's office he told sir as per the law auditor is required to send the financial statements you are the article assistant sitting in that office your engagement partner is not there he went out so now you are telling okay auditor is required to send the financial statements no our auditing faculty told auditor means entire engagement team i am an article assistant i am also part of engagement team only give me the audit report i will sign the audit report is it acceptable why because this is a matter relating to acceptance of responsibility by signing you are taking the responsibility so since this is a matter relating to acceptance of responsibility if it was written somewhere auditor has to take the responsibility auditor has to sign the financial statements their auditor doesn't mean entire engagement team their auditor means only engagement partner only only the engagement partner shall sign you cannot sign there so their auditor means only engagement partner not entire engagement team clear second case where auditor means only engagement partner see for example your firm has done some mistake you did the audit in a wrong way so that case has been filed and one day police came to arrest the auditor so when the police came to arrest the auditor you are the article assistant sitting there in the office your engagement partner is not there can the police take the uh, take this article assistant keep him in the jail and take him uh, uh, keep him in the jeep and take him to the jail no why because it comes to when it comes to ac accountability before regulatory authorities like somewhere it was told auditor will be liable for imprisonment their auditor means only engagement partner not article assistants not paid assistants not audit managers not uh, uh, not senior article assistants etc clear so when it comes to two circumstances acceptance of responsibility when somewhere it was told auditor should accept the responsibility their auditor doesn't mean only no, that their auditor doesn't mean entire engagement team their auditor means only engagement partner similarly when the matter comes to accountability before regulatory authorities like auditor shall pay fine auditor shall pay uh, shall face imprisonment so in these circumstances auditor doesn't mean entire engagement team auditor means only engagement partner clear in rest all other circumstances whenever we are using the term auditor it includes reference to entire engagement team but in these two circumstances one is acceptance of responsibility other one is accountability before regulatory authorities in these two circumstances auditor means only engagement team not the entire sorry auditor means only engagement partner not the entire engagement team able to understand everybody so this is very very important so in these two circumstances i am writing it here also once again in these two circumstances auditor means only engagement partner in rest of all the circumstances auditor means entire engagement team collectively refers to entire engagement team clear so this is what the discussion relating to the term auditor so and as a part of this explanation whatever we had till now we have completely understood or we have completed understanding the chapter introduction to the auditing so this chapter is very very important this chapter is very very significant why because in this we got to know all the fundamental things relating to audit if we are very strong in our fundamentals and basics the balance concepts also will make sense so if we are unable to understand these basic terms and basic definitions no matter how much in depth discussion we try to do for the subsequent chapters all Always something will be lacking. I hope you would have understood this uh, entire chapter introduction to auditing in a detailed and effective manner. So this is what regarding this chapter, guys. Now we will begin with the remaining chapters. So we are successfully done with revising the chapter introduction to audit. So the now the next chapter which we are going to revise is the second chapter, which is the nature, objective, scope of audit, and also ethics. So before I actually go into revising the concepts of this chapter, first I want to give one small clarity. So the clarity which I want to give here is, see the chapter, whatever you are able to see in my material, the second chapter, whatever you are going to see in my material, whatever we are going to revise. See, that is actually a combination of two chapters from the study material. 
this one chapter whatever is there in my material this is actually the combination of two chapters in the study material if i put it in other way around so what i have done is two chapters from the study material i have taken clubbed them together and created one single chapter sir why i did that why i did that combination is why because both the concepts are very closely related to each other so what in fact i have done is i have taken two chapters from the study material combined them together and created one single chapter nature objective and scope of audit and ethics sir what are that two chapters from the study material which you have combined so the two chapters which i have combined in uh, combined from the study material are first chapter and the last chapter first chapter and last chapter in your study material whatever is there so first and last chapter of the study material i have combined together and created one single chapter if i tell you the titles of the chapter also in the study material the first chapter you will be able to find something called nature objective and scope of audit and the last chapter will be something called ethics and terms of engagement ethics and terms of engagement so there are two chapters actually in the study material first chapter nature objective and scope of audit last chapter ethics and terms of engagement so what i have done is since the concept in both the chapters is related to each other i have combined both the chapters and created one single chapter nature objective and scope of audit and ethics so when i am revising this particular chapter i am actually revising two chapters from the study material first and the last chapter Leo. so this one clarification i wanted to give it so since we are i'm done with the clarification now i will go into the topics see before i actually go into the questions before i actually go into the concepts of this particular chapter one more thing one more concept i will bring it to your attention see at the ca inter level as a part of this paper number five auditing and ethics there are a lot of chapters now there are a lot of chapters are there in your study material also you'll be able to find a lot of chapters what do you think is the source for your paper number five whatever content we are reading i'm not talking about just my material whatever content which is there even in the study material what is the source from where that content in the study material has been taken from from where ici took that content and give it and gave it in your study material so i will say almost all 85 percent of the content whatever is there as a part of our ca inter audit syllabus 85 percent of that content has actually been taken from something called standards on audit and the balance 15 percent of the content whatever we have that is not actually taken from the standards that is taken from practical concepts like laws and regulations like if you take the last two chapters audit of various entities audit of items of financial statements those are very much practical concepts and if you take some chapters like cooperative society audit and if you take a chapter like uh, audit of banks those are actually taken from some laws and regulations so that content which has been taken from other than standards is very minimal only 15 percent of the entire content has been taken from other than standards standards but the balance 85 percent of the content whatever we are about to discuss or whatever we are about to revise as a part of our ca inter audit that has actually been taken from standards on auditing only so the major source from which our syllabus has been taken is what the standards on audit so which means that whenever i am teaching you certain chapter i am actually teaching you certain set of standards if I say I'm teaching you certain chapter, I'm actually trying to teach you a few standards on auditing. So when I say I'm going to teach you this chapter, nature, objective and scope of audit and also ethics. So when I say I'm going to teach you this chapter, I'm teaching you nothing but two standards here actually. So those two standards are SA 200 and SA 210. So when I say I am going to teach you this chapter, nature, objective and scope of audit and ethics, I am teaching you nothing but two standards on audit. Which two standards uh, I have been teaching you now? SA 200 and SA 210. Nothing but this entire chapter, whatever we are going to discuss, whatever we are about to discuss, that entire chapter has been taken from two standards, SA 200 and SA 210. And that's what we are going to learn as a part of this chapter sir and what kind of concept will be there in this chapter what exactly this chapter will teach us very simple guys in the previous chapter whatever we are done with just now so in the introduction chapter what did we understand in the introduction chapter just we got to know what is the meaning of the term audit and we got to know we got familiar with the basic terminology which will be used in the entire subject of the audit that's what we have understood we did not understand any advanced concepts in the chapter introduction to audit what in fact we have understood is we just understood what is the meaning of the term audit and we understood a few basic terms which we are going to use it throughout this entire subject called audit 
like what is financial information what is a misstatement what is material what is applicable financial reporting framework we just got familiar with the basic terminology whatever we are about to use in the entire subject of the audit clear so now in this chapter nature objective of nature objective and scope and ethics what in fact we are going to discuss in this chapter is on the basic terminology which we understood we are going to build some concepts on the basis of terminology whatever we have understood in the introduction chapter on that basic terminology we are going to build the concepts of the audit like if i have to put it in other way around like if you take a scenario of construction of a building by discussing introduction we have just laid the foundation we have just we have just laid the foundation for the building called audit now on that foundation we are going to build the pillars on which entire building is going to stand so we got to know the basic terminology on the basis of that we are going to learn few more basic concepts which are relating to the subject of audit so that's what we are going to discuss in this chapter nature objective and scope of audit and also ethics so if i list out a few concepts which we are about to revise see we are going to think something we are going to talk something like what are what are going to be various types of audit so what is going to be the entire purpose of the audit what are the minimum points which auditor will verify while doing the audit what are the principal aspects which are required to be covered in an audit what will be included in the scope of the audit what will be included in the scope of the audit and also we are going to talk about few more things like ethics what are the ethical requirements which auditor has to follow there is something called inherent limitations that's what we are going to discuss so like this on the basis of introduction on the basis of fundamentals whatever we have understood we are going to build the basic concepts relating to audit so that is what going to be the agenda for this entire chapter called nature objective and scope of audit and also ethics clear so having said that now we will take up each and every concept for our discussion see we already know what is the meaning of the audit we have already revised in a perfect manner what is the meaning of audit and i hope by now you all will remember the definition of audit can somebody let me know what is the definition of audit so by now i hope so you all would have already remembered it so audit is defined something like this audit is an independent examination of financial information of an entity whether profit oriented or not irrespective of its size or legal form when such an examination is conducted with a view to express an opinion thereon so we got to know we everybody got to know what is the meaning of the term audit so now let us try to address the next question what is going to be the purpose of audit what is the purpose of audit why audit as a function has existed very simple guys the purpose of the audit is to enhance the confidence of users of the financial statements whoever the users of the financial statements are there to increase their confidence to enhance their confidence levels the audit as a function has been introduced if i give you explanation regarding this see who will prepare financial statements management as we all know management will prepare the financial statements now these financial statements will be used by different users let us take for example one important user of the financial statements is shareholder see management are the people who will run the business who will take the decisions they are the people who will prepare the financial statements so management is preparing the financial statements and assume that there is no audit function in between those financial statements which are prepared by the management if they are directly given to the shareholders what will happen so what will happen is shareholders will not have confidence on that financial statements which are prepared by the management why because being a shareholder you don't know what is exactly happening inside the company so board of directors are only taking decisions management is only running the show management has only prepared the financial statements and they are only asking you to believe that financial statements so in such a circumstances as a shareholder you will not have confidence on that financial statements which are prepared by the management so if in the financial statements they have told there are fixed assets worth 100 crores what is the guarantee really inside the company there are fixed assets worth of 100 crores what is the guarantee for the shareholder so shareholder will not have that much confidence so in order to increase the confidence of the shareholder what the regulatory authorities or what the industry has thought is once the financial statements are prepared by the management now one independent qualified and competent person one independent qualified and competent that is capable person who is that independent qualified and capable person you and me chartered accountants currently me future you so the independent and qualified and competent person a chartered accountant that is an auditor will verify the financial statements check for its authenticity and validity check whether those financial statements are genuine and valid or not 
on that he will give opinion then these financial statements will become audited financial statements and if those audited financial statements are given to the shareholder they will have more confidence the confidence of the shareholders will get increased so what is the logic behind increasing of that confidence of the shareholders the simple logic is before the financial statements reach the user one independent qualified competent person is verifying the financial statements checking for its authenticity that is validity and genuinity of the financial statements then they are given to the shareholder that will enhance the confidence of the users of the financial statements so that is what the entire purpose of audit engagement not just audit engagement for most of the uh, for most of the external engagements the entire purpose is to enhance the confidence of users of the financial statements that is what the reason behind this introduction of a uh, area called audit okay so we understood what is the purpose of the audit now let me ask you one more question is audit mandatory for all kinds of organization do you think whatever audit which we are whatever the concept of audit i have explained do you think is that function audit is it mandatory for each and every organization just you give a thought so you might be knowing so many people who are doing business might be your relatives might be your friends might be your close family do you think each and every of your known person whoever is doing the business are everyone going to a chartered accountant and getting their accounts audited your answer might be no that means from this we can conclude that audit is not mandatory for each and every organization audit is not going to be mandatory for each and every organization so depending on the applicability depending on the requirements the audits can be broadly divided into two categories depending on requirements of the law the audits can be broadly divided into two categories number one is statutory audit and the other one is non statutory audit so on the basis of what we are doing this classification on the basis of requirements of law we can divide audits into two categories number one statutory audit and number two non statutory audit so let us try to understand what is a statutory audit what is the meaning of the statute statute means some law or regulation what is the meaning of statutory audit those audits which are mandatorily required under some law or regulation under any law or regulation those audits we are going to call them as statutory audits under certain law under certain law or regulation if an audit has been made mandatory so that kind of audits we are going to call it as statutory audits if i have to give you a few examples take for example company audit company act 2013 has clearly told that each and every company must get their accounts audited so since it is made mandatory under company act under some law or regulation so company audit becomes a statutory audit or you take cooperative societies audit which has been made mandatory under cooperative societies act or you take bank audit which has been made mandatory under the banking regulation act or you take income tax audit which has been made mandatory in certain cases under section 44 ab of the income tax act so like that you take any audit which has been made mandatory under certain law or regulation those audits we are going to call them as statutory audits so then what will be the meaning of non statutory audit very simple those audits even though there is no requirement of law if the client is voluntarily coming forward and getting his accounts audited there is no law asking you to get the accounts audited but still if you voluntarily come and get their accounts audited those audits we are going to call them as non statutory audits like for example sole proprietor's audit see in case of a sole proprietor there is no governing law there is no law which will ask the sole proprietor to get his accounts audited but still if the sole proprietor is coming forward and getting his accounts audited voluntarily out of his own choice is going to get his accounts audited we call them as non statutory or voluntary audits or even you take partnership firms audit that is also one of the example of non statutory audit clients voluntarily coming and getting their accounts audited now you all might get a doubt sir even though there is no requirement of the law why the clients will get their accounts audited because the conduct of audit gives so many advantages to the clients that's why even though there is no requirement of the law the clients will still come and get their accounts audited because there are so many advantages which we will talk about in a while what are that advantages for conduct of audit that we will talk it that we will talk about later but for the time being now even though there is no requirement they still come and get their accounts audited so those audits we are going to call them as non statutory audits clear everybody so this is the major point of difference one is statutory compulsory under law non statutory voluntary audits even though there is no requirement of law one more point of difference i will tell you see in the case of statutory audit where the audit has been made mandatory who do you think will decide the scope and objective that means what auditor has to cover what things are required to be included in the audit what are rights of auditor what are rights of client what are object what are responsibilities of auditor what are responsibilities of the client so these scope and objective will be decided by whom 
so in case of statutory audit the scope and objective will be decided by law itself under whatever law the audit has been made mandatory the same law will decide what what is the scope and objective of the auditor what auditor is expected to do what are rights of auditor what are responsibilities of auditor everything will be decided by the respective law only under whatever law audit has been made mandatory the same law will even decide the scope and objective also sir what about non statutory audit in this case who will decide the scope and objective there is no law here itself which is asking the audit to get it done then who will decide the scope of uh, who will decide the scope and objective very simple by way of terms of engagement when i say terms of engagement very simple the client and the auditor sit across the table they mutually discuss and decide what is the scope and objective of the auditor whereas in the case of statutory audit law will decide the scope and objective of the audit one more thing also they say in the case of statutory audit they say scope and objective will be decided by law and also terms of engagement very important point i'm going to tell you very important concept i'm going to tell you in the case of non statutory audit scope and objective will be decided purely by way of mutual discussion but in the case of statutory audit they have told scope and objective will be decided by law also and also by way of mutual discussion between auditor and the client but one important point here for our attention is that by way of terms of engagement whatever scope and objective which has been decided under law that can be only extended law will tell you certain scope and objective if you want you can extend that scope and objective by way of mutual discussion but by way of terms of engagement no auditor no client can reduce the scope and objective which is already decided under law so when i say the terms of engagement will be the scope and objective will be decided by terms of engagement in the case of statutory audit what do i mean by that is by way of terms of engagement by way of mutual discussion between the auditor and the client the scope and objective which is already decided under law can only be extended but in any case it cannot be reduced it can only be extended like for example if the law is asking the auditor is giving the auditor some 20 responsibilities by way of mutual extend by way of mutual discussion if you want to add some ex extra to you can do it but do you think the client and auditor by way of mutual discussion can they come and reduce out of this 20 can they make a discussion and reduce that reporting responsibilities to 18 no that can never happen if they want they can increase but they never can reduce the scope and objective which is already decided under law clear so two differences i have told one meaning other one who will decide scope and objective now there is one more point of difference but to understand that one more point of difference we need to go deeper into the concept of independence we need to go deeper into the concept of independence so we already know i have already explained you what is the basic meaning of the term independence so in the introduction chapter itself i have told independence means what from the perspective of audit from the subject perspective of audit what do you think is the meaning of the term independence so i told you that independence is a nature or characteristic or quality of a person to take the decisions without any influence the ability the characteristic or the nature of a person to take decision without any influence from the third party we are going to call that characteristic that nature of the person as independent now from the auditing perspective independence will be of two types from the auditing perspective independence will be of two types one is independence of mind and the other one is independence of appearance so let us try to understand this concept of independence of mind and independence of appearance in a detailed manner important concept so independence of mind means the state of mind the agreement of the mind to act independently if i make a decision in my mind i am going to do the audit of this client independently then that becomes independence of mind an agreement of mind a state of mind to act independently that we call it as independence of mind whereas independence of appearance means the name itself says we have to appear to be independent that means you should not have any kind of relationship any kind of association with the client which will look as if independence has been compromised so not having any kind of relationship or association with the client for which you are doing so that we call it as independence of appearance whereas independence of mind is nothing but it is like a feeling it is an agreement in mind it is acceptance in the mind that i am going to do the audit of this client independently that acceptance in the mind that state of mind i am going to call it as independence of mind whereas independence of appearance means not having any relationship not having any association with the client for which i am doing the audit that free from relationship free from association i call it as independence of appearance so let me give you one example let me give you one example to understand take for example there is a student there is a student he has written an exam 
he has written an exam so there is a answer sheet so this is the answer sheet written by the student so take uh, a student like you he has given a ca examination so board examination he has given now assume this student's father is also a practicing chartered accountant the student's father or mother is a practicing chartered accountant and they have applied for verification of answer sheets of the students and your answer sheet has gone to your parent for the purpose of verification your answer sheet has gone to your parent for the purpose of verification now you what your parent has thought is okay this answer sheet might belong to my son or daughter this answer sheet might belong to my son or daughter but i will treat this answer sheet as some person who is not related to me i will treat this answer sheet as a uh, normal person's answer sheet and i will evaluate it correctly i will allocate the marks only whatever this answer sheet deserves so your parent has made a decision in the mind that he will evaluate this he will verify this answer sheet without any bias without any influence so he agreed in his mind to do the verification independently that state of mind here the parent is having independence of mind yes he has made an agreement in mind to verify the answer sheet independently but if you see here there is a existence of relationship between the verifier and the person whoever has done the work there is a relationship what is that relationship parent and a child parent and a child so because of this relationship you are not appearing to be independent you don't look independent the parent might have agreed in the mind independence of mind is there but here there is a existence of relationship or appearance because of it you are not appearing you are not looking to be independent independence of appearance is not there independence of appearance is not there one simple common example to understand now let us try to understand these concepts from the perspective of audit take for example there is a client there is a sole proprietor he is doing a business he is doing some business now he wants to get his business audited he wants to get his business audited he went to a chartered accountant he went to a chartered accountant who is none other than his brother who is none other than his brother so he asked his brother who is a chartered accountant to do the audit of his business to do the audit of his business now if you take this case this chartered accountant has agreed in his mind i will do the audit of this business independently i will not treat this business as my brother's business i will treat this business as some unrelated person's business and i will do the audit independently he made a agreement in mind so independence of mind is there for this brother but there is a association between auditor and client there is a relationship they both are brothers they both are relatives so even though there is a independence of mind there is no independence of appearance they don't appear to be independent why they don't appear to be independent because of a existence of a relationship so independence of mind means a state of mind to act independently independence of appearance means not having any kind of association or relationship with the client for which you are doing the audit so that we call it as independence of appearance so like this independence will be of two categories independence of mind and independence of appearance and i hope with the examples whatever i have used you have got the clarity so why i told you this is i am going to relate this independence with the audits types of audits do you think in the case of statutory audit in the case of statutory audits in the case of those audits which are mandatorily required under law do you think auditor should be independent yes auditor should be 100% independent and what kind of independence is required is independence of mind is required or independence of appearance is required or independence of both is required in the case of statutory audit independence of mind is also required independence of appearance is also required both are required in the case of statutory audit whereas when it comes to non statutory audit the auditor should be independent here also independence of the auditor is required but independence of mind is enough independence of appearance is not required in the case of non statutory audit independence of appearance is not required one simple logic i will tell you see if you are a sole proprietor no one is asking you to get your accounts audited you voluntarily go and want to get your accounts audited you voluntarily want to go and get your accounts audited now if you go to your brother and get your accounts audited if you go to some outsider and get your accounts audited no one will be bothered at all so if you are a sole proprietor if you are voluntarily going and getting your accounts audited and if you are getting that accounts audited by your brother no one will come and ask you why you are getting your accounts audited by your brother why because no law is expecting you to do the audit only you voluntarily doing it whether you do it by your relative or an outside person no one is bothered so in the case of non statutory audit independence of appearance is not required independence of mind alone will be enough so these two are the types of audits on the basis of requirements of the law
Hope you guys have understood. So what did I teach you till now? I have explained you what is the purpose of the audit? What are the various types of audit? Now let us talk about one more small concept called advantages of audit. See, I told even though there is no requirement of the law, some clients will get their accounts audited. So you all will get it out, sir. What is the purpose? Why the clients will get their accounts audited even though there is no requirement of the audit? Why? Because as I was telling, there are certain advantages of the there are certain advantages because of which the client might feel that. Uh, the client might feel i will go and get the accounts audited even though there is no requirement sir what advantages will be there by going and getting the accounts audited what advantages will be there so if you see here it will safeguard the financial interest of the person who are not associated with the management if the accounts if the, if the audit of the accounts happen it will protect the interest of the people who are not associated with the management like shareholders bankers etc these are not a part of the management if audit happens their interest will be protected see one of the examination they have asked a true or false statement so what true or false statement they have asked is it safeguard the financial audit safeguard the financial interest of the persons who are associated with the management they have removed this term not at the post and they asked a question is it true or false it is false actually the audit purpose is it will safeguard the interest of the people who are not a part of the management see who are already who are already a part of the management why their interest is required to be safeguarded so audit will safeguard the financial interest of the person who are not associated with the management number one first advantage number two it acts as a moral check on the employees of the client if audit happens the employees of the clients will have fear in their mind even if you do some mistake tomorrow auditor will come and do the verification he will catch us if the management knows they will remove us that fear will be there in the minds of the employees if you get your accounts audited it is helpful for settling the liability for taxes tax issues can be sorted in an easy manner if audited financial statements are there you can easily negotiate the loans and also in case of acquisitions and all purchase consideration can be easily determined on the basis of audited financial statements and these audited financial statements will help in settling trade disputes and also insurance claims it will help you to detect any wastages and losses losses happening in the organization and also the client will come to know by undergoing audit whether he has maintained all the necessary books of accounts as required by law and in the case of partnership firm the audited financial statements will help in the settlement of the accounts between the partners in the case of admission or death or retirement of the partners and even when you need a license from the government for carrying out certain businesses, government will say we will give you license only when you bring audited financial statements. So if you get your accounts audited, it will also become easy for you to get your licenses, licenses or grants from the government. So these are the various advantages because of which the clients will prefer to go for audit even though there is no statutory requirement. So even if they ask you the question, what are advantages of audit? What are benefits of audit? These things you can write here. So we are done with this concept also. Now let us address the next question. See the next concept is, see when you are going to do the audit, you are required to express an opinion. Before you express the opinion, what are the basic things, what are the minimum things which you will check before expression of opinion? To satisfy yourself that financial statements does not mislead anybody. See, before you, uh, the ultimate objective of the audit is, you are required to express an opinion. Now, before you express that opinion, some basic things you will check in the financial statements, no? Some basic things you will check in the financial information. So, what are that basic points which you will verify before you express an opinion? So, that is what this question is. Explain the points which auditor should consider before expression of opinion. So, before you express that opinion, what basic things you will try to verify? Very simple. In the answer, they will say six basic things we will try to verify before we express our opinion. Number one, whether the financial statements are prepared in accordance with the books of accounts. So the source for the preparation of financial statements is books of accounts. So the whatever is there in the books of accounts, the same thing should come even in my financial statements also. So the first point which auditor needs to verify whether the financial statements are in agreement with books of accounts or not. Number two, whatever entries in the books of accounts are there, those entries in the books of accounts should be supported by proper evidence whatever entries in the books of accounts are there, there should be evidence for that entries in the books of accounts. That is what I need to check. Third one, I need to make sure that there are no omissions in the financial statements. Whatever entries are there in the books of accounts, they should not be omitted from the financial statements. And also there should not be any fake entries. There should not be any fake entries. So this also I need to verify. So I need to make sure that there are no omissions and there are also no fake entries. This is also one basic thing which I will check. Number four, I should check that the information conveyed in the financial statement should be clear and unambiguous. 
that means whatever information you are trying to present in the financial statements that information should be clear and unambiguous sir what is unambiguous that should not create any confusion by reading the financial statements and user should get the clarity he should not get confused number five i need to check whatever amounts classification presentation and disclosure are there whether they are done as per accounting standards whether accounting standards are complied with or not one more basic thing which i will check number six finally i have to check whether the financial statements are giving a true and fair view of state of affairs and uh, financial results so these are the six basic things six minimum points which i will check before expression of my opinion the same thing we have tried to uh, give here also so the first thing the the person conducting the audit should take care to ensure that financial statements would not mislead anybody how he can ensure that financial statements will not mislead anybody by checking a few points which points is a so whether accounts have been drawn with reference to entries in the books of accounts nothing but financial statements are matching with books of accounts and entries in the books of accounts should be supported by evidence there should not nothing should have been omitted in the books of accounts and nothing which is not in the books of accounts should be there in the financial statements nothing but no omissions no fake entries and information should be clear and unambiguous and whatever amounts classification presentation and disclosures are there they should be in conformity with the accounting standards and finally the financial statement should give a true and fair picture these are the six minimum points which i will check before expression of my opinion clear everybody now so i want to talk about one more thing see whenever we are giving opinion see till now whatever discussion we had i was always telling as an auditor your objective is to express an opinion your objective is to express an opinion so our opinion the opinion expressed by the auditor should not be taken as a guarantee the opinion expressed by the auditor should not be taken as a guarantee and specifically the opinion expressed by the auditor should not be taken as a guarantee regarding two things the opinion expressed by the auditor should not be taken as a guarantee especially regarding two things why because most of the people will have a misconception so the opinion expressed by the auditor is not a guarantee regarding future viability of the entity. The opinion expressed by the auditor is not a guarantee regarding future viability of the entity. Sir, what is the meaning of this? Take for example, I have conducted the audit of the financial statements of the client X Limited. When I verified the financial information, I did not find out any material misstatement. I gave a positive opinion. Now, when I give positive opinion on the financial statements, do I mean I'm giving a guarantee that this company will continue forever in the future? This company is having good future. You can invest your money in the company. There is, there is no chance company will incur loss in the future. Am I giving that guarantee? No. The opinion expressed by the auditor is not at all a guarantee regarding future viability. When I, when I have given positive opinion, I am not giving any guarantee regarding the future. I'm not giving any guarantee regarding future as an auditor i have nothing to do with the future what i have done is i have verified historical financial information i have verified financial information that to which financial information i have verified historical financial information and have just expressed my opinion whether that historical financial information the information which has already taken place in the past whether it is giving true and fair view or not that's what i have done so when i have given my opinion i'm not giving any guarantee regarding future viability of the entity also, the auditor's opinion is also not a guarantee for efficiency and effectiveness of management. Sir, what does that mean? See, which means that, take for example, if I have given a positive opinion on the financial statements of some entity, I have conducted audit of some company and on that company's financial information, I have given a positive opinion. So, if I give a positive opinion on the financial statements of an entity, does that mean, am I giving a guarantee that the management of that company are effective, the management of that company are honest, the management of that company are efficient? Am I giving any conduct certificate regarding the management? No. So, whenever I express my opinion, my opinion cannot be taken as a guarantee regarding future viability of the entity and my opinion also cannot be taken as a guarantee regarding efficiency and effectiveness of the management. I have nothing to do with the future of the company, I have nothing to do with the efficiency and effectiveness of the management. So, being an auditor, I verify financial information that to historical financial information, the information which has already taken place in the past. So, historical financial information I am going to verify and on that I will express my opinion whether it is reliable or not. That's it. My opinion can't be taken as a guarantee regarding future viability. My opinion also can't be taken as a guarantee regarding efficiency and effectiveness of management. So, that is what uh, here has been given. Auditor's opinion is not a guarantee. So, what we have understood till now, so we have understood the types of audit, we have also understood uh, what are the advantages of the audit and what points you are required to consider before expression of opinion and also what is the purpose of the audit I have explained, even we have also understood 
a few more aspects just now like the auditor's opinion is not a guarantee for certain things so let us try to understand few more concepts so we'll try to understand a small concept called qualities of an auditor if you want to become an auditor so what kind of qualities you have to possess so if an auditor wants to become a good auditor he needs to possess a combination of personal qualities as well as professional qualities to become a uh, to become an ideal auditor to become a good auditor you need to have two kinds of qualities a combination of two qualities will make an auditor a good auditor so what are the, which which combination of qualities personal qualities and professional qualities sir what are the professional qualities professional qualities are nothing but those qualities which you acquire by way of your formal education like if you want to become a good auditor you need to have a good knowledge of auditing concepts and standards you need to have good knowledge of accounting you need to be good at your taxation laws indirect and direct tax laws you need to be uh, you need to be you need to have good knowledge about laws and regulations like specific laws which are applicable to your client like for example if i'm conducting audit of a company i need to have a good knowledge of companies act in addition to that you need to have knowledge about good knowledge of general laws and regulations also when i say general laws and regulations like indian contract act sale of goods act partnership act so i need to have knowledge of specific laws which are applicable for my client i need to have a knowledge of general laws and regulations also and i need to have a good knowledge of management general management nothing but a strategic management i need to have good knowledge about information systems that means i need to i i should be able to understand the information systems which my client is using because today we know no entity is maintaining the accounts in a manual manner they are all using softwares in such an environment if you expect me to do the audit i need to have a good knowledge on information technologies also so if i want to become a good auditor i need to have these professional qualities nothing but a good knowledge of all the subjects so you have to write the list of all the subjects which are there in our ca curriculum so having professional qualities alone will not be enough to become a good auditor you need to even have something called personal qualities also to become a good auditor you need to have some personal qualities also sir what personal qualities like you should be a honest person you should be a sincere person you should have integrity and also you should be able to take the judgments you should have good judgmental skills you should be clear headed you should have clarity of thought right you should have a good temper so all those qualities which make a person a good person all those qualities are also required to even become a good auditor also so in order to become an ideal auditor or in order to become a good auditor you need to possess a combination of personal as well as professional qualities understood everybody and one more thing in uh, see the beauty of the subject of audit is the audit is not a stand alone subject audit is not a stand alone subject the audit will have relationship with various other disciplines also the audit is going to have relationship with other disciplines also like the subject of auditing is linked with various other subjects so if you want to do the audit in a audit in a proper way you need to have the knowledge of the other subjects as well other disciplines as well sir what are that various other domains or what are that various other disciplines which will have a relationship with the auditing or if i put it in other way around how audit is related or uh audit is related with what and all other subjects so we will have a concept regarding the same like if you see here explain the relationship of auditing with other disciplines disciplines in the sense other subjects or other other uh, domains actually so like if you see auditing and accounts are they related yes see as an auditor we are required to verify financial information financial information is nothing but outcome of the accounting process only no so definitely auditing and accounts are both related with each other next auditing and law even we even the subject of auditing is also related with law like for example we need we need to have good knowledge of income tax law we need to have knowledge of gst laws we need to have knowledge of company law etc so even the subject of auditing and law are also related with each other and the subject of auditing is even having a relationship with economics also like uh, we will be concerned mainly with the microeconomics than the macroeconomics so auditing and economics is also related with each other auditing and behavioral science behavioral science means nothing but psychology human psychology see in the audit we will do verification but for doing that verification during the course of audit we need to interact with the different people we need to interact with management we need to interact with employees so you should have some psychology skills to extract the information from the knowledgeable persons like you need to have some skill if you ask questions in what manner you will be able to extract the information so that human behavior also you need to know it they are not asking you to do some a phd in the psychology but just they are telling but just they are trying to say that auditing is even related with behavioral sciences also and auditing is related with statistics and mathematics see in audit generally we verify the transactions on sampling basis and how that samples and all will be selected on the basis of 
statistical concepts and even the subject of audit is related with mathematics also and auditing is related with data processing nothing but information technology as i was telling you just now today maintenance of manual accounts has become a history everybody is maintaining the accounts in computers if you have to do the audit of the accounts you also should become familiar on how to use the information technology for that you need to have knowledge about this information technology so the subject of auditing is even related with something called data processing nothing but information technology and the subject of auditing is related with financial management also see in financial management you will have a chapter called ratio analysis so whatever you learn in the chapter called ratio analysis that we are directly going to use it in the audit generally by way of analytical procedures for that we have a dedicated chapter we will talk about that later but for the time being now i want you to remember even the subject of auditing is related with financial management also and not just that auditing is even related with production production in the sense that they are referring to costing here so if they ask you the question explain the relationship of auditing with various other disciplines this is what you are supposed to write auditing and accounts is related auditing and law is related audit is having a relationship with economics auditing is also having a relationship with behavioral science it is having a relationship with statistics and mathematics it is having a relationship with the data processing it is having relationship with financial management it is also having a relationship with production or costing clear and comfortable everybody so this is what regarding relationship of auditing with other disciplines comfortable everybody now so we will address one more concept now we will try to cover a concept called principal aspects what and all are principal aspects which are required to be covered in an audit very very important from the examination perspective or uh, in the earlier exams they have asked this question multiple times so here the question will not be tricky at all they will somewhere mention straight away in the question uh, to ask to uh, asking you to write about the principal aspects nothing but what are the main aspects what are the compulsory aspects which you have to cover it as a part of your audit so a list of principal aspects has been given here let us try to understand what are all that principal aspects which you are required to cover in an audit so number 1 as you could see one of the main aspect which you have to cover in the audit is you have to understand about clients accounting and internal control system you have to understand about clients accounting system and also internal control system so two terms they are using here number 1 they are asking us to understand and test the clients accounting system and number 2 they are also asking us to understand about clients internal control system see these of terms we are going to use it at the multiple places so we will try to spend some time in understanding what is the meaning of this accounting system what is the meaning of this internal control system i will try to summarize it in a simple way accounting system means nothing but a collection or a combination of processes the tools the techniques the softwares whatever they are using for maintaining the books of accounts of the client that we call it as accounting system like for example if your client is using tally for maintaining books of accounts then the tally becomes their accounting system if the client is using sap then sap becomes their accounting system if the client is following certain processes like for example they have a process to write the ochers before passing entries uh, this ocher maintenance system will become accounting system so like that a combination of tools or processes techniques or softwares whatever the client is using for maintaining their books of accounts that combination of tools softwares techniques we are going to call it as accounting system so then what is internal control system this is interesting thing see in fact we have a dedicated chapter talking about internal controls its components and all that we will have a detailed discussion regarding internal control in risk assessment and internal control chapter but till that point of time at various instances we will continuously come across this term called internal controls so what i will do is i will give you a brief about internal control now that discussion you remember but the detailed discussion the in-depth understanding of internal controls we will have it in the chapter called risk assessment and internal control so now i am going to tell you brief sir what is the meaning of internal control system any simple any policy any procedure which is designed implemented or maintained by the management or those charged with governance by the top level management of the organization that policy and procedure i am going to call it as internal control any policy or any procedure which is designed implemented maintained by some management of the entity to prevent some mistakes from happening in the organization those policies systems procedures which are implemented for preventing mistakes from happening in the organization that i am going to call it as internal control system let me give you one simple some simple examples to make you understand take for example there is a it company there is a it company 
Now, IT company wants to make sure that or IT company's management has put a policy that if a person, if an employee has to enter inside the company, this is the premises of the company. If an employee want to enter inside the premises of the company, the company has put a policy that there will be entry gate here. At the entry gate, they have to show their identity card and they have to give their biometric. Then only the gate will open. After that, only you can enter inside the campus. So this is a policy set by the management that every person has to enter inside the company only by scanning his identity card and giving the biometric access. So this is the policy which is kept by the management. Why this policy has been kept? This policy has been kept to make sure that mistakes will not happen in the organization, to make sure that no unauthorized person enters inside the IT company. So this is a policy set by the management to ensure that there is no mistake happening in the organization. So this policy of showing the identity card and giving the biometric, I can simply call this as an internal control. You can simply call this as a internal control or let me give you a few more examples the company has put a policy that the warehouse the warehouse wherever stock is kept that in that warehouse cctv cameras should be installed and there should be a person who should be monitoring that cctv footage the company has put a policy that the warehouse wherever the stock is getting kept that warehouse should be surrounded by cctv camera and that cctv footage should be monitored by one person this is a policy kept by the management of some company this installation of cctv cameras also i can call it as internal control why because this policy is implemented to make sure that misstatements don't happen the mistakes don't happen in the organization or company has put from the accounts perspective i will tell you one internal control company has put a policy that if there is a cashier the cash cashier should be given the responsibility of only making payments and receiving the receipts the company has put a policy that the, the cashier should only make payments and collect receipts he should not pass an accounting entry he should not pass a entry regarding cash in the books of accounts accounting entry should always be passed by some another person called accountant so the company has put a policy to divide the responsibilities of cashier and accountant. The company has put a policy that the cashier should be responsible only for making payments and collecting the receipts. He should not pass accounting entry. Accounting entry should always be passed by accountant only. This we popularly call in the industry as segregation of duties. This is also one internal control. This is also one internal control, a policy set by the management of the organization. Or the company has put a policy that an accountant will pass an entry. <clears throat> an accountant, before he passes an entry, he has to write a voucher. And that voucher should be given to concerned manager. That manager should approve that entry. Then only entry should be recorded in the books of accounts. So the company has put a policy that before passing an entry, accountant should write a voucher. That voucher should be approved by the manager. Then only entry will get recorded in the books of accounts. Policy set by the management. This also I can call it as internal control. This also I can call it as internal control. So like this numerous examples I can give you. So you might have already come across internal controls in various businesses as a part of your day to day life. But just the thing is you don't know that it is an internal control. So simply if you visit any supermarket and if you see before you enter inside that supermarket security guard will check you. That is a policy set by the management of the company. So checking of the security guard before entering a supermarket, internal control. So once you have entered inside the supermarket, each and every nook and corner will be covered by the CCTV footage, uh, internal control. Now once you do the shopping, you have to go to the billing counter. There, the, there they will uh, do the billing on the basis of barcode scanning. When they scan the barcode on the item, price and discount will get automatically captured policy set by the management internal control after you have done the shopping before you leave the store there will be a security guard standing at the exit gate he will check the items which are there in your trolley whether they are included in the bill or not security guard will check then only he will send you out internal control so like this i can give you numerous examples so if i have to summarize what is this internal control so as an auditor if i have to summarize this internal control it simply means that any policy or procedure which is designed implemented or maintained by the management of the organization to prevent the mistakes happening in the organization that i will be call it as internal control see this is the simple meaning this i have told you in a simple way there is actually a technical definition for the term internal control there is a lot of discussion revolving around the term internal control this we will talk about it later in the chapter risk assessment and internal control clear so for the time being now just did you get the clarity basic clarity what exactly is internal control i hope so you have got it
so why we have discussed about accounting system internal control system from where from which part of the concept we have come here we are actually trying to discuss something called principal aspects main aspects which you have to cover in the audit in that first point one of the main aspect you are required to cover is relating to accounting and internal control so then we took some time and understood what is accounting system what is internal control system so now let us see what is the principal aspect what is the main aspect we have to cover in the audit so you have to examine the client's accounting system and internal control system to ascertain whether it is appropriate for the business and helps in properly recording all the transactions so first a principal aspect as an auditor you should get a you should examine the client's accounting system the client's internal control system determine whether that accounting system followed by the client whatever internal control system followed by the client are they appropriate and do they help the organization to record all the transactions in a proper manner nothing but we should get a overall understanding of clients accounting system internal control system number two second point reviewing the systems and procedures to find out whether they are adequate and comprehensive and whether material inadequacies and weaknesses exist to allow the frauds and errors getting unnoticed so first in the first point see both the points are relating to internal controls only so what is the difference is in the first point they ask us to obtain an understanding they are just trying to trying us to asking us to understand about clients accounting system internal control system second point after you have done the understanding now you perform in depth procedures and try to find out whether in that internal control system is there any weakness is there any inadequacy which will allow the frauds or errors to happen like for example you have understood internal control you came to know that your client is following one internal control of installing the cctv cameras but i came to know that even after of even after installing the cctv cameras the footage is not getting monitored that means internal control is there but in that internal control there is a weakness because of that weakness it is creating a scope for fraud or error to happen able to understand so that is what two things we have to say regard you have to see regarding accounting and internal control system one of the main aspect number one try to get overall understanding number two try to do in-depth procedures to find out whether there is any weakness or deficiency in that internal control system so that is the first point second one so first point is regarding accounting and internal control system next one we need to check arithmetical accuracy arithmetical accuracy means what whether the calculations calculation of profit balance sheet additions deletions all this have been correctly calculated or is there any arithmetical error that also we need to verify but this point is no longer relevant today why because today the accounts are maintained in the software all the arithmetic calculations like additions subtractions all that things will be automatically done by the software and we can rely on the software to the extent of arithmetical accuracy but still they are asking us the second main aspect which we have to check is arithmetical accuracy third one we also need to check authenticity and validity of the transactions authenticity means a genuinity whatever transactions are there in the books of accounts are they authentic are they genuine are they valid that also you have to cover sir how i will come to know whether a transaction is genuine and valid simply with the help of supporting documents like if you want to know whether a purchase is correct or not supporting document you have to verify invoice if you want to know whether rent payment is correct or not supporting document rental agreement you have to verify so like that whether the transactions in the books of accounts are authentic that is genuine and valid or not that also you need to verify and you have to verify it on the basis of supporting documents then one more important aspect which you need to cover proper distinction has been made between capital and revenue items this is also one of the main aspect which you have to cover and also amount of various items and expenditure adjusted in the accounts correspond to the the relevant accounting period only nothing but if i put it in simple way whatever incomes and expenses which are recorded in the books of accounts they should belong only to the current year none of the future years incomes and expenses should be recorded in the current year none of the past years incomes and expenses should be recorded in the current year so whatever has been recorded they should correspond they should relate to the current year only that also we need to verify then we need to compare balance sheet and pnl account with books of accounts nothing but whether financial statements are matching with the books of accounts same point we have seen in the first question also points which are required to be covered next one we need to verify various items of the financial statements we need to verify assets also we need to verify liabilities also and even we need to verify the items in the statement of pnl that is incomes and expenses also we have to verify so all items of the financial statements we have to verify in addition to that in case if you are conducting audit of a corporate entity like company in addition to the above aspects even you need to verify the statutory compliances whether the entity is complying with the laws and regulations or not that also i have to verify so that is if i am conducting audit of a company i will verify even the compliance with the provisions of companies act also and finally after verifying all the principal after verifying all the above aspects audit will not get completed unless and until you express your opinion 
so the ultimate objective of audit is to express an opinion only no so the audit will not come to an end unless you express an opinion and how you are going to express that opinion when i say you have to express an opinion how you will express that opinion will you come before the audience take the mic and say i am giving a positive opinion will that be a proper expression of opinion or will you post a uh, will you do a tweet uh, in x or twitter uh, i am giving a positive opinion on so and so company if you tweet if you tweet it will that be enough or if you are uh, uploading a youtube video you have a youtube channel on that youtube channel you are uploading a video i have conducted audit of so and so company on that i am giving positive opinion will that be appropriate no so auditor has to express opinion and the proper form of expression of opinion is by giving it in a written format in the form of a written report we have to give so the ultimate objective of the auditor is to express an opinion and that expression of opinion should not be just oral that expression of opinion should happen in a documented form and in a written format and the written document which contains the auditor's opinion that we are going to call it as audit report that we are going to call it as audit report nothing but simply audit report is a document which contains auditor's opinion unless and until the auditor gives the audit report audit will never get completed so that is what the last aspect of the audit which is reporting once you have covered all the principal aspects you are required to express your opinion in the form of a written document which we generally call it as audit report so these are all the principal aspects which are required to be covered in an audit very important repeatedly asked so if i do a quick revision first point accounting and internal controls in that also two things first obtain overall examination then perform in depth audit procedures and find out weakness number two arithmetical accuracy number three authenticity authenticity and validity of the transactions number four proper bifurc proper bifurcation between capital and revenue expenditure number five uh, whether p whether incomes and expenses belong only to the current year or not numbers uh, number six we need to verify we need to verify whether financial statements are in agreement with the books of accounts or not number 7 we have to verify various items of the financial statements we have to verify assets also liabilities also incomes also expenses also number 8 in case if you are conducting audit of a corporate entity you need to even verify the compliance with the statutory laws and regulations also and finally you have to even give a report also so these are all the principal aspects which are required to be covered in an audit clear everybody comfortable till here so now we will go to the next concept now we will start revising the concept regarding scope of audit so what will be included in the scope of the audit what will not be included in the scope of the audit once again important question from the examination perspective so let us try to quickly revise it so what will be included in the scope of audit or they might also ask you a question write a short note on scope of audit so if you have been appointed as auditor of some entity as a part of your scope what and all will be included what you are supposed to do what you are not supposed to do what will fall in your scope what will not fall in your scope so that is what this question is about so let us say what does the answer say here let us see what does the answer say here number 1 the standard says as an auditor you have to cover all aspects of the organization which are related to the financial statements see when i say you are doing audit your scope is not just restricted to financial statements and books of accounts you just will not stick to the few pages of books of accounts and few documents of books of uh, few pages of the financial statements and few books of accounts so you as an auditor you are supposed to verify each and every part of the organization which is having a relationship with the financial statements if i give you example for example as an auditor you wanted to go and verify the inventory so at the warehouse the client is keeping some stock you want to go and physically verify the stock can the management say boss your scope is only financial statements and books of accounts we will not permit you to go to the premises and verify the stock can they say it no why because even that verification of inventory is also giving me evidence relating to one of the items of the financial statements so even that inventory verification also forms part of my scope why because it is related to financial statements so in this manner the auditor should the audit should be organized in such a manner all aspects related to the financial statements have to be covered as a part of your audit number 2 as a part of your audit you need to verify whether the financial information is reliable or not sir what do you mean by reliability trustability so nothing but as an auditor you are supposed to verify whatever financial information is there we already know what is financial information which is financial statements and books of accounts so you need to verify whatever financial information is there which is reliable or not doing that is also included in your scope sir how i can verify whether the financial information is reliable or not whether the financial statements and books of accounts are reliable or not how will i how will i come to know so this point we have already seen in the principal aspects number 1 you need to have a you need to make a study of accounting system and internal control system number 2 you need to carry out various other test inquiries and various other verification procedures 
sir what are that test verifications and other verification procedures that we are actually try that actually we will try to cover in our subsequent chapters so in our subsequent chapters we will understand in a detailed manner what test we will do like inquiry inspection observation reperformance so what are that various test and verification procedure we need to perform to know that reliability of financial information that we will get to know in a later chapter called audit documentation and evidence so for the time being now for this particular question you need to remember that as a part of scope you need to verify even reliability of financial information and for knowing the reliability of financial information you are supposed to do two things number one you need to make a study of accounting system and internal control system and you need to carry out various various other test and verification procedures which we will discuss later as a part of our subsequent chapters then as a part of your scope even you are required to verify even you are required to verify proper disclosures in the financial statements whatever disclosures which have been made in the financial statements be it in the form of balance sheet be it in the form of pnl be it in the form of notes to accounts whatever disclosures which are required in the financial statements whether there is a proper disclosures of all that is there in the financial statements or not that you need to verify sir how can i do it number one you have to compare the financial statements with underlying records nothing but whether the financial statements are matching with books of accounts or not if you remember this point we are coming across very repeatedly we have seen it in the points to be considered before expressing an opinion opinion we have seen the same point even in the principal aspects also now they are telling this point once again in the scope also number two we need to consider whatever judgments which the management has made in the preparation of financial statements whether they are reasonable or not so the management while preparing financial in file while preparing the financial statements they make use of various assumptions and estimates whether all that assumptions and estimates are reliable or not reasonable or not that also you have to verify Number three, you should also check accounting policies. What accounting policies your client has followed, whether they are consistently applied year after year or not, that also you need to verify. So these three activities will be, these broadly, these activities will be included in our scope. What are they? Our audit should cover all aspects related to the financial statements. We need to check the reliability of financial information. And also we need to check whether there is a proper disclosure in the financial statements. Now they might also ask you a question, what will not be included in the audit? Sometimes instead of asking you the question, they might also alternatively ask what is not included in the auditor scope as a part of audit, what you are not supposed to do. That also they can ask you a question. So how to answer that particular question? Here I have an example for you. So if they ask you the question, if they ask you only what is included in the scope, you will write the points whatever I have explained you till now. In case if they are alternatively asking the question, what is not included in the auditor scope, this is what you are supposed to write. First, you have to write that as an auditor, you are not supposed to do anything which is beyond your competence. If you are not competent, if you are not capable to do something that you are not supposed to do, that will not be forming part of your scope. I will give you one simple example. You are appointed as auditor of some entity. One day, the client's management came to you and asked, sir, we appointed as an auditor. You have to fight a case for me in the court of law. We have some uh, criminal case against one of our director. You have to fight the case for us. Are you supposed to do? No, because fighting a case is beyond your competence, beyond your capability. You are not supposed to do anything which is beyond your scope and competence. Or one more example. So you have been appointed as auditor of some company. One day the management is coming to you and asking, boss, you are appointed as an auditor. Our machinery has broken down. You have to come and fix our machinery. Will you go and do it? No. Why? Because that is beyond your competence, beyond your capability. So as an auditor, you are not supposed to perform any duty which is falling beyond your competence. Even if the management asks you to do something which is beyond your capabilities, you can straight away reject it. You are not under any obligation to do something which is beyond your scope and competence. Number two, an auditor is not an expert in the authentication of documents. Very important point, guys. And also, if you read this point further, the genuineness of the documents cannot be authenticated by him because he is not an expert in this field. Which means, take for example, the management of the company brought to you some ownership document. They are about to buying. They are about to buy a property. They are about to buy a property. So, some for example, they are about to buy a piece of land. They brought the legal documents to you. They brought the legal documents to you and they are asking you to check whether those property documents, whatever are there, whether they are genuine or not. That means on the basis of these documents, whether they can purchase this property or not, they are asking. Are you supposed to do it? No. Why? Because we are not an expert in authentication. We are not an expert in checking whether the transaction is genuine or not. We are not some forensic investigators. See whether a document is genuine or not, whether a forgery has happened or not, that is not something which in which we are experts with. 
so we try to verify whether the evidence is convincing or not that's all we cannot we are not supposed to be an expert in authentication in determining genuinity of the documents that is a part of forensic we are not experts in that so in case if the client is asking you to check the check the genuineness of the documents whether a document is genuine or not signatures in the document are genuine or not is there any forgery are we supposed to do it no that is also beyond our competence we are not an expert in authentication of documents and also our audit is not an official investigation audit is different from investigation sir what is different what is the difference between audit and investigation see investigation is a special purpose assignment investigation investigation will always happen with a special purpose for example sometimes you are required to sometimes investigation will happen to find out only fraud sometimes investigations will be conducted by income tax authorities to find out the black money so investigation is a special assignment with a specific cause whereas audit is a general assignment where overall objective is to express an opinion so audit is a different from investigation when you are appointed as an auditor your responsibility is to do the audit not to do investigation investigation is going to be different audit is going to be different so that's what we have said here an audit is not an official investigation into alleged wrongdoing audit is different investigation is different so what is the difference so investigation is a critical examination it is a in-depth examination of the accounts with a special purpose whereas the objective of the audit is to obtain reasonable assurance whether financial statements are free from material misstatements that is a general objective and express the opinion whereas investigation always happens with a special purpose and a specific purpose audit is different investigation is different understood everybody so if they in case if they ask you the question what is not included in the scope of audit this is what you are supposed to write three simple things auditor is not expected to perform duties which fall beyond his scope and competence auditor is not an expert in authentication of documents he cannot he cannot vouch for genuine uh, genuineness of the document number three audit is not an investigation into alleged wrongdoing and write this few points explaining the differences between audit and investigation so in case if they are asking you this question you are supposed to write this particular part of the answer so with this we are done with the scope scope related concept also this we are done with what will be included what will not be included in the scope of audit so now let us try to proceed further and try to understand the remaining concepts here right okay so so now I will try to explain, now we will try to revise this question number two. What are the objectives of the auditor as per SA 200? See, this answer we already know, just a little bit elaboration, that's it. So as I have told you earlier in this chapter, when I say I am teaching you the chapter nature, objective and scope of audit, I am in fact trying to teach you two standards. Which two standards I am trying to teach you? SA 200 and SA 210. SA 200 is the first and foremost standard on auditing. Like the way AS1, AS1 is the first and foremost standard on accounting. Similarly, SA200 is the first and foremost standard on auditing. See, every standard will have an objective. Similarly, SA200 has also put some objectives on the auditor. So, let us see what are the objectives of the auditor as per SA200. So, SA200, the title of the standard, see it is always advisable to remember the standard numbers and standard titles. This is one question which I often uh, uh, often which I often get asked from the students sir am I required to remember the standard numbers am I required to remember the standard names if you remember it better it will uh, improve your presentation it is always advisable to do it but if you face any lot of difficulty significant difficulty in remembering you can ignore that also but I will suggest you even if you uh, do not remember the title of the standards fine but always try to remember which standard is talking about what concept that you have to remember standard numbers you re you remember so if you don't give reference to the name of the standard fine but you always try to give reference to the standard number that will be the, the that will be the uh, good thing if you do it clear so sa 200 has also given certain objectives to the auditor sir what are that objectives so title of the standard is overall objectives of the independent auditor and conduct of an audit in accordance with standards on audit so in this standard, the standard told that the overall objectives of the auditor are to obtain reasonable assurance regarding two things. Say 200 has given objectives and in that first objective they have told as an auditor, you need to obtain reasonable assurance. Sir, what is reasonable assurance? We will talk about in a just a while. First, we will read the ignoring this reasonable assurance. We will complete the objectives. Once we are done with understanding this particular answer, once we complete reading this particular answer, 
Next, we will take up a concept called inherent limitations. There, I will elaborate in a detailed manner what is this reasonable assurance. Okay, so don't worry about it. Please focus. So the objective of this standard is to uh, objective for the auditor is to obtain reasonable assurance about whether financial statements as a whole are free from material misstatements, whether due to fraud or error. And also the auditor is required to express an opinion whether financial statements are prepared in accordance with applicable financial reporting framework. Is there anything new here? No, there is nothing new here. Why? Because we have already understood these two objectives in an elaborated manner when we took up the concept of introduction to audit. So in the, in the introduction to audit, the same two objectives we have seen, which SA 200 is also saying, but it had it, it has added one more term. It is asking you to obtain reasonable assurance regarding two things. For the time being, you remember assurance as confidence, reasonable means acceptable. So as an auditor, you are required to obtain reasonable assurance. As an auditor, you are required to obtain acceptable level of confidence. You need to be having enough of confidence that financial statements are free from material misstatements and to express an opinion whether financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework. So obtaining that level of confidence is your objective regarding these two matters. There is nothing new here. We already know about these two matters in a detailed manner. And also to report on the financial statements and communicate as required by the standards in accordance with the auditor's finding. And during the course of audit, you will have various findings. Whatever findings you have, you are required to report. And how to report all my findings, sir? For every kind of finding, there is a standard. For example, if you found a fraud, how I have to report it? There is SA 240 about it. Sir, I did. I found some non-compliances by my client entity. What I should do? I have to report it. How you have to report it? SA 250 is there. Sir, I came to know some issue regarding going concern. How I have to report? You have to report it as per SA 570. So whatever your findings are there during the course of audit, you might come across various findings relating to the audit. All those findings you are required to report and how to report, sir, as per the relevant standards. So this is what the objectives which are given to the auditor as per SA 200. As per SA 200. So this is what you have to write in case if they ask you the uh, in case if they ask you to write about what are the objectives of auditor as per SA 200. Now we will revise one of the most important concept on this entire subject in this entire topic uh, which is having high chance of getting tested in the examination which has been repeatedly tested in the examination which is inherent limitations which is what inherent limitations. Sir what is this concept of inherent limitations? I will try to simplify it in a simple manner. See no matter how effectively you do the audit no matter how effectively you do the audit there is always a chance of auditor's opinion going wrong no matter how effectively you do the audit there is always a chance of auditor's opinion going wrong because the process of auditing is suffering from some limitations and those limitations are of such a nature that they are unavoidable what is the nature of that limitations they are unavoidable in nature and those limitations, we call them as inherent limitations. Inherent means something which is unavoidable. So the point which I'm trying to say is no matter how effectively you do the audit, there is always a chance of auditor's opinion going wrong because the process of auditing is suffering from some limitations which are of such a nature you can't avoid them no matter whatever you do. Those limitations, we call them as inherent limitations of audit. I will tell you one simple example. See, take for example, you are supposed to do audit of Reliance Industries Limited. You are supposed to do audit of Reliance Industries Limited. Or let us take the practical case. Reliance Industries Limited is there, one of the biggest conglomerate of India. For that also audit will happen. So take for example, for the financial year 22-23, audit of Reliance Industries Limited would have happened. Yes, it has happened. Sir, within how many days the audit of Reliance Industries Limited will be completed? The audit of Reliance Industries Limited will be completed in a span of 30 days. And if you take companies like Infosys, TCS, even for these companies also audit will happen. And if you check their audit reports, Infosys audit report will be there on or before 15th of April. That means hardly within 15 to 20 days audit of these companies are getting completed. So Reliance Industries Limited Auditor will take 30 days to complete the audit. Infosys Auditor will take 15 days to complete the audit. TCS Auditor will take 15 days to complete the audit. So just imagine how big these companies are. But the auditors are able to complete the audit of these so-called bigger companies just in a span of 15 days, 20 days, 30 days. How do you think that is possible? That is possible because auditors will not verify 100% of the transactions. Auditors will verify sampling. Auditors will verify the transactions on sampling basis. Sir, why auditor will verify transactions on sampling basis? 
Why? Because just imagine in case of Reliance Industries Limited, which is having 6 lakh plus crores of turnover of the company, 10 lakh plus of employees. If I have to do audit of this Reliance Industries Limited by verifying 100% transactions, it will take easily 3-4 years for me to do the audit. So we can't afford to spend such amount of time on audit. So audit has to be completed within reasonable time. Audit has to be completed within reasonable cost. And sometimes 100% verification becomes impossible also. Sometimes 100% verification becomes impossible. So that's why what practically auditors will do is auditors will try to verify the transactions on sampling basis. For example, in the entire Reliance Industries Limited audit, the auditors verified only 10% of the transactions. Sir, is it permitted by the standards? Yes, the auditors are permitted to verify the transactions on sampling basis. Even standards on auditing itself is giving you the permission. Okay, Reliance Industries Limited auditor has verified the transactions of only 10%. And on the basis of that, he has expressed an opinion. But if you observe carefully here, if the auditor has verified the transactions on sampling basis, if he's saying I have verified 10% of the sample, indirectly he's, ver indirectly he's saying he did not verify 90% of the transactions. In the 90% of the transactions which he did not verify, there could be fraud also, there could be error also. Since you did not verify this 90% of the transactions, you will not be able to find out the fraud also, you will not be able to find out the error also which is there in that 90% of the transactions. Because of that, your opinion can go wrong or not? Yes. So no matter how effectively you do the audit, you are, there is always a chance of auditor's opinion going wrong. Sir, in this particular example, what is the reason for my opinion going wrong? Because I am verifying the transactions on sampling basis. I am verifying the transactions on sampling basis. This is a limitation. This is a what? Limitation. I have to do the audit on sampling basis only. Then only I will be able to complete the audit. Sir, can I avoid this limitation? What do you mean by avoiding the limitation? Avoiding the limitation means don't verify the transactions on sampling basis. Verify 100% of the transactions. Do you think it is possible? Looking at the size of the so-called companies, looking at the volume of transactions nowadays the companies are doing, 100% verification is close to impossible. So that's why we are verifying the transactions on sampling basis, but that is limitation. We can't avoid it. We have to verify the transactions on sampling basis only. So verification of transactions on sampling basis is such a limitation of audit which can't be avoided. But if you verify the transactions on sampling basis, there is always a possibility of auditor's opinion going wrong. So can I say sampling has inherent limitation? Yes. The process of audit is suffering from limitation which is of such a nature. We can't avoid it. So that's why we can call verification of transactions on sampling basis is an inherent limitation. So like this, this is not the only limitation. There are various other limitations because of which no matter how effectively you do the audit, there is always a possibility of your opinion going wrong. One such, one such example I have given is audit sampling, but, uh, but that is not the only limitation. There are various other limitations also which you can't avoid it no matter whatever you do. That limitations, we call them as inherent limitations. Let us see what are those inherent limitations of audit. But before I talk about what are those inherent limitations, let me try to explain what is the impact of inherent limitations. Because of inherent limitations, what will happen? Number one, as I have told, because of inherent limitations, there is always a possibility of auditor's opinion going wrong. Because of, because of inherent limitations, there is always a possibility of auditor's opinion going wrong. There might be a chance that your opinion can go wrong. Number two, because of inherent limitations, there will always be an audit risk. Audit risk can never be eliminated. It can only be reduced. Sir, what is audit risk? Nothing but audit risk means nothing but chance of auditor's opinion going wrong. So you can never ever eliminate the audit risk. Eliminating audit risk means you are coming and saying, I have done the audit and uh, I am damn sure that my opinion will not go wrong. Can you give that guarantee? No. So that is what the meaning. Audit risk can never be eliminated to zero. It can be reduced, but it can never be eliminated. Third implication, because of this reason only, we always say auditor will express opinion but not guarantee. So till now, whenever we have seen the objectives of audit, I was always telling auditor will give only opinion. Never ever have I told auditor will, exp auditor will give guarantee. Sir, why you did not say auditor will give guarantee? Because he can't. Why he can't give guarantee? Why he can only express opinion? Why? Because there are inherent limitations. Number four, one more implication of inherent limitation. Auditor can obtain only reasonable assurance but not absolute assurance. Auditor can only obtain reasonable assurance but not absolute assurance. Sir, what is reasonable assurance? They say reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance but not absolute assurance. So in order to understand what is reasonable assurance, first we need to know what is reasonable assurance. What is absolute assurance? Sorry. So if you see, 
yeah this is what the definition they have given reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance but not absolute assurance so in, to understand what is reasonable assurance first we need to understand what is absolute assurance assurance as i have told confident uh, absolute means absolute means what 100% 100% confident so absolute assurance means giving guarantee absolute assurance means what equal to giving guarantee so in audit the standards are expecting even if you remember in sa 200 we have seen they are only asking us sa 200 is only asking auditor to obtain reasonable assurance even sa 200 is not expecting the auditor to obtain absolute assurance sir why even sa 200 is not expecting the auditor to get to be 100 percent confident because he can't do it why he can't obtain absolute assurance why he can only obtain reasonable assurance because of inherent limitations so because of these reasons the standard sa 200 has told Dear auditor, you try to obtain high level of assurance, but we are not expecting from you absolute assurance. Absolute assurance means giving guarantee. SA 200 itself told, we don't want guarantee from you. Sir, why you don't want guarantee? Why the standards are only expecting reasonable assurance? The logic is very simple. The process of audit is suffering from some limitations which are unavoidable, which we call them as inherent limitations. So this is what the impact of inherent limitations. So four impact guys. Number one, auditor can obtain only reasonable assurance, but not absolute assurance. The auditor can express opinion, but not guarantee. There is always a possibility of auditor's opinion going wrong. The auditors can never be eliminated. So we have seen impact. Let us try to understand what are that inherent limitations? What are those limitations which can't be avoided? Number one, nature of financial reporting. So financial reporting, as we have already seen earlier, it means the process of preparation and presentation of financial statements. Now they are telling, ignore the audit, the process of financial reporting, the process of accounting itself is suffering from some limitation. Sir, what is the limitation which accounting process is suffering from? Accounting process is suffering from some limitation, which is usage of estimates. We all know that the management will prepare financial statements by making use of some estimates. Take for example, depreciation. In calculation of depreciation, in this formula, cost minus residual value divided by useful life. In this formula, cost is only the thing which we know with accuracy, reliable, Residual value is an estimate. Useful life is also an estimate. Provision for bad and doubtful debts, estimate. Provision for expenses, estimate. So like this, in the preparation of financial statements, management might make use of so many estimations which involve uncertainty. See, when we say estimate, that estimate can go wrong also. For example, management created a provision for bad and doubtful debts. They are required to collect 1 crore rupees of money from the debtor. And the financial position of the debtor is very bad. And management thought that not even a single rupee is recoverable from him. So what they have done is provision for bad and doubtful debts. One crore they have created. Provision for bad and doubtful debts. One crore expense they have created. So profit will reduce by one crore. As an auditor, I felt yes, provision for bad and doubtful debts. This estimate of one crore provision is correct only. I gave a positive opinion. But in the next year, what happened is all of a sudden, this uh, debtor's position has become very good. He repaid us back entire one crore rupee. That means last year we have created a wrong provision and last year I have audited, I thought revision, I, th I thought that provision is correct and I gave the opinion. But in the current year that estimation has gone wrong. If the estimation has gone wrong, financial statements has also gone wrong. If the financial statements has gone wrong, auditor's opinion has also gone wrong. Able to understand what I am trying to say. So first inherent limitation is nature of financial reporting. That means the process of accounting itself is suffering from some limitation which is management will make use of assumptions, estimates which involve uncertainty. These estimates can go wrong in the future and when these estimates go wrong in the future, financial statements also will go wrong. When the financial statements go wrong, auditor's opinion also can go wrong. Can we avoid this limitation? Avoiding this limitation means what? Preparing the financial statements without using a single assumption. Do you think it is possible? No, it is not going to be possible. Understood everybody? So that is what the first inherent limitation, nature of financial reporting. Clear everybody? And also one more category also they say here. See generally we do audit on the assumption that management will implement internal controls. But what could happen is those internal controls also might not function effectively. We, we will generally assume that internal controls in the client organization will work very well. We generally have that presumption. But what could happen is internal controls might not work that effectively as we thought. So when internal controls don't work properly, frauds and errors also will not be prevented. And we will not be able to detect it. And obviously our opinion also will go wrong. So that what they have added one more point here. So first the main explanation here is 
the process of financial statements involve usage of estimates because of which auditor's opinion can go wrong. And one more thing, we generally do the audit with the assumption that management will implement internal controls, but that internal controls might not function effectively, which can make the misstatement to still happen, which can't be identified by the auditor. Clear? So that is what the first category of inherent limitation. Second one, nature of audit procedures. Now, first inherent limitation, they told the process of accounting is suffering from some limitation. Now, in the second point they are telling, the process of audit itself is suffering from some limitation. The process of audit is also suffering from some limitation. Sir, what is the process of, or what limitation the process of audit is suffering from? See, the thing is, sometimes auditor will not be able to obtain audit evidence because of practical and legal limitations. See, generally the entire process of audit is, first auditor will perform audit procedures. By performing that audit procedures, auditor will get something called audit evidence. On the basis of that evidence, auditor will express opinion. Then the process of audit will generally come to an end. So generally, auditor will perform audit procedures to obtain audit evidence. But in some cases, what will happen is, there will be certain practical and legal limitations because of which auditor will not be able to obtain audit evidence. And if you express opinion without obtaining audit evidence, definitely there is a chance of that opinion going wrong. For sure, it will happen. Right. Sir, what is the what are those limitations associated with audit procedures? One thing we have already covered, sampling. Auditor will verify the transactions on sampling. When you are verifying transactions on sampling, obviously there is a chance of your opinion going wrong. Number two, sometimes management themselves will not provide you with the required information, either intentionally or unintentionally. See, in order to get the audit evidence, we take the help of management. Information by the end of the day has to be provided by management only. But sometimes management themselves will not provide you with the required information, either intentionally or unintentionally. Then also you will not obtain evidence. Number three, sophisticated frauds, which means, see, generally the person whoever is committing a fraud, definitely is doing something wrong. But always the person committing a fraud will be a bit intelligent. See, I'm not giving you any motivation for you to go and commit the frauds, but I'm telling the fact. Generally, the person whoever commits a fraud will be a little bit intelligent. If he is too intelligent, no, he will commit fraud in such a manner that no one will even get a suspicion that fraud has been committed. So he will create false documents, he will destroy the existing documents, he will uh, make so many adjustments, he will control so many people and he will pretend as if no fraud has taken, it, taken place. And if such an intelligent person has committed a fraud in a sophisticated manner, no matter how effectively you do the audit, there will always be a chance of not identifying that fraud. Take for example, Punjab National Bank case. In the PNB case, there is somewhere around 13,000 crores worth of fraud. And this fraud did not happen just in one year. The fraud has taken a span of eight years to accumulate that much value. So, uh, sir, but, sir, but the fraud was identified in the eighth year. That means in the seven years, auditors were not able to identify the fraud. Sir, is it auditor's mistake? No. Why? Because in that case, the fraud was carried out in a sophisticated manner. Different people in the organization are involved. One third party, one top level management, one middle level manager, one low level clerk. Like this, different people in the organization colluded with each other and they're able to manipulate in such a manner that no matter how hard the auditor puts the effort, he is still unable to detect it. So like this, because of sophisticated fraud also, auditor might not be able to identify it because of that also auditor's opinion can go wrong. Number four, related party transaction. Sometimes your client will enter into related party transaction, like a transaction between holding and subsidiary. See, the problem with the related party transaction is, since both the parties are related, they can manipulate the terms and conditions. On paper, the transaction will look correct only, but we will never know the actual intentions in the case of related parties. So if there is any collusion, if there is any fraud which is getting committed through the related party, it is very much difficult to be, it is, it is very much difficult for the auditor to detect it. And in most of the cases, auditor will not be able to detect the related party frauds. Why? Because they're both the parties are closely related with each other. They can do, they can manipulate the terms, they can collude and put, and together they, they can cheat the auditor. So that's why when there are related party transactions and because of that any fraud is happening, that is also difficult for the auditor to find it out. So second category of inherent limitation, nature of audit procedures, in that four examples they have given, number one, sampling, number two, management themselves will not provide complete information, number three, fraud will be carried out in a sophisticated manner, number four, related party transactions. Third category of uh, limitation, audit is not in the nature of investigation. I have already told you this. See, audit is different, investigation is different. In the case of official investigation, the person will have a lot of powers. Take for example, income tax right. See, in the income tax right, if you carefully observe, what will happen in the income tax right? A group of professional people will come and do, uh, and will do certain things which we don't expect from the professionals. Like they will break the walls, they will break the ceilings. That is their duty, agreed. 
See, in the case of investigation, the person doing investigation will have superior powers. They can break the walls, they can stop the communication, they can stop the movement of the people. If since the investigators, since the investigators are having supreme powers, they can get more information, they can get absolute assurance. But as auditor, we are not official investigators. We don't get all that powers. We can't go and break the walls. We can't go and break the ceilings. We can't stop the communication. We can't uh, uh, stop the movement of the people. If we do all these things, no. Uh, if, if we do all these things, the client will give a tight slap and throw you out of the company. So audit is different. Investigator is different. Like or like investigator, we auditors will not have supreme powers because of which we always uh, rely only on convincing evidence. We never get conclusive evidence because of which also auditor's opinion can go wrong. Number four, timeliness of financial reporting and decrease in the relevance of information. This I will tell you in a simple way. I will try to example. See, sometimes what will happen is, take for example, I have done audit of one client X Limited for the financial year 2021-22. Well, I am doing the audit of the financial year of 21-22 of the client X Limited. I performed in-depth audit procedures and I obtained a lot of evidences. Okay. Now the same client appointed me as an auditor for the financial year 22-23 also. Now in some cases standards will give you permission that because of timeliness of uh, since you have to complete the audit within time <coughs> the standards have given permission. Sometimes you can use the evidence which you have obtained from the previous years in the current year's audit. Some evidence regarding internal controls and all like that. Uh, if you have done the last year's audit also in the current year's audit in some cases you can use the evidence which is which you have obtained in the previous year you can use that information and some auditors will do it standards also permit it but by doing that also there is a chance of your opinion going wrong. why because since there is a time gap between the time at which you have obtained the evidence and whenever you are using it there is a time gap between the there is a time actually there is a, there is a lot of time that has lapsed between the time you got the evidence and when you are using it in case if you are using last year's information last year you have obtained and you are using that information in the current year because of that the relevance of that information will come down or not i will give you one simple logic here in the year 21 22 you thought of buying a car you thought of buying a car you did a lot of analysis, you obtained a lot of information, what is the latest features in the market and all and you decided in the last year, according to you, so some Tata Motors is the premium car, that is the suitable car for you. But you did not buy it. Now in the year 22-23, you want to buy a car once again. Can you use the analysis whatever you have made in the year 21-22 to buy the car in the year 22-23? Yes, you can use it. But in between this one year, there might be new features which are available in the market. So you can use it, but since there is a time gap between the, since there is a lapse of time between the time you have obtained the information and you are using it for decision making purposes, sometimes because of this your decision might go wrong. Might be in this one year some new features have come in the market which you are not aware and using the last year's information only you have bought a wrong car. Yes or no? The same thing can happen even in the audit also. Sometimes you use last year's information for the current year's audit, but since there is a time gap, the relevance of the information may come down because of which your opinion might go wrong. So that is what the simple summary of that point. You can refer this example that will give you better understanding. So that is what the fourth point, decrease in the relevance of information. And number five, future events. Our opinion can always go wrong because of future events. Why? Because we don't have control over future events. Like for example, in the year 22-23, as on the balance sheet date, I thought going concern assumption is valid. Entity will continue for the foreseeable future. Management told going concern is valid. I also felt going concern is valid. I gave a positive opinion. But within six months, some unavoidable circumstances, some huge fire accident happened, 70% of the factory burnt and they don't have insurance policy. The factory got closed down. Now the going concern all of a sudden has become invalid. That means my opinion has gone wrong. Is it my mistake? No. Why? Because my opinion has gone wrong because of some future event over which I don't have control. So like this, even because of future events also, my opinion can go wrong because of which I am not the responsible person. Uh, for, and for that, and if my opinion has gone wrong because of future events, definitely I am not the I am not the one who is responsible for my wrong opinion. It is limitation of the audit itself. It is unavoidable. I can't avoid that limitation. The process of audit itself is suffering from some limitation. So these are the inherent limitations. Clear everybody? Very important question. They might ask you only one part of the question instead of asking you entire inherent limitations. They might ask you only one part. Like they might ask you write about nature of financial reporting as an inherent limitation. Or they might ask you nature of audit procedures as an inherent limitation. You should be able to write the significant uh, portion of that answer.
clear so what are inherent limitations very important i will quickly revise once again number of number one nature of financial reporting Number two, nature of audit procedures. In that also various categories are there. Sampling, management themselves are not providing information, sophisticated frauds and related party transactions. Number three, audit is not in the nature of investigation. Number four, decrease in the relevance of information over time. Number five, future events. So these are the various these are the various limitations because of which there is always a possibility of auditor's opinion going wrong. Till here, comfortable everybody. So with this we are done with the inherent limitations. Now let us proceed further with the revision of the remaining concepts from this particular chapter. So till now whatever concepts we have understood, whatever concepts we have revised from this chapter, majorly they are from SA 200. So whatever content we have revised from this chapter till now like types of order, principal aspects, scope of order, what is included, what is not included, what are inherent limitations. So all this content whatever we have discussed till now, majorly it has been taken from standard on audit SA 200. Now there are few more concepts which are there in this particular chapter. Let us try to revise them. So the next concept which I am going to revise is relating to something called ethical requirements. The next concept which we are going to revise is what? Ethical requirements. See, we auditors play a very crucial role. So depending on our opinion, there are so many people who are going to base their economic decision. Like if you take a listed company like Reliance Industries Limited, the auditors of this Reliance Industries Limited conduct the audit, give their auditor's opinion, that auditor's opinion will form the basis for so many shareholders decision, whether they have to stay invested in the company or they have to quit from the investment or they have to add extra investment. Or if you take the case of a banker, the banker is going to rely on the audited financial statements to decide whether to give a loan to a company or not. So like that, being an auditor, once we express an opinion, that opinion is going to be used by so many people. And so many different kinds of stakeholders are going to base their economic decisions on the basis of our auditor's opinion. So as an auditor, we are playing a very crucial role in the decision making process of the various stakeholders, especially they base their economic decisions, financial decisions on the basis of what opinion we are giving. So that's why since our opinion is forming the basis for so many people's actions, there is a requirement of ethical requirements. As an auditor, we are supposed to follow some ethical requirements. Ethical requirements means you can say some moral values we are supposed to follow. So as per the standards on auditing, an auditor is required to comply with five ethical requirements how many ethical requirements guys the auditor is required to comply with five ethical requirements sir what are that five ethical requirements which every auditor must comply with number one is integrity number two we have objectivity number three confidentiality number four professional competence and due care and number five we have professional behavior professional behavior so being an auditor, we are supposed to comply with these five ethical requirements. Name the five ethical requirements, guys. Number one, integrity. Number two, objectivity. Number three, confidentiality, professional competence and due care and professional behavior. Sir, what are all these five ethical requirements? If we try to understand it in a detailed manner, integrity means being honest being sincere being straightforward as an auditor, you should not associate yourself with such a documents which you believe it to be false. If you know some document is uh, false, you should not associate yourself with those kind of documents. So that honesty, that sincerity, that straightforwardness of an auditor that we call it as integrity. And as an auditor, you must have that integrity. Number two, objectivity. Sir, what is the meaning of objectivity? Very simple. You should not have any kind of bias. You should not show any favorism. You should not let any, any persons influence your decision. You should behave in an unbiased manner. So that ability to act in an unbiased manner, not getting influenced by others, that we call it as objectivity. More or less, objectivity, independence, both convey same meaning. So second ethical requirement which auditor must possess is objectivity. Third one, confidentiality. See, being an auditor, you will be in some superior position. During the course of audit, you will get a lot of information regarding client's business. Sometimes you will also acquire some confidential information also. Now, being an auditor, you have been given that power to get any information which you require for the purpose of the for the purpose of conducting the audit. There is also a responsibility to maintain the confidentiality. So, whatever information you are acquiring from the client, you should not disclose that information to anybody else, other uh, unless you have obtained the client's permission. So, that confidentiality you have to maintain, secrecy over the client's information you have to maintain. However, if there is any legal or regulatory requirement, then you have to disclose. 
then you should not say no no i have to maintain confidentiality i will not disclose the information even to the regulatory authorities also that things will not work there unless there is any legal or regulatory requirement you should not be disclosing the client's information to any outsider so that confidentiality you have to maintain sir why this requirement as i have told being an auditor you enjoy that privilege you get whatever information you want regarding the client's business client will never say no but when you are getting that information you have to be responsible for that you have to maintain confidentiality you have to maintain secrecy over that client's information then next uh, next ethical requirement which is professional competence and due care sir what is professional competence competence means what capability see as we all know being an auditor we deal with such a subjects which are tend to change over period of time like every year for every year when the budget comes there will be some changes in the income tax act there will be changes in the indirect taxes sometimes uh, all together old laws will be scrapped and new laws will be brought in like companies act 1956 was scrapped and companies act 2013 was brought so so many circulars will come so many notifications will come so many guidance notes will come so like that being an being a chartered accountant we deal with such a subjects which will not remain constant which will change continuously now if you have to provide a relevant services to your client don't you think you have to remain updated with all the recent things happening in our subjects yes so that is what the meaning of professional competence you have to be competent enough you have to become capable so that whatever services you are providing to the client that is relevant that is not outdated service so that is your moral response moral responsibility since your opinion is getting used by so many people you have to remain professionally competent you have to remain professionally capable person you have to maintain you have to update your knowledge you have to update your skills and also you have to maintain due care that means you have to do the audit with utmost care and responsibility you should not do any kind of assignment carelessly you have to do the assignment in such a careful manner which we generally call it as diligence diligence means you have to do the audit with utmost care so that is one more ethical requirement you have to be professionally competent and also you have to maintain due care and finally professional behavior which means whatever work you are trying to do that work should comply with laws and regulations and being a chartered accountant don't do any such work which will bring a discredit to the profession which will bring a bad name to the profession that kind of work you should not do should always do the work which complies with the laws and regulations so these are the five ethical requirements which every auditor must comply with what are the five ethical requirements guys very important from the examination perspective the five ethical requirements are integrity objectivity confidentiality professional competence and due care and also professional behavior should everybody now now we will also try to elaborate on the concept of independence so we have already seen what is the meaning of the term independence sir what is the meaning of the term independence so if i tell you what is the meaning of the term independence so here we have here so independence implies that the judgment of a person is not subordinate to the wishes or directions of another person who might have engaged him this point i have already revised when i took up the chapter introduction so what is the meaning of the term independence independence means you should take decision in such a manner that or your decision should not change judgment of a person it's not subordinate that means the decisions made by the person should not be changed according to the wishes and directions of the other persons that ability to take the decision without giving importance to other persons wishes and directions that characteristic we call it as independence that characteristic we are going to call it as what independence and also i have told audit of de uh, definition of audit itself says audit is an independent examination so in audit whatever examination we are doing that is completely an independent examination and also at one point i have explained this independence can be divided into two categories independence will be of two types number one is independence of mind and the other one is independence of appearance this also i have explained while i was explain while i was explaining about various types of audit i elaborated on this concept of what is independence of mind what is independence of appearance what is independence of mind the act the agreement of mind the decision the agreement which you have made in your mind to act independently that we call it as independence of mind sir what is independence of appearance not having any relationship or association with the client that we call it as independence of appearance now when it comes to this concept of independence there is one important question which is very frequently tested in the examination what are various threats to independence what are various threats to independence see there is a global organization called ifac international federation for accountants like this there is one global organization this global organization has identified five kinds of threats to independence see when i say something as a threat to independence what do i mean by that if i am telling a circumstance as a threat to independence what do i mean by that 
because of that circumstance is independence is going to get increased or independence is going to get compromised or reduced so when i say something as a threat to independence which means because of that factor because of that circumstances there is a danger of independence getting compromised is a danger of independence getting reduced so like that ifac has identified how many kinds of threats five kinds of threats they have identified sir what are that five kinds of threats sir so what are that five kinds of threats so if we see here the five kinds of threats are so if you see here the five kinds of threats are number one you have to uh, number one self-interest threats number two self-review threats number three advocacy threats number four familiarity threats and number five intimidation threats so what are the five kinds of threats which are identified by whom ifac five kinds of threats they have identified which are self-interest threat self-review threat advocacy threat familiarity threat and intimidation threat let me try to revise in a brief what is exactly each of this threat first let us talk about self-interest threat sir what is self-interest threat self-interest threat occurs when the auditor is getting some financial benefit or when the auditor is financially interested in the client for which he is doing the audit like for example auditor is holding shares in the company auditor has given loan to the company or auditor has taken loan from the company he is having some close business relationship so when the auditor is getting benefited because of a financial interest in the client company that kind of threats we do call it as self-interest threat so then what is self-review threat the name itself says as an auditor you are reviewing your own work which you have done as a part of previous assignment as an auditor if you are reviewing your own work as a part which uh, you are reviewing your own work which you have done as a part of previous assignment that threat we call it as self-review threat sir when does that happen take for example i am a chartered accountant recently i have been a director of the company x limited for the entire year i have been acted as a director of the company x limited at certain point of time i retired as a director now this company is looking for appointment as an auditor they went to the same chartered accountant who was their director and told him boss you do the company audit for us so whatever whoever person who has been a director in the company the same person has been appointed as auditor see as an auditor you are supposed to verify financial statements and books of accounts but earlier you were a director being a director you have already involved in the preparation of financial statements and books of accounts so as a director you have performed the work of preparation of financial statements and books of accounts as an auditor you are supposed to review the same financial statements and books of accounts which are prepared by yourself that means you are reviewing your own work which is a self-review threat basically you are evaluating your own answer sheet see if you evaluate your own answer sheet can we call that as independent evaluation definitely not so that is when self-review threat will occur when the auditor is reviewing his own work which is which has been performed as a part of previous assignment so in those circumstances self-review threat will happen then we have something called advocacy threat sir what is advocacy threat advocacy threat occurs when the auditor supports the client's opinion without any reasonable basis when does advocacy threat occur when the auditor supports the client's opinion without any reasonable basis if i give you an example take for example there is some company x limited this company x limited is having a case pending before income tax department and this company has appointed one practicing chartered accountant to fight the case they did not appoint as added auditor initially they have appointed this practicing chartered accountant to fight the case on behalf of this client company x limited that means that this company is expecting this practicing chartered accountant to support this company and win the case before income tax department now what the client is doing is the same practicing chartered accountant they want to appoint as an auditor the same practicing chartered accountant whom they have appointed as an advocate to fight the income tax department the same person if they are appointing as an auditor here advocacy threat will occur sir how come advocacy threat will occur why because here auditor is in two conflicting positions here practicing chartered accountant is in two conflicting positions see when the client has appointed you as an advocate what is your duty you have to support the client's mistake see what lawyers will do for their clients even though they know that their client has done a mistake they will try to support the client's mistakes no to make the to make their clients win the case here also when they have appointed this practicing chartered accountant as an advocate he will support the client's mistakes and he will try to defend the client against the income tax department now if the same person is appointed as auditor of the same company now he has to report his findings he has to report the mistakes so as an advocate you are supporting the mistakes as an as an auditor you have to you have to identify and report the mistakes in one position you have to defend the client in one position you have to offend the client 
both are two conflicting positions at certain point of time uh, con at a certain point of time independence will be compromised or not now in one case he is supporting before income tax department my client is honest person my client did not do any fraud now as an auditor you have to come and yes my client has done a fraud so both are two conflicting positions he has to uh, conflict his own statement so definitely independence will get compromised there so these kind of threats we call them as advocacy threats so generally advocacy threats occur when the auditor supports the client's opinion without any reasonable basis so we have seen three kinds of threats self-interest self-review advocacy then we have familiarity threats sir when the familiarity threats will occur familiarity threats will occur when the auditor is having a close personal relationship with the client so you are too familiar with the client personally you are familiar with the client like how sir for example you are a practicing chartered accountant your brother is in some top level management your brother is a director of a company your father is a cfo or you and the client they, you are having some long standing relationship from the last 10 years you are you are, you are acting as an auditor of the same company so like this when you have a close personal association with the client for whom you are doing audit you become very familiar you generate sympathy towards the clients because of that also there is a possibility of independence getting compromised those threats we call them as familiarity threats and finally we have something called intimidation threats intimidation threats occur when the auditor is prevented from acting independently intimidation means a threatening auditor wants to act independently but the client is threatening he is blackmailing for example the client is telling, uh, the client is going to the auditor and telling, sir, did you do the audit? Yes. They have asked the auditor, did you find any misstatement? The auditor told yes. Sir, which opinion you will give? Auditor is telling, I will definitely give negative opinion. Now the management of the client is telling, if you give negative opinion, you will not go back to home. If you give negative opinion, your wife will not return from office. So threatening, that means the auditor wants to act independently, but the client is preventing him from acting independently by intimidation, by threatening, that we call it as intimidation threats. So these are the five kinds of threats which are identified by a global organization called IFAC. So what are the five kinds of threats? Self-interest, self-review, advocacy, familiarity and intimidation threats. Clear everybody? Able to understand? Next. Now safeguards to independence there is one small uh, and one more thing guys when you are preparing for this uh, particular question threats to independence the most important thing is please do refer to these examples so i suggest you refer these examples repeatedly why because they might pose a question as a uh, case scenario based mcq they will give you a scenario and say uh, this will fall under which kind of threat so mostly they will try to choose the questions from these examples whatever they have given so my humble suggestion my humble request each and every student compulsorily you have to go through these uh, uh, points or examples whatever have been given for each threat that is very very important from there true or false statements and case scenario based mcqs have a high chance of getting tested okay so now let us proceed further so we have understood what is the meaning of the term independence we have understood what are the various types of independence we have also understood what are various threats to independence now let us try to understand what are various safeguards to independence that means how can you safeguard your independence how can you protect your independence how can you protect your independence as an auditor what steps you can take to protect your independence very simple guys you have to apply the common sense see before you accept the audit before you accept the audit then only you have to analyze is there any threat to my independence for example there is a there is a practicing chartered accountant one day a client x limited has came to him and asked him sir you please do the audit for us before you say yes to that client analyze if you accept this audit is there any threat is there any self-interest is there any self-review is there any advocacy threat is there any familiarity threat is there any intimidation threat try to analyze so before accepting audit only you start analyzing for this if you did not find any threat if you did not find any threat what you do happily go and accept However, before accepting the audit only, you came to know that there are certain threats. What you will try to do? Take some precautionary measures to eliminate that threat. Analyze, can you do something to eliminate that threat? If you could eliminate that threat, eliminate it, then accept the audit. If you are unable to eliminate the threat to independence, don't accept the audit only. If you are unable to eliminate that threat, don't accept the audit only. So how you can safeguard the independence is before accepting the audit, analyze, are there any threats to independence? Yes they are there then try to take some precautionary measures to eliminate that threat if you are able to eliminate that threat happily go and accept the audit if you are unable to eliminate the threat don't accept the audit at all see sometimes what will happen is before i accept the audit there are no threats but after i have accepted the audit then i come across any of the threats to independence at the time of before accept before accepting the audit i did not have any threat so i have accepted but after i have accepted the audit i have come across any of the five threats 
then what I should do? Here also same steps. If after accepting the audit, if you have come across any of the five threats, take precautionary measures to eliminate that threat. Analyze, can you do something to eliminate that threat? If you are able to eliminate that threat, happily continue the audit. If you are unable to eliminate that threat, what you do is withdraw from the audit altogether. Don't continue doing the audit, withdraw. Able to understand, very simple guys, you have to apply the common sense, that's all, nothing else. Before accepting the audit, analyze for threats. If there are any, take precautionary measures to eliminate. If you are able to eliminate, accept it. If you are unable to eliminate it, don't accept it. Sometimes what will happen is, after you have accepted the audit, then you will come across a threat. Then what you should do? Same steps. Uh, analyze, uh, will you be able to do something to eliminate them? If you are able to eliminate, yes, continue the audit. If you are unable to eliminate it, withdraw from the audit. That's all. So these are all the various safeguards to independence. So we have seen meaning of independence, types of independence, threats to independence, and even we have seen what are the various safeguards to independence. Comfortable everybody till here? No. So now what we will do is, we will try to understand one more important concept, professional skepticism. We'll try to understand one more important concept, professional skepticism. So, professional skepticism is one of the important quality which every auditor must possess. Professional skepticism is one of the important quality which every auditor must possess. Sir, what is the meaning of professional, uh, what is the meaning of professional skepticism? So, as per the standard, professional skepticism involves three components, A, B, C. I generally say A, B, C of professional skepticism. So, professional, when I say professional skepticism, it involves three components. Sir, what are that three components? A stands for attitude of questioning mind. Being an auditor, you should not blindly accept anything. You should always have a questioning mind. B for being alert to unusual circumstances. If you find any unusual circumstances, if you find something other than usual, if you find something suspicious, you have to remain alert to it. And C for critical assessment of audit evidence. Whatever audit evidence you are gathering, you have to critically analyze that audit evidence. So when I say professional skepticism, it involves three components. Maintaining an attitude of questioning mind, being alert to unusual circumstances, critical assessment of audit evidence. See, attitude of questioning mind, very simple to understand. So don't accept anything, whatever client says blindly, try to question it. Sir, we have to remain alert to unusual circumstances. If at all you come across any unusual circumstances, to that you have to remain alert. You should not take them lightly, you have to remain alert. Sir, are there any examples of unusual transactions to which auditor should remain alert? Yes, there are some examples of unusual transactions to which auditor should remain alert. Number one, when there is a conflict between multiple audit evidences. For example, for a same item of financial statement, you have evidence from two sources. When both the evidences are relating to same item, they should match with each other. If they are conflicting with each other, see for example, if you want to obtain evidence regarding debtors, you have obtained evidence by doing inspection, by doing verification of books of accounts, you also obtain audit evidence by asking a confirmation from the debtor. See, both the evidences are trying to support same item. Now, when both are trying to support same item, they both should match with each other. But from inspection, I got something else. From external confirmation, I got something else. So, multiple evidences regarding same item are not matching. There are conflicts. This is one example of unusual circumstance to which you should remain alert. Conflicts between multiple audit evidences. Or if you come across situation of possible fraud, if you came to know because of some situation, there is a possibility of happening of fraud to that situation also, you have to remain alert. And when you have doubts regarding reliability of audit evidence, when you have questions regarding trustability of audit evidence, when you have something suspicion about the audit evidence to that circumstances also, you have to remain alert. So second component of professional skepticism, you should be alert to unusual circumstances. And here they have given a few examples of unusual circumstances to which you have to remain alert. What are they? So you have to, if you find any conflicts between multiple audit evidences, if you find any situation of possible fraud, if you, if you have any doubts regarding reliability of audit evidence. So third component, critical assessment of audit evidence. Whatever evidence you have got, you need to critically analyze. When I say critically analyze, you have to analyze it from multiple perspectives. Whatever evidence you have got, is it enough? Is it sufficient? Is there any requirement of alternative or, evidence, or, alternative or additional evidence? Is the evidence, whatever you have obtained, is it appropriate? So like this, from multiple perspectives, you have to critically analyze the audit evidence. And by maintaining this attitude of professional skepticism, you can reduce different kinds of risk. As an auditor, by maintaining professional skepticism, you can reduce various kinds of risk. Sir, what kind of risk I can reduce? Sir? Risk of overgeneralizing while taking decisions. You can reduce the risk of taking overgeneralization. You will not do overgeneralization. See, overgeneralization means, for example, if I say a dog will have how many legs? You will say four. 
Now, if I say all the all the animals which have four legs are dogs, I'm over generalizing a fact. So, over generalizing is actually bad for audit. If I put it in audit terms, for example, I started verification with purchases. In the purchases, I did not find any misstatement. Now, if I do over generalization, what it looks like is since in the purchases there is no misstatement, in all other areas also there will not be any misstatement. This is over generalization, which is bad for audit. But if you maintain professional skepticism, you will not do over generalization. Your thought process will be if in the purchases there is no misstatement, why can't there be misstatement in other areas? So that questioning mind will be there. So by maintaining professional skepticism, you can reduce the risk of over generalizing while taking decisions. You can also reduce the risk of overlooking unusual circumstances. Overlooking means ignoring. You will not ignore unusual circumstances. You will pay more attention. And also you can reduce the risk of taking inappropriate decisions regarding nature, timing and extent of audit procedures. Which means if you maintain professional skepticism, you can make more appropriate decisions regarding nature, timing and extent of audit procedures clear everybody so this is what the concept of professional skepticism once again an important concept clear everybody able to understand whatever i'm trying to say here so now let us try to proceed further with remaining concepts let us now proceed further with the next question so i want you to take to take you through now one more important question one more small but important question this one very very important from the examination fact uh, examination perspective what are the factors which are required to be considered before accepting and continuing a client relationship as per SA, SA 220. So before you accept a client relationship or before you continue the client relationship, before you take that decision, first of all, we need to understand when we will accept the client relationship, when we will continue the client relationship. For example, there is some new client, you did not do any assignment for him previously, a new client came to your office and is asking you to do some audit assignment for you. What decision you will take? There you will take the decision whether to accept that client relationship or not. Sometimes existing client only will be there. Last year, you know a client, X Limited. Last year, you have done some audit for him. So last year, you have done company audit for him. In the current year, the existing client only, but he is asking you to do new engagement. Like take for example, in the last year, 2021, for the client X Limited, you did company audit. The same client 2122 X Limited, he came to me and asked me to do tax audit. So existing client only, but he is asking me to do some new engagement. Here also, you have to take a decision whether to accept that client relationship. Sometimes what will happen is existing client only, he will ask us to do existing engagement only, which means for example, last year 1920, I have done a company, uh, last year 2021, I have, done, I have done a company audit. Now in the current year, the same client is asking me to do company audit once again. So existing client, existing engagement, here I have to take a decision whether to continue the client relationship or not. So in some circumstances, I will take a decision regarding acceptance of the client relationship. In some circumstances, I have to take a decision regarding continuation of the client relationship. Now the question is, before you accept or continue the client relationship, before you say yes or no for the engagement, what factors you will consider? What factors you will consider and take the decision whether I should say yes to the client or whether I should say no to the client on, on the basis of what factors you will try to consider? So now, uh, SA 220 says, before you accept or continue the client relationship, four factors you have to consider. Which is standard says it? SA 220 says, there are four factors which you are required to consider before you accept or continue the client relationship. Sir, what are the four factors? So, very simple. Number one, you have to consider the integrity of the principal, owner's key, management and those charged with garnets. You have to consider how honest your top, your client's top level management are. Like for example, if you are approached by a client whose top level management is very dishonest persons, they are known for committing frauds, once in every six months they go to jail. So if such a client is coming to you and asking you to do the audit, generally if I am a prudent auditor, I will try to stay away from that kind of clients. So like this, first factor what you should check is before you accept or continue the client relationship, you have to check the integrity, honesty of the top level management of your client. Number two whether engagement team is competent that means if you accept or continue that audit are you capable enough to complete the audit which means do you have enough of resources do you have enough of time to complete the audit why because if you don't check your capability for example you are a newly practicing chartered accountant you have only two article assistants in your office one day a company of thousand crores came to you and asked you to do the audit out of excitement you said yes later you realized you don't have enough of staff to complete the audit 
you don't have enough of time to complete the audit then client will suffer auditor will suffer stakeholders will suffer so that's why what the standard says is before you say yes or no to the client relationship then only you analyze are you competent enough are you capable enough do you have enough of time and resources to complete the audit if you have accept if you don't have don't accept next one whether the firm and engagement team can comply with relevant ethical requirements just now i have told you what are ethical requirements now before you say yes or no to the client relationship you should also check if i accept this client will i be able to comply with ethical requirements or is there any possibility of violating my ethical requirements like i have told five ethical requirements so before accepting only you have to check will i be able to comply with this ethical requirements if i accept this audit and finally you should also consider any significant matters that have arisen during the previous or current years audit assignments so this is particularly suitable last point is particularly suitable in case of existing client for example last year you have done one audit for the client now in the last year your client troubled you a lot you asked for information client did not give two three times you asked one day a client has come to beat me now somehow i did the audit but after completion of audit the client is coming to me and asking sir please do the audit for the current year also will you do it i will not do it so like this even you have to consider even significant matters are there any significant matters which have arisen during previous audits consider that factors also and take the decision accordingly will it be suitable for me to say yes or no to this client relationship so as per sa 220 these are the four factors which you are required to consider integrity of the top level management of the client whether engagement team is capable enough to complete the audit whether you will be able to comply with ethical requirements and is there any significant matter which have arisen during the course of previous audit assignments understood so this is uh, actually taken from sa 220 now with this we are done with uh, the concepts from sa 200 now we will go to sa 210 balance questions whatever are there in this chapter those are actually taken from sa 210 sa 210 is actually talking about uh, agreeing to the terms of engagement agreeing to the terms of engagement this is what the main focus of this particular standard nothing but when you accept the audit when you are doing the audit of some client there is a requirement that you and the client should agree on the terms and conditions so what are the terms and conditions of the audit what you are supposed to do what your client is supposed to do so there should be agreement of times and uh, there should be agreement of terms and conditions before you accept the audit if there is no agreement of terms and conditions relating to audit there is a high chance of misunderstanding between the parties so how you have to agree to the terms in what format that agreement will be arrived so all that things will be covered in SA 210 small standard easy standard from the examination perspective important also so listen carefully so as I have told in any commercial in any commercial contract there will always be a chance of misunderstanding between the parties to the contract there will always be a chance of misunderstanding so there will be two parties to the contract in a commercial transaction always there is a chance of misunderstanding between the parties to the contract for example a builder has agreed to construct a building for a landowner they have orally agreed so many terms and conditions how many floors have to be constructed what amount will be paid what quality of cement has to be used all that terms and conditions they have orally agreed but in future what could happen is so many misunderstandings can come might be the builder is not using the cement which he has agreed or might be landowner is not paying the remuneration what he has agreed so like that in any commercial transaction there is always a chance of misunderstanding between the parties to the contract now you tell me can we do one simple thing to avoid all that misunderstandings in the case of commercial contracts can we do one simple thing to avoid all that misunderstandings yes one simple thing we can do so what we can do is whenever we are entering into any commercial contract whatever terms and conditions are there instead of agreeing orally put it down on a piece of paper both the parties to the contract should sign it both of them should keep one copy if you keep that written agreement of terms and conditions in future if at all any misunderstandings comes you can easily sort it out yes or no audit is also not an exception audit is also a commercial contract only being an auditor we agree to pro provide services to the client and the side uh, and the client will agree to pay the fees in return so like any commercial contract even audit is also a commercial contract like in any other commercial contract there is a chance of misunderstanding even in the audit also there will be a chance of misunderstanding take for example you are conducting audit of some company you went to the management and told sir give me financial statements i will do the audit management is telling you have to only prepare the financial statements you are only supposed to prepare financial statements misunderstanding or the client might not pay the fees agreed so like that even in the audit also there is a chance of misunderstanding sir what we can do sir in the case of chance of misunderstanding 
in the case of audit also to avoid this misunderstanding what we can do like the way we do in other cases here also take a piece of paper write down all the terms and conditions auditor will sign it client will sign it both will keep one copy and this one single written document which contain terms and conditions of audit will be enough to sort out the misunderstandings between auditor and client and this written document which contains the terms and conditions relating to the audit this in the audit terminology we call it as engagement letter or even we can call it as letter of engagement understood so what is engagement letter or letter of engagement the written doc, the written document which contains the terms and conditions relating to the audit that we call it as engagement letter or letter of engagement and how to prepare that engagement letter what should be the contents of that engagement letter what should be the format of the engagement letter everything has been given under sa 210 and SA 210 specifically says that auditor should prepare the engagement letter and give it to the client. Very important statement I made here as per SA 210. It is whose responsibility to prepare engagement letter. Auditor shall prepare the engagement letter and give it to the client. Not the client will prepare the engagement letter and give it to the auditor. It is always the responsibility of the auditor to prepare the engagement letter and give it to the client. Very, very important for the true or false statements. Clear? And also, let me ask you one more question. Before we see what are the contents of the engagement letter, I have one more question for you. You tell me, we have seen two kinds of audit, statutory audit and non-statutory audit. In which kind of audit do you think engagement letter is very, very important? In which kind of audit engagement letter is very, very important? So as per the standards, or even if you take the practical perspective, the importance of engagement letter is very high in the case of non-statutory audit. Why? Because in the case of statutory audit, as I have told, terms and conditions that is scope and objective will be decided by law. So in the case of statutory audit, even though if you don't have engagement letter, you need not worry. Why? Because the terms and conditions would have already been given under respective law. Law will come to your rescue in case of misunderstanding. But in the case of non-statutory audit, there will be no law or regulation which will come to our rescue. There is uh, non-statutory audit is not required under any law itself. And here if the engagement letter is missing, no one will come to your rescue. Even the law will not come to your rescue. So in the case of non-statutory audit, since in these cases, uh, law will not interfere and tell you the terms and conditions. In the case of non-statutory audit, the importance of engagement letter is many fold than when compared with the statutory audit. And uh, But practically what will happen is in both the cases, in statutory as well as non-statutory audit, in both the cases, generally the client and auditor will have a terms of engagement able to understand everybody now sir what will be the contents of the engagement letter what and all will be the contents of engagement letter so here we have given here so what is engagement letter or letter of engagement and what should be the contents of the engagement letter so here we have given the contents of engagement letter first there should be title title means was uh, title means what and heading should be there engagement letter or letter of engagement appropriate title should be there addressee you have to address this engagement letter to someone auditor is preparing who will be addressee the management of the client then you have to include a paragraph in explaining about objective and scope of the scope of the audit what is your objective what is your scope like tell like tell that you are required to obtain reasonable assurance you are required to express an opinion so all that objective and scope paragraph should be there then you have to include one paragraph which will explain the responsibilities of the auditor as an auditor what you are supposed to do next you should also include one paragraph explaining responsibilities of management as a management what the management is supposed to do you have to explain you have to add one paragraph and also you have to identify applicable financial reporting framework you should also give hint what kind of applicable financial reporting framework will be applicable for your client and also reference to expected form and content of the audit reports also give a reference how you are going to how your audit report will be according to which standards you have to prepare the audit report give reference to the form and content of the auditors report also and finally after including all the terms auditor should sign it and after signing it you give it to the client if the client is signing and giving it back to you that indicates that client has agreed to the terms whatever has been mentioned and finally mention the date and the place also clear everybody so these are all the contents these are all should be the contents of the engagement letter all this contents should be there in your engagement letter clear and comfortable everybody so what should be the contents title addressee objective and scope responsibilities of the auditor responsibilities of management what applicable financial reporting framework the client is supposed to follow expected form and content of any report signature of the auditor signature of the client indicating acceptance and date and place of audit
date and place of that engagement letter so all this contents should be there in your engagement letter and even if you want to have a format what exactly will be there in each and every paragraph for practical purposes if you want to learn just open the study material or download essay 210 from the google at the end of essay 210 you will be able to find a format that format if you follow that format you can simply copy paste and use it if you have attended our regular classes i have shown you practically how to draft that engagement letter and in case if tomorrow as a part of your article ship if your partner is asking you to prepare the engagement letter no need to ask for his guidance just download essay 210 go to and there will be something called appendix in that appendix copy the format change the client's name change your auditor's name that's all engagement letter will be prepared your client your partner will be very happy if you do that okay so in our regular classes we have understood this in a very detailed manner and also in a very practical way we have understood it so these are all the contents of engagement letter now one more thing here here we have told responsibilities of management here one of the content of the engagement letter is responsibilities of management now what are those responsibilities of the management what actually are the responsibilities of the management see these responsibilities of management we also call them as preconditions for an audit we also call them as what preconditions for an audit or even we can call them as a premise to audit so when they ask you the question what are responsibilities of management or even if they ask you the question what are preconditions for an audit or even if they ask you the question what is premise to audit for all those three questions answer is going to remain the same sir why management responsibilities are called as preconditions simple logic guys what is precondition some things which must exist before i do something for example if i gave you some instructions and told if you have to attend my classes you have to follow these rules that is a precondition for my class that means some things which should be present before i can do some task that i call it as preconditions so if i have to do the audit management has to fulfill some responsibilities unless and until management fulfills their responsibilities i will not be able to do the audit so that's why these responsibilities of the management i call it as preconditions for an audit one simple example if i have to give see as an auditor i have to verify financial statements if the management does not agree to prepare the financial statements will i be able to do the audit no so one of the responsibility of the management is to prepare financial statements that is nothing but a precondition for an audit so that's why responsibilities of management has been given various other names we also call it as preconditions for an audit we even call it as premise to an audit okay so in case if they ask you the question what are preconditions to audit what is premise to audit you are supposed to write this answer so what are those responsibilities what are those preconditions for an audit number one the management is responsible for the preparation of financial statements that also in accordance with applicable financial reporting framework number one that is the first responsibility preparation of financial statements that too as per applicable financial reporting framework number two they are also responsible for implementation of internal controls not just preparing financial statements management is also responsible for implementation of internal controls and to provide the auditor that means to provide the auditor to give the auditor with access to all information such as records documents and other matters so if auditor has to do the audit management is having responsibility to give him all records documents and various other matters whatever auditor requires and not just that additional information the management has given books of accounts to the auditor now if auditor needs any further explanation if the auditor needs any further clarification who is responsible to give that additional information once again management so management has to provide auditor with access to all information like records documents and other matters and also they should give the auditor additional information whatever auditor is asking in addition to that it is the responsibility of the management to provide the auditor with unrestricted access to persons within the entity if the auditor wants to question the employees in the organization it is the responsibility of the management to give access to the employees of the organization without any restriction clear so these are all the responsibilities of management in case if they ask you the question preconditions of audit responsibilities of management or even premise to audit for all these three things you are supposed to write the same answer very simple guys preparation of financial statements implementation of internal controls to give auditor three things all records documents additional information whatever auditor requires and also without any restriction giving access to the people within the entity so these three are uh, these three are uh, responsibilities of the management Sir, what happens if preconditions are not present, not present, if you are supposed to do the audit, but you came to know that in that audit, preconditions will not be there. That means management will not prepare financial statements, management will not prepare internal controls, management will not give auditor access to all the information. What you will do? Don't accept the audit only. So that's what they say. If the preconditions for an audit are not present, the auditor shall not accept the proposed audit engagement. If you came to know that preconditions are not there, that means you came to know that management will not prepare financial statements, management will not implement 
internal controls management will not give you access to the records management will not give you access to additional information they will not allow you to question to the employees of the organization what you will do i will say no sir i will not accept the audit clear so if preconditions are not present you are not supposed to accept the audit clear everybody so this is what relating to preconditions so we have seen essay 210 in that we have seen what are the contents of engagement letter and also we have seen preconditions for an audit now let us talk about few more things relating to engagement letter and terms of engagement there are few more concepts from essay 210 let us try to understand those also so now coming to the next concept yeah we will try to understand this question number 19 which is talking about a requirement of engagement letter in the case of recurring audits so first of all before we understand what are the circumstances in which we give engagement letter in the case of recurring audit first we have to understand what is the meaning of the recurring audit see on the basis of requirements of law we have divided audits into two categories statutory non-statutory now i am going to do one more classification for audit on the basis of person getting appointed as auditor so on the basis of person getting appointed as auditor audit can be divided into two categories number one initial audit engagement and number two recurring audit Sir, what is initial audit engagement? If I have to put it in simple terms, if the last year auditor and the current year auditor, both are two different persons. If the last, if the current year auditor is different from the last year's auditor, that we call it as initial audit engagement. Sir, then what is recurring audit? The name itself says, if the last year auditor is only appointed as current year auditor, if the last year auditor itself is appointed as current year's auditor, we call that assignment as recurring audit, as simple as that. That is last year auditor, current year auditor, both are same. Now, let us talk about requirement of engagement letter. In the case of initial audit engagement, do you think engagement letter is required? Yes, very much required. In the case of initial audit engagement, engagement letter is very much required. There is no doubt about it. But the question is, sir, in the case of recurring audit, is it required to give engagement letter year after year? Take for example, in the year 21-22, there is an auditor, Mr. A, he conducted audit of the client X Limited company audit he has done. Now for the next year 22-23 the same auditor has been appointed as company auditor for the same client same client same auditor same scope last year he would have given engagement letter do you think in the current year audit also he is compulsorily required to give the engagement letter once again the answer is no the standard did not make it compulsory SA 210 did not make it compulsory so what SA 210 has done is in case of recurring audit it has left it to the choice of the auditor let the auditor himself decide whether to give the engagement letter or not in the case of recurring audit there is no compulsion put by the standard the standard has simply left it to the choice of the auditor so if the auditor wants to give engagement letter in the case of recurring audit give it even if he, if he decides not to give the engagement letter then also fine standard is having no objection but what the standard has done is it has listed out a few circumstances in which even though it is a recurring audit still it is required to give engagement letter generally normal circumstances the standard has given the choice to the auditor in the case of recurring audit whether to give the engagement letter or not to give the engagement letter but the standard has identified few circumstances where even though it is a recurring audit it is highly advisable to give the engagement letter in some circumstances sir in which circumstances very simple if you apply the logic you will get it simply for example there is a change in the management of the client last year you did the audit of the same company but in the current year the management has changed it is advisable to give engagement letter once again or not yes or there is a change in the nature of the client's business there is an expansion of the client's business there is a change in ownership or new new applicable financial reporting framework has come into picture or there are some changes in the laws and regulations so if these kind of circumstances happen then even though if it is a recurring audit still it is highly advisable to give the engagement letter if these circumstances are not there even though it is a recurring engagement the auditor might not give engagement letter so logic is very simple the standard has given few circumstances if any of the circumstances the auditor comes across even though it is a recurring audit give the engagement letter if these circumstances are not there auditor may not give engagement letter not a compulsion so what are that circumstances so very simple indication that entity misunderstands objective and scope last year you have given engagement letter but in the current day you understood that the management has misunderstood the last year terms and conditions try to sort out that misunderstanding by giving once again a new engagement letter or any revised or special terms of the audit engagement audit engagement terms and conditions have changed then also give a new engagement letter or recent change in senior management the top level management of the client has undergone some changes significant change in ownership your client's ownership has changed or significant change in nature of size of nature and size of the client's business change in laws and regulations change in financial reporting framework 
or change in any other reporting requirements. So if any of these circumstances persist, then even though it is a recurring audit, still give engagement letter. If these circumstances are not there, then no need to give the engagement letter. Okay, right. So now we will try to understand two simple questions, conceptual questions. Question number 20. What if management imposes a limitation on scope prior to the audit engagement acceptance? So which means if I try to give it a scenario, what they are trying to ask you in the question. For example, you are a practicing chartered accountant. One day you are sitting in your office. The management of some client came, the board of directors of some company came to your office. They came to you and told, sir, you please do company audit for our client, for our company X Limited. You are a chartered accountant sitting in your office. The management of some X Limited came to your office and they're asking you, sir, you please do the company audit for us. You did not say yes yet. Before you accept the audit only, the client is putting restriction. The management is telling, sir, you do the company audit for us, but we will not give you any information regarding sales. Don't verify sales. You do the company audit for us. We will not give you information regarding fixed assets. You do the company audit for us, but we will not let you verify the inventory. So here the client is imposing a limitation even before you accept the audit. If you are in the auditor's chair in this situation, if you are in the auditor's chair, what you will do? What you will do? Simply I will ask the client to get lost. Simple no. If the client is putting a restriction on your work, even before you have accepted the audit, who will accept the audit? Don't accept the audit only. That's what you are supposed to do. Why? Because before accepting the audit only, if the client is putting a restriction, why are you supposed to accept it? Don't accept it. That's what even the standard has also told. But just they have put the common sense in a uh, sentence. So if we read the answer, if the management or those charged with guidance imposes a limitation on the scope of the auditor's work, or on the scope of the auditor's work, prior to accepting the audit, you did not say yes, then only management is coming and putting a restriction on you. Don't accept the audit at all. Simply don't accept the audit. Say no to the audit. Why you should accept the audit? If before accepting only, they are putting a restriction. Yes or no? Now, the next question is, sir, before accepting the audit, the client did not put any restriction. Before accepting the audit, the client did not put any restriction. But after I have accepted the audit, then the client is coming and putting the restriction on my work. See, if before accepting the audit only, they would have put a restriction. We would have said no to the audit. But the problem is when I was supposed to accept the audit, they did not put any restriction. They told, okay, sir, you do whatever you want. But after I have accepted the audit, then the client is coming and putting a restriction on my work. Then what I am supposed to do, sir? Then what I'm supposed to do in that case, SA 210 is giving some guidance that guidance I've actually summarized in the form of a chart. Let me try to present that chart before you for easy understanding and revision. Yeah, this one. So let me copy it here. Copy the page. Just a minute. Just a minute, guys. Yes, got it. See here. So what if client is asking for changes in the terms of engagement after accepting the audit? See, before accepting the audit, if the client is asking for the changes in the terms, we will simply don't accept. But when the problem arises is the client is coming to me asking me for the changes in the terms after I have accepted the audit. So you have said, yes, engagement letter is drafted. They have agreed, both of you signed. But later when you are actually started doing the audit, then the client is coming and asking you the changes in the terms. Then what you should do? The standard essay 210 says, if the client is asking you for changes in the terms after you have accepted the audit, first auditor shall understand the reasons. You have to understand why the client is now coming and asking you for the changes in the terms. So when you understand the reasons, two outcomes could be possible. Sometimes you might feel that the, the, the reason why the client is coming to me and asking for the changes, there is a valid reason for it. There is a reasonable justification. Like take for example, as an auditor, you wanted to verify inventory. You wanted to do the physical verification of the stock. The management told, sorry sir, we will not let you, do, we will not let you verify the inventory. Please take out inventory verification from your scope. So first I will ask the reason. I will ask the management, sir, what, because of what reason you are asking me not to uh, because of what reason you are asking me to take out inventory verification from my scope. Now the management will give some reasons. So you have to analyze, is there a valid justification? For example, management is telling, sir, at the time when we accepted the audit, the warehouse was in our control. But recently, the last two days ago, there was a case going on between us and GST department. GST department came and sealed that warehouse. That's why you can't verify the stock now. Valid justification? Yes. Why? Because if a seal has been imposed by the government, no one can break it. 
So the management is asking for changes in the terms. Is there a valid reason? Yes, there is a valid reason. So if there is a reasonable justification, what the standard is asking you to do is agree to the changes. If you find reasonable justification, agree to the changes. And if you have agreed to the changes, old engagement letter will no longer be valid. You have to draft a new engagement letter containing the revised terms and conditions. And also, when you give the final audit report, in that final audit report, you should not give any reference to old engagement letter and audit procedures which you have performed in the old engagement letter. That means your audit report should not contain any reference to previous engagement letter. Your audit report should contain reference only to the revised terms and conditions. Everybody, clear till here, simple till here. So if the client is asking you for changes in the terms after you have accepted the audit, we will try to understand reasons. If you find there is a reasonable justification, we can agree to the changes happily. But once you have agreed to the changes, old engagement letter becomes invalid. What you should do? Draft a new engagement letter. And in the audit report which you are giving, don't give reference to any old engagement letter. Understood? When the problem arises, there is no reasonable justification. The client is coming to me, asking me for the changes in the terms. When I ask them the reasons, they are not giving me reasons or they are giving reasons which are not at all valid. They are giving me all the bullshit reasons. In that case, what you will do? So if there is no reasonable justification, very simple, don't agree to the changes. Don't agree to the changes. Straight away say to the client, sir, you are not giving me a valid reason. I will not agree to the changes. I will do the audit as per original terms only. So first thing what you should do when there is no reasonable justification, do not agree to the changes. See, when you don't agree to the changes also, two things can happen. See, you are telling, I will not agree to the changes. In most of the cases, management will not mess with the auditor. They will say, okay, this fellow is not listening. Let him do the audit as per original terms only. You did not agree to the changes and management did not mess with you. Management permits the auditor to continue the audit as per original terms. They did not mess with you. They told, okay, sir, you don't agree to the changes. Okay, fine. You do the audit as per original terms only. Then what you will do? Don't do any issue. You continue the audit as per original terms. So you did not agree to the changes. Management did not create any scene there. They told, okay, this fellow is not listening. Whatever you want to do, you do. Then what you will do? Simply continue the audit. But when the problem will arise is, management is asking you for the changes in the terms. They did not show any reasonable justification. I do not agree to the changes. But here, the management is trying to create a scene here. I don't agree to the changes, but the management is not permitting me to continue the audit as per original terms. Like for example, I want to verify the stock. Management told no. I asked them reasons. They did not give valid justification. I told them, sir, I will not agree to it. I will, ha I will have to verify the warehouse. Now, in most of the cases, what management will do is, okay, they will say, okay, sir, if you are not listening, go and verify the stock. Well and good. Then I will continue the audit. But when the problem arises is, I told, no, boss, I have to verify the warehouse. Now, the management is telling, no, sir, you can't verify. We will not give you the key of the warehouse. Or we will deploy some people at the warehouse who will not permit you to go inside the warehouse. So, I am not agreeing to the changes in the terms, but the management is not permitting me to carry out the audit as per original terms. In that case, what the standard is suggesting you to do is withdraw from the audit. Resign from the audit. No longer continue the audit. Resign from the audit. So this is what you are supposed to do in case if the client is coming to you and asking you for the changes in the terms. Understood everybody? Very simple. So if the client is asking you for the changes in the terms, when after you have accepted the audit, before accept before accepting the audit only if they are putting limitation, we will not accept only. The actual problem arises when after we have accepted the audit, first understand reasons, reasonable justification, well and good, agree to the changes, draft new engagement letter, you should not give any reference to old engagement letter in your audit report. No reasonable justification, uh, don't agree. If you don't agree, management did not create a scene. They agree to continue the, they permit you to continue the audit as per original terms. Do the audit silently and come back. But if they are creating a scene, management is not permitting the auditor to continue the audit as per original terms, then what you should do? Withdraw from the audit engagement. So this is what you are supposed to do in case if the client is coming to you and asking you for the changes in the terms of audit engagement. Clear everybody? So there are few more questions. Let us try to quickly revise that few more questions and wind up the chapter nature, objective and scope of audit. So question number 23, very simple one. Who appoints an auditor? Also explain to whom the report is submitted. So two questions they are asking, generally who will make an appointment of auditor? Who will make an appointment of auditor guys? Generally the owners of the company will make an appointment. Take for example, if it is a sole proprietor, sole proprietor will appoint. If it is a partnership firm, partners will appoint. If it is a company, shareholders will appoint. Generally auditor will be appointed by owners. But in some extreme cases, even regulatory authorities, even government authorities also will make an appointment of auditor. Like take for example, in case of government companies, CNDG will make an appointment. CNDG is a government authority. In case of certain banks, RBI will involve in the appointment. 
So generally, who will make appointment? In 90% of the cases, owners, depending upon the entity's legal structure, owners will make an appointment of the auditor. But in some rare circumstances, the appointment of the auditor will be done by constitutional or government authorities. Like in the case of government companies, C and AG is going to make an appointment of auditor. Clear? Next one. Sir, to whom report is submitted? One half of the question we have answered. Who appoints the auditor? The next half of the question. Who, to whom report is submitted? Whoever appointed you to that people only will submit the report. The same thing they say. The outcome of audit is written audit report and the report is submitted to the persons whoever is making the appointment. So whoever has made the appointment to same persons you will submit your audit report also like in the case of companies we will submit to shareholders in the case of partnership firm we will submit it to partners in the case of a sole proprietorship firm we will submit it to the sole proprietor clear so this is what one simple question this is uh this was a question which is added in the new scheme this question was not there in the old scheme but once again a simple question so now let us try to begin our discussion with question number 24 sir what is question number 24 talking about very important question from the examination perspective please pay complete attention explain the meaning and elements of assurance engagement so in this particular question i am going to teach you i am going to explain you about what is the meaning of the term assurance engagement so little bit important discussion guys please pay attention so engagement means simply a kind of contract a promise a mutual promises we call it as engagement so this i've already told you when i was explaining you about this concept of engagement letter engagement means a mutual agreement a mutual contract that's what we are going to call it as engagement so now they are asking you what is the meaning of assurance engagement this i will try to explain it in a detailed manner please pay complete attention meaning of assurance engagement assurance engagement means an engagement in which a practitioner practitioner means professional so assurance engagement is an engagement in which a practitioner expresses a conclusion opinion or something or an uh, practitioner will try to give his conclusion which is designed to enhance degree of confidence of intended users assurance engagement is a kind of engagement in which as a practitioner i will express a conclusion and what is the purpose of my conclusion to enhance to increase the degree of confidence of intended users and those intended users are other than responsible party other than responsible party about the outcome or evaluation of a subject matter against criteria let us try to uh, point, uh, make a list here the important terms which we need to have a clarity in order to understand this assurance definition number one we need to know someone called practitioner listen carefully guys we need to call someone called practitioner and actually there are three parties in an assurance engagement there will be three parties number one practitioner then we have someone called responsible party we'll have someone called responsible party then we will have one more party called intended users intended users listen carefully very simple concept not at all complicated i will try to make it as simple as i can so in the assurance engagement three parties will be there number one practitioner sir what do you mean by practitioner practitioner means professional like you and me like for our example we will take a ca in practice a ca in practice for example so a practitioner will be there there will be another party called responsible party responsible party means a party which is having certain responsibilities relating to some activity a party which is having some responsibilities to fulfill then we have someone called intended users sir what is intended users ultimate users ultimate users of certain subject matter then this entire process will revolve through one subject matter there will be the main information regarding which all this verification and all is happening see they told as a practitioner you have to express conclusion about what you have to express conclusion there should be certain subject matter there should be certain subject matter and this subject matter is compared with some criteria whether the subject matter is as per certain criteria or not first responsible party will prepare the subject matter according to the criteria practitioner will verify the subject matter whether it is correctly as per criteria on that he will express a conclusion which will increase the confidence of intended users of the information confusing don't worry don't don't worry please listen carefully now let us try to understand this entire assurance engagement with the help of audit audit discussion we already had no let us try to understand what exactly happens in the audit see in the audit assignment what we do we chartered accountants we are practitioners in the audit assignment what we do we are chartered accountants in practice we are the practitioners so what is the definition of audit what we have understood audit audit is an independent examination of financial information audit is an independent examination of financial information so what is the entire subject matter of the audit what is the main aspect in the entire audit assignment financial information so in the audit assignment a practitioner is a chartered accountant in practice 
subject matter subject matter means around which matter the entire audit activity is happening what is audit all about audit is all about financial information so in an audit assignment subject matter is financial information responsible party who is responsible for preparation of financial information management who is responsible for preparation of financial statements management who are intended users who are the ultimate users of the financial statements shareholders can i say shareholders the ultimate users of the financial statements are shareholders and for preparation of this financial information for preparation of this subject matter will there be any criteria yes what is that criteria called as applicable financial reporting framework what is that criteria applicable financial reporting framework is a criteria so in the entire audit assignment what we do we as a practitioner we will try to express a conclusion nothing but we will try to express our opinion about what about the financial information yes or no this conclusion for what purpose to enhance to increase confidence of intended users to increase the confidence of shareholders and who are other than intended party sorry who are other than responsible party are we doing the audit for the purpose of management no we are doing the audit to increase the confidence of intended users who are shareholders and shareholders are other than management see are we doing audit to increase the confidence of the management or to increase the confidence of the shareholders we are doing the audit to increase the confidence of shareholders able to understand so and we are verifying whether this subject matter which is a financial information whether it is as per applicable financial reporting framework or not that is the criteria against which financial information should be prepared now can i say this audit assignment is falling under assurance assignment this audit assignment is falling under assurance engagement or not why because this is what assurance engagement definition we have read from the material what we have read assurance engagement definition so they told that assurance engagement means an engagement in which a practitioner expresses a conclusion designed to enhance the confidence of the intended users other than responsible party about the outcome or evaluation of a subject matter against this criteria so what is happening here this audit assignment whatever we are doing this is also falling under assurance engagement whatever audit assignment we are doing that is nothing but what assurance engagement now let me give one more example assume that there is certain company some company x limited it is going for public issue is going for public issue ipo they are going for ipo for the first time and the management of the entity prepared prospectus the management of the entity prepared prospectus now they asked certain chartered accountant to give a report whether the prospectus is completely as per the company's act and also whatever information that is stated in the prospectus whether it is correct or not this company this management of the company approached one chartered accountant and they asked him sir you please verify our prospectus and tell and give us a report that this prospectus is completely prepared as per companies act and all the information in the prospectus is correct or not so that whoever is applying for our ipo whoever wants to subscribe whoever wants to apply for our ipo their confidence will get increased now let us see what is happening here there is a practitioner here who is a practitioner chartered accountant being myself there is a responsible party who is responsible for preparation of the prospectus management who is the ultimate user of that prospectus the ultimate user will be those people who wants to apply for this ipo these are not currently shareholders these are prospective shareholders they want to become the shareholders of the company so prospective shareholders these are the people who are who want to apply for ipo so these are intended users these are intended users and in this <laughs> in this subject matter i am trying to verify being a practitioner a chartered accountant i am trying to verify subject matter what is the subject matter of this entire assignment prospectus what is the subject matter of this entire assignment prospectus so prospectus is what subject matter and this prospectus i want to check it against some criteria what is the criteria for this prospectus companies act 2013 that is a criteria so in this assignment in which a company asked me to give a or give a report on the prospectus what is actually happening i am a practitioner i am trying to express a conclusion to increase the confidence of intended users who are prospective shareholders who are other than responsible party management and in this assignment i am evaluating a subject matter against some criteria what is the criteria here the criteria is companies act 2013 understood can i call this as assurance assignment yes can i call this as assurance assignment yes can i call this as audit no this is not audit as i have told audit is also a kind of assurance assignment apart from audit there will be various kinds of assignments which will fall under assurance previous example whatever i have told that is falling under audit assignment also that is falling under assurance assignment also but audit is not the only assurance assignment the term assurance assignment is a very broader term even whatever example i have told the appointment of a chartered accountant to issue a report on the prospectus will this also fall under assurance assignment yes 
yes understood so if i draw something like this for example if this is entire assurance engagement so assurance engagements contain different activities like giving a tax report uh, calculations on tax report giving a report on prospectors giving a report on some gst calculations so like this assurance engagement is a very wider area which takes into accounts different kinds of activ activities in that one of the assurance engagement is audit also in that one of the assurance engagement is audit also so assurance engagement is a very wider term which involves a different kinds of activities in that one of the assignment is audit assignment also able to understand that's all this is what the meaning of assurance engagement and as a part of this explanation i have explained you the complete answer elements also have explained if you have a doubt you can check so this point we have read so a meaning of assurance engagement so what are the elements of assurance engagement as i have told in the assurance engagement there will be three parties who are the three parties in the assurance engagement a three party relationship involving a practitioner a responsible party and intended users as i have told in an assurance engagement there will always be three parties who are they a practitioner no, practitioner is a person who provides the assurance like in our example in audit example a chartered accountant in practice the term practitioner is broader than auditor see all all assurance assignments need not be done only by chartered accountant there will be various assignments in which other professionals also can be there for example if you take cost audit cost accountant will do but cost audit also will fall under assurance engagement only so when i say practitioner practitioner need not always be only a chartered accountant in practice so various other people also can give that report depending on circumstances so the term practitioner is broader than auditor audit is related to historical information whereas practitioner may provide assurance not necessarily related to historical financial information see this you will get clarity this sentence you leave it what is historical information what is not historical information the, this uh, better clarity you will get it when we reach the standards on auditing chapter so this point you keep it on hold this will be automatically covered in the standards on audit so three parties will be there number one practitioner number two responsible party is the party responsible for preparation of subject matter one more party will be intended users those who to whom the assurance report will be given who will be ultimately using that report that we call it as intended users so in the assurance engagement one number one element is there should be three party relationship next there should be certain subject matter that means entire assurance act, uh, assurance engagement will review around one subject matter in case of audit it is financial information in another case it is prospectus in some other case it is tax calculation so it refers to the information that has to be examined by the practitioner suitable criteria now for preparing that subject matter there will be certain criteria like for the purpose of financial statements it will be schedule 3 for the purpose of prospectus it will be companies act for the purpose of tax calculation it will be income tax act so like that for the preparation of that subject matter there will be certain suitable criteria so these refer to some benchmark benchmark means some rules some standards rules which are used to evaluate the subject matter like standards guidance laws rules and regulations and every time whenever we are doing assurance engagement for example if we have to express opinion in the case of audit we express opinion i might have told you in the inherent limitations of audit will we just like that express opinion or our opinion will be based on some evidence sufficient and appropriate audit evidence should be there similarly in one more assignment here auditor has to express his conclusion on prospectus now in that prospectus will he blindly give or will he try to obtain audit evidence he will try to obtain audit evidence don't read this paragraph now sufficient appropriate evidence this you will get better clarity in the chapter audit documentation and audit evidence trust me when you refer to the chapter audit documentation and evidence evidence whatever the terms which are used here what is sufficient what is appropriate what is the ultimate meaning of evidence everything will be automatically covered in audit documentation and evidence for the time being you just remember for doing assurance engagement we need evidence we need what evidence on the basis of evidence we will express a conclusion that you remember whatever extra co other content that has been given here that will be automatically covered in audit documentation and evidence chapter you keep it on hold next one finally whatever conclusion we are giving will we express that conclusion orally no we will always give that a uh, final conclusion in the form of a written report a written report will be given in the case of audit we give audit report in the case of prospectus there also will give some report in the case of verifying tax calculations there also we give certain kind of a report so there will be ultimate report So let us now let us now try to cover the last question from this chapter. Very simple question. So let me read and explain it. Briefly outline how principle based approach differ from rule based approach to ethics. Simple concept, guys. Let us not over complicate it. I will try to tell you in simple way and try to understand that much only. Don't go deeper into the details. See, as we all know, as an auditor, we are we are supposed to follow some ethics. Ethical requirements are there. Like I have told you, you should be independent. You should be objective. You should be having integrity. So, like this, as an auditor, we need to have some ethics. And there are numerous amount of ethics which we need to follow. More about that ethics, we will try to talk about at the CA final level. at the ca final level we have a dedicated chapter called professional ethics there we will try to understand in a detailed manner there are numerous ethics which we need to follow we will talk more about that ethics which you need to follow at the ca final level 
but when it comes to ethics there are two approaches which are there when uh, I, generally i say will give you the ethics I, I say will give you a list of ethics which you are required to follow and in giving that ethics in making the ethics mandatory for the auditor there could be two approaches one is principle based approach and the other one is rule based approach to the ethics when an institute or any other, in any other case if you have to follow some ethics ethics can uh, to make the ethics implemented there will be two approaches number one is either it could be principle based approach other one could be rule based approach so what is this principle based approach to ethics and what is this rule based approach to ethics let me try to explain it with one simple example see first i will talk about rule based uh, rule based approach so this i will try to explain it with the help of independence for example i told you that as an auditor you have to be independent as an auditor you have to be independent now sir how the auditor can be independent how he can make sure that he can be independent for example assume that if ICI is telling some four conditions this is just example guys this is just example don't take it as a literal thing from any act or so for the purpose of making you understand what is principle based approach what is rule based approach i'm trying to just give you one illustration assume that ICA or some act has told if you have to be independent you should avoid yourself from four kind of scenarios so I say is telling avoid four kind of scenarios to remain independent what are that four scenarios sir don't become auditor of a company in which you are having shares don't become auditor of a company in which you are having shares don't become auditor of a company to which you are indebted that means uh, you are you have taken some money from the company from that company uh, from that com you owe some amount to the company to that company you don't act as an auditor or if you have any given if you have given any guarantee to the company if you have any if you have given any guarantee to the company then also you don't accept the audit or if you have taken any loan if you have taken any loan then also don't conduct audit of that company so this is a rule based approach ICA is telling in order to be independent you have to follow these four rules you have to follow these four rules to remain independent this is a rule based approach that means the uh, some institute is giving a list of certain numbers for example 10 rules 15 rules if you have to be uh, you have to follow these 15 list of rules that is a rule based approach other one is principle based approach when i say principle based approach here there will not be any rules it all depends on professional judgment for example if i follow rule based approach what will happen is the ICI is prohibiting to act as an auditor if i am having four kind of relationships if i am having shares i should not accept if i am having debt i should uh, if i am indebted to the company i should not accept audit if I have given any guarantee, then I should not accept audit. If I have taken any loan, then also I should not accept audit. Now, if I follow strictly rule-based approach, I will say that, for example, I'm having debentures. I bought the debentures of the company. Now I will say, okay, ICA, in the rules, they are giving only four circumstances. They did not mention the debentures. That means if I have debentures, still I can accept as auditor. Still I can hold that position as auditor. This thing will happen when you follow rule-based approach. Why? Because ICA is giving you only four rules. This scenario, if I hold the debentures of the company, this is not covered in the rules. I will say, since this is not covered in the rule, I will accept the audit of that company. But if you follow principle-based approach, what will happen, you know? Here, there will not be any strict rules. It all depends on the professional judgment. So, in the principle-based approach, even in this case also, I will not accept audit. Why? Because the institute is telling me to be independent. Not just in these four circumstances, even if I subscribe for the debentures of the company, then also there is a possibility of my independence getting compromised. So, I will apply my professional judgment here and I will say, even if I hold the debentures also, still I am having some sort of relationship with the company. I might not act independently. My independence will be in danger. So, in this case also, I will not accept audit. That is a principle-based approach. That is a principle-based approach. That means where strict rules and regulations will not be given, it all depends on professional judgment, whether to follow that, whether to follow this or whether not to follow this, that all depends on the professional judgment. That is a principle-based approach. But when I say rule-based approach, here strict some set of rules and regulations will be given. Just follow that rules. If certain scenario is outside of that rules, there will be no problem. There will be no problem. I will tell you one simple thing. I will tell you one simple thing, guys. For example, I am teaching you class. There is a physical class. I am teaching some 100 students. I told my students, during the class, you should not talk. During the class, you should not talk. During the class, uh, no mobile phones. No calls are allowed. No texting is allowed. No texting is allowed. I gave you these three rules. Okay. So, in this case, you should not talk. You should not use mobile. You should not uh, do chatting. 
Now one person is coming to the class and he is sleeping. One person is coming to the class and he is sleeping. He is telling, I, when I asked him, boss, why are you coming to the class and sleeping? He is telling, sir, you gave me only three rules, no? You told me not to talk. You, know, you told me not to use the mobile. You told me not to do the chatting. I am not doing any of these three activities. I am doing sleeping. You did not tell me in the rules. This is a rule-based approach. On the other hand, if I come to the class and say, dear students, you have to pay complete focus and attention to my class. I did not tell you these rules. I told, I want complete focus and attention of you in my class. Then, if I go, if I find some student sleeping, if I go and question him, can he escape now? Can he say, sir, you did not uh, tell me not to sleep, so you could not punish me. Can he say that? No. Why? Because I told you well in advance, you have to pay complete focus and attention. In that case, sleeping also will come in losing the focus and attention. So, this is a principle-based approach. This is what? Principle-based approach. It depends on facts and circumstances. Here, whatever I told, this is rule-based approach. I told only three things. That means, student can do anything beyond that. But if I told, you have to pay complete focus and attention in the class. I don't want any kind of deviation. That is a principle-based approach. I am not giving you strict rules and regulations. I told you my objective. I want this thing to happen. So, all that things which is creating disturbance to that should be avoided. That is a principle-based approach. Understood? So, even in the ethics to be followed by the auditors also, there are two kinds of approach. One is principle-based approach. Other one is rule-based approach. In the rule-based approach, strict rules and regulations will be there which you have to follow. In case of principle-based approach, it all depends on professional judgment. Sir, which one auditors have to follow? What kind of approach ICI will take in implementing ethics? They use a combination. They will have principle-based approach also. They will have rule-based approach also. That means they have given certain rules. Along with that, they have given some scope for professional judgment also. They follow a combined approach for implementing ethics for the chartered accountants. Just this much you remember. So, with this, we are successfully done with revising the chapter Nature, Objective and Scope of Audit. So, since we are done with revising the chapter Nature, Objective and Scope of Audit, the next chapter which we are going to take up for revision is going to be Audit Reporting Chapter, one of the most important chapter from the examination perspective. The weightage also will be very high when you look from uh, exams or uh, even in the previous attempts also they have asked a lot of questions from this particular chapter audit reporting and one more good thing about this chapter is it's going to be very very practical it's not just going to be completely theoretical it is very practical chapter so it will help you even in the examinations and it is going to help you out even after your examination like especially when you practically start doing the audit then this chapter will even help you at that point of time see earlier uh, if you are a person, if you are a student who has already given your attempt under old scheme, there used to be a chapter called company audit earlier. It was CA inter level, there used to be a chapter company audit, but under new scheme, under audit, they have removed this company audit chapter. But this company audit chapter is still there in your law paper. In your CA inter law, the company audit chapter is still there. But from audit, it has been excluded. So why I am telling you this is, even though the chapter company audit has been removed, even though the chapter company audit has been removed from audit, but it is still continuing in the law paper, there might be some interconnected questions with relating to company audit uh, related chapter in the auditing paper. So even though officially they have removed this company audit chapter from audit, it's still there in your law paper. So they might ask some interconnected questions relating to company audit chapter in the subject auditing and ethics so my suggestion will be it will be better if you watch the revision video relating to company audit so you will you need not go anywhere else to find that revision video of the company audit chapter in my youtube channel itself you will be able to find a chapter uh, a dedicated video revising the important provisions or relating to company audit please do watch that also once because i don't want you to take the chance if they ask you any interconnected questions relating to company audit you should be in a position to answer it so that's why i will even add the link in the description of this video where you will be able to access that company audit related uh, revision video which i have uploaded long ago so that you watch it once before you go for examination to be on a safer side to be able to answer the question in case if any interconnected questions gets tested
clear right so having said that now i am coming to the topic now we will start revising the content of the chapter audit reporting sir what exactly we are going to revise in this chapter what exactly we are going to learn in this chapter see as we all know the auditor's ultimate objective is to express the opinion and when i say auditor has to express the opinion i have told you multiple times the auditor will not just uh, come and uh, say his opinion orally so auditor will express his opinion in the form of a written document that written document which contains the auditor's opinion that we are going to call it as audit report so when i say audit report it is nothing but a written document through which auditor is going to express the opinion so how to prepare the audit report so can every auditor prepare the audit report as per his own wish no even for preparation of audit report also there are guidelines there is specific format there are specific rules and regulations there are specific contents which must be included in your audit report sir what is providing all that guidance the guidance is provided by standards on audit so in fact practically speaking there are four standards under ss 700 series which are ss 700 ss 701 705 and 706 so these four standards from sa 700 series is going to talk about how to prepare the audit report what should be the format of the audit report what should be the contents of the audit report so what content has to be there so everything has been included in this four standards of 700 series which are 700 701 705 and 706 so when i say i am going to teach you this chapter audit reporting i am simply trying to teach you the content of four standards which is sa 700 701 705 and 706 i am simply trying to teach you the content of these four standards clear everybody so apart from that there are a few reporting requirements under 143 subsection 1 in addition to that uh, four standards there are certain provisions of the company's act also which are putting some reporting requirements on the auditor so the three sections are 143 subsection 1 143 subsection 3 and 143 subsection 11 so like this we have uh, somewhere around three sections under which there are various reporting requirements imposed on the auditor of a company even we are going to cover these three uh, the, the, even though we are even we are going to cover the reporting requirements under these three sections of the company's act also so that is what the complete perspective of this chapter that is what we are exactly going to discuss in this chapter so having told what exactly we are going to cover now let me directly come to the concepts so first i will be starting with sa 700 first we will be revising the content with sa 700 sir what is sa 700 talking about so if you see the title of sa 700 the atla the title of sa 700 is forming an opinion and reporting on financial statements so that means SA 700 is going to guide the auditor how to form an opinion. Sir, how we will form the opinion? On the basis of whatever audit evidence we have, on the basis of that, how the auditor should form an opinion. And once the auditor has formed that opinion, the opinion should not be kept to the auditor himself. That should be expressed. Sir, how the opinion should be expressed? In the form of a written report. Sir, what do we call that written report as audit report? So, which means SA 700 is going to give the enough of guidance required for the aud required for the auditor how to form an opinion and how to express that opinion in the form of audit report. If I put it in simple terms, SA 700 is going to tell you the entire format of the audit report, how your audit report should be, what format you have to prepare the audit report. So, simply SA 700 is going to tell you about the overall format of the audit report. So there is a lot of content here regarding uh, audit uh, in SA 700. I will ignore all that. First, we will come to the main topic. We will talk about what should be the contents of the audit report. What exactly the contents of the audit report should be. What paragraph should be there. In that paragraph, what content should be there. That we will focus first. So the following shall be the contents of the audit report. That means auditor's report should contain the following contents. What are they? Number one, there should be title. Sir, what is title, sir? Nothing but there should be an appropriate heading. See, we will do one thing. We'll try to understand the concept from here. At the same time, we will try to simultaneously see the practicality also. Practicality also. I will take the help of one practical report to make you understand this concept of audit report. Okay. So first content of the audit report, there should be appropriate heading, title an appropriate title should be there an appropriate heading should be given so in the case of normal company statutory audit the heading will be independent auditors report so as you could see here there is an independent auditors report title has been given so first audit report uh, first content of the audit report is what title there should be appropriate heading given second content of the auditors report once you have given the title the second content should be addressing see when i say audit report audit report is nothing but a letter through which auditor is expressing the opinion See, to whom you are expressing the opinion, there should be certain addressee, no? For example, if you are drafting any letter, there should be certain addressee. Sir, who should be the addressee in the auditor's report? 
it depends on the legal form if you are conducting audit of a company the address will be shareholders if you are conducting audit of a partnership firm the address will be partners if you are conducting audit of a sole proprietor the address will be the concerned proprietor so depending upon the legal form of the client you are doing the audit appropriate address should be given so in the case of company generally the address will be shareholder so if you see your reliance Industries limited audit report first they have given title then they are including the address to whom the audit report is getting addressed to to the members to the shareholders of the reliance Industries is limited clear so first we will give title second we will give addressy now the third and most important content we are supposed to give opinion what we are supposed to do we are supposed to give opinion so why because see the ultimately we are preparing audit report what is the ultimate objective of preparing audit report to express our opinion so that's why what the standard is also telling first you tell the title then you tell the address then directly come to the point then first give the opinion why because the ultimate purpose of giving the audit report is to express the opinion only apart from that lot of content is there apart from opinion whatever you want to say say it later but the main purpose of the audit report is going to be expression of opinion so first come to the point tell your opinion first come to the point and tell your opinion now so now we will uh, try to elaborate on this opinions now we will try to elaborate on this opinions in a detailed manner sir opinion of the auditor can be broadly divided into two categories see this point we have already seen i told at the beginning in the introduction to audit chapter i told that any opinion not just audit you take any other opinion regarding anything regarding any object any person opinion can be of two types only so the two types of opinion are i told simply a positive opinion and a negative opinion yes or no opinion will be of broadly two categories positive opinion or negative opinion but this is a layman terminology this is a what layman terminology even audit opinion also will be of two categories either a positive opinion or a negative opinion like as I, like as i have told at the beginning in the introduction to audit chapter if the auditor is satisfied that financial statements do not contain misstatement if the auditor is satisfied they are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework if the auditor is satisfied that the financial statements are not misleading they portray the correct information so if the auditor is if the auditor is satisfied with all these things then he will give something called positive opinion he will say financial statements are giving true and fair view however if the auditor is not satisfied with the true and fair view of the financial statements then he will give negative opinion but this positive opinion negative opinion is a very layman terminology we use it that terms because at that point of time we are not so comfortable with the concepts of the audit but now since we have got enough of exposure in the audit now we will introduce uh, now i will introduce you to the technical terms so opinion of the auditor will be broadly divided into two categories number one is unmodified opinion and the other one is modified opinion the opinion of the auditor can be broadly divided into two categories what are they number one is unmodified opinion and the other one is modified opinion unmodified opinion is nothing but till now whatever we are calling it as a positive opinion modified opinion is nothing but till now whatever we are calling it as a negative opinion sir when the auditor will give unmodified opinion simple guys we already know when the auditor is satisfied that financial statements are free from material misstatements when the auditor is satisfied that the financial statements are free from material misstatements and also the auditor is satisfied that financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework so when the auditor has performed audit procedures obtained audit evidence and he has satisfied that financial statements are free from material misstatements and the financial statements are also prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework when the auditor is satisfied with these two things he will give a opinion called unmodified opinion and there are other names for unmodified opinion also we even call it as unqualified opinion we also call it as clean opinion these are all other names for unmod uh, other names for unmodified opinion first let us try to understand what is the logic for this name unmodified opinion why the name unmodified opinion very simple financial statements will be prepared by whom management so auditor what he will do he will verify the financial statements so auditor has verified the financial statements which are prepared by the management and he is satisfied with them and he is telling that there is no modification required in the financial statements they are giving true and fair view only able to understand so that's why the name unmodified opinion so how this term unmodified opinion has been derived because auditor is verifying financial statements which are prepared by the management and he is satisfied that there is no modification required the financial statements are already giving true and fair view they doesn't require any modification so that's why the name unmodified opinion or unqualified or clean opinion now the standard says as an auditor if you give unmodified opinion you have to use specific terminology 
in the opinion section of the paragraph if you are giving in case if you are giving unmodified opinion in the opinion section of the paragraph you have to use certain terminology sir what terminology i have to use the standard says in case if you are giving unmodified opinion you have to use the phrases either financial statements give true and fair view either you have to use this phrase or you have to use the phrase financial statements present fairly in all material respects so any one of these two phases you have to use either the financial statements give true and fair view or you have to use the phrase financial statements present fairly in all material respects either of these two phrases you should use apart from that you are not given a choice to use any other term other terminology you are not given here the opportunity to present your communication skills so simply if you have if you want to give unmodified opinion you have to use one of these two phrases either use the phrase financial statements give true and fair view or alternatively you can use the phrase financial statements present fairly in all material respects either one of these two phases uh, two phrases you have to use like if you see the reliance industries limited audit report so as we have seen the contents from ss 700 first the title is there then address is there then comes the opinion paragraph in the opinion paragraph lot of things are there if you see here in the opinion paragraph always there will be two paragraphs first paragraph i will talk about it later in the second paragraph the auditor will mainly try to express his opinion so if we if i take you through certain content they say that the auditor of reliance company say the financial statements give a true and a fair view so auditors of reliance industries limited are telling the financial statements give what true and fair view that means what kind of opinion it is unmodified so if you see the entire opinion you will not you will not be able to find a term called unmodified but how come we are telling this is unmodified opinion by the usage of the terms because auditor has told in the opinion paragraph financial statements give true and fair view by that we have identified this is a unmodified opinion clear everybody so this is what regarding unmodified opinion understood everybody clear till here so we have understood one category of opinion now we have to understand there is one more category of opinion which is modified opinion see when the auditor is fully satisfied with the true and fair view then the auditor will give unmodified then not then when auditor will give modified opinion when auditor is having some remarks when the auditor finds that financial statements do not give a true and fair view when the auditor finds that financial statements are misleading they are not portraying the correct information so when the auditor is having some objection some remarks regarding the financial statements which are prepared by the management then he will give something called modified opinion then he will give something called modified opinion so we'll come to the technical definition of the term modified opinion later first we will try to understand different types of modified opinion so actually there are three different types of modified opinion which are number one qualified opinion number two adverse opinion and number three disclaimer of opinion so all the three are negative opinions only when i say modified it is a negative opinion and that modification of the opinion can be done in three ways that means you can modify your opinion in three ways or if i put it in other way around there are three types of modified opinion sir what are that three types of modified opinion either it could be a qualified opinion or it could be an adverse opinion or it could be a disclaimer of opinion so first let us try to understand when the auditor will give qualified opinion when the auditor will give adverse opinion when the auditor will give disclaimer of opinion this we will try to understand so when the auditor is going to give qualified when he will give adverse when he will give disclaimer this we will try to first understand it so uh, for that i have summarized the content in the form of a chart let me use that chart here yes so this chart i have mm. i will do one thing i will copy this here we'll use the same chart here okay right so we have here so auditor can give modified opinion if he is not satisfied with the true and fair view that modified opinion can be given in three categories either qualified adverse or disclaimer so let us now try to understand when the auditor will give qualified opinion when the auditor will give adverse opinion when the auditor will give disclaimer of opinion okay so this we will try to understand with the help of some simple simple examples see qualified opinion can be given in two cases qualified opinion can be given in how many cases qualified opinion can be given in two cases first case auditor has obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and on the basis of that evidence auditor concluded that there is a misstatement in the financial statements and the misstatement is material but not pervasive case one when auditor will give qualified opinion is auditor has obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence 
on the basis of that evidence auditor concluded that financial statements contain a misstatement and the misstatement is material but not pervasive sir what is this what they are trying to say this i will try to explain it once again with the help of example assume that there is a balance sheet of certain company so there are fixed assets worth 100 crore rupees under current assets you have inventory 70 you have cash and cash equivalents 30 and you have uh, trade receivables some 20 so total of the assets side which is going to be 220 crores similarly liabilities also will be there you have equity share capital you have share capital 100 reserves and surpluses 50 long term borrowings 50 short term borrowing 70 so like this you have a copy of the balance sheet before you now you are conducting audit of this entity you verified fixed assets no misstatement you are able to find you verified inventory no misstatement you are able to find you verified cash and cash equivalents no misstatement so all items of the financial statements you are not able to find any misstatement but in the trade receivable you have performed audit procedures you obtain audit evidence that in the trade receivables there is some two crores worth of misstatement you have performed audit procedures in the area of trade receivables you obtained audit evidence and on that basis of audit evidence you concluded that the, there is a misstatement of 2 crore rupees in the financial statements so you have obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence on the basis of that you have concluded that financial statements contain a misstatement the impact of that misstatement is material but do you think this misstatement is so big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong agreed 2 crores is material but do you think is it suitable is the misstatement so big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong no so if the misstatement is so big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong then we call it as pervasive but in the given case there is a misstatement that misstatement is material but that is not big enough to say complete financial statements are wrong that means in the given case misstatement is material but not pervasive agreed it is material but it is not so big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong so in this case what auditor will do qualified opinion he will give so that is what case one so auditor has per performed audit procedures obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and on the basis of that evidence he concluded that financial statements contain a misstatement which is material but not pervasive not so big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong in that case what auditor will do he will give qualified opinion he will give which opinion qualified opinion sir how to identify qualified opinion see in this case itself what auditor will say is he will say except except trade receivable which contain a misstatement of two crore rupees financial statements give true and fair view that means he is not giving completely positive opinion he is not telling financial statements give a true and fair view at the same time he is also not telling completely negative he is not even telling financial statements are completely wrong he is giving a positive opinion with a slight negative remark so the misstatement is not so big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong so that's why what auditor is telling is okay financial statements give true and fair view but there is one light negative remark what slight negative remark is there trade receivables contain a misstatement of two crores apart from that financial statements give true and fair view so whenever you find this kind of terminology which kind of terminology except or subject to do certain items financial statements give true and fair view the moment you find this terminology that opinion is a which opinion qualified opinion that opinion is a which opinion qualified opinion understood so this is one case in which we give qualified opinion there is also one more case in which we will give qualified opinion what is one more case as an auditor you are unable to perform audit procedures and you are unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence the possible effect of that undetected misstatement could be material but not pervasive sir what is this this also let me try to explain so what i will do is i will take the help of this same uh, example for reason can we uh that will help me out i don't want to draw this again and again so i'm telling you one more case where auditor will give qualified opinion so take for example once again i am conducting audit of this entity so here i will tell you my observations see i performed audit i am able to obtain audit evidence regarding fixed assets everything is okay i am able to obtain evidence regarding inventory that is also okay cash and cash equivalents also okay all other items are fine but in this trade receivables in the trade receivables also there is some 5 crores worth of one debtor is there there is one debtor who owes 5 crore rupees to my client company from this data i am unable to obtain evidence he is not giving me external confirmation i tried to call him i tried to reach out to him i am unable to get the evidence regarding this 5 crore rupees so in this case i am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence regarding a item of the financial statement 
am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence regarding the item of financial statement. Assuming that this 5 crores I am unable to obtain audit evidence, assume this entire 5 crores has gone wrong. If I assume even this entire 5 crore goes wrong, what will be the possible effect? What will be the possible effect? Why I am using the term possible? Because I am just assuming I am unable to get this evidence of 5 crores. Whether this 5 crores is correct or not, I am unable to get the evidence. Since I am unable to get the evidence, I am assuming even if this 5 crores goes wrong because of which I am unable to obtain evidence, what will be the impact? The impact is material. But is it so big enough to say complete financial statements are wrong? No. That means I am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. But the possible effect of undetected misstatement is material but not pervasive. The possible effect of that undetected misstatement is material but not pervasive. That means the item regarding which I am unable to get the evidence, even if that goes wrong, the possible effect is material only. It is not so big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong. See, I am telling you simple meaning. Pervasive means a so big misstatement which is, say, uh, which is big enough to say financial statements are wrong. But there is actually a technical definition given to the term pervasive. Once I complete the different types of modified opinion, we even we will try to revise what is the meaning of pervasive also. Technical definition also we will understand. But for the time being now, just remember pervasive as a misstatement which is so big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong. So in this case, I am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. The possible effect is material but not pervasive. So what I will say is, I will say except or subject to certain item which is trade receivable regarding which I am unable to obtain evidence for 5 crore rupees, the rest of the financial statements give true and fair view. So this is also a qualified opinion. Why? Because the terminology used is except or subject to certain items, financial statements give true and fair view. So the point which I want to conclude here is qualified opinion will be given in two circumstances. Case 1, auditor has obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and on the basis of that evidence he concluded financial statements contain a misstatement. The effect of that misstatement is material but it is not pervasive. Auditor will give qualified. One more case in which auditor will give qualified opinion. Auditor is unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. The possible effect of that undetected misstatement is material but not pervasive. Then auditor will give qualified. And when the auditor is giving qualified opinion, the terminology which he will use will be except or subject to certain items. That means except one or two items, financial statements give true and fair view. If you pay close attention, that is also a negative opinion only. It is not completely positive opinion. It is a slight negative remark is there. Clear? Now, coming to adverse opinion. Sir, in which case adverse opinion will be given? Adverse opinion will be given only in one case. Sir, what is that one case? Auditor has obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. And on the basis of that evidence, auditor concluded that financial statements contain a misstatement, which is not just a material, which is material and also pervasive. So if I try to ex explain this with the help of same example, so once again, I'm taking this uh, financial statements. See, so assume that I'm conducting audit of this entity. I'm, I found some misstatement in the fixed assets. I found some misstatement in the inventory. I found some misstatement in the cash and cash equivalents. I found some misstatement in the trade receivables. So that means I performed audit procedures. I obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. On the basis of that, I found that there is a misstatement. The misstatement is not just material. Here the misstatements are big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong. See, in this case, I will not say except fixed assets, except inventory, except cash and cash equivalents, except trade receivables, financial statements give true and fair view. It is not fair. What I will say directly, financial statements do not give true and fair view. Don't believe financial statements, they are completely wrong. So that kind of opinion, we call it as adverse opinion. Sir, when we will give adverse opinion, when we have performed audit procedures, obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence on the basis of that we concluded financial statements contain a misstatement the effect of that misstatement is not just material it is pervasive it is big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong so such a kind of in such case i will give what opinion adverse opinion i am going to give the same thing we have told even in the chart also so auditor has obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and on the basis of that he concluded financial statements contain a misstatement the effect of that misstatement is not just a material it is also pervasive sir what kind of terminology we will use in that case we will use a terminology we will directly say in our opinion paragraph financial statements do not give true and fair view will directly say what financial statements do not give true and fair view i will show you a few examples of the same uh, so just give me a minute so i should have something here not this one okay 
Mm. So there should be some report along with me where uh, where I wanted to show that to you. Okay. So I think this is the one. So I will show you example of qualified opinion. So I will show you example of qualified opinion. So if you see here in the qualified op in the opinion paragraph, see what the auditors are telling. Except for certain matters, the financial statements give true and fair view. This is a qualified opinion. See, if it is an adverse opinion, what auditor will say? You know, if if it is an adverse opinion, the auditor will say directly here the financial statements do not give true and fair view. That is extremely negative opinion, completely negative opinion. Able to understand everybody. So that's what uh, we are trying to say here. So adverse opinion will be given in one case. What is that case? Auditor has performed audit procedures. He has obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. And uh, on, the, on the basis of that evidence, he concluded financial statement contained a misstatement. And the effect of that misstatement is not just a material. It is also pervasive. Sir, what kind of terminology auditor will use in that case? He will use a terminology financial statements do not give true and fair view. Completely negative opinion. Extremely negative opinion. Adverse something which is completely negative. Now we have one more kind of qualified opinion which is a disclaimer. Sir, when disclaimer of opinion will be given? So disclaimer of opinion will be given when I am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and the possible effect of undetected misstatement is material and also pervasive sir what is this let me once again take some example let me once again take some simple example the same example we'll try to use here so take for example i'm conducting audit of this balance sheet i'm unable to obtain audit evidence regarding fixed assets i'm unable to obtain audit evidence regarding inventory i'm unable to obtain audit evidence regarding reserves and surpluses i'm unable to obtain audit evidence regarding short-term borrowings so now i am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence the possible effect that means the items regarding which i am unable to obtain evidence if they go wrong even if they go wrong the possible effect is not just a material it is pervasive it is not just a material it is big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong so in this case what i will say is i will say i am unable to express the opinion i am unable to express the opinion because i am unable to obtain audit evidence i will not say accept fixed assets accept inventory accept trade receivable financial statements give true and fair view no i will directly say here i am unable to obtain audit evidence i am unable to perform audit procedures so that's why i will not i am not in a position to express the opinion the moment you find this terminology we are unable to express the opinion in the opinion paragraph that opinion is nothing but what disclaimer of opinion so that's what they say in the case of disclaimer of opinion so disclaimer of opinion will be given one in one circumstance when you don't have sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and the possible effect of that undetected misstatement is material and also pervasive then we will give disclaimer and when we give disclaimer of opinion on the terminology which we use in our audit report will be we do not express an opinion on the financial statements so final summary here guys the auditor can give modified opinion in three ways or there are three types of modified opinion number one is qualified number two is adverse number two is disclaimer qualified opinion in how many circumstances two circumstances whether we have evidence or we don't have evidence but the effect of but the effect or possible effect of the misstatement is material only but it is not pervasive Adverse opinion, we will give in only one circumstance. See, when we give adverse opinion, what we say, financial statements do not give true and fair view. We are directly telling financial statements are completely wrong. When you will say financial statements are completely wrong, when you know something, when you know something, when you have some evidence, then only you can say completely it is wrong. So adverse opinion we will give when we have sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. On the basis of that, we found misstatements and we came to know that misstatements are not just a material, they are pervasive also. They are big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong. Then we will say financial statements do not give true and fair view, don't believe them. Then disclaimer. Disclaimer, the name itself is a disclaimer, stopping yourself. Disclaimer of opinion, stopping yourself from expression of opinion. So in the disclaimer of opinion, we will say we are unable to express the opinion. When we will say we are unable to express the opinion, when we don't have sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and the possible effect of that undetected misstatements is not just going to be material, it is even pervasive. Then we will give disclaimer. We will say in that case, we are unable to express the opinion. We are not able to express the opinion because we are unable to obtain the sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Clear everybody? See here, most of the students will do one mistake. The moment they come across the term, the auditor is unable to express the opinion, they will immediately jump to the conclusion disclaimer. This is what uh, most of the students will do the mistake here. Please pay attention carefully. Don't uh, you don't be that student who does that mistake. So when most uh, when students see the term auditor is unable to obtain audit evidence, they will immediately jump to the conclusion disclaimer. But wait, guys, 
when the auditor is unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence, there is also an option of qualified opinion. So don't immediately jump to the conclusion. When you find auditor is unable to obtain audit evidence, don't immediately jump to the conclusion disclaimer. Why? Because when the auditor is unable to obtain audit evidence, there is one more option also possible when the possible effect of the misstatement is uh, just a material but not pervasive. In that case, auditor can give qualified also. Disclaimer will be given only when we are unable to obtain audit evidence and the possible effect of that misstatement is material as well as pervasive. Then only disclaimer. Okay, so don't do this mistake. So this mistake you will do in the case of mainly standards related questions. This point I will link it once again when I take up the chapter standards on auditing for revision. So till here, everybody comfortable? So we have seen different kinds of opinion. So broadly opinions are of two types, unmodified, modified. And the modified opinion itself is of three categories, qualified, adverse, disclaimer understood now one more important thing which we have to which we have to know which we have to remember most important from the examination perspective is the definition of the term pervasive the definition of the term pervasive so this term pervasive has been repeatedly tested the definition of this term pervasive has been repeatedly tested see i told you simple meaning a misstatement will be called as pervasive if it is so big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong so this is what I have told. If the financial statements are completely wrong, then we call that misstatements as pervasive. This is simple meaning. But as we know, simple things don't work in the examination. There is one complicated definition for the term pervasive. But ultimately, the conclusion is those misstatements which are so big enough to say entire financial statements are wrong, that we call it as pervasive. But this definition only, they try to complicate it. So what is the definition? Actual definition, textbook definition given for, given for the term pervasive. So that definition is very important. That's why I'm stressing a lot on this. So when we say a misstatement is pervasive, they say that a misstatement will be called as pervasive if it is not confined to specific elements, accounts or items of the financial statements. If the misstatement is not restricted to just one or two items of the financial statements, if the misstatement is spread across so many items, then we call it as misstatement. Clear? This we all know it. Uh, this that is what even I have used in the example. If the misstatement is not just restricted to one item, if it is spread across so many items, in so many items there is a misstatement, then we can call it as pervasive. Or even though it is confined, sometimes a misstatement will be confined to only one item, but it could represent a substantial portion of the financial statements. If I give you an example for this, take for example, in this case only, in this case of uh, financial statements only see all items are not containing any material misstatement except the fixed assets in the fixed assets alone there is a misstatement and the amount of the misstatement is 70 crore rupees so here misstatement is confined to only one item but that misstatement is representing a substantial portion a major portion of the financial statements then also we call it as pervasive so number one if the misstatement is not confined to one or two items it is spread across so many items then we call it as pervasive sometimes a misstatement will be restricted to only one item but it could represent a substantial portion of the financial statements. Then also we call it as pervasive. Or if the management has made a mistake in relation to such disclosures, which are fundamental to users understanding of the financial statements. If the management has made a mistake in those disclosures, which are fundamental to users understanding, like management has given a wrong disclosure regarding going concern. Going concern is very fundamental to users understanding. If the management gives a misstatement, if the management gives a wrong disclosure regarding going concern only, then also we call it as pervasive. So very, very important. This could be asked as a true or false statement. This could be asked as a MCQ. This could be even asked as a descriptive question also. So when we call a misstatement as pervasive, number one, if it is not confined to specific elements or items of the financial statements. Number two, even though it is confined, it is representing a substantial portion of the financial statements. Number three, the management has made this mistake in those disclosures which are fundamental to users understanding of the financial statements. Till here, everybody comfortable? See, till now, whatever I have explained, like different types of modified opinion, like qualified, adverse, disclaimer, what is the meaning of pervasive, whatever we have discussed till now, different types of modified opinion, that entire content has been taken from SA 705. So when I taught you different kinds of modified opinion, when qualified, when adverse, when disclaimer, this is nothing but I have taken you through the content from SA 705. In fact, we have discussed till now the content of SA 705. Clear everybody, able to understand. So why we discussed about opinions guys? From where we have come to, from where we have come till here. So in fact, we are actually trying to discuss about the contents of the audit report. In that contents of the audit report, we have seen there is a content called title. There is a content called addressee. Then the main content will be opinion. So that's why we have understood what are different kinds of opinion. But the standard says that in the opinion paragraph, you will tell your opinion. 
but in addition to your opinion you also should include certain important things in your opinion paragraph so what they are trying to say here is see if this is the opinion paragraph in the opinion itself two two paragraphs will be there so in the second paragraph you will express the opinion along with expression of opinion you are also required to state certain mandatory things in your opinion paragraph you will, you will tell your opinion that is here in addition to your main opinion you should also add certain important things in your opinion paragraph sir in addition to my opinion what things i have to add in my opinion paragraph so here they give so the first section of the audit report shall include the auditor's opinion under the heading opinion and in that opinion section you have to include certain things what are they identify the entity whose financial statements you have audited that means tell the fact that oh uh, sorry tell the name of the entity whose financial statements you have audited number two state the fact that you have out you have audited the financial statements you have to add one statement that you audited the financial statements number three identify the title of each of the items of the financial statements describe the title of items of the financial statements like it includes a balance sheet p and statement of p and l state uh, statement of cash flow statement of changes in equity etc give a reference to notes including summary of significant accounting policies even you should include in the opinion paragraph that financial statements includes notes also which include summary of significant accounting policies and then finally specify the date and period covered by financial statements so you will give your opinion but along with your opinion these are four th these are five things also must be included in the opinion paragraph so if you see here you will be able to find it so if you read it we have audited the accompanying standalone financial statements of reliance industries limited two points are covered they have told the name of the entity and also they have told fact that financial statements have been audited next which comprises balance sheet statement of p and l statement of other comprehensive income cash flow statement nothing but items of the financial statements a description they have given which includes notes and summary of significant accounting policies they gave a reference to the notes and significant accounting policies and finally date and period covered by financial statements see here date and period also they have given clear so you will give opinion but in addition to the opinion these five things also must be mentioned in your opinion paragraph so that is what regarding opinion so three contents we are done with title address the opinion and the opinion related discussion whatever we had it till now that is going to be damn important very repeatedly asked in the examination clear so now let us proceed ahead and try to understand the remaining contents of the auditor's report so after the opinion paragraph the next content which we have to include in our audit report is basis for opinion paragraph sir what will be included in this basis for opinion paragraph very simple guys see i have told just in the immediately previous paragraph we are telling our opinion that means what opinion we are going we are giving like either we are giving unmodified qualified adverse disclaimer so what opinion we are giving that opinion we actually express it in the opinion paragraph but why anybody should believe your opinion you are giving opinion okay but why anybody should believe your opinion any stakeholder why he should believe your opinion so if you let them know on what basis you have given your opinion then that then the person whoever is reading that audit report he will have confidence on that audit report and he will believe it so if you don't let them know what is the basis for your opinion no one is going to believe it so that's why immediately after giving the opinion paragraph the next content which we have to add in our uh, audit report is we have to include a paragraph with the heading basis for opinion sir what should be stated in the basis for opinion paragraph what i have to mention in the basis for opinion paragraph so if you see here sa 700 says in the basis for opinion paragraph you have to mention four things in the basis for opinion paragraph you have to state four things sir what are the four things which i am required to state in basis for opinion paragraph number one you have to say that you have done the audit as per standards on auditing you have to let the users know that you are doing the audit not as per your own choices you have done the audit actually by following the standards on audit and you had we have to also give reference to auditors responsibilities paragraph we have to let the shareholder know we have so many responsibilities to fulfill and those responsibilities are actually given in a separate paragraph with the heading auditor responsibilities like if you have a look at the contents see in the content you will be able to find one paragraph called auditors responsibilities now what they are asking you to do is in the basis for opinion paragraph you include a reference to the auditors responsibilities paragraph that means in the basis for opinion paragraph you let them know boss apart from expressing the opinion we have so many responsibilities and all of that responsibilities we have given it in a separate paragraph called auditors responsibility please refer that auditors responsibility paragraph that reference also should be given where in the basis for opinion paragraph third one you have to mention in the basis for opinion paragraph that you are independent of the entity and you have complied with ethical requirements ethical requirements we have seen in the nature objective and scope chapter so integrity objectivity compete uh, professional competence and due care confidentiality professional behavior 
So I have to include one statement that you are doing the audit after complying with independence and also after complying with relevant ethical requirements. And also you have to state whether the auditor believes that the auditor has obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. That means you have to mention in your basis for opinion paragraph that you whether you have obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence or not. So these are the four things which must be compulsorily stated in your basis for opinion paragraph. So what are the four, what are the four things which must be stated in the basis for opinion paragraph? Number one, you have to say that you have done the audit as per standards on audit. Number two, you have to give reference to auditor's responsibility paragraph. Number three, you have to state that you are independent of the entity and you comply with the relevant ethical requirements. Number four, you have to say that you have obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. So these four things must come in the basis for opinion paragraph as we are seeing the practicality also here. So if you look at the basis for opinion paragraph in the practical auditor's report, the same four things you will be able to find here. So if you see the auditor is telling we have conducted the audit in accordance with standards on auditing. Our responsibilities are included in the auditor's responsibility paragraph, nothing but reference to auditor's responsibilities. He is telling we are independent of the company and we comply with relevant ethical requirements. And also last thing you have to state whether you have obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence or not. So if you see here that we have obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. So these four things must compulsorily come in your basis for opinion paragraph. Now here one more thing is there. See if you are giving unmodified opinion, if you are giving unmodified opinion, in the basis for opinion paragraph, if you mention these four things, that will be enough. If you are giving unmodified opinion in the basis for opinion paragraph, if you include these four things, that will be enough. So if you take your example, Reliance Industries Limited, the auditor has given unmodified opinion. And if you have a look at basis for opinion paragraph, in the basis for opinion paragraph, he has told only the said four things, whatever we have read in the standard. But in case, if you are giving any of the modified opinion, either you are giving qualified opinion, either you are giving adverse opinion, or you are giving disclaimer of opinion. So if you give any of the modified opinion, then what should happen is in the basis for opinion paragraph, first you have to tell the reason why you are giving the modification. Like for example, if you have given a qualified opinion in the basis for opinion paragraph, you have to explain the reason why you have given the qualified opinion. Then you have to state the four things, whatever we have read in the standard. So these four things will come. But in case if you are giving any of the modified opinion, in addition to these four things, you should also explain the reason why you have given any of the modified opinion. So if you have given qualified opinion, first you explain the reason why you have given the qualified opinion, then state that four matters. If you have given adverse opinion first, explain the reason why you have given the adverse opinion, then explain that four matters. If you have given disclaimer of opinion, explain the reason why you have given disclaimer of opinion, then state the four matters able to understand. So if I show you one practical example here, anyhow, we have one copy of the audit report available with us. So if you have a look at it here, see here in this case, in this audit report, the auditor has given a qualified opinion. And if you see here in the basis for qualified opinion, first he will explain the reason. First, he will explain all the different reasons why he is giving the modified opinion. And after explaining the reasons, then he will say that four matters that he has done the audit as per standards on auditing. He will give reference to auditor's responsibility paragraph. He will say that he has been independent and comply with ethical requirements and whether he has obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence or not. So these four things, anyhow, he will say. But before that, he should also explain the reason why he is giving the modified opinion, be it qualified, adverse or disclaimer. And one more thing, in that basis for opinion paragraph, you should even quantify the amount of misstatement. What do you mean by, what do you mean by quantification? Quantification means you should explain what is the misstatement, what is the reason for the misstatement, what is the cause of the misstatement. Along with that, you should also to the extent possible, if you are able to measure the amount of misstatement, that amount of misstatement also should be stated in the basis for, in the basis for opinion paragraph. In case if you are unable to quantify, if you are unable to express the amount of misstatement, you should mention the fact that we are unable to quantify, but so and so misstatement happened. So whatever it is, the reason, you have to explain in the basis for opinion paragraph in case of modified opinion. Along with that, these four things also should be mentioned. And one more thing, SA705 also says, which says that, see, if you are giving unmodified opinion, the title of your opinion paragraph will be just opinion. If you are giving unmodified opinion, the title of the opinion paragraph will be just opinion. And the title for basis for opinion paragraph will be just a basis for opinion. But in case, if you have given either qualified adverse or disclaimer, you have to change the title of opinion and basis for opinion paragraph also. If you are giving qualified opinion, the heading of the opinion paragraph should be qualified opinion and the basis for opinion should be changed to basis for qualified opinion. If you give adverse opinion, the title of opinion paragraph should be changed to adverse opinion. 
basis for opinion paragraph title should be changed to basis for adverse opinion if you give disclaimer of opinion the title of opinion paragraph should be changed to disclaimer of opinion and the basis for opinion should be changed to basis for disclaimer of opinion so if i show you once again the example here see in the case of reliance auditor is giving unmodified opinion so opinion paragraph heading was just opinion basis for opinion was just a basis for opinion in case if it is a qualified opinion the titles of the opinion and uh, basis for opinion should change so if you see here, here auditor is giving qualified opinion, he has changed the title to qualified opinion and basis for opinion has been changed to basis for qualified opinion. The same change you have to make it even for adverse and disclaimer of opinion also. Understood. So these are all the few important points relating to basis for opinion paragraph. So how many contents we have seen guys till now we have seen four contents. What are the four contents we have seen? We have seen title, we have seen addressee, we have seen opinion and basis for opinion paragraph and what will come in that paragraph all that we have seen. Now we have next to four contents regarding which we will have a separate discussion. Five, six, seven, eight. You will have five contents here. And the five contents are number one is material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph. Sir, what is this paragraph? What kind of information will be presented in this paragraph? This we will not discuss in this chapter. This we will come across when we take up the standards on audit revision. In that also when I will be explaining you the concept of SA 570, then you will come to know what exactly is this paragraph and what will come in this paragraph. So in this chapter, we are going to ignore this content. Material uncertainty relating to going concern. This we will not know it in this chapter. We will get to know about it once we take up the standards on auditing chapter. In that also SA 570, there we will come to know. After that, we have something called key audit matter. This we will discuss in the same chapter. First, we will try to complete revision of SA 700, 705. Once we are done with that, then we will proceed with SA 701. When we discuss SA 701, that is nothing but completely talking about key audit matter. So this key audit matter, we will discuss later in the same chapter. Within a short time, we will try to discuss. Next, we have two contents, emphasis of matter paragraph and other matter paragraph. These two paragraphs also we will cover in the same chapter, but at later. So once I finish SA 701, then I will take up SA 706. When I am explaining SA 706, I am nothing but trying to explain you two contents. One is emphasis of matter and other matter paragraph. So we have four contents after that, which we will have a separate discussion. One in all together separate chapter standards on audit. Three in the same chapter, but after some time. Okay. So after that four contents, what is the next content? So next we have the next paragraph, which should be included in the auditor's report is responsibilities of management for the financial statements. So in the audit report, you have to include one paragraph in which we have to explain what are responsibilities of the management. So what are the responsibilities which management have to fulfill? You have to explain even in the audit report also. Sir, in the audit report, what responsibilities I have to mention? Very simple. Same, like uh, more or less similar to preconditions, whatever we have seen. So you have to include a paragraph with the heading responsibilities of management for the financial statements. In that paragraph, you should say that the management is responsible for preparation of financial statements that too in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. You should also mention that the management is responsible for implementation of internal controls for, for uh, to ensure that the financial statements are free from material misstatements. And also you should add a statement that the management is responsible for making an assessment relating to going concern. Whether entity will be able to continue as a going concern, will not be able to continue as a going concern. That assessment is responsibility of management. That also you have to include. And you should also identify who is responsible for oversight of the financial reporting process. That means who is monitoring that financial reporting process. If it is audit committee, tell that audit committee is monitoring the financial reporting process. If it is a board of directors, tell that board of directors are the persons who are oversight, who are having oversight of financial reporting process. So like this, you have to include one paragraph, responsibilities of management for the financial statements. In that paragraph, these four things you have to mention. What are the four things you have to mention? That they are responsible for preparation of financial statements. They are responsible for implementation of internal controls they are responsible for making an assessment regarding entity's ability to continue as a going concern and they are also responsible for oversight of financial reporting process clear everybody right so after this management responsibility paragraph the next content which will come in our audit report is auditor's responsibility so you have explained management responsibility now immediately after that you have to include one paragraph called auditor's responsibilities and in that auditor's responsibility paragraph you have to mention all your responsibilities in brief like what I have to mention there, like you have to say that as an auditor, your responsibility is to obtain reasonable assurance whether financial statements are free from material misstatements. And your responsibility is to issue an audit report. You have to give an audit report. And you have to say that uh, reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance, but it is not a guarantee. And you should 
communicate with the users that the misstatement can happen from fraud or error also and as an auditor you will not be concerned with each and every misstatement you will be concerned with only those misstatements which are material and the misstatements will be considered material if they could influence the economic decision of users of the financial statements so that responsibility also you have to state and you should say that you are responsible for exercising professional judgment you are responsible for maintaining professional skepticism and also you have to say that you are responsible for identification and assessment of risk of material misstatement that you have to understand internal controls and even you have to to comment on appropriateness of accounting policies so in brief whatever your responsibilities are there all that responsibilities you are required to state in your auditors report under the heading auditors responsibility paragraph clear everybody able to understand right so that is what regarding auditors responsibilities so we have seen what will be the management responsibilities what will be the auditors responsibilities then after that there will be one paragraph called reporting on legal and other regulatory requirements See, if you see here, till now, we, I have told you various contents, like in your audit report, title should be there, addressee should be there, opinion should be there, basis for opinion should be there. All this is a requirement of what? Standards. See, whatever contents we have seen here, these are all the requirements of standards on audit. See, apart from standards on audit, sometimes the governing law of your client organization, sometimes the governing law of your client organization might also put some additional reporting responsibilities on the auditor. See, what I mean to say is, if you are conducting audit of a client, which is a company, the governing law for your client is Companies Act 2013. Sometimes, Companies Act 2013 will put some additional reporting requirements on the auditor. Like I told you at the beginning of the chapter, there are three sections, 143 subsection 1, 143 subsection 3, 143 subsection 11. Under these three sections, there are various matters which auditor is required to report as per the requirements of Companies Act. Sir, where he will include these matters in the auditor's report, sir? He will use this paragraph, report on legal and other regulatory requirements. Similarly, if you are conducting audit of a bank, the governing law for your client company is Banking Regulation Act. Now, the Banking Regulation Act might put some reporting requirements on the auditor of a bank. Sir, in which section of the auditor's report, auditor will comment on that reporting requirements as per Banking Regulation Act? He will try to report them under this paragraph, reporting on other legal and regulatory requirements. So, the name itself says, apart from the requirements of the standards, if there is any reporting requirement under any other law or regulation, those reporting requirements you you can include in your auditor's report under this paragraph called reporting on other legal and regulatory requirements. Understood everybody? So that paragraph also will be there. Now after including all this contents, finally auditor has to sign the report. Why? Because without your signature, the document will not be valid. No. What is the guarantee? You have only given that audit report. So that's why after including all the contents, the auditor should sign the audit report. Sir, who will sign, sir? See, if an individual is there, the same individual, if an individual practicing chartered accountant has been appointed as an auditor, the same individual practicing chartered accountant will sign the audit report. <laughs> sir, if a firm or LLP is appointed, then who will sign? Will all the partners sign? No, all the partners will not sign. Who will sign, sir? On behalf of the firm or LLP, one practicing chartered accountant will sign the audit report, whom we generally call as engagement partner. So, if an individual is conducting audit, that person will mention his name, number, his membership number and sign the audit report. But if a firm is getting appointed on behalf of the firm, one of the partner who is a practicing chartered accountant will sign the audit report. Like if I show you practically here, if a firm is appointed, if the firm is appointed, this is how signature will happen. So, first they will mention the name of the firm. They will mention the firm's registration number. Now, on behalf of this firm, one partner will sign name of the partner. His membership number also will be stated and here the partner will sign. Able to understand? So, like this, depending on the person getting appointed, either individual or firm, <coughs> someone has to sign the audit report indicating their membership number and also the firm's membership number also they have to mention. Three of firm's registration number actually. So, signature will be there. Then there will be date of signature and also place of signature. So here, as you could see, place of signature, nothing but city in which the auditor has signed that city. Along with that, the date on which auditor has signed, the date also will be mentioned. In addition to that, the auditors are also required to mention below their signature a unique number called unique document identification number, which we call it as UDIN in short. So, this UDIN has been introduced to prevent the forgeries and uh, to prevent this uh, misinterpretation of chartered accountants. So, to ensure that um, no misuse of the chartered accountant signature is happening, ICA has come up with this concept called UDIN, Unique Document Identification Number. This is nothing but every time a chartered accountant is signing the document, he has to generate one unique number by going through one website called UDIN.com. 
ICI. So in that website, every time you are signing the document, you have to generate one unique number. Every time you generate this number, some different different number will come. So every time whenever you are signing any document, you have to go to that UDIN portal, generate this unique number and mention this number below your signature. Sir, why? What is the purpose of this UDIN, sir? Why? Because if someone is having a doubt whether really this document is signed by the same person or not, he can verify it by this UDIN. So he can go to that UDIN portal and he can click on the option verify UDIN. And in that verify UDIN option, if someone enters this UDIN number, you will get all the details. This UDIN was generated by which partner on which date for which entity all that you will get to know clear everybody so to prevent the forgeries to increase the reliability of the signatures of the chartered accountants i say has come up with this concept of udin and below the signature of the auditor udin is also required to be mandatorily stated understood so these are all the various contents of the audit report so if you have a quick recap what and all are the contents of the audit report as per sa 700 first there should be title there should be addressee opinion paragraph basis for opinion paragraph material uncertainty relating to going concern which we have not discussed which we will discuss later in the standards then key audit matter which we will discuss now emphasis of matter and other matter paragraph which we will discuss now itself then we have auditors response then we have management responsibilities auditors responsibilities then auditor signature will be there date of signature will be there place of signature will be there and even udin number has also to be mentioned understood everybody so this is what the requirement of sa 700 regarding the contents of the auditors report understood everybody comfortable till here shall we proceed further now so now we will proceed further since we are done with major content from SA 700 and 705 since we understood what are all the various contents and also what are different kinds of opinion what is the meaning of the pervasive statement and all so now we will proceed ahead and try to understand about this key audit matters in a detailed manner so we'll now try to understand in a detailed manner regarding key audit matters we'll try to understand so what is this key audit matter what is this paragraph what content will be included in the key audit matters that we will try to understand but to understand the key audit matters we have to go to sa 701 so sa 701 is a dedicated standard which is going to talk about exclusively related to what is a key audit matter when it will be included so all that things will be covered in sa 701 so let let me go to that standard once Guys. yes here we have so SA 701 the title of the SA 701 as you could see the title itself says communicating key audit matters in the auditors report so I will tell you a brief background what exactly is this key audit matter why the purpose what is the purpose of this key audit matter see when compared with all other standards in the SA 700 series SA 700 was there for a long period of time SA 705 is also there for a long period of time so we had so many contents already so when compared with the other standards SA 701 is a relatively new standard so after we have already the audit report after we have all the contents still after that also there was a requirement to introduce one new standard to include one new content in the auditor's report with the heading key audit matter sir what led to the introduction of this standard when we have so much of contents in the audit report what led to the introduction of a new standard and bringing one extra content in the auditor's report what is the ultimate purpose behind it see the logic behind introduction of this key audit matters is see previously what used to happen is there used to be no uniformity in the audit reports Every auditor used to prepare the audit report in his own choice. So industry started crying, hey, audit reports are all not looking similar. We want uniformity in the audit reports. So let us bring the uniformity in the audit reports. So institute gave a effort and they brought the standards and they achieved the uniformity. Now all the audit reports will look exactly similar. If you take two companies audit reports in which auditors are saying the same opinion in both the companies, both the audit reports will look exactly similar, exactly copy pasted information, only the name of the company and name of the auditor will change. So ICA has put a lot of effort and they have brought the standards and they achieved a different level of uniformity in the auditor's report. So today auditor's reports are all looking similar. Now when ICA has achieved that uniformity in the audit reports, once again industry started crying. 
Now, what is the reason for their crying is they are telling, hey, you have breached, you have brought the uniformity in the audit reports. Now, all the audit reports are looking similar. If I read uh, audit report of Reliance Industries Limited, if I read audit report of Infosys, both the audit reports are looking similar except the change in the name of the company and the name of the auditor. I am not getting any value addition. What the industry started complaining because of the standards. Now, audit reports are looking exactly similar. Just the just there is a change in the name of the company and name of the auditor. I am not getting any value addition by reading this audit report. I am not getting any value addition. I am not deriving any benefit. I don't get any new information by reading the audit report. So your audit report is completely waste of time. Industry started complaining. So when we when we didn't had uniformity, then industry cried. We brought uniformity. Now when we brought the uniformity, industry is crying once again and they are telling. Now there is almost uh, similar audit reports are there. We don't find any value addition. So what Isaiah has taught us, there is a need to increase the informative value of the auditor's report. So when the user reads the audit report, he should not get a feeling that he is not getting any value addition. He is not getting any new information from reading that audit report. He should not get that feeling. So in order to increase the communicative value of the auditor's report. So what is the purpose behind introduction of the key audit matter to increase or to enhance the communicative value of the auditor's report industry uh, ICA has thought there is a requirement to bring one more content which will increase that communicative value which will increase the informative of the value of the audit report. So with that intention they have brought up this uh, content in the auditor's report called key audit matter. Okay, so that is what the purpose. So as you could see here, the purpose of communicating key audit matter is to enhance, is to increase the communicative value of communicative value of the auditor's report by providing greater transparency about the audit that was performed. So to increase the communicative value, to enhance the value provided by the auditor's report, a new content was introduced by the ICI, which is with the name key audit matters. Okay, we understood what is the purpose of key audit matter. Sir, what has to be exactly stated in the key audit matter? So what the standard says is they have defined the term key audit matter. Sir, what is a key audit matter? They told that you will do the audit of the current year. No, from the current year's audit, you find a few matters which in your professional judgment, you feel it as more significant. So what the standard is telling you would have done audit of the current year. From the current year's audit, you select a few matters which in your professional judgment, which in your own knowledge, experience and training, you feel it as most significant. Try to choose certain matters from the current year's audit and explain how you have dealt with them. Explain how you have dealt with them that you have to identify from the current year's audit. You have to identify a few matters and that which you feel it as more significant and include them in the auditor's report. Tell them why it is a key audit matter and how you have dealt with that significant matter. So that if the users read that information, they will get better value, inform better value, better informative value from that auditor's report. See now, if you pay close attention, key audit matters will not look similar. Why? Because... When I am doing audit of Reliance, I might feel some matters which are very significant. Nothing but if I put it in simple terms, in whatever audit areas you are facing difficulty, that you explain what difficulty has faced, how you have dealt with that matter. See, when I am doing audit of Reliance, there might be a few matters which I found it as difficult. The same matters might not be difficult when I am conducting audit of Infosys. The same matters might not be difficult when I am conducting audit of some Tata Motors. So depending on entity to entity, depending on industry to industry, depending on client to client, depending on facts and circumstances, whatever is significant in each audit will change. So what the standard has simply told is, dear auditor, you use your professional judgment, you apply your knowledge, information, experience, training, and you determine from the current year's audit the matters which you feel it, which you feel it as most significant. And that audit matters you have to explain, which we call it as key audit matters. That's what even the definition says. Key audit matters are those matters that in the auditor's professional judgment were of most significance in the audit of the financial statements sir who has to decide it auditor himself has to decide it is there any hard and fast rule no what the standard said it is up to the auditor's choice auditor will use his information experience knowledge training and he will choose which matters were significant and key audit matters are selected from those matters which are communicated with those charged with governance so which simply means that before if you before you want to include a matter as a key audit matter in the auditor's report first you have to communicate that with the those charged with governance so first to communicate the matters with those charged with garments then included in the key audit matter so understood the meaning so meaning is very simple those matters which are most significant in conducting audit of the current year that you have to explain 
So what is the purpose? I have already told the main purpose of the key audit matter is to enhance, is to increase the communicative value of the auditor's report. And most important thing, this is very, very important. This paragraph repeatedly they have asked in the form of MCQs and true or false statements. See, if you communicate key audit matter, it is not a substitute for certain things. If you communicate a key audit matter, it is not a substitute for three things. So when you are communicating key audit matter, it is not a substitute for disclosure in the financial statements that applicable financial reporting framework requires the management to make. Sir, what is it? Simply, I will tell you. See, assume that uh, or let me ask you one question. Who is required to prepare financial statements? Management. Who is required to give explanation in the notes to accounts of the financial statements? Management. Assume that the management of your client company while preparing financial statements, they forgot to give some disclosure. They forgot to give some explanation in the notes to accounts. Now they are coming to the auditor and telling, Sir, dear auditor, we are we have prepared the financial statements and in the financial statements, we did not include certain, disclo uh, certain disclosure. You do us a favor, you will give the audit report no. In that audit report, you will use the key audit matter paragraph no. In that paragraph, whatever disclosure we forgot to give it in the financial statements, you include that as a part of key audit matter paragraph. Is it acceptable? Do you think institute has introduced key audit matter as a substitute for giving disclosure in the financial statements? If I put it in simple terms, do you think can the key audit matter paragraph be used to include those disclosures which the management has forgot to give it in the financial statements? No. So whatever disclosures which the management is required to give in the financial statements that management only should do in the financial statements only they should do. So key audit matter is not a substitute. Key audit matter was not given so that if the management forgets something, they can, they can ask the auditor to include in the key audit matter. No, that is not the purpose. Key audit matter is not a substitute for giving those disclosures in the financial statements which applicable financial reporting framework wants the management to give. Similarly, giving a key audit matter is not a substitute for auditor expressing a modified opinion. Sir, what is this? Assume that I am conducting audit of some entity. In that entity, I found a material misstatement. See, if you found a material misstatement, what is your uh, course of action? You should give modified opinion. But one auditor is telling something like this. I found a misstatement. I will not give a modified opinion that I will explain it in the key audit matter paragraph. Is it acceptable? Do you think key audit matter is a substitute for modified opinion? No. If you are required to, uh, if you found any material misstatement, the correct course of action is giving modified opinion. You can't say, I will explain that in the, I will explain that material misstatement in the key audit matter and give unmodified opinion. No, you can't do that. So communicating key audit matter is not a substitute for giving a modified opinion. Similarly, key audit matter is not a substitute for reporting in accordance with SA 570 regarding material uncertainty relating to going concern. See what is the meaning of this paragraph is, if you remember uh, previously we have seen the contents in SA 700, in SA 700 we have gone through the contents of the audit report. In that one of the content is material uncertainty relating to going concern. I told what is that paragraph, what content will come in that paragraph that we will discuss in the standards on audit chapter. Did I tell you this? Yes. So in the standards on audit chapter. We will see what content will come in material uncertainty relating to going concern. Now, can the auditor say he found some matter? So, what matter will come in material uncertainty relating to going concern? That we'll talk about it later. Can the auditor say the matter which is required to be disclosed in the material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph? Can the auditor say instead of disclosing that in this paragraph, I will explain it as a key audit matter? Can the auditor do it? No. See, what I'm trying to say here is. If I once again take you back to the discussion, whatever we had just now. So if you see here, here there is a content, no material uncertainty relating to going concern. See, SF, in SA 570, we will come to know what content will come here. Can the auditor, instead of explaining that particular content in the material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph, can he alternatively explain it in the key audit matter paragraph? No. Which I put it in simple, which if I put it in simple terms, the content which has to go to this paragraph that should be disclosed in this paragraph only, key audit matter is not a substitute for the content which has to come in the material uncertainty paragraph. So that is what they try to say here, key audit matter is not a substitute for material uncertainty relating to going concern. And similarly, when you have communicated a key audit matter in the auditor's report, the auditor is not giving any separate opinion on any of the matter. Which means if you see here in the audit report of... Uh, 
Reliance Industries Limited, there are certain key audit matters. The auditor using his professional judgment, he has identified a few matters and he explained it. Now, he has, if you see here in this audit report, there are various matters which he explained it as key audit matter. Like there is something called capitalization. He gave some key audit matter as litigations and claims. See, if the auditor is explaining a key audit matter, does that mean, is he giving a separate opinion on this matter? No. So, when the auditor has communicated a matter as a key audit matter, he is, he is not giving any separate opinion on any of the matter. Just he is letting you know what difficulties he has faced and how he has dealt with the audit. So, communicating key audit matter is also not a separate opinion on any of the matter. So, if they ask you what is the purpose of the key audit matter, you have to write this entire paragraph. You have to say that the ultimate purpose of the key audit matter is to enhance the communicative value of the auditor's report. Communicating key audit matter is not a substitute for three things. It is not a substitute for those disclosures which are required as per applicable financial reporting framework. It is also not a substitute for giving modified opinion. It is also not a substitute for material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph. And auditor is also not giving any separate opinion on any of the key audit matter. Just he is letting you know what difficulties he has faced and how he has dealt with them. Leo, next one. Sir, is key audit matter required to be included in each and every audit? No. For the time being now, Communicating key audit matters is not mandatory for every organization. There is an applicability criteria. If you are conducting audit of certain kind of companies, then only key audit matters is mandatorily required to be included. Sir, when it is mandatory, so the auditor shall communicate key audit matter only in the following cases. When? When you are conducting audit of general purpose financial statements of listed entity. If you are conducting audit of a listed company, then in your audit report, compulsorily key audit matters you have to include. Or sometimes it is not a listed entity, but law or regulation may ask certain sometimes law or regulation might ask you. Like for example, if certain bank is there, even though it is not listed, Banking Regulation Act will ask you to include the key audit matter paragraph in the audit report. So like that, in case of in case if you are conducting audit of listed entity, compulsorily you have to include the key audit matter. If it is not listed entity, sometimes law or regulation will specifically ask you to include the key audit matter. Then also you have to include. In all other cases, in rest of all the circumstances, it is up to auditor's choice. If he wants, he will give. If he doesn't want, he will not give. Clear? So that's what they say in the third point. So in listed company, it is mandatory. Even though it is not listed, sometimes law or regulation will mandate. Then also it is mandatory. In all other circumstances, let the auditor himself decide. If he feels necessary to give the key audit matter, he will give. If he doesn't feel necessary to give the key audit matter, he will not give. In rest of the circumstances, it is his choice. Next one. Uh, yeah. One more thing I will say, circumstances in which key audit matters shall not be communicated. There are certain circumstances in which you should not communicate the key audit matter paragraph at all. Even though you are conducting audit of listed entity, even though law or regulation is asking you to include key audit matter, still in certain circumstances, you will not include the key audit matter paragraph in your audit report. When so, number one, when the auditor is giving disclaimer of opinion. If you are giving a disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements, then in your audit report, there should not be a paragraph called key audit matter. Logic is very simple. When you are giving disclaimer of opinion, what you are trying to say, you are trying to say that you are unable to do the audit. That's why you are not expressing opinion. See, when you are telling you are unable to do the audit only, how can one expect you to once again identify the significant matters from the audit? You are unable to do the audit itself. Then how can we expect you to explain a matter from the current year's audit? able to understand so that's why if you have conducted the audit and in the audit report you are giving a disclaimer of opinion then in that audit report you should not include the key audit matter paragraph okay now there are certain matters which should not be explained as a key audit matter that means for example if you are not giving disclaimer you will include the key audit matter paragraph no in that key audit matter paragraph certain matters should not be explained Sir, which matters should not be explained as a key audit matter? If I say, sometimes there will be a prohibition on law or regulation. Sometimes law or regulation will say, certain matters should never be communicated as a key audit matter. Those matters you should not include as a key audit matter. Others you can explain. Okay, next one. The auditor determines that matter should not be communicated because of possible adverse consequences. So first one, law or regulation prohibits. If I have to give you an example, like bank, uh, like some RBA says that whatever uh, international transactions are there, regarding that, no disclosure should be given. So now if I'm conducting audit of bank, I should not explain about that international transactions as a key audit matter. So when there is a law or regulatory prohibition, then I should not include that in the key audit matter paragraph. Or the auditor determines that the matter should not be communicated because of possible adverse consequences. That means if the auditor feels that because of explaining certain matter as a key audit matter, 
instead of advantages there will be more disadvantages there will be more negative consequences if the auditor feels like that so that matter you should not include it as a key audit matter some other matter you can include it or if the auditor concludes that certain matter is highly confidential or sensitive at the interest of the company or if you find uh, there is certain area which is highly confidential which should not be brought to the public notice that confidential information that confidential information related matter also you should not include it in the key audit matter paragraph see summary is very simple guys if you are giving disclaimer if you are giving disclaimer in your audit report key audit matter paragraph itself will not be there the second point is in your audit report for example if you give unmodified opinion in your audit report key audit matter paragraph will be there but in that paragraph these matters should not be communicated as a key audit matters which matters when there is a prohibition from law or regulation or if the auditor feels that because of the communication there will be more adverse consequences more negative consequences than the positive consequences and also if the auditor concludes that certain matter is highly confidential or sensitive at the interest of the company even that matters also he will not explain other matters he can explain so what we have seen till now in SA 701 we have understood what is a key audit matter what is the purpose of communicating key audit matter we have understood when it is applicable when it should not be communicated apart from that sir how to determine key audit matter i have told it is simply on the basis of auditor's professional judgment but the standard will be very unfair if it leaves everything on the auditor so that's why they are telling you certain areas or they are asking you certain matters which you can consider certain factors which you can consider to determine a key audit matter or if i put it in simple terms the standard is trying to help you in telling you in which areas you can look for key audit matters See, finally, you have to use your professional judgment. Finally, auditor has to use his knowledge, experience and training to determine what is key audit matter, what is not a key audit matter. That is for sure. But the standard is trying to help you out by guiding you in which areas you can start looking for key audit matter. It is just guiding you. Once again, it is not giving you hard and fast tool. It is just guiding you in which area you have to look for key audit matters. So if you see here, they are telling you can look for key audit matters from those areas where there is a high risk of material misstatement. If you find a certain area where there is a high risk of material misstatement from there, from that areas, you can uh, you can look for key audit matter or you can look for key audit matters in those areas which involve significant assumptions, significant judgments like depreciation, provision for bad and doubtful debts. So wherever significant judgments are getting used there, you can go and search for key audit matter or even you can search for the key audit matter from the significant events or transactions that have occurred during the audit. Like for example, if there is any acquisition, if there is any demerger from those areas also, you can start searching for key audit matters. So once again, if you pay attention, it is not giving you any hard and fast rule. Just the standard is giving you hint. It is giving you direction in what areas you can go and look for key audit matters. Understood everybody? So this is how you can determine key audit matter. And also they have one more paragraph regarding presentation. Sir, how you have to present the key audit matter? Nothing but before you explain the key audit matters, there is some one to paragraphs introductory information you have to give. Before you explain the key audit matters, you have to give a few lines of a few paragraphs of introductory information. So what introductory information I have to give, sir? So number one, whatever key, when you want to present the key audit matter, you have to give one separate side heading key audit matter. In that also for each key for each key audit matter there should be separate subheading. So as you could see first main heading is there and for every matter there is there is a separate subheading. And before you actually start explaining the key audit matter some two paragraphs you have to say. So what you have to say is the introductory language you have to use before you start explaining the key audit matter some two lines of introductory information you have to present what is that so you have to explain what is the meaning of key audit matter key audit matters are those matters that in the auditor's professional judgment were of most significance in the audit of the financial statements and these matters were addressed in the context of the audit of the financial statements and the auditor does not provide a separate opinion so give this two three lines of introductory information then you proceed further and try to understand what are and try to explain what are the key audit matters as you could see here before they explain what actually are the key audit matters see here a paragraph of introductory information has been given same thing whatever we have read in the material same content you will be able to find here also understood so this is what sa 701 is about a relatively small standard very important from the examination perspective very frequently the questions were tested from this particular standard so very very important only six paragraphs are there so don't ignore it even try to revise it multiple times understood everybody clear and comfortable
So since we are done with revising the standard SA 701 and we have understood and we have revised in a comfortable manner what is the key audit matter. So the, the next thing which we are going to do now is we are going to talk about two more contents from the auditor's report. So as I was telling uh, there are uh, after the key audit matter paragraph there are two more contents which we did not discuss yet. So we have to look into that now what is an emphasis of matter paragraph what is an other matter paragraph. To understand or to know what is this other matter paragraph or what is this emphasis of matter paragraph, we have to go to the next standard which is SA 706. So let us go to this SA 706 which is going to talk about two concepts actually, two matters which will come in the auditor's report. One is emphasis of matter and the other one is other matter paragraph. So let uh, will not take much of a time, let us try to understand it quickly in a simple manner. So first since there are two contents, I will be talking about each content in a detailed manner. First, we will be taking up emphasis of matter paragraph. What we are going to talk about emphasis of matter. Sir, what is this emphasis of matter paragraph? When it will be used? In what circumstances it will be used? What information will be presented in that? Let us try to have one quick recap. So first of all, what is the meaning of the term emphasis? You might have heard this term emphasis or emphasize. We often hear this term. So what is the meaning of this term emphasis or emphasize is to highlight. So the definition of emphasis of matter paragraph says this paragraph is used to highlight certain information which is already presented and disclosed in the financial statements. Emphasis of matter paragraph is used to highlight certain information which is already presented and disclosed in the financial statements. But in the auditor's opinion that is fundamental to users understanding. That is fundamental to users understanding. So a matter has already been presented and disclosed by management where in the financial statements, but the auditor feels that that matter is very important for users. That matter is very fundamental for users understanding of the financial statements. So auditor thought it will be necessary to highlight somewhere in his audit report in that circumstances to highlight such matters. What auditor can do is he can use the emphasis of matter paragraph. I will give you one small example uh, to wind up this entire discussion. Take for example, the management you are conducting audit of the client X limited. Now the management of the client has prepared financial statements. In their financial statements, they have notes to accounts also. In that notes to accounts, they have explained about one contingent liability. They have explained about one contingent liability. Might be this company is going through one legal case. They are fighting one legal case. And uh, there are chances of winning also. There are chances of losing also. Outcome of the case is not at certain. So if the company loses that case, the company has to pay penalties amounting to 1000 crore rupees. The case is still going on. There is no certainty. So what the management has done is as per the accounting standards, they have disclosed that as a contingent liability in their financial statements. Did the management do any mistake? No. So there is a contingent liability. This item is already presented and disclosed by the management in the financial statements. Management without their mistake, they have already presented or disclosed this information in the financial statements. But as an auditor, what I thought is I cannot expect each and every user of the financial statement to read each and every page of the financial statements. I can't expect that. So even, even if the people try to read it also, they might not be able to understand. So if you take an ordinary user, he will just see profit, he will just see balance sheet, total assets, he will just see some cash flow statement on an overall basis he will see. He will not go through each and every content given in the audit report uh, or each and every content given in the financial statements. So as an auditor, I, th I thought that this matter, even though it has already been presented in the financial statements, but it is very fundamental for the user to know this. It is very important for the user to know that the company is going through pending case. Management without their mistake they have disclosed but as an auditor I am feeling that some users might miss out on this matter I thought it will be better if I highlight this information somewhere in the auditor's report Now what auditor can do is sir how can he highlight can he modify the opinion and highlight no See when we give modified opinion when the management did some mistake in the given case did the management do any mistake no why because as, as I am telling they have clearly explained. So there is no mistake in the management uh, from the management side. So I can't highlight it by giving qualified opinion. So now what I can do. So now you follow SA 706, which says in these circumstances in the audit report, you use one paragraph called emphasis of matter paragraph in that highlight the information in that highlight that information, whatever you want to highlight. So what I will do is in this case, if I'm auditor of this company, I will use the emphasis of matter paragraph and I will write there, dear members, please go and refer so and so note number. Assume that contingent liability has been explained in note number 24. So I will write in the emphasis of matter paragraph, dear user, please go and refer note number 24. There you will be able to find some information regarding contingent liability, which is very important for your understanding of the financial statements. So nothing but I'm drawing the user's attention to certain matter matter which is already presented or disclosed in the financial statements in those circumstances i am going to make use of emphasis of matter paragraph 
that's it as simple as that so if we start reading about it so if we have to if you have a quick look at what they are trying to say regarding the emphasis of matter paragraph so if you see here right so what is emphasis of matter paragraph this standard i will go i will take some time in going through in a detailed manner why because once again important from the examination perspective so emphasis of matter paragraph is a paragraph included in the auditor's report that refers to a matter which is appropriately presented or disclosed there is certain matter which is already presented or disclosed in the financial statements that in the auditor's judgment is of that important to fundament which is fundamental to users understanding of the financial statements so in this entire definition the most important term is the matter which is appropriately presented certain information is already presented or disclosed in the financial statements just auditor wants to draw it to user's attention then he will use which paragraph emphasis of matter sir how when i will use emphasis of matter once again they elaborate in a certain matter a certain manner the auditor should use an emphasis of matter paragraph only uh, provided the auditor would not be required to modify the opinion in accordance with sa 705 as a result of the matter which means for example if you find a misstatement in the financial statements if you find a misstatement in the financial statements instead of giving a modified opinion can you just highlight that in the emphasis of matter paragraph no you can highlight only those matters in the mistake uh, you can only highlight those matters in the emphasis of matter paragraph which are not misstatements because of which you are not required to give modified opinion if there is some if there is some item because of which you are required to give modified opinion that we have to uh, that we have to take proper action of giving the modified opinion we can't just highlight it in emphasis of matter paragraph so what they say here is the auditor shall include only those matters in the emphasis of matter paragraph because of which auditor is not required to give modified opinion if there is certain matter because of which you are required to give modified opinion give a modified opinion only don't just highlight it in the emphasis of matter paragraph next one also when a certain matter has been determined as a key audit matter see if you found some matter in the financial statements that you thought that it is a key audit matter you want to explain it as a key audit matter once again will you include it in the emphasis no if you determined a certain matter to be a key audit matter explain in the key audit matter paragraph only don't bring it here in emphasis of matter paragraph so two cases you should include only such matters in the key audit matter paragraph because of which you are not required to give modified opinion similarly include only those matters in the emphasis of matter paragraph which are not required to go to key audit matter paragraph and also they have given a few examples some examples not hard and fast rules just they are giving you a few examples of the matters which might be highlighted in the emphasis of matter paragraph so what examples is sir as you could see uncertainty relating to future outcome of litigation like i have told contingent liability companies going through pending litigation that you thought is very fundamental to users understanding you want to highlight it where you can highlight it uh, highlight it in the emphasis of matter paragraph or a significant subsequent event or in the financial statements management had uh, adjusted one subsequent event that you want to bring it to users attention bring it to the users attention by using emphasis of matter paragraph or early application of a new accounting standard your client has adopted accounting standard more uh, well in advance you want to bring that to the users attention bring it by highlighting it in the emphasis of matter or if there is any major catastrophe if there is any major calamity fire accident is there or some uh, calamity has happened so if you want to highlight about those information which is already presented or disclosed in the financial statements these are the examples of certain matters which can be highlighted as a emphasis once again i am telling you guys this is just an illustrative list this is not a full and final list this is not conclusive list these are just a illustration of few matters which can be highlighted in the emphasis of matter sir how you have to present the emphasis of matter very simple when you want to include a emphasis of matter paragraph in the audit report use a separate section in the audit report give a separate side heading emphasis of matter there you have to highlight it and also you should give a reference to the matter being emphasized nothing but as i have told in my explanation so you have to even give a reference to the respective note number where the management has presented this information so in our example the management has disclosed about contingent liability in note number 24 when i highlight this matter in the emphasis of matter paragraph in that certain paragraph i have to even mention that the go and refer that note number 24 where the user can go and get more information regarding that matter that reference also should be given that's why we say see, if you have to give the reference first it should have been included in the financial statements so that's why we say emphasis of matter paragraph will be used to highlight that information which is already presented or disclosed why because when information is already presented or disclosed then only you can give reference 
so manner of presentation two points number one add it in a separate paragraph don't mix it in the other paragraphs number two uh, wherever the user will be able to find about that matter in the financial statements give the reference to that information also like referring to that respective note number and all and also tell that auditor's opinion is not modified and one more line you have to add in the emphasis of matter paragraph you have to say that you are just highlighting this matter you are not giving any modified opinion because management did not do any mistake you are just highlighting it so you have to add one sentence there we are just highlighting this information for you we are not modifying the opinion because of this that also you have to say so that's what if you see here uh, reliance industries limited audit report is having emphasis of matter paragraph if you could see the terminology they are telling we draw attention to note number 32a that means there is a there is some information which is already presented in note number 32a as an uh, auditor i am asking the user to go and refer that note number 32a in which certain information is there which will be helping the or which will be helping the user to understand the financial statements in a detailed manner and also if you see here our opinion is not modified as i have told in the emphasis of matter paragraph you have to include a line that we are not modifying the opinion see one important question i would like to ask you here do you think emphasis of or emphasis of matter paragraph will be there in each and every audit report the answer is no only when the auditor finds something which is important for users understanding which is required to be highlighted then only the auditor will use the emphasis of matter paragraph if you are conducting audit of certain entity in which there is no matter which is which is so fundamental to users understanding which is required to be highlighted emphasis of matter paragraph will not be there in that audit report so so don't be of a wrong notion emphasis of matter paragraph will be there in each and every report it is not the case only when required it will come so the, the thing which i want to say is even if tomorrow if you see some audit reports you might not be able to find the emphasis of matter don't worry then don't uh, come and ask me then sir you told emphasis of matter paragraph will be there it is not there in the given case there is no guarantee it will it will be there in each and every case only when required auditor will include it clear next see one more paragraph is there here emphasis of matter paragraph is not a substitute for certain things same whatever we have read in the key audit matter paragraph key audit matter paragraph is not a substitute for three things for disclosures which are required in the financial statements for giving a modified opinion and also for explaining something in the material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph even emphasis of matter paragraph is also not a substitute for the same three things so same paragraph copy pasted information from sa 701 only so this is what regarding emphasis of matter paragraph now sa 706 talks about one more content the one more content is other matter paragraph there is one more content which will talk about other matter paragraph so very simple guys if emphasis of matter paragraph is used to refer to that information which is already presented or disclosed in the financial statements they say that other matter paragraph will be used to refer that information which is not presented and disclosed in the financial statements if you want to tell something to the users which is not presented in the financial statements then you can make use of other matter paragraph so that's what the definition says but practically speaking why other matter paragraph will be used is to explain the responsibility related matters if there is any additional responsibility taken by the auditor, if there is any reduction of the responsibilities of the auditor, so that responsibility related matters we can explain in other matter paragraph. Like for example, if there is a separate branch auditor, you did not do the audit of the branches, you want to tell that to the shareholder where you can tell it, you can tell it in the other matter paragraph. So other matter paragraph will be used for those information which is not presented or disclosed in the financial statements, but mainly it will be used for uh, auditors reporting responsibilities as you could see it is mainly used for auditors responsibilities any additional responsibilities taken or any reduction in the responsibilities clear everybody so that's all regarding the other matter paragraph nothing else to discuss regarding other matter paragraph and one more thing they say here before you want to include emphasis of matter paragraph or other matter paragraph first you have to communicate those matters with the, those charged with garnance then only include them in the auditor's report same like key audit matter if you want to include key audit matter first you have to communicate with those charged with garnance no Similarly, if you want to include a certain matter in the emphasis of matter paragraph or other matter paragraph, first you have to communicate with the those charged with garments, then only you include them in your auditor's report. Clear? So that's all regarding this emphasis of matter and other matter paragraph. Understood everybody? Clear and comfortable? So with this, we are done with mostly the four standards. So as I have told in this chapter, we are going to, uh, this chapter has been completely taken from four standards. What are the four standards uh, from which this chapter has been taken from? SA 700, SA 701, SA 705 and SA 706 and important content from all these four standards we have covered. Okay. Uh, I think one more small thing also I want to explain from SA 705. One more thing I want to explain. Yeah, this one. This point I want to explain. This is also having high chances of getting tested in the examination. This is this is actually from SA705. 
so what is that consequences of an inability to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence due to management imposed limitation after the auditor has accepted the engagement that means you have accepted the audit you have started doing the audit but after you have accepted the audit you are unable to obtain audit evidence after you have accepted the engagement but during the course of conducting of the audit you were unable to obtain audit evidence because management has imposed some limitation on you in that case what will be the consequences so if i put it in simple terms what they are trying to say here is assume that there is certain company x limited there is an auditor so both of them have agreed to the terms and conditions and the auditor has accepted the audit but during the course of conducting of the audit this auditor is not able to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence he is not able to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence sir why he is unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence because the management of the client company is imposing some limitation he, they are putting some restriction on the auditor that's why he is unable to obtain the sufficient and appropriate audit evidence in these cases what will be the consequences in these cases what will be the consequences in these circumstances what auditor is supposed to do regarding that matter guidance has been given under sa 705 let us see what guidance has been given so we already have a chart here there is no need to prepare the separate chart the chart is there in the material itself we'll use the same chart to understand it so inability to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence due to a management imposed limitation after the auditor has accepted engagement you have accepted it you have started doing the audit but during the course of audit you were unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence because the management has put some restriction on your work then what you should do first thing request the management to remove that limitation go to the management and say boss please remove the limitation please let me do my work if, the, if you are unable to obtain audit evidence because of management imposed uh, management imposed restriction what you should do obviously common sense you should go to the management and first request them sir please let me do the work don't put me any restriction now in most of the cases what will happen is management will remove the restriction they don't want to mess with the auditor why because if the management if the clients try to mess with the auditor auditors will make their life a mess so in most of the cases when you go and request the management to remove the limitation yes management will remove the limitation what you will do if the management removes the limitation you continue you, you have gone there for audit now the management has removed the limitation do the audit continue with the audit simple scenario no complication but when the problem will arise management is refusing to remove the limitation i went to the management made a request boss please remove the limitation please let me do the work management is telling no we will not remove the limitation so then what i should do then what you should do is first go and communicate with those charged with garnets and then perform alternative audit procedures so if the management is not removing the limitation first course of action there will be those charged with garnets if they are there go to the those charged with garnets go to the top level management and go and complain them sir your management is not removing the limitation or try to analyze whether you can do any alternative audit procedures if the management is not permitting is there any way by which you can perform alternative audit procedures and get the evidence think it See, some, in some cases it will be possible in some cases it will not be possible sometimes what will happen is when we communicate with the those charged with garnets they will punish the management and uh, remove the limitation or sometimes when we go and communicate with those charged with garnets those charged with garnets are also a part of the management only they are also not helping us or we are unable to perform any audit procedures any alternative audit procedures so if the management does not remove the limitation first we go and communicate with those charged with garnets and try to perform alternative audit procedures but if we are unable to obtain audit evidence even after communicating with those charged with garnets or even after trying to perform alternative audit procedures still i am unable to obtain audit evidence then what i should do then you have to determine what is the possible effect of that undetected misstatement so still you are unable to obtain audit evidence to no? determine what will be the possible effect that means whatever items regarding which i am unable to obtain uh, evidence if that item goes wrong if it is material or material and pervasive if i came to know that the possible effect of the misstatement is material only but not pervasive continue the audit with the other areas and you try to give a qualified opinion you try to give a what qualified opinion when when the possible effect of that undetected misstatement is material but not pervasive in case if the possible effect of the misstatement is material and also pervasive then first option what they're asking you to do is to the extent possible withdraw from the audit to the extent possible resign from the audit why because management themselves are putting the restriction they themselves are not giving the uh, not giving you scope to obtain audit evidence and the possible effect of the misstatement is material and pervasive who asked you to continue in that audit so in, if possible try to withdraw from the audit in certain cases withdrawal from the audit will not be possible then what you do then you give disclaimer of opinion 
very very important so if the possible effect is only material but not pervasive we continue the audit and give the qualified opinion but when the possible effect is material and also pervasive the first option should be withdrawal to the extent possible you should try to withdraw from the audit but in some cases withdrawal might not be permissible because of law or regulation or practical circumstances whatever it is if withdrawal from the engagement is not permissible then continue the audit and give the disclaimer of opinion clear everybody so very very important from the examination perspective there is a chance of this question getting asked in the examination clear everybody so whatever it is so, so all the important content from essay 700 essay 701 essay 705 and essay 706 we are done with the four standards revision we are done with clear everybody able to understand so since we are done with the four standards now what we will do is before i talk about the reporting requirements under various sections we will try to revise three more concepts before we actually so there are actually certain reporting requirements under 143 subsection 1 there are some reporting requirements under 143 subsection 3 there are some reporting requirements under 143 subsection 11 which we also call it as caro 2020 and there is certain reporting requirement under 143 subsection 12 exclusively relating to fraud uh, if the auditor has identified so we have various reporting requirements under various sections of the companies act but before i talk about these reporting requirements under these various sections i want to explain a few concepts so what are those concepts which i'm going to explain so i'm going to talk about a concept called branch audit then i'm going to talk about a concept called joint audit after that we will also try to have a look at the concept called uh, internal audit and related standard so that we will try to revise it quickly then we will go ahead and try to understand the reporting requirements under 143 uh, under various subsections of section 143 so now our immediate agenda is to revise the concept of branch audit to revise the concept of joint audit and also to revise the concept of internal audit along with that we will also try to revise quickly the content of essay 610 also so first i will start with the concept of branch audit sir what is branch audit see generally it is it is quite common that when the company expands they will open up various branches if you take there is certain company x limited whose head office is located at mumbai now slowly this slowly this business started expanding and they have opened their branches in hyderabad also they have opened their branch in delhi also they have opened their branch in chennai also they have opened their branch in bangalore also so when generally business expands its geographical spread also increases see in normal circumstances what will happen is an auditor will be appointed for the company so a person or a firm will be appointed as auditor of a company generally that auditor will only conduct audit of head office and all the branches also so the company's act is giving the permission the person whoever has been appointed for the company as a whole principal auditor we call him so generally the principal auditor himself can do the audit of all the branches so under the company's act there is a permission the principal auditor himself can do the audit of all the branches also but in some circumstances either at the request of the auditor or the company on its own choice they might also take a decision the accounts of the branch has to be audited by separate auditor that decision also can be taken take for example in this case the company decided that they have appointed mr a principal auditor for the company and this auditor told sir i will look after the head office i will look after the uh, hyderabad branch also i will look after hyderabad uh, delhi branch also i will look after chennai branch also but why don't you appoint a separate auditor who will exclusively go and verify the books of accounts of bangalore branch so either that request could be made by auditor or the management on suomoto also they can take their decision so whatever it is assume that in this given case the company has appointed a separate person mr b exclusively to conduct the audit of books of accounts of only bangalore location that decision also can be taken so principal auditor himself can do the audit of entire company or the company at their own request or at the request of the auditor they can also appoint a separate person to conduct the audit of accounts of the branch now in this case mr b, mr. b will be called as branch auditor and the main auditor will be called as principal auditor but the main auditor will be called as principal auditor in our case the principal auditor is mr b and the branch auditor will be mr b Sir, now who can conduct, uh, if the company wants to appoint a separate person to exclusively conduct the audit of accounts of the branch, who is eligible to act as auditor of a branch? Simply another practicing chartered accountant or another form of chartered accountants. Whoever is eligible to act as auditor of a company, the same person can be appointed as auditor of even the branches also, if at all, if the company wants to do it. So a practicing chartered accountant or firm of chartered accountants can be appointed as an auditor of a branch. 
Now, sometimes what will happen is the company will have a head office in India. The company is basically an Indian company, but it might have a branch office located outside India. Sometimes an Indian company might have a branch office located outside India. Take for example, US, you take so many IT companies today. They have their head office. They are primarily incorporated into India, but they have their place of business outside India. They have their branches outside India. So take for example, there is certain company X Limited, which is an Indian company. They have a branch which is located outside India. If the company wants to appoint a branch auditor or who could do the audit of accounts of the branch, which is located in the US, who is eligible to be appointed as auditor of the books of accounts of US branch. So companies access if if uh, the principal auditor wants the principal auditor himself can go and conduct the audit of the foreign branch or the company might appoint another practicing chartered accountant or another form of chartered accountants in India to go and conduct the audit of accounts of that foreign branch. And the Companies Act is also giving one more permission in case if the branch is located outside India, a person who is permissible to act as auditor as per the laws of that respective country in which the branch is located, even that person also can conduct the audit of accounts of that foreign branch. Which means, so if a branch is located outside India, take in our example US, either the company's principal auditor him, uh, himself can do or another practicing chartered accountant from India can go and do the audit of that US accounts branch. Or even a person who is qualified to act as auditor of US, a person who is qualified to act as auditor as per US laws, like there will be CPA, a local CPA also can conduct the audit of that US accounts, US branch. If a branch is located in AC, uh, if the branch is located in UK, a principal auditor himself can do the audit of that branch or another practicing chartered accountant from India can go and do the audit of that branch. Or if the company wants, they can even appoint a local person who is eligible to do the audit of the company as per UK laws. That is ACCA also can do the audit of that UK branch. So like this, these are the people who are eligible for getting appointed as auditor of branch. Sir, when branch auditors will be appointed, when there are two auditors actually, principal auditor and the branch auditor, how the audit will happen? The logic is very simple here. See, take for example, there is a company X Limited. There is a person, Mr. A, who is a principal auditor. For one branch exclusively, another person, Mr. B, was appointed. He is a branch auditor who will conduct audit of accounts of only one or two branches. So now this branch auditor, generally what he will do is he will verify the books of accounts of that respective branches for which he has been appointed and he will prepare an audit report on the books of accounts of the branches, whatever we have verified. Now this branch audit report will be circulated to principal auditor. That branch audit report will be circulated to principal auditor. Now the principal auditor using the work, whatever the principal auditor has done and also using the audit report of the branch auditors. Now the principal auditor will form a will express will form an opinion on the entire company and he will give a single audit report on the entire company. But in preparing that audit report, he will use his own work and he will also use the branch auditors report. So using his own work and using the branch auditors work, he will prepare one single report on the entire company and this report only will be circulated to the shareholders only principal auditors report will be circulated whatever branch audit report is there that branch audit report actually goes from branch auditor to the principal auditor now the principal auditor will make use of the branch auditors work and also he does his respective work and he will form an opinion on the entire company and that report will be circulated to shareholders only principal auditors report will be circulated to shareholder not the branch auditors report understood and also whatever reporting requirements that are applicable for principal auditor all that reporting requirements will be even applicable for the branch auditor also whatever reporting requirements that are applicable for principal auditor all that reporting requirements will be equally applicable for branch auditor also so if the principal auditor is required to uh, required to report on caro even the branch auditors are also required to report on caro uh, irrespective of the turnover of the branch and all. So whatever reporting requirements that are applicable for a principal auditor, all that reporting requirements will be even applicable for branch auditor also. Understood everybody? So this is what regarding uh, uh, who can be appointed as branch auditor and all. And one more thing, who will appoint the branch auditor? Sir, who can appoint the branch auditor? We have seen who can be appointed as branch auditor, but I'm asking who will appoint the branch auditor? Generally, the branch auditor of the company will also be appointed by shareholders only. Members will appoint the principal auditor, same members also will appoint branch auditor. But if the members want, they can delegate that power to board of directors to appoint the branch auditor. See, power to appoint principal, the power to appoint principal auditor is always with the shareholders. They can't delegate the power to board of directors to appoint the principal auditor. 
when it comes to branch auditor for appointment of branch auditor also the power is there with the shareholders only but if they want they can delegate that power to appoint the branch auditors to the board of directors but you have to remember here the power to appoint the principal auditor can never be delegated by shareholders to the board of directors only the power to appoint branch auditor can be delegated to the shareholders sorry to the member to the board of directors clear and comfortable everybody now so there is one uh, one more related aspect to this uh, branch audit concept a small paragraph from sa 600 is there a small paragraph from SA 600 is that which we will try to analyze which is applicable for our CA inter examination. So which is what procedures are required to be performed by the principal auditor when using the work of other auditor as per SA 600. Now if I talk from the branch audit perspective I told just now that branch auditor will prepare the branch audit report and give it to the principal auditor. I told that principal auditor he will do his respective portion of the work and using the audit report which is given by the branch auditor he will prepare a single audit report on the entire company now in the process of preparation of audit report on the entire company is the principal auditor making use of branch auditors work yes is the principal auditor making use of the branch auditors work yes principal auditor is making use of the branch auditors work why because he is forming opinion on entire company for example there are uh, there is a company x limited it is having head office and four branches out of that four branches principal auditor is conducting head office audit and three branches branch auditor is conducting audit of only one branch but principal auditor is required to express an opinion on entire company but while expressing that entire company audit he has conducted audit of only head office and three branches but one more branch was audited by branch auditor so that's why what principal auditor is doing he is completing his respective portion of the work and when it comes to this branch audit for which a separate branch auditor is appointed he will make use of this branch auditor's work then prepare an audit report on the entire company Yes or no? So one thing is for sure, principal auditor will make use of the branch auditor for the purpose of expressing and for the purpose of preparing the audit report on the entire company. Now, when the principal auditor is making use of the branch auditor or even we call it as component auditor, when the principal auditor is making use of that branch auditor or the component auditor, what procedures he need to perform, what precautions he has to take in that way also you can call it. See, I'm a principal auditor. I'm making use of the branch auditor's work. I need to take some precautions. No, I need to follow some procedures. So as a principal auditor, I'm using the work of someone else. So as a principal auditor, when you are using the work of other component auditor or other branch auditor, what procedures you will perform? What precautions you will take? Those procedures and precautions are actually explained in SA 600. Where that procedures and precautions are actually explained? In SA 600, they have explained that procedures and precautions. So what procedures are required to be performed by the principal auditor when you are using the work of branch auditor's work? Very simple guys. First, you have to advise the other auditor the use that you are going to make out of that person's work. And also, you have to make sufficient arrangements for coordination. If I put it in simple terms, if as a principal auditor, you are you want to make use of the branch auditor's work. First, what you should do is you should have an official communication with the branch auditor. You should tell you should let the branch auditor know how you are going to make use of his work. In what manner you are going to make use of his work. Like if I'm a principal auditor, I will call the joint auditor and say, boss, I will call the branch auditor and say, boss, if you conduct the audit of the branch and give your audit report using that audit report and using my work, I will prepare the report on the entire company. So first, as a principal auditor, you have to let him know how you are going to make use of his work. And also, you should make sufficient arrangements for coordination. That means at the beginning of the audit only, you have to make sufficient arrangements for coordination, like uh, at what duration you will talk. So like, for example, I have told once in a week, we will have a Zoom meeting and we'll discuss the proceedings of the audit. So like that, the first procedure which you have to do as a principal auditor, if you want to make use of the branch auditor's work, let the branch auditor know how you are going to make use of his work and also make sufficient arrangements for coordination. Next one. Second one, the principal auditor would inform the other auditor the matters which are requiring special consideration and also timetable for completion of audit. Even you should discuss with him as a principal auditor, if you found some matters which are very critical, which are very, which require special attention, even tell the branch auditor also. For example, as a principal auditor, I thought that in my client's company, revenue is revenue requires special consideration. Tell the branch auditor also once, boss, when you are doing branch audit, pay, sp uh, pay special consideration to revenue and also discuss with him timetable for completion of audit. Let 
let him know within what time you are supposing to complete the audit. For example, if a principal auditor is supposing to complete the audit within 20 days, at least 5 days before you should report the branch auditor. Uh, it's at least 5 days before you have, to you have to receive the audit report of branch auditor. If you don't get it, you will not be able to complete your timetable. So second step, let the branch auditor know what areas require special consideration and also discuss with him timetable for the completion of audit. And advise the other, other auditor of significant accounting, auditing and reporting requirements and obtain representation as to compliance with them. As a principal auditor, let your branch auditor know what significant accounting procedures you have to follow, what auditing reporting requirements will be there, what requ what sections you have to report. Even let the branch auditor also know about the reporting requirements, not just letting him know, ask him to give a written confirmation that he will also comply with that accounting, auditing and reporting requirements. And finally, the principal auditor discuss with the, might discuss with the other auditor the audit procedures which he has applied and even he can ask a written summary of audit procedures he has performed. For example, branch auditor gave you his audit report. But you have some questions whether the branch auditor did the work properly or not. If you want, you can inquire the branch auditor. You can call the branch auditor and ask him, sir, please explain me what procedures you have performed. Or even you can ask the branch auditor to give a written summary of whatever procedures he has performed so that you can get the comfort zone whether the branch auditor did the work properly or not. And finally, if you are not satisfied with conducting inquiry and getting the written summary, the principal auditor may also wish to visit the branch auditor. He can also go and visit that branch or branch uh, branch location once. So as a principal auditor, if you want to make use of the branch auditor's work, these are the procedures you have to follow. And these procedures where they are mentioned in SA 600, they have mentioned five steps, five very simple steps. Number one, you have to discuss with him how you are going to make use of his work and make sufficient arrangements for coordination. Number two, discuss with him which areas require special consideration and also discuss with him timetable for completion of the audit. Number three, discuss with him significant accounting, auditing and reporting requirements and get a written representation as to compliance with them. Number four, if you have any doubts, ask him, uh, inquire him what procedures he has performed or even you can ask, ask from him a written summary of whatever audit procedures that he has performed. And finally, if you are not satisfied, you can even go and visit that other auditor also. So this is what a small portion of branch audit which is relevant at the CA inter level. Clear everybody till here. So now we are left with two more concepts. One is a joint audit and the other one is internal audit. Let us try to talk about these things also. So now uh, immediately we'll start uh, talking about joint audit. So what basically is joint audit? So and uh, there is also one relevant standard talking about joint audit, whatever content which we are going to talk about it now that has been actually taken from SA 299. So let us try to understand about this joint audit in a detailed manner and also the related related standard SA 299. So what is the meaning of joint audit? Very simple guys. When more than one auditor have been appointed for the same entity, for the same financial EO and also having same scope of work that we call it as joint order. When more than one auditor is appointed for the same entity, have for the same financial EO and also if they have same scope of work, such assignments we are going to call them as joint audit assignments. So that is what the simple definition. So now on the basis of definition, let us try to understand a few cases. Let me try to put it before you a few cases and you have to reply back to me whether those audits will fall under joint audits or not. Take for example, there is a company X Limited for the financial year 2020-21. They have appointed a firm ABC and co in which three practicing chartered accountants are there ABC. Now for this year 2021, can this be called as a joint audit? No, this can't be called as a joint audit. Why? Because the auditor is only one. See, when I say auditor, more than one appointment you have to do. Here, the entity is appointing only one audit firm. In that audit firm, how many partners are there? That is irrelevant. But the appointment is made only for one auditor, one audit firm. So this can't be called as a joint audit. This is a normal audit only. Or take, for example, the company X Limited. For the financial year 2020-21, they have appointed Mr. A as a principal auditor. For one of the branches, they have appointed another, another person, Mr. B, as a branch auditor. Can this be called as a joint audit assignment? No. Why? Because to call as a joint, assi joint audit assignment, there should be more than one auditor for the same entity, for the same financial year, and also they should have same scope of work. In this case, same entity, same financial year, but the scope of work is different. 
Mr. A, principal auditor, will have the scope as entire company. Mr. B, branch auditor, will have the scope of only that one or two respective branches for which he has been appointed. So, since the scope is different, this assignment can't be called as joint audit assignment. Or, there is a company, X Limited, for their financial year 2020-23, they have appointed a person, Mr. A, as a company auditor. They have appointed another person, Mr. B, as a tax auditor. Can this assignment be called as joint audit? Once again, no. Sir, why no? Why? Because there is a same entity, same financial year, year is there, but here also the scope is different. The scope of the company audit will be decided as per the company's act. The scope of tax audit will be decided as per the income tax act. So, since the scope is different, this assignment also is not a joint audit assignment. Take for example, there is a company X Limited they, for the financial year 2022-23. They have appointed a person, Mr. A, as a company auditor. They have also appointed a person, Mr. B, as a company auditor. Can this be called as joint audit assignment? Yes. Why? Because same entity, same financial year and also having same scope. This we can call it as a joint audit. Or take for example, there is a company X Limited for the financial year 2022-23. They have appointed Mr. A, an individual practicing chartered accountant as a company auditor. They have appointed a firm, PQR and Co an audit firm as a chartered accountant can this be called as joint audit yes this also will be called as joint audit more than one auditor for the same entity for the same financial year or take for the take for example the company x limited for the financial year 2022 23 they have appointed a firm abc and co to do the company audit they have also appointed another audit firm pqr and co as a company auditor can this be called as joint audit assignment yes this also can be called as joint audit assignment so when more than one auditor has been appointed for the same entity for the same financial year and also having the same scope of work such assignments we are going to call it as joint audit assignments sir does joint audit assignments really happen yes they do happen audit of reliance industries limited is actually a joint audit audit of reliance industries limited is actually a joint audit so if you see the audit report here if you see the signatures of the auditor see two persons from two firms two audit firms are so are signing so Two name, uh, two audit firm names will be mentioned for DTS and Associates LLP for SRBC and Co LLP. Able to understand? So these two two audit firms are appointed for conducting the audit of the same company. Yes, Reliance Industries Limited is a auditor, is a joint audit. So to answer your question, does joint audits really happen? Yes, they do happen. Similarly, if you see the audit report of SBI, you will be able to find in the audit report of SBI names of 16 audit firms. How many guys? You will be able to find the name of 16 audit firms in the audit report. That means 16 auditors have been appointed for the company as a whole. So like this, yes, joint audits do really happen. But for the time being now, it is not mandatory. The standards have not, the, no act has made it mandatory. No standard has made it mandatory joint audit just the clients on their own choice the clients out of their own interest they are appointing the joint auditors it is not a compulsion okay so now let me ask you one question so why do you think companies will go for joint audit the answer is very simple see no business entity will try to incur extra expenditure unless there is some value addition unless there is some advantage Similarly, the companies are finding some advantages in going for joint audit. Sir, what could be the advantages of joint audit? So, the advantages of joint audit could be, number one, the work will be completed in less time. The work can be completed in less time. See, if one single auditor is doing the audit, it will take a lot of time. When two auditors are doing the work, work will be divided, work will be completed in no time. In less time, the work will be completed. Better quality of service. The client will get better quality of the service. The same work is done by multiple persons, multiple professionals. The client's quality of service will get increased. And also, sharing of expertise. There will be a sharing of experience. Uh, there, is, there will be a sharing of expertise between the two audit firms whoever are getting appointed. So, they can share their experiences. Mutual uh, mutual consultation will be there what will be there mutual consultation if one person is getting doubt he can take the help of another person another person another auditor is getting a doubt he can take the help of first joint auditor why because all the all the uh, all the chartered accountants might not have expertise in all areas depending upon the area in which they are practicing some chartered accountants will have expertise uh, in taxation some chartered accountants will have expertise in accounts some chartered accountants will have expertise in audit so if you appoint joint auditors, what they will happen? What will happen is they will have mutual cooperation. They will have mutual consultation. It will also promote healthy competition. There will be a healthy competition between the joint auditors because of implementing more than one auditor. So like this, industry is finding so many advantages in appointing the joint audit. So that's why the clients are voluntarily going for joint audit. But the joint audit does not come only with the advantages. The joint audit will also come with disadvantages. 
the joint audit doesn't come only with advantages it is also going to come with disadvantages sir what will be the disadvantages of joint audit very simple when you look from the company perspective cost will increase earlier last year i have appointed single auditor i paid 10 lakh rupees of fees now if you appoint joint auditors you can't say for each person i will pay five 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 lakhs no that is not going to happen so if you have appointed joint auditor previously you paid 10 lakhs for one auditor now you have to pay seven and seven so it could be 14 on an overall basis if you appoint the joint auditor little bit little bit marginal increase in cost is there so increase in the cost from the company's perspective if you look from the auditor's perspective reduction of fees see last year if i i did the audit single-handedly i got 10 lakh rupees of audit fees this year they're asking me to share the work when i share the work what will happen my fees also will come down so reduction of fees there will be problems of coordination joint auditors might not coordinate with each other they might not support each other ultimately the client will struggle because of this sometimes superiority complexes will be there ego complexes will be there if you appoint auditors of different experiences as joint auditors one auditor who is very experienced having 30 plus years of industry experience another auditor is a newly pass, newly qualified chartered accountant if you appoint these two kinds of joint auditors no then what will happen is there will be ego complexes superiority complexes will build up and when you appoint audit firms of different uh, background then also problems of coordination will arise like some audit uh, some audit firms will be very much risk taking they are ready to take the risk some audit firms are very conservative they don't want to take any risk if you appoint these combination as joint auditors ultimately the client is going to suffer so like this the joint audit is also coming with disadvantages so there are advantages for joint audit also there is disadvantages for the joint audit also but advantages outnumber the disadvantages that's why the clients are going for the joint audits okay so we understood meaning we understood advantages we also understood disadvantages now let us talk about how the work is going to happen how generally work will happen in case of the joint auditors are appointed see i told there are somewhere around 16 joint auditors are there is for sbi see if there are 16 joint auditors for sbi do you think each auditor will do the audit separate separately and 16 times audit of the entity will happen that is not going to happen Similarly, Reliance Industries Limited, two audit firms are appointed. Does that mean each joint auditor will do the audit separate separately and two times audit of Reliance will happen? No, that is not why the joint auditors are getting appointed. So when joint auditors are appointed, generally what will happen is all the joint auditors will sit together. They will divide the work among themselves. If there are 16 joint auditors of SBI, they will not do each one audit separate separately. They will divide the work among themselves. All the 16 joint auditors sit together and they will divide the work among themselves. The two joint auditors of Reliance Industries Limited, they will sit together. They will divide the work among themselves. Sir, on what basis work will be divided among joint auditors? So there could be different basis on which work can be divided on the, on the the between the joint auditors. It could be on the basis of assets, liabilities, incomes and expenditure. Nothing but on the basis of items of financial statements, work can be divided. Like one joint auditor of Reliance is coming and telling, I will look after incomes and assets. Another joint auditor is telling, I will look after expenses and liabilities. So like this, on the basis of items of financial statements, the work can be divided. On the basis of geographical areas, like for example, one joint auditor of Reliance is telling, I will look into the northern part of the company. So uh, whatever uh, branches of the, whatever branches which are there in the northern part of India, that I will, that I will do the work. One joint auditor is telling, whatever branches are there which are in the southern part of India, that I will verify. So like this, on the basis of geographical areas, the work can be divided. Or even the work can be divided on the basis of period of the financial statements. One joint auditor is telling, I will look after the first six months. Next joint auditor is telling, I will look after the other six months. Or even it could be divided on the basis of identified units. If the company is into diversified businesses, multiple products are there. Even the work can be divided on the basis of different products also. Like in case of Reliance, one joint auditor is telling, I will look after petroleum retail fashion. One joint auditor is telling, I will look after other segments. So like that, on the basis of identified businesses also, the work can be divided so we have seen how the work will happen now let us talk about responsibility sir what about responsibility how to fix the responsibility in the case of joint audit who will be responsible see there will be separate responsibility also there will be joint responsibility also sir what is separate responsibility what is joint responsibility simply separate responsibility means in normal circumstances when the work is divided among the joint auditors each joint auditor will be held responsible only for the work which was allocated to him in normal circumstances when the work is divided among joint auditors each joint auditor will be held responsible only for the work which was allocated to him he will not be held responsible for other joint auditors work 
For example, if the joint auditors of Reliance divided the work on the basis of period of the financial statements, joint auditor A told he will look after the data from April to September. Joint auditor B has taken the responsibility for October to March. If tomorrow some fraud was identified in the month of August, which was not identified by the joint auditors, who will be held responsible? Only joint auditor A will be held responsible. So, when the work is normally divided among the joint auditors, each joint auditor will be held responsible only for the work which was allocated to him. However, the standard is telling there will be certain areas in which there will be a collective responsibility. And there are certain areas in the audit for which there will be collective responsibility or joint responsibility. That means the standard has listed out certain areas. In those areas, if something goes wrong, all the joint auditors will be collectively held responsible. Sir, what are that area, sir, where there will be joint responsibility, collective responsibility of all the joint auditors? Number one, undivided work. If there is any work which is undivided, if certain work is not divided, whatever may be the reason. If certain work is not divided, then in that work, if something goes wrong, every joint auditor will be held responsible why because that is not divided next one if there is any decision taken by all the joint auditors if certain decision has been taken by all the joint auditors collectively and if that decision has only gone wrong who will be held responsible all the joint auditors number three matters brought to the notice of all joint auditors if some matter has been brought to the notice of each and everybody and no one has taken action against it then also all the joint auditors will be held responsible number four whether the financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework nothing but whether the disclosures whether the disclosures Disclosures required as per uh, standards, disclosures required as per laws and regulations, nothing but if I put it in simple terms, whether the financial statements are uh, prescribed in the proper format as per Schedule 3, all the explanations which are required as per Schedule 3 and accounting standards are given. Presentation part of the financial statements is also everybody's responsibility, which means if tomorrow something goes wrong in the presentation of the financial statements and if no one has commented on it, then all the joint auditors will be held responsible. So when it comes to presentation of financial statements, verification of presentation of financial statements is everybody's responsibility. And finally, whether audit report has been given as per the standards or not, this is also the collective responsibility of all the joint auditors. So when something goes wrong in any of these five matters, not just one auditor, all the five auditors will be, all the, all the joint auditors will be collectively held responsible. What are the five matters? If there is any undivided work, if, the if, the, if any decisions are taken by all the joint auditors, matters which are brought to the notice of all, whether financial statements are presented properly as per applicable financial reporting framework whether the audit report has been prepared as per standards on audit in these five matters there will be a joint and collective responsibility so we have seen uh, responsibilities also now let us talk about opinion sir what about opinion how the opinion will be expressed see if there are two joint auditors of uh, reliance industries limited do you think each auditor will give separate separate audit report generally no Similarly, SBI is having 16 joint auditors. Do you think will there be 16 audit reports for SBI? No. See, generally what will happen is, once the entire audit is completed, all the joint auditors will sit together, they will discuss all their observations and they generally form one common opinion that one common will opinion will be expressed through a single audit report which will be signed by all the joint auditors. This is what generally will happen in case of joint audit. Once the audit is completed, all the joint auditors will sit together. They will discuss all their findings and they will form one common opinion. And on the basis of that common opinion, they will express a single report. They will express an opinion and in a single audit report, which will be signed by all the joint auditors. This is what normally happen. But in some cases, the problem will arise. See, when everybody agrees on the same point, then it is a good thing. But in most of the cases, what could happen is there might be a disagreement between the joint auditors. Take for example, 16 joint auditors of SBA are there, 15 are telling they will go with unmodified opinion. But one joint auditor is there, he want to show all his skill. Assume that he is a newly qualified chartered accountant, he want to display all his skill in the first audit only. He found a misstatement which is, which is not at all material. He told that I found a misstatement in my work. All the remaining 15 joint auditors told, okay boss you found a misstatement but that is not material. You found a misstatement, but that is not material. Let us give unmodified. But this fellow want, as I have told, this fellow wants to show all the skill in the first audit only. He is telling, no, no, I will consider this misstatement as material. I want to give modified opinion. Now there is a difference of opinion. 15 joint auditors are telling unmodified opinion. One joint auditor is telling modified opinion. Now what should happen? Should this person go with the majority? Should this disagreeing partner, should he go with the majority? Not required. The standard says, if there is any disagreement, no need to go with the majority. Then what will happen, sir? Then what will happen is, these 15 people will give one audit report which contains unmodified opinion. This one person can give a separate audit report containing a modified opinion. 
understood everybody so if there is a difference of opinion the joint auditor so disagreeing can give a separate audit report expressing his own opinion no need to go with the majority the standard did not compel did not compel any joint auditor to go with the majority he can give a separate audit report expressing his opinion now which report will be circulated to shareholder both the reports should be circulated to the shareholder which one shareholder will rely that is his headache we have submitted both the informations both the reports the shareholder will go through both the reports whatever he feels relevant that he will rely the other one he will throw it in the dustbin clear so this is what regarding reporting and one more important point there they might ask you a true or false statement is a joint auditor entitled to rely on other joint auditors work yes each joint auditor is entitled to rely on other joint auditors work even without doing review without verification a joint auditor can review on other joint auditor uh, can rely on other joint auditors work because the other person is also equally qualified like you this statement they might pose as a question a true or false statements or mcq so that's why i thought of bringing it to your attention understood with this we are done with the joint audit concept also now we will try to revise the concept called internal audit so we are done with uh, out of three special concepts out of three specific topics we are done with two we are done with the concept of branch audit we have also discussed what is joint audit so now we are going to discuss about something called internal audit so uh, let us try to understand what is this concept of internal audit and for which companies it will be applicable what does companies act say about it so very simple guys whatever statutory audit we have seen till now the audit reports which auditor will give these are all the audit reports out of statutory audit company audit basically and the company audit is an external audit and the industry thought that in certain big companies or listed companies and especially where the common persons uh, where the common person like you and me are involved just having the external audit alone will not be enough there is a requirement for one more robust audit mechanism which is internal audit the industry thought it sir what are basically the differences between external audit and internal audit very simple guys in case of external audit the person external to the organization who is not a part of the management who is not an employee of a company an external person comes to the organization verifies their books of accounts on uh, uh, once in a while like once in a quarter or once in a year he will come verify the books of accounts give the opinion and go away so when it comes to external auditor the auditors the auditors objective is only to express the opinion he has nothing to do with the improvement of the organization's performance or finding uh, suggesting the management to how can overcome their weaknesses all that is not a part of the external auditor scope so a person external to the organization comes once in a while like once in a quarter once in a financial year he will come verify the books of accounts give the opinion and go away he has nothing to do with the improvement of the company he is nothing to have he has he has nothing to add value to the organization so whereas when it comes to internal audit internal audit is a person the name itself says who is internal to the organization like who is like a management who is like an employee of the company he will also verify not just books of accounts he will verify various other aspects of the organization also external auditor will only his main scope will be financial information but when it comes to internal auditor the scope is very wider in that one of the component is financial information apart from that internal auditor also will verify operations he will also verify production he will also verify hr activities so like that the scope of internal auditor is much more wider and the external auditor's objective will be only to express opinion but the scope of internal auditor is to add value internal auditor will be appointed for value addition that means he is not just expressing the opinion he will try to create value for the organization he is trying to add value for the organization he is trying to improve the organization's overall uh, internal controls or activities so with that intention internal audit concept has been introduced so main difference the external auditor will only express opinion whereas the internal auditor will be appointed to add value to create the value for the organization to improve the overall organization internal auditor will be appointed okay so even if you have a look at the definition also they say that internal audit is an independent objective assurance and consulting activity which is designed to add value and improve an organization's operations so as i was telling internal audit is not just implemented with a view to express the opinion the objective of internal auditor is to add value to improve the overall organization of the client sir it is applicable for which entities is each and every company required to mandatorily appoint an internal auditor the answer is no each and every company is not required to appoint the internal auditor there is a criteria given under section 138 of the companies act only those companies which fulfill that criteria given under section 138 of the companies act they are only required to make an appointment of internal auditor sir what are those companies number one every listed company if the entity is a listed if the company is listed no need to check for any criteria for every listed company appointment of internal auditor becomes mandatory if the client is a public company but not at listed 
it is an unlisted public company then if it satisfies any one of the four conditions if it satisfies any one of the four conditions then they are required to mandatorily make an appointment of internal auditor sir what are that four conditions i will tell you easy things to remember so the conditions are 25 50 100 200 twice the previous number start with 25 twice of it so if the company is having outstanding deposits of 25 crores or more if the company is having turnover of 200 crores or more if the company is having paid up capital of 50 crores or more if the company is having outstanding loans and borrowings from banks and financial institutions of 100 crores or more if any one of these four conditions are satisfied outstanding deposits of 25 crores or more paid up capital of 50 crores or more loans from uh, loans and borrowings from banks and financial institutions of 100 crores or more and turnover of 200 crores or more if any of these four conditions is satisfied and if the client is public company which is not at listed then they are required to make a mandatory appointment of internal auditor understood so this is the applicability criteria of internal audit for unlisted public company and for some private companies also internal audit will become applicable to know whether for a private company internal auditor will become applicable or not we need to check only two conditions out of the above four we need to check only two conditions in the case of a private company one is either turnover should be 200 crores or more and loans and borrowings from banks and financial institutions should be 100 crores or more so if these two conditions are satisfied in the case of a private company then that company is also required to mandatorily make an appointment of internal auditor very very important from this concept applicability they might ask you a practical question out of the applicability so you have to remember these limits so we have seen who has to make an appointment of internal auditor now we will see who is eligible to act as internal auditor who can be appointed as an internal auditor so the act says section 138 says the following persons can be appointed as internal auditor either an individual can be appointed a partnership firm can be appointed or even a body corporate also can be appointed as an internal auditor if you remember from the company audit chapter body corporate can't be appointed as a statutory auditor but body corporate can be appointed as an internal auditor and what should be the qualification so a chartered accountant whether in practice or not a chartered accountant whether engaged in practice or not if you qualify chartered accountancy that will be enough whether you are in practice or not doesn't matter you become eligible for appointment as internal auditor a cost accountant whether engaged in practice similarly if you have completed your cost accountancy whether you have a cop or not doesn't matter you can be eligible to get appointed as an internal auditor or such other professional as may be decided by the board so here is the interesting thing now in the final point they are telling you need not be a chartered accountant you need not be a cost accountant you can be any other professional also any other person any having any other qualification as made as the board of directors may deem fit even that person also can be appointed as internal auditor not just chartered accountant and cost accountant sir uh, and one more thing here internal auditor may or may not be an employee see the statutory auditor can never be an employee of a company but internal auditor may be an employee or may not be an employee of a company next sir who will decide objective and scope of internal auditor the act says in the case of internal lawyer the objective and scope the law doesn't want to interfere the objective and scope has to be decided by the audit committee if it is there if audit committee is not there the board of directors after consultation with the internal auditor so actor doesn't want to interfere they have given the freedom to decide it by management and auditor so if audit committee is there audit committee will have a discussion with the board of uh, the audit committee will have a discussion with the internal auditor and finalize what is objective and scope if in the company audit committee is not there then the board of directors will sit with the internal auditors and try and they try to finalize what will be the objective and scope so this is what the company act simply says about internal audit very very important is applicability very very important is what applicability clear everybody now so now what we will do is there is one related standard of internal audit which is sa 610 so there is one standard sa 610 let us try to revise quickly the content of sa 610 also guys when it comes to sa 610 i have already uploaded a detailed video explaining the provisions of sa 610 in the youtube channel i will give a description i will i will give a link of that video in the description if you want you can watch that full video See, if i have to go deep into the concepts of sa 610 it is going to easily take an hour but since this is a revision we can't afford that much amount of time so i will try to give you an overview of sa 610 what the standard is trying to say i will try to give you an overview of sa 610 if you want to understand the concept in a detailed manner i will give the link in the description of this video you can watch that video of sa 610 in a detailed manner so that you will get full conceptual clarity so but here we are going to revise it quickly so i will spend hardly some uh, 10 minutes of time to revise the content of sa 610 so what is SA 610 talking about? SA 610 is talking about external auditor making use of internal auditor's work. So SA 610 is talking about external auditor making use of internal auditor's work. See whatever work external auditor will do, the same work will be done even by the internal auditor and in a much more in-depth manner. 
So that's why the standard has given permission as an external auditor, if you want to make use of the internal auditor's work, use it. There is no restriction. But at the same time, we have to recognize the fact that SA610 is not making it mandatory for the external auditor to make use of internal auditor. It is not it is not telling mandatorily that, dear external auditor, you have to compulsorily make use of the internal auditor's work. They did not say it. It is up to the choice of external auditor. If he wants, he can use it. If he doesn't want, he will not use it. There is no compulsion. If at all you have decided to use, if at all an external auditor decides to make use of the internal auditor's work while expressing the opinion, there are some precautions, there are certain procedures which are given under SA610 that you have to follow. So one thing you have to make it very clear, the standard does, does not compel the external auditor to compulsorily make use of the internal auditor's work. It only told if you want to make use of it, use it. If you want to make use of it, you use it. But when you have decided to make use of internal auditor's work, there are certain precautions or there are certain procedures which you have to follow which are given under SA610. Okay, right. So this is what the entire objective of this SA610. Now, as per SA 610, the external auditor can make use of internal auditor's work in two ways. The external auditor can make use of the internal auditor's work in two ways, which I simply call it as type 1 usage and type 2 usage. The external auditor can make use of the internal auditor's work in two ways. One is type 1 usage, other one is type 2 usage. Type 1 usage is also called as using the work of internal audit function. Using the work of internal audit function. Type to usage, we call it as using the internal auditors for direct assistance. Using the work of internal auditors for direct assistance. So, an external auditor can make use of the internal auditors work in two ways. Either he can go, he can take up the route of using the work of internal audit function or other way in which external auditor can make use of the internal auditors work is by way of direct assistance. So, first we have to understand the differences between the two. First, we have to understand the differences between the two. If you understand the differences between the type 1 usage and type 2 usage, discussion is almost over the content is all uh, the content is almost discussed so let us try to understand the difference between what is this uh, using the work of internal audit function using the work of internal auditors for direct assistance one simple thing type 1 usage means in in case of uh, using the work of internal audit function you will as an external auditor you will use the work which is already performed by the internal auditors internal auditors have already performed such work performed some work if you want to use the work which is already performed by the internal auditors that we call it as using the work of internal audit function like take for example i will try to give you one simple example to make you understand <coughs> so there is an auditor he is conducting audit of the client x limited now while conducting audit of the client x limited as a part of his audit he is even required to check the compliances with the laws and regulations also but external auditor is not having enough of time. What he thought is there is internal audit team already in that client. That internal auditor have already done their internal audit and they have given their internal audit report. In that internal audit report, the internal auditor told their observations about laws and regulations. Internal auditor has already verified the compliances with the laws and regulations. And in the internal audit report, they have given all their observations regarding laws and regulations. So as an external auditor, I thought instead of me verifying in a detailed manner the compliances with the laws and regulations, I thought I will use that work which is already performed by the internal auditors. That means I thought I will take the internal auditors report, open that internal auditors report, go to the respective section where they are giving comments about laws and regulations and whatever internal auditors have their observations regarding laws and regulations that I will use for expressing the opinion. Able to understand? So this we call it as using the work of internal audit function. That means some work has already been performed by internal auditor that I want to use it now. So that usage, I call it as using the work of internal audit function, using the work which is already performed by internal auditors. Whereas direct assistance means in the case of direct assistance, I will not use the work which is already performed by internal auditors. I will try to get the work done by the internal auditors now under my direction supervision and review. So in the type 2 what actually happens is let us take the let us take the same scenario. So I am an external auditor. I am conducting audit of the client X limited. I want to comply with laws and I want to check whether the client is complying with the laws and regulations. But I don't have enough of time and resources to complete this. So what I have done is I went to the internal auditors of the client company and I made a request to them. Sir, as an external auditor, I have to verify the compliances with the laws and regulations. But I don't have enough of time and resources. You are also auditors only. You are internal auditors. Why don't you do some work for us now? On our behalf, actually, we are required to verify the compliances with the laws and regulations. We will try to allocate the work to you. Whatever procedures we external auditors are required to perform, now you do it. We will give you direction, we will give you supervision, we will even review the work, whatever you have done. So under my super, under our direction, under our supervision, under our review, you please uh, 
under my direction under under our direction under our supervision under our review you perform the audit procedures now so that is what the meaning of direct assistance that is what the meaning of direct assistance which means in the case of type 1 usage using the work of internal audit function i am using their past work which is already performed but in the case of direct assistance i am not using their past work i am getting the work done through the internal auditors now under my direction under my supervision under my review so that is what we call it as direct assistance so in one case we use the past work in one case we get the work done through the internal auditors now so if you understood these two differences, that's all the standard discussion we can complete in just two minutes of time. So now what the standard says is if you want to use type one work, if you want to use type one work, three things you need to check before you decide whether to use the type one work or not, before you decide whether to use the work already performed by the internal auditors or not, you have to consider three factors and then take the decision. Sir, which three factors I have to consider? Number one, whether the internal auditors are independent and objective. If I want to use the work of internal audit function before I before I decide whether I can use the past work done by the internal auditors first I need to check are the internal auditors independent of the company whatever organization status given to them does it permit the internal auditors to act in an objective manner without any bias they did the internal audit or not that I need to check number two I need to check are the internal auditors competent enough is the internal audit function in the organization are capable are they qualified person are they not qualified person are they chartered accountants do they have enough of knowledge and skill do, you do the do the internal audit team have enough of resources so I will check whether the internal audit team is competent enough number three I need to check whether the internal auditors have carried out the work in a disciplined and systematic manner I should also check whether the internal auditors have carried out their work in a systematic and disciplined manner. So I will evaluate these three factors. What are the three factors which I will evaluate before I decide to make use of type one work, whether internal auditors are independent and whether they are done their work in an objective manner. Are they competent enough? Are they capable enough? Number three, have they carried out their work in a systematic and disciplined manner? For these three questions, if I got positive responses, yes, internal auditors have done their work in an independent manner, they are competent enough, they have carried out their work in a systematic and disciplined manner. For all these three questions, if I got positive answers, then I will be comfortable in using the type 1 work. For any of the question, if I got negative response, like internal auditors are not independent, they are not capable enough, they are not, they have not followed any systematic and disciplined manner, then I will stay away from using the type 1 work. Clear? Now, if the auditor, before the auditor wants to use direct assistance, that is before the auditor decides to make use of type 2 work, before he decides to allocate the work to the internal auditors now, here also few factors he will evaluate. Here he will evaluate before I, before I allocate the work to the internal auditors, I have to check if I allocate the work to the internal auditors, will they be able to do the work in an independent manner or not. Number two, if uh, before I allocate the work to the internal auditors, I have to check are the internal auditors competent? Do the internal audit team have enough of skill and capabilities to execute the work whatever I am delegating to them now? That's all. Here two factors only have to consider. Third factor will not come here. Whether internal auditors carried out the work in a systematic and disciplined manner, that will not come here. Why it will not come here? Why? Because I am not using their past work. Now I am uh, executing the, now I am uh, allocating the work to them under my direction, under my supervision, under my review. Now I am allocating. So there is no need of checking the, whether they they have carried out the work in a systematic and disciplined manner so in case if i want to use the work of internal auditors for direct assistance only two factors i will check whether they are independent whether the internal audit team is independent uh, whether they will be able to carry out the work in an independent manner if i allocate it to them are they competent enough are they competent enough if i allocate the work to them will they be able to do it in a proper manner are they competent enough that also i will evaluate if i got for both these questions positive responses then i will use the internal auditors for direct assistance if i got negative response for any one of this question i will not use them for direct assistance clear everybody next now specifically they say a few more things about uh, type 2 usage regarding direct assistance they say a few more things they say that certain areas you should not allocate for internal auditors for direct assistance when you want to allocate the work to internal auditors for direct assistance be careful don't allocate certain areas to internal auditors which areas should not be allocated for direct assistance those areas in which there is a high risk of material misstatement wherever there is a high risk of material misstatement those areas you don't try to allocate it for internal auditors you try to do it on your own second area where there is usage of significant assumptions and estimates in whatever areas there are significant assumptions or estimates that areas also you don't allocate it for internal auditors that you try to do it on your own number three those areas in which internal auditors are already involved those areas in which internal auditors are already involved in the preparation those areas once again you don't allocate it to internal auditors why because it will lead to self-review threat so if you see here in the ss610 we have added it here mm -hmm. yeah 
so which kind of areas should not be allocated to internal auditors for direct assistance number one wherever there is a significant judgment wherever there is a high risk of material misstatement wherever the work in which internal auditors have already been involved these three areas you should not allocate for direct assistance other areas you can allocate it and one more important thing here when you want to make use of internal auditors for direct assistance you need to obtain some written agreements when you want to make use of internal auditors for direct assistance you need to obtain some written agreements you need to obtain written agreements from two people from the management you need to obtain written agreements from the internal auditors also you need to obtain written agreements sir what agreement i have to obtain from the management i have to obtain from the management a written agree written agreement that when i am using the work of internal auditors the management will permit me to use the work of internal auditors and the management will not interfere when the internal auditors are working for me so before you use internal auditors for direct assistance you have to obtain one written agreement from the management regarding what that management will permit the internal auditors to work for me and they will not interfere when the internal auditors are working for me similarly you need to obtain a written agreement from internal auditors also that when they are executing the work for external auditor if they find anything confidential they should not disclose it to the client some confidential matters will be there during the course of audit that information they will not disclose it to the management ask a written agreement from the internal auditor that they will not disclose to the management some confidential information which external auditor will specify and also if, if at all they find any threat to their independence or objectivity they will come and inform the external auditor so for these two matters you have to obtain written agreement even from internal auditor so if you want to use internal auditors for direct assistance use one written agreement uh, obtain one written agreement from management also obtain one written agreement from internal auditor and whatever written agreements that you are obtaining that you have to include it as a part of your audit documentation that you have to include it as a part of your audit documentation clear everybody so this is what in brief the important content from SA 610 as i have told this standard is very wider if you want further detailed explanation i will add a link in the description to SA 610 that you can revise it that you can use it for the purpose of getting a practice uh, getting a much more in-depth understanding much more concept if you want to know use that video clear everybody so this is what regarding SA 610 so we are also done with uh internal audit and also related standard is 610 so now we will proceed ahead and try to revise the reporting requirements under 143 so we have certain reporting requirements under 143 subsection 1 143 subsection 3 143 subsection 11 and there is one specific fraud reporting requirement under 143 subsection 12 so first what we will do is we will uh, under 143 subsection 1 we have total six matters which are required to be reported under 143 subsection 3 there are total of 9 plus 6 15 matters are there which are required to be reported and under 143 subsection 11 we have called something called caro there are total 21 matters which are required to be reported this will come to that later what are reporting requirements under 143 subsection 1 3 and 11 we'll talk about it later but first we'll try to discuss the reporting requirements under 143 subsection 12 see 143 subsection 12 talks about in case during the course of your audit if you came to know about fraud to whom you have to report what is the manner of reporting so fraud reporting in the case of audit of companies that is what uh, uh, we will uh, try to revise here what will be the reporting requirements of the auditor in case auditor comes across fraud during the course of audit so entire discussion i have summarized it in the form of a simple chat simple chat so for the purpose of reporting requirements we will try to divide the frauds into two categories fraud in which amount involved is one crore or more fraud in which the amount involved is less than a crore see whenever the amount involved in the fraud is one crore or more the auditor has to report the matter to central government so let us see what is the manner of reporting so if the fraud is one, one, one crore or more central government reporting will become applicable sir but what is manner of reporting first whenever you came to know about the fraud you have to report the matter to audit committee in your client company if audit committee is there you have to report it to the audit committee if audit committee is not there then you have to report the matter to the board of directors very important guys they might ask you a mcq question in case auditor comes to know about the fraud to whom he has to report option one audit committee option two board of directors option c audit committee or board of directors option d audit committee and board of directors no guys not both not anyone if audit committee is there to the audit committee only if audit committee is not there then to the board of directors it is not a choice given to the auditor to decide audit committee or board of directors if audit committee is there to the audit committee only if audit committee is not there then to the board of directors okay and uh, not both also so you have to remember this point if audit committee is there to the audit committee if audit committee is not there then to the board of directors within two days if for example if today i came to know about the fraud by tomorrow or day after tomorrow i have to report the matter to audit committee or board of directors about the fraud and after communicating the matter with audit committee or board of directors give them 45 days of time how much time give them 45 days of time to get the reply now 
within 45 days two things can happen reply will be received management has given the reply now what you should do within 15 days of receiving the reply from the management you have to report the matter to the central government so you communicated to audit committee or board of directors within two days gave them 45 days of time within that 45 days you received reply now within 15 days of receiving the reply as an auditor you have to report that fraud to the central government sir how you have to report it by submitting one form called ADT4 you have to submit one form ADT4 in that form ADT4 you have to report it to the central government how you have to report it and that ADT4 whatever you are sending that should be on the letterhead of the auditor and that letterhead should contain mobile number email address all the details should be there and that uh, report should be signed by the auditor he should affix his seal and also indicate the membership number whatever document you are sending it to central government you should uh, attach your stamp you have to sign include your membership number also and uh, what and all you will report to the central government whatever report that you have sent to audit committee or board of directors from them what reply you have received on that reply if you have any remarks that remarks all that three has to be sent to the central government what and all you will report original report which you sent to audit committee or board of directors on that what replies you have received on that replies if as, if as an auditor you have any remarks that remarks all the three should be sent to central government sir what if reply is not received within 45 days here also the act says simply report to the central government here also follow ADT4 here also use a letterhead here also you sign it you have a seal you have your membership number but what here you will send it to the central government since you did not receive any reply what you simply will do is you will send whatever report originally you have sent to audit committee or board of directors along with the fact that reply has not been received that you will report it to central government so if you if reply is received three things we will send report whatever you have sent to audit committee or board of directors on that what reply you have received on that reply if you have any remarks in case if no reply is received then also you have to report to central government but what here you will report is whatever original report which i have sent to audit committee or board of directors along with a fact along with that you also have to mention a fact that we did not receive any reply so those things you are required to report to central government so this is what the requirements of fraud reporting in case if the amount involved is one crore or more in case if the amount involved is less than a crore then what you have to do in case if the amount involved is less than a crore then also you have to report the matter to audit committee if it is there if audit committee is not there to the board of directors within how many days sir here also within two days you have to report the matter and what and all you have to communicate you have to communicate to the audit committee or board of directors in case if the amount is less than one crore nature of the fraud what kind of fraud has happened a description you have to give approximate amount involved what is the approximate amount involved in the fraud and who are the parties involved in the fraud these three things if you report the matter to audit committee or board of directors your responsibility will come to an end if you communicate these three matters your responsibility will come to an end now but once your responsibility ends board of directors will have one more additional responsibility board of directors will give their board's report now in that board's report board of directors should disclose certain matters what board of directors should disclose is in their board report nature of fraud amount parties involved along with that what remedial actions management has taken that also need to be reported in the board of directors report clear so when the amount involved in the fraud is less than one crore auditor's responsibility is very simple communicate with audit committee or board of directors regarding three things with that your responsibility will come to an end but in that case board of directors will have additional responsibility they will give board's report in that board's report they have to disclose four matters nature of fraud amount involved parties involved and what remedial actions were taken by the management after being reported by auditor clear so this is what regarding 143 subsection 12 so then now we will proceed further to understand the reporting requirements under 143 subsection 1 subsection 3 and also subsection 11. Now we will try to proceed further with the reporting requirements under Companies Act which are given under three sections 143 subsection 1 subsection 3 and subsection 11. So first we will start with the reporting requirements under 143 subsection 1. There are six matters which are required to be reported under 143 subsection 1. So let us try to have a quick look at it. First point is regarding loans and advances made by the company. First reporting requirement under 143 subsection 1 is as an auditor, you need to check loans and advances made by the company. Made by the company means given by the company to the others. So first point is talking about assets of the company. Your client has given loans and advances to others. If yes, if they are on the basis of security, whether they are properly secured or not, and on whatever terms and conditions those loans are made, are they prejudicial to the interest of the company or members? Are they harmful to the interest of the company or members? The terms and conditions on which the loans were given, are they harmful? Sir, when the terms and conditions will be harmful, like company has given loan without charging any interest. They have given loan without offering any secu without accepting any security. They have given loan without mentioning any repayment period. So these are the examples of terms which could be prejudicial to the interest of the members. 
So whatever it is, first point we need to verify loans and advances, whatever are there, which are given by the company, whether they are properly secured and the terms on which they are made, are they prejudicial, are they harmful to the interest of the company or members. Second point is regarding whether transactions represented merely by book entries whatever transactions are there, which are there just by way of book entries. Sir, what are the examples of transactions merely by book entries? Provision entries, depreciation. These kind of entries are nothing but just book entries. So whether those are transactions which are represented merely by book entries, are they prejudicial? Nothing but whatever provisions etc. are getting created by the company. The provision should be neither under neither over reported provision should not be under reported provisions depreciation should be calculated at exact figures no over reporting no under reporting should happen so that's what we need to check in the second point whether the transactions represented merely by book entries are they prejudicial are they harmful entries like provisions depreciation are they harmful to the interest of the company third point in case if your company is having shares whether your client company sold the shares at a price less than purchase price. Third point, you need to comment whether your client is holding the shares of any other companies. If yes, whether your client has sold the shares at a price less than purchase price. Nothing but whether your client has sold the shares at a loss. Sometimes in the exam, they will try to confuse you. They will give market price. They will give uh, uh, fair value. All these things they will say. Like for example, one question they might ask you something like this. So they will say that your client company is X limited. You are conducting audit of this company. This company is holding shares of some other companies. They have bought it at the purchase price of 100 rupees per share. Current market price is 90 rupees. But the company was able to sell it at 95 rupees. Tell whether this transaction is required to be reported under 143 subsection 1. Yes, it is required to be reported. Why? Because selling price is less than purchase price. What is the current market price that is irrelevant? If you find that the company has sold the shares at a price less than purchase price, you are required to report it. However, this point is not applicable in case if you are conducting audit of a banking company or investment company. This reporting requirement, this particular point need not be reported in case if you are conducting audit of a banking company or investment company. In case if you are conducting audit of other than banking or investment company, then only you need to report on this matter. D point, you need to check whether loans and advances which are given by the company have been shown as deposits. Here also they are referring to loans and advances made by the company. Made by the company means given by the company. So whether your client has given any loans and advances, but instead of showing it as loans and advances, have they shown it as deposits? Find it out and report it here. Whether personal expenses have been charged to revenue, Nothing but whether the personal expenses of management and board of directors, they have been shown as a business expenses that we need to find out and report. And the last one where it is stated in the books and accounts of the company that any shares have been allocated for cash. That means if you came to know that your client has issued for issued some shares for cash, if yes, whether cash has actually been received. And in case if the cash is not received, the position stated in the financial statements should be correct and not misleading. That means you should show correct position in the financial statements. Clear everyone? So these are the six matters. Number one, loans and advances given by the company, whether they are properly secured and the terms and conditions are not prejudicial. Number two, transactions represented by mere book entries are not prejudicial. Number three, whether the company has sold the shares at a price less than purchase price. Number four, loans and advances are shown as deposits. Number five, personal expenses are charged to revenue. Number six, whether shares have been allocated for cash, if yes, cash has been received or not. In case if cash is not received, position stated in the financial statement should be correct and not misleading. And one more point here, the auditor is required to report on the above six matters under 143 subsection 1 only if he gets negative remarks. If he gets positive responses, no need to specifically report on that matter. You need to report on any of the above six points only if you get negative responses. That's all. So these are the reporting requirements under 143 subsection 1. Now let us come to the reporting requirements under 143 subsection 3. Under 143 subsection 3, there are all together some 9 plus 6, 15 reporting requirements are there. Let us see what are they. So there are very remote chances that this question will be tested in the examination. Why? Because as we know in the recent examination, the descriptive question will be tested either for 3 marks or 4 marks. So uh, they might ask you 143 subsection 1, 6 points for 4 marks is fine, reasonable. But 143 subsection 3 is having all together 15 points. So it will be unfair to expect, I say will ask you to write 16 po uh, 15 points just for 4 marks or 3 marks, they will not ask you. So very remote chances of asking it, but we will try to quickly cover these uh, points. 
So there are a few points which are required to be reported under 143 subsection 3. What are they? Number one, as an auditor, did you obtain all the information and explanation which is necessary for the, for the purposes of your audit? Whatever information you needed, whatever explanation you needed for the purpose of doing the audit, whether did you get all that information or not that you have to comment. Number two, whether in your opinion, proper books of accounts are maintained by your client? Did your client maintain proper books of accounts? And also, did you receive returns from branches? Number three, in case if there is any separate branch auditor, whether the branch auditor sent his report to you and how you have dealt with that report. You are a principal auditor. One of the branches are audited by somebody else. Some other branch auditor is there. If yes, whether that branch auditor has submitted his report to you and how you have dealt with that report. Number three, whether the company, uh, sorry, number four, whether the company's balance sheet and P&L are in agreement with the books of accounts. Nothing but financial statements are matching with the books of accounts or not. Number five, whether in the opinion, the financial statements comply with accounting standards, whether financial statements are prepared after complying with the accounting standards or not. Next one, if you have any observation or comment on the financial transaction, which have an adverse effect, which have a bad effect on the functioning of the company, you need to tell it here under this point number F. Nothing but if you find any financial transaction which is having any bad effect on the functioning of the company that you need to report. Whether any director is disqualified from being appointed under 164 subsection 2, you need to even comment whether any of the directors of your client are disqualified. Sir, when the directors will be disqualified under 164 subsection 2, listen carefully. If any company did not file annual return or financial statements for three consecutive financial years with the ROC, then all the directors of that company will be disqualified for a period of five years. Not just in the company in which they are conducting, in which they are acting as directors, for any company they can't get appointed as director for five years. So when the directors will be disqualified under 164 subsection 2, when a company did not file annual return or financial statements for three consecutive financial years, for three continuous financial years, if a company is not filing annual return or financial statements with the ROC, all the directors of that company will be disqualified for a span of five years. So I need to check and give a comment whether any directors of my client company are disqualified under section 164 subsection 2. Then. If you have any qualification, reservation or adverse remark relating to maintenance of accounts, if you find any mistake in the books of accounts, that comment you have to give it here. Next, whether the client is having adequate internal financial control, whether your client company is having proper internal financial controls and whether those internal financial controls are operating effectively or not on this also you need to give comment. However, there is one note point here for some companies internal financial controls are not at all applicable. Some companies don't need to have internal financial controls only. Which company, sir? If it is a private company which satisfies the following conditions, either it is a one-person company or small company or a private company which is having a turnover of less than 50 crores as per audited balance sheet date. And also, if they are having turnover less than 25 crores at any point of time during the financial year, then those companies are not required to implement internal financial controls at all. What are the companies exempted from internal financial controls? One person company, small company and a, comp and a private company having a turnover of less than 50 crores and also borrowings from banks and financial institutions shall not exceed 25 crores at any point of time. Those companies are not required to implement internal financial controls at all. Now, if you are conducting audit of such a company which is coming under this exemption, what you will do? I will mention the same fact that my client company is not required to maintain, uh, not required to implement internal financial controls at all. So reporting requirement does not apply. This fact you have to mention. Now, under J point, there are actually six extra reporting requirements which were added over a period of time. So till now, under 143 subsection 3, we have seen point A to point I, 9 reporting requirements we have seen. Now this under clause J, there are six more additional matters are there which are required to be reported. Let us see what are they. Number one, whether the company has disclosed the impact, if any, of pending litigations on its financial position. So, As an auditor, I need to comment whether my client company, whatever pending litigations are going on against the company, everything has been disclosed in the financial statements or not, either as a contingent liability or provision. See, in one of the past examinations, they have asked a question, true or false statements they have asked, the auditor is required to disclose the impact of pending litigations in the auditor's report. This is what the true or false statements tested in the exam. Listen carefully once again. The auditor is required to disclose the impact of pending litigations 
on the financial positions in the auditor's report. Do you agree with that? The answer is no. Why? Because 143 subsection 3 is not asking auditor to give disclosure. They are just asking auditor to check whether company gave the disclosure regarding pending litigations that too in the financial statements. Hope you have paid the attention. The 143 subsection 3 not asking auditor to give disclosure regarding pending litigations. 143 subsection 3 is in fact asking auditor to check whether management gave the disclosure in the financial statements or not. That you need to check. Next one, second one. Whether the company has made provision as required under any law or accounting standard for material foreseeable losses on long-term contracts. If your client company has entered into any long-term contract and if they came to know that on that long-term contract they are going to make a loss, your client company should not wait till the completion of the contract to recognize the loss. They have to recognize it immediately. So whether your client created a provision for losses on long-term contracts or not, that you need to check and give a comment. Whether your client has made any delay in transferring the amounts which are required to be transferred to Investor Education and Protection Fund. Is your client company required to transfer any funds to IEPF? If yes, whether they have made any delay in transferring the money required to be transferred to IEPF. Fourth point I will come to that later. Fifth and sixth point I will explain now. Whether dividend declared or paid during the year by the company is in compliance with Section 123 of the Companies Act. Whether your client company has declared any dividend, uh, if the client company has declared any dividend, if yes, whether that dividend has been declared as per section 123 of the Companies Act. So section 123 talks about this dividend in a detailed manner, whether the client company declared the dividend after complying with section 123 of the Companies Act or not, that I need to check. And whether company in respect of financial years commencing on or after 1st April 2002, that, that is from 1st April 2022, the company should use such an accounting software which has the facility of audit trail. From 1-4-2022, the company, whether the company is maintaining such an accounting software which is having the facility of audit trail or not and whether that audit trail feature should not be tampered during the year. So whether such a client, whether your client is using such an accounting software which has the facility to record the audit trail which has not been tampered that you need to comment. Guys fourth point is there here but it will take lot of time for me to explain. So what I will do is in the YouTube I have already uploaded a detailed video explaining about this extra reporting requirements under clause J. I have done a dedicated video on YouTube to uh, a dedicated video of uh, some 20-30 minutes of time to make you understand this uh, six reporting requirements separately under clause J. That description, that YouTube link, I will give it in the description below. You can watch it. Clear everyone? So uh, let me show you once here itself. So if you go to my YouTube channel, you will be able to find it there. So just a minute, I will show you. So if you go to my YouTube channel here, so in my YouTube channel, I have already uploaded a detailed video just explaining about this extra reporting requirements under 143 subsection 3 clause J. So you could see here, this is what that particular video is. In this, so I have explained in a detailed manner exactly. what are that reporting so requirements under 143 subsection 3 clause J specifically. Even the, uh, the link to this video, I will give it in the description below. You please do watch it. So this is what the reporting requirements under 143 subsection 3. So all together, we'll come back uh, to the marathon now. So definitely I will give the link to that video in the description below. So please uh, do watch it. Very important. Why? Because this contain recent amendments and uh, this points are not suitable for revision because this one point only will take in order to explain only this fourth point, it will take half an hour of time. So I have already put that effort and uploaded a video and I will give it in the description below. Please go and have a look at it. So like this under 143 subsection 3, we have total of 15 matters which are required to be reported. 9 plus uh, 6, 15 matters are there which are required to be reported. But one more thing here, like I told you previously, <clears throat> the matters under the matters under 143 subsection 1 are required to be reported only if you get negative comments. 
But for 143 subsection 3, those 15 matters, whatever we have revised now, these 15 matters are required to be reported whether or not you have a negative comment or positive comment. Irrespective of the answers which you get, all the 15 matters are required to be compulsorily reported. But whereas 143 subsection 1 matters are required to be reported only if you get negative responses 143 subsection 3 9 plus 5 16 matters whatever we have revised now those matters are required to be reported in all the circumstances irrespective of your responses whether you get positive response or you get negative responses clear now we are going to discuss the reporting requirements under 143 subsection 11 and these rep uh, these reporting requirements also have an other name which we call it as caro Company auditors report order, one of the most important uh, from the examination perspective. From the CARO itself, you can expect minimum five, minimum four to five marks. You can expect it only from the CARO. So let us try to spend enough of time on revising this CARO reporting requirements. Totally, we have 21 clauses which are required to be reported under CARO. Let us have a quick look at it. Shall we do it now? Right. So my uh, this file is getting a stuck bit. So what I will do is I will close it and reopen it once again so that uh, it will stop getting stuck. Just give me a minute's time. Yeah, so we can resume our discussion. So we are going to revise now CARO 2020. And how many reporting requirements are there under this CARO? We have a total of 21 matters which are required to be reported under this CARO 2020. Before we can revise what are that 21 reporting requirements, first we will try to understand applicability. Listen, this applicability itself is so important that in, in even in the recent examination also if you observe, there is a question regarding applicability only. So such an important concept is this applicability related matter. So we will try to spend enough of time in understanding or revising this CARO applicability and then we will spend significant amount of time on revising the reporting requirements. So first we will talk about applicability. See CARO is actually an additional reporting requirement which is given by central government after consulting with NFRA, National Financial Reporting Authority. Now this order is applicable for every company including a foreign company. However, CARO is exempted for such an, uh, for certain class of companies. CARO is exempted for certain class of companies. In case if you are conducting audit of certain companies, CARO will not become applicable for you. So what are they, sir? Number one, banking company. If you are conducting audit of a banking company, CARO doesn't apply. If you are conducting audit of an insurance company, CARO does not apply. In case if you are conducting audit of a Section 8 company, non-profit making company, CARO will not apply. It will not get applicable even for one person company and even a small company. And it is not even applicable for private limited company. It is not applicable for private limited company if the private limited company satisfies four conditions. Not any one condition. If the private company satisfies all the four conditions, then CARO will not become applicable. Once again, I am repeating, when a private limited company satisfies any one or, or all four, when a private company satisfies all the four conditions given here, then auditor need not report on CARO for that company. So what are that four conditions? So if I list them out, the company, your client company should not be a subsidiary or holding of a public company. Number two, your client should have uh, should not have paid up capital and reserves and surpluses exceeding 1 crore rupees as on balance sheet date. Your client should not have borrowings from banks and financial institutions exceeding 1 crore rupees at any point of time during the financial year. And your client company should have a turnover as per Schedule 3 including revenue from discontinuing operations not exceeding 10 crores during the entire financial year. So if you if your if your client company is a private limited company and if it satisfies all these four conditions then CARO does not become applicable. Now, sometimes they have asked a practical question. They will give in the question, so and so company is there, which is a private unlimited company and which satisfies the conditions. Caro applicable or not applicable? They will give you in a question, like for example, even I have included it here for reference. So in this material, this material is a very comprehensive material. We have put a, uh, I have personally put a lot of effort in redesigning and revamping all this material. So please do consider downloading it and how to download it. I have already told you in the description below.
yes so this is how assume this is what somewhat a kind of examination question ca jayesh is appointed as auditor of kp private unlimited a company registered under companies act with unlimited liability for financial year 2020-21 the company had total revenue of 8 crores which is less than 10 crores borrowings from banks and financial institutions is also within the limit of 86 lakhs paid up capital and reserves of 97 lakhs explain whether th whether this audit report must include caro so now if you observe look at the conditions all the conditions are satisfied so the company's turnover is less than 10 crore borrowings from banks and financial institution is less than 1 crore and even paid up capital and reserves and surpluses balance is also less than 1 crore now is the caro applicable or not applicable caro will be applicable why because exemption is there for a private limited company subject to fulfillment of conditions but in the given case the client is a private unlimited company since the company is a private unlimited company no need to check for any conditions caro will directly become applicable caro will be applicable exemption is there only for a private limited company subject to fulfillment of conditions for a private unlimited company no exemption nothing directly caro will become applicable so like this also they might pose you a question so now let us try to pay try to understand these conditions in a detailed manner and special points that need to be kept in mind while doing this calculations let us try to do it sorry yeah so what is the first condition here first condition they are saying that your client should not be a subsidiary or holding of a public company which means if you are conducting audit of a private limited company that private limited company should not have a holding company which is a public company the private company should not have a subsidiary company which is a public company Condition number one, in case if your client company is a private limited company for Caro to be not applicable, first condition is your client company should not have a holding company which is a public company, your client company should not have a subsidiary company which is a public company. Condition number one. Second condition, your client paid up capital and reserves and surpluses should not exceed 1 crore. That means it shall not be, it shall be less than or equal to 1 crore. Even if it is 1 crore is also fine. But paid up capital and reserves and surpluses shall not exceed 1 crore even by 1 rupee also. Now some special points to be kept in mind while doing the calculation. When I say paid up capital, equity share capital also will be considered, paid up uh, preference share capital also will be considered. And when I say reserves and surpluses, all kinds of reserves will come here. Capital reserves will come, uh, revenue reserves will come, revaluation reserve will come and even statutory reserves like CRR, DRR, all these things will come. So all kinds of capital is required to be considered, all kinds of reserves and surpluses are required to be considered. Sometimes there will be a debit balance in the P&L account. If there is any debit balance in the P&L account, that could be adjusted again as a credit balance for the purpose of calculation of reserves. Like for example, assume reserves and surpluses credit balance is some 80. But there is a balance in the P&L, P&L debit balance is 20. So this 20 can be adjusted again as this 80. Sometimes what will happen is, even after adjusting again as the credit balance of the reserves, there will be excess debit balance left in the P&L account. If I give you one typical example, the company is having paid up capital of 120 lakh rupees. In the reserves and surpluses category, they have cap credit balance of the reserves, which is 20 lakh rupees. Whereas they have a debit balance in the P&L of 50 lakh rupees. Now, out of this debit balance in the P&L, only 20 could be adjusted again as the reserves. Even after that, 30 lakh rupees of excess debit balance is left out. Can this be adjusted again as the paid up capital for the purpose of calculation? Yes, it can be adjusted. So excess debit balance in the P&L can be adjusted even again as the paid up capital also for the purpose of calculation of paid up capital and resource and surpluses. So these special things you have to keep in mind. Understood? Now coming to the third point, borrowings from banks and financial institutions shall not exceed 1 crore at any point of time during the financial year. Very important thing at any point of time. Now there are some special points which we need to pay attention here. Borrowings from only banks and financial institutions are required to be considered. Borrowings from individual person, all these things will not be considered. Borrowings only from banks and financial institutions will be considered. When I say borrowings, they could be short term borrowings, they could be long term borrowings, every borrowing should be considered. And frankly speaking, even credit card outstanding amount is also required to be considered. All kinds of balances, short term, long term, every kind of borrowing or even that could be secured, unsecured, every kind of borrowing you have to consider. 
and you should not see the borrowings amount only as on balance sheet date at any point of time the borrowings shall not exceed 1 crore at any point of time during the year even if for even for one day also if the outstanding balance of borrowings has exceeded 1 crore rupees karo will become applicable like for example a typical example i will give you 21 22 financial year opening date 1 1 1 4 2021 borrowings from banks and financial institutions 70 lakh rupees as on 30th of june 21 the company has taken additional borrowings of 40 lakh rupees during the current year the company repaid some borrowings to the extent of some 50 lakh rupees as on the balance sheet date that is as on 31st of march 2022 the closing balance is 60 lakh caro becomes applicable or not yes it becomes applicable why because from 30th of june till 30th of september the outstanding balance is 110 lakhs which has exceeded 1 crore rupees caro becomes applicable at any point of time is very very important but when you are checking paid up capital and reserves and surpluses you need not be concerned at any point of time paid up capital and reserves and reserves and surpluses balances shall not exceed 1 crore only as on balance sheet date during the year anything can happen but paid up capital and reserves and surpluses balance shall not exceed 1 crore only as on balance sheet date. But for borrowings at any point of time during the financial year. And few more things here. Uh, when I say borrowings, borrow all kind of borrowings are required to be considered. This I have already told you. And one more thing here. This limit of 1 crore is for all banks and financial institutions put together. Collectively, the total borrowings from all banks and financial institutions shall not exceed 1 crore. It should not be like for each bank and financial institution 1 1 crore of limit. No. The cumulative balance of borrowings from all banks and financial institutions shall not exceed 1 crore. Not for individual banks separate separately 1 crore limit is given. Now, fourth point, the total revenue of the company shall not exceed 10 crores. Should be less than or equal to 10 crore rupees. Now, while calculating this, the special points which you need to keep in mind is uh, revenue from discontinuing operations also should be added. If in the question they are saying revenue from discontinuing operations, that shall be added for that revenue. And from this total revenue, only three things are permitted to be deducted. One is sales returns are to be sales returns are to be deducted. If there is any trade discount, trade dis, uh, trade discount also can be reduced. And along with that, even GST or other tax components also can be reduced. But sometimes in the question, they will give you something like this. Total revenue of the company 11 crores. GST collected and accounted separately. They will ask you this also. GST collected and accounted separately 1 crore rupees. Now what you will consider for calculation? Will you consider the figure as 11 crore rupees? Or will you adjust that 1 crore and consider it as 10 crore? You have to consider 11 crores only. When you see the phrase GST collected and accounted separately. The meaning of this sentence GST collected and accounted separately is the given turnover does not include the GST component. That's what it meant. See when the given turnover does not include GST component, why we will deduct it once again? So like this, if you find this terminology GST collected separately, excise duty collected and accounted separately, that means that the given revenue figure is already exclusive of taxes. We should not reduce it once again. Leo. So these are the things which needs to be kept in mind while calculating total revenue. So keeping all these things in mind, we need to check, check for these limits in the case of a private limited company. And if all conditions are satisfied, then Caro becomes uh, not applicable. If any of the condition is violated, then Caro becomes applicable. And one more thing, in case of holding company, holding company will prepare two sets of financial statements, standalone financial statements and consolidated financial statements. Limits will be calculated only as per standalone financial statements, not consolidated. And while conducting audit of consolidated financial statements, CARO is exempted, except one clause, which is clause number 21. If you are conducting audit of consolidated financial statements, your audit report need not include the 20 clauses, only clause number 21 should be mentioned in consolidated financial statements. In case if the company is having branches, then the limits will be calculated for the company as a whole, including all the branches information. And once, com once CARO becomes applicable for the entire company, all the principal auditor, branch auditor, everybody have to report on this 21 matters in their respective audit reports. Understood? So this is what calculations, applicability criteria. Very important. As I have told, sometimes questions will be tested from this applicability criteria itself. Now let us come to the reporting requirements. What are those 21 matters which are required to be reported that we will try to understand. 
first reporting requirement is regarding property plant and equipment regarding property plant and equipment you need to check five things how many things five things number one you need to check whether your client is maintaining proper records relating to fixed assets sorry pp whether your client is maintaining proper records relating to pp which should show quantitative details of pp situation of the pp nothing but location of the pp so whether your client is maintaining such a records which should show me quantitative details as well as situation or location of pp number two whether those fixed assets are physically verified by the management at reasonable intervals whether your client company has verified has physically verified they are not asking auditor to do physical verification they are asking whether management did the physical verification of that ppe at reasonable intervals here at reasonable intervals means once in three years for ppe physical verification reasonable interval can be taken as once in three years and on doing such physical verification did the management find out any material discrepancy any differences were found out by doing that physical verification if yes whether they have been properly dealt with in the books of accounts whether they have been properly adjusted in the books of accounts so this is the second point regarding physical verification first point is regarding maintenance of records second point is regarding physical verification number 3 we need to check titles of immobile properties nothing but whether your client is a true owner of the immobile properties or not i need to check sir how can i check the title of immobile properties simply by checking the registration documents by checking the sale deeds so whatever land and buildings are there in your client's balance sheet get the registration documents of all these land and buildings check whether in the registration document company's name is there or not if company's name is not there that means in the registration document if somebody else name is there then i need to report some details what are they description of the property describe about that property what is the gross carrying value if not in the company's name then it is held in whose name whether that person in whose name the property is held is he promoter director or employee for what period the company is holding for what period the company is holding the asset and the reason why it was not at transferred in the name of the company these reasons are required to be reported in case if the property is not in the name of the company if it is there in the name of the company no issue now coming to the fourth point during the year whether your client company did any revaluation of the assets revaluation means restating the assets in case if your client has done the revaluation of the assets whether the revaluation is based on valuation done by a registered valuer whatever figure comes to your client's management should not be revalued the company should go to a registered valuer get the valuation certificate as per that valuation certificate revaluation should happen so i need to check whether revaluation is based on a certificate from registered valuer and also specify the amount of change you need to mention how much amount of change has happened because of revaluation only if the change is 10% or more in the aggregate of net carrying values of each class of property plant and equipment which means you need to tell the amount of revaluation only if because of revaluation the change is 10% or more not for individual asset for aggregate value of entire class of assets so what do i mean by here is i will give you one best example to make you understand very very important assume company is having some buildings under buildings category three buildings are there building 1 building 2 building 3 i will give you values before revaluation i will give you values after revaluation so before revaluation the company the building one is having a value of 100 crore rupees it was revalued to 115 crores building 2 is having a value of 50 crore rupees it was revalued to 53 crores building 3 is having value of 100 crore rupees it was revalued to 87 crore rupees now you tell me for which asset i need to mention the amount of revaluation will you say here sir here change is 15 crores more than 10% before revaluation 10% is 10 crores only revaluation is more than 10% here here only 3 crores of revaluation less than 10% here 13 crores of difference of revaluation which is also more than 10% will you say i will report the amount of change for building 1 and building 2 you are absolutely wrong you are completely wrong you are required to tell the amount of revaluation if the change is 10% or more not for individual assert if the change is 10% or more for the aggregate of enter class of pp for what for aggregate of enter class of ppe so what do i mean here you need to check the value before revaluation or after revaluation for enter class of buildings not for individual buildings 
So if I do the totaling here, it will be before revaluation, entire buildings was 250 crores. After revaluation, the building's value was somewhere around 255 crores. If I'm not wrong, correct me if I'm wrong with the calculations. So I guess so it is 255 crores. So there is for the entire buildings category, there is only 5 crores of change because of revaluation, which is hardly less than 10%. Here 10% is only 25 crores, but the effect of revaluation is only 50 crores. No amount is required to be reported. Clear everybody? So fourth point is regarding revaluation, whether your client has revalued any of the property, plant and equipment. If so, whether that revaluation is on the basis of registered value or certificate and because of that revaluation, if the change is 10% or more, that too in the aggregate of total value of each class of property, plant and equipment, specify the amount of change also. Next, last point regarding PP, whether any proceedings have been initiated or are pending against the company for holding Binami properties whether any case has been filed against your company or whether any case is already going on against the company for holding Binami property. If yes, whether the company without hiding disclosed the details of that proceedings in the financial statements or not, that I need to comment. Once again, I'm telling you here, here also, the Caro is not asking auditor to disclose the Binami transactions. The Caro is asking auditor to check whether management disclosed the Binami transaction cases in their financial statements. I'm repeating it once again. In this case also, the Caro is not asking auditor to disclose the Binami transactions in his audit report. They are just asking the auditor to check whether company disclosed the details of Binami transactions in their financial statements or not. Clear? So this is the first reporting requirement PPE regarding that five points are there. Number one is regarding proper record maintenance. Number two, whether physical verification done by the management. Number three, title of the immobile properties are held in the name of the company. Number four, whether any revaluation happened. If yes, on the basis of registered value or if the change is 10% or more for each class of asset, mention the amount. Number five, whether company disclosed the Binami transaction cases in their financial statements or not. That's all. This is the first point. Second point is regarding inventory. Regarding inventory, what I need to do? First here also, I need to check whether physical verification of inventory has been done by management, not auditor. They are not asking auditor to, auditor to do physical verification. They are asking whether management did the physical verification of inventory at reasonable intervals. Here reasonable intervals means once in every year. For physical verification of inventory, reasonable interval means what? Once in every year. And whether the coverage and procedure of such verification is appropriate, whatever coverage management has done, whatever procedure management has followed for, uh, for doing that physical verification, is that appropriate or not, you have to give the comment. And whether any discrepancies, differences of 10% or more, here also for aggregate of each class of inventory were noticed. For every class of inventory, if you find difference of more than 10%, then you need to mention that amount and also you have to tell whether it has been properly dealt with in the books of accounts. See, when I say classes of inventory, when it comes to inventory, there will only be four classes, raw material, work in progress, finished goods, stores and spares. So if there is 10% or more difference you are able to find for total of each class of inventory, then only you need to report that difference. If the change is there, but less than 10% discrepancy is there for entire class of asset, then you need not, then you need not report that discrepancy. Next, working capital loans. Second point is regarding in case your client at any point of time during the year, whether your client has taken working capital loan in excess of 5 crore rupees, giving security of current assets. Second reporting requirement is applicable in case your client company has taken loans. That to which kind of loan? Working capital loan. That too for an amount exceeding 5 crores at any point of time during the financial year. And what they have given as security for this working capital loans, current assets, mainly stock. So in case if your client has taken any working capital loan in excess of 5 crore rupees from banks or financial institutions, giving the security of current assets, then I need to check whatever quarterly stock statements which my client company is submitting it to the banker, are they submitting genuine stock statements? That means, are those stock statements are in agreement with the books of accounts of the company or if they are submitting wrong stock statements to the banker, that also I need to check. So this particular point is included to protect the interest of the bankers. Clear everybody? So that is what the second point is about, whether your client has taken any working capital loan, that too in excess of 5 crore rupees at any point of time during the year. If yes, 
they will generally submit quarterly stock statements to the banker to make the banker aware of what is the current status of the stock as an auditor i need to check whatever quarterly stock statements which my client company is submitting to the banker whether they are matching with the books of accounts that is whether they are submitting genuine stock statements or they are submitting fake stock statements that i need to have a look and give a comment on that clear everybody so two reporting requirements we are done we are left with 19 more so let us have a look at them now also now we will go to point number three so point number three is talking about investments guarantees security loans or advances given by the company so this third point is regarding loans and advances which are given by the company to others that means this is also talking about assets of the entity the loans which your client company has given to others so now in this also six points are there let us try to understand them first one you need to find out whether your client company has given loans to any of the related parties so third sub point we are dealing in that six points will be there point number a you need to check whether your client company has given any loans and advances or investments or guarantees to any of the related parties if yes we need to segregate how much amount of loan was given aggregate amount of loan given and balance outstanding for subsidiaries, associates and joint venture, we have to report that separately. For other than subsidiary, associates and joint ventures, that I need to mention the amount separately. Whether your client has given loan to any of the related parties, if yes, I need to divide aggregate amount of loan given during the year, balance outstanding at the end of the year, for subsidiary, associate, joint ventures separately, for other than subsidiary, associate, joint ventures separately. Like for example, the company has given loans of total 100 lakh rupees. Out of that, uh, to total 10 entities, the company has given the loan. Out of that, four subsidiary associate joint ventures are there. So the company has given total loan of 100 lakhs to 10 entities. Out of the 10 entities, four entities are having a relationship of subsidiary associate joint venture. Remaining six are other than subsidiary associate joint venture. Now I need to divide out of this 100, loan, 100 lakh rupees of loan, how much was given to subsidiary associate joint venture? Assume 60 lakhs was given. How much has been given for other than subsidiary associate joint venture? 40 lakh. Not just that, what is the balance outstanding as on the balance sheet date? So they have given loan during the year, but during there some repayments, all the things also would have happened. I need to even report what is the balance outstanding as at the end of balance sheet date from subsidiary associate joint venture. Assume it is 50 lakh rupees. And what is the balance outstanding for other than subsidiary associates joint venture? Assume it remained the same 40 lakh rupees. So like that, in case if my client has given loans to any of the related parties, I need to divide aggregate amount of loan given and balance outstanding for subsidiary associate joint ventures separately and other than subsidiaries associates joint ventures separately. Clear? Second point. This is the first point that I tried to summarize here. Second point, I need to check under whatever terms and conditions the loans are given, whether those terms and conditions are they prejudicial are they harmful to the company's interest this point we have already covered under 143 subsection 3 they are saying you to check the same thing here also once again under whatever terms and conditions your client has given loans to that others to that other parties are those terms and conditions are genuine or are they harmful i already gave you examples when the terms and conditions will be considered as harmful when they will be when they will be considered harmful so if they have been given without uh, charging any interest, without repayment period, without any accepting of security, then they will be considered as prejudicial or harmful. Next, third point. It should not be like just your client has given the loan and ignored it. As an auditor, even I need to check whatever loans that have been given to others, whether repayment of principal and payment of interest is happening regularly on or before the due dates, whether your client, whether the third parties, whoever have taken the loan, whether they are repaying the principal and interest on or before the due dates or not, that also I need to check and give a comment. And if at all, any amount remains overdue for more than 90 days. If your client has given loan to other party and if the other party is not repaying the loan, if it has remained overdue and if it remains overdue for more than 90 days, I need to check whether management has taken reasonable steps for recovery of the principal and interest. The management, whether the company has taken reasonable steps for what? <clears throat> for recovery of principal and interest. What could be reasonable steps? Selling the security, filing a case on them, etc. Whatever it is, reasonable steps are taken by the management for recovery or not. I need to check. Then we have rescheduling or extension of the loans, which means your company has given some loan in the past and that loan has fallen due during the year. In the current year, the due date is there. 
when the due date is in the current year your client should have should have collected the money but instead of collecting the money of the loans which have fallen due what your client is doing is they are either renewing it or they are extending it or the fresh loan is given to the same party to settle the old loan did you find any of these transactions your client has given loan in the past which has fallen due in the current year but instead of collecting the loan which has fallen due they are either extending or renewing it that means they are extending the due date or for the same party they are giving a new loan out of that new loan he is repaying the old loan nothing but indirect way of extending only so did you find whether your client has has conducted these kind of transactions instead of collecting the loans they are renewing extending or fresh loans are given to same party if yes i need to report what is the total amount of such loans which are renewed extended or settled by fresh loans the total amount of loans i have to report along with that i need to calculate percentage with the total loans and advances like for example the total loans are 100 out of that 40 lakh rupees of loans are in the nature of renewal extension and fresh loans so percentage if you calculate that will be 40% that percentage also i need to calculate and report it here clear however this particular point is not applicable in case if you are conducting audit of such a company whose principal business is to give loans nothing but in case if you are conducting audit of banks and financial institutions this reporting requirement does not apply for banks caro itself will not be applicable even if you are conducting audit of any nbfc then you are not required to report on this matter not just this point even the first point also this uh, loans to related parties uh, i told you that segregation aggregate amount and balance outstanding that first point is also not applicable in case if you are conducting audit of such a company whose principal business is to give loans whose main business is to give loans that is for banks and financial institutions you need not report on this matter and one more last point under this third point whether your client has given any demand loans demand loans means your client is giving loan without mentioning any repayment period so in case if you find out that your client is giving the loans without mentioning any repayment period you need to mention in the audit report what is the total amount of such loans given without repayment period here also calculate the percentage how many total loans are there out of that how much percentage is in the form of demand loans that calculate the percentage also and along with that tell how much amount has been given to promoters and related parties out of the total loans how much demand loans are given to promoters and related parties that also you need to mention so coming to the third point six sub points are there which we have seen number one in case if your client has given loan to related parties divide between subsidiary associate joint venture other than subsidiary associate joint venture second point whether the terms and conditions are prejudicial third point repayment of principal and interest is happening regularly on or before due dates number four if amount is owed for more than 90 days reasonable steps are taken for, taken by the company for recovery of the principal and interest number five in uh, well, when the loan has fallen due instead of collecting it whether your company has renewed extended or fresh loan given to same party if yes mention the total amount and also calculate the percentage last one whether your client has given loan without mentioning any repayment period this is what we call it as demand loans if yes mention the total amount of such demand loans here also calculate the percentage and report it that's all this is what the third reporting requirement now coming to the fourth one very simple fourth point is also regarding loans investments guarantees which are given by the company in the fourth point they simply says that if your client has given any loan investment or guarantee to other parties check whether they are giving it after complying with the section 185 and 186 of the companies act that's all fifth point acceptance of deposits in case if your client company has accepted deposits whether they complied with section 73 to 76 of the companies act and regarding that acceptance of deposits if there are any directives or instructions given by rbi whether they are complied with or not and if there is any order of clb that is company law board court or tribunal regarding that uh, deposits whether those are complied with or not very simple in case if your client has accepted any deposits provisions of the companies act rbi instructions a uh, court order whether all these are complied with or not i need to check if you find any non compliance report what is that non compliance which has happened during the year next one sixth point maintenance of cost records nothing but whether your company is coming under that applicability criteria given under section 148 subsection 1 if yes whether your main whether your client is maintaining cost records or not that's all whether for your client cost records are applicable in case if cost records are applicable whether your client is maintaining proper cost records or not you have to comment on that next seventh point important point which is regarding statutory dues first of all what is the meaning of statutory dues statutory dues means those amounts which are required to be paid because of the requirement of law 
you are required to pay some amount because of requirements of law examples income tax gst pf esi gratuity so this all will come under statutory dues and regarding the statutory dues there are some reporting requirements and for the purpose of auditors report auditors reporting requirements statutory dues are divided into two categories undisputed and disputed so what is this undisputed and disputed disputed dues means there is some case going on between your client company and the regulatory authority that's why some tax amount was not paid that is disputed undisputed means there is no issue nothing no one is challenging so but still your client did not pay the money that is undisputed so if your client is fighting a case with the regulatory authority regarding one statutory due that is a disputed due if there is no case nothing going then that will be an undisputed statutory due so now what are the reporting requirements relating to statutory due what are the reporting requirements relating to sorry what are the reporting requirements relating to undisputed what are the reporting requirements relating to disputed so first we will talk about undisputed dues when it comes to undisputed dues i need to check whether my client company is regular in depositing all the undisputed statutory dues with the authorities if there is no dispute lying my client should have paid all the undisputed statutory dues regularly regularly means what on or before due dates whether my client company is depositing all the undisputed statutory dues with the regulatory authorities or not if not the extent of arrears outstanding if you find some undisputed statutory dues was not paid then i need to report extent of arrears of outstanding dues nothing but amount of that uh, outstanding dues as at the last day of the financial year concerned for a period of more than 6 months from the date they become payable shall be indicated by the auditor so what they are trying to say here what they are trying to say here is if at all any undisputed statutory due is there which is not paid to the regulatory authorities and those statutory dues which are undisputed which are outstanding for a period of more than 6 months as on the balance sheet date only those amounts are required to be reported once again i am repeat i am once again i am repeating not all the undisputed statutory dues outstanding shall be reported only those undisputed statutory dues which are outstanding for a period of more than 6 months as on the balance sheet date are only required to be reported let me make it simple with the help of example assume your client is required to pay some gst no dispute nothing the due date is 31st of january 2022 but your client did not pay it till balance sheet date 31st of march 2022 the amount is 10 lakh rupees is this required to be reported no why because even though amount is outstanding it is outstanding for less than 6 months it is hardly 2 months another amount is there they are required to pay some pf amount amount is 20 lakh rupees the due date is 30th of june 2021 they did not pay it till 31st of march 2022 is this amount required to be reported yes why because the amount is outstanding for more than 6 months as on balance sheet date clear so this is what the reporting requirements relating to undisputed now coming to disputed statutory dues in case of disputed statutory dues auditor is required to comment on two things what is the amount involved in the dispute and the forum and the court or authority where the case is pending what is the amount involved in the dispute and the court uh, when the court or commissioner before which the case is pending is it pending before commissioner is it pending before court is it pending before district sorry is it pending before tribunal is it pending before supreme court high court that need to be mentioned so two things regarding disputed dues what is the amount involved in the dispute and the forum where the case is pending so this is what regarding statutory dues coming to eighth point disclosure of undisclosed income in this point what they try to say here is during the year whether your client company has faced any income tax assessment during the year whether any tax assessment happened like income tax right or return taken up for scrutiny so like that whether any tax assessment happened and as a part of the tax assessment has your client surrendered or disclosed some previously unrecorded income like some income tax right happened and in that right your client has surrendered some income which he did not offer to taxation earlier so like this during the year whether the client has surrendered or disclosed income as a part of tax assessments now as an auditor what i need to check is now if you are surrendering for taxation you would not have recorded in the books also you would have hidden that income from the books also whatever you are surrendering now so just a surrendering before the tax authorities alone will not be enough that unrecorded income whether it is now recorded in the books of accounts or not that i need to check 
what they are trying to say if as a part of tax assessment whether whether any income is surrendered or disclosed to the tax authorities now just surrendering to the tax authorities alone will not be enough that income should have been now brought to the books of accounts also so i need to check whether that previously unrecorded income which is offered to taxation now has been recorded in the current years books or not that i need to check here next ninth point is regarding loans which are accepted by your client now they are talking about borrowings of your client not the assets now they are speaking about liabilities of your client so when it comes to loans accepted by the client we need to report on a few points like whether your client has done any re uh, default in the repayment so has your company defaulted either in the repayment of principal or payment of interest now what do you mean by default sir default means either you are not paying the money or even if you pay the money beyond the due date that also will come under default so whether your client company has made any default in repayment of loans or borrowings if yes i need to report the period and the amount of default for each lender lender wise amount and period of default should be reported not the not the total amount of default for each lender how much period of default has been made how much amount of default has been made that needs to be reported next i need to check whether my client has been declared as a willful defaulter by any bank or financial institution willful defaulter is a bad credit rating given to the company so i need to check whether my client has taken any loan from the borrower and whether any bank or financial institution classified my client's account as a willful defaulter that i need to check and give a comment third one is regarding term loans where i need to check whether my client has taken any long term loan but instead of using it for the purpose which was mentioned to the banker are they using it for other purposes so in simple terms if i have to put it whether your client has applied the term loans for whatever purpose they have got it they should not have mis misused it in case if they have misused the long term loans i need to mention what amount of loan has been used for that other purposes and what is that other purpose for which they have used it that i need to report simply if i have to put it for whatever purpose long term loans are taken whether they are used only for that purpose or not i need to check and report now fourth point is regarding short term loans in case if your client has taken any short term loan whether it is used only for short term purposes or it has been used for long term purposes that i need to check and give a comment then whether your client company has taken loan for meeting obligations of your subsidiary associate joint venture companies your client has taken loan but not for meeting your client's requirement but for meeting obligations of subsidiaries associates joint ventures then i need to report what amount of such loans are taken for meeting obligations of the subsidiary associate joint venture and for what kind of transactions they have spent it that i need to report clear next last point under this uh, point last sub point under this point loans against a pledge of securities or subsidiaries that means whether your client has taken any loan but for loan we need to offer security no what has been pledged with the banker is the shares which they are holding in subsidiary associate joint venture so whether the company has raised any loans during the year by pledging securities which they are holding in subsidiary associate joint venture whether your client has got any loan by pledging the shares of subsidiary associate joint venture if yes give the details like what is the amount involved and how many shares are pledged etc and also report whether there is any default in the repayment of such loans taken on the pledge of securities held in subsidiary associate joint venture that's all so six points regarding loans which are taken by your client company what are they whether your client has made any default in the repayment if yes amount and period for each lender wise number 2 client is declared as willful defaulter number 3 whether term loans are used for the set purposes number 4 short term loans are used for long term purposes number 5 loans are taken for meeting the obligations of subsidiary associate joint venture number 6 whether loans are taken by pledging the securities of subsidiary associate joint ventures that's all clear now coming to the 10th point and the point is regarding ipo or fpo so when it comes to ipo or fpo they have two sub points here whether your client has raised the money by way of ipo or fpo including debt instruments if yes they will tell some purpose to the investors no for so and so purpose we are raising this ipo fpo as an auditor i need to check whatever amount that has been raised from ipo or fpo whether that amount has been used only for the set purposes 
sir how will i come to know about the purpose sir you will come to know about the purpose from reading the prospectus so i need to check whatever money that has been raised from ipo fpo whether it has been used only for the purposes mentioned in the prospectus if not i need to report what defaults have taken place what delays have taken place and what subsequent rectifications are done everything needs to be reported similarly during the year if there is any private placement or preferential allotment See difference between IPO and F IPO and this preferential allotment is in IPO FPO the offer will be open for everybody, but in the private placement of shares, shares will be issued but only for a limited group of people. So in case if your client has raised money by way of preferential allotment or private placement, I need to check whether they have complied with section forty two and sixty two of the Companies Act, which contains rules regarding this preferential allotment or private placement, and whatever amount that has been raised from that private placement, whether it has been used only for the purpose which had, for which it has been raised. If not, if they are used for other purposes, then I need to report what kind of non-compliances have taken place. Now, talking about the eleventh point is regarding reporting of the frauds. So here, what they say is whether any fraud by the company or on the company has been noticed or reported during the year. As an auditor, did you notice or report any fraud by the company or on the company? If yes, you need to mention nature and amount involved in the caro. What is the nature of the fraud along with the amount needs to be reported in the caro? Similarly, you need to comment whether any of the auditors submitted form ADT four during the year. We have reporting requirements under one forty three subsection twelve. When amount involved in the fraud is one crore or more, reporting to central government will happen. So I need to give a comment whether any of the auditors submitted form ADT four during the year. Similarly, even I need to give a comment whether, as an auditor, did you receive any whistle blower complaints during the year? If any, how you have considered them? As an auditor, did you receive any whistle blower complaints and how you have dealt with them? So three points regarding the frauds. What are they? Number one, uh, whether you notice an, or report any fraud. If yes, nature and amount involved. Number two, whether any of the auditors submitted form eighty four. Number three, as an auditor, did you consider any whistle blower complaints taken place during the year? Next, twelfth point is regarding Nidhi Company. In case if you are conducting audit of a Nidhi Company, you need to check three points. Whether net owned funds to deposits ratio is one is to twenty. Which means for every one rupee of net owned funds of Nidhi Company, they can accept maximum of twenty rupees of deposits only. If they have one lakh rupees of net owned funds, they can accept maximum deposits of twenty lakh rupees only. So whether this net owned funds to deposits ratio of one is to twenty is met or not, I need to check it. And whether Nidhi Company is maintaining ten percent unencumbered term deposits out of the total deposits which they have collected, ten percent should be kept in a fixed deposit that to unencumbered without offering any security. So if the Nidhi company has collected total hundred lakh rupees of money in that ten percent, which will be ten lakh rupees, that ten lakh rupees should be kept in a fixed deposit, and that fixed deposit should not be offered as a security for any loan. So whether ten percent has been kept in unencumbered term deposits or not, that I need to check. And finally, whether Nidhi company has made any default in repayment of principal or interest to any of the deposit holders. So three things I need to comment in case if my client is Nidhi company. Sir, what if my client is not a Nidhi company? I will mention the same fact. My client is not a Nidhi company. Reporting requirements under this clause will not be applicable. Next point, thirteenth point is regarding related party transactions. So in case if your client has entered into any related party transaction, you need to check whether those related party transactions are as per section one seventy seven and one eighty eight of the Companies Act. And regarding related party transaction, there are so many disclosure requirements as per accounting standards. I need to check whether all those disclosure requirements are given in the financial statements or not. That's all. Compliance with Companies Act disclosure requirements as per accounting standards. Fourteenth point is regarding internal audit system. I need to comment whether your client is having internal audit system. Which is commensurate, which is matching with the size and nature of the business. Nothing but whether your client company is having enough of internal audit team, which is matching with the size of the company. That I need to comment. Along with that, as an external auditor, did you use the reports of internal auditors? That also you need to give a comment. As an external auditor, did you make use of internal auditors report? That also you have to comment in your audit report. And finally, non-cash transactions. Whether the company has entered into any non-cash transactions with the directors? Did the company enter into any exchange of goods and services, barter transactions? So I need to check whether company has entered into any non-cash transactions with the directors and other related parties. If yes, whether the provisions of Section 192 of the Companies Act are complied with or not. So Section 192 will give you some rules and regulations regarding non-cash transactions with the directors or related parties. I need to check whether that Section 192 has been complied with or not. 
Next one. NBFCs. If I am conducting audit of a non-banking financial institution, then I need to check, then I need to comment on certain points. Whether my client company is required to obtain registration under 45 1A of the Reserve Bank of India Act. 45 IA of the Reserve Bank of India Act. So some NBFCs are required to get necessary registration under this particular section of the RBI Act. I need to check whether my client is getting uh, covered under that section of the RBI Act. If yes, whether they have obtained that necessary registration from the RBI or not. Second one, whether my client company is conducting any non-banking financial activities or housing finance activities without obtaining a valid certificate of registration. Did my client company carry out any non-banking housing finance or non-banking or housing finance activities without obtaining registration from uh, RBI? That I need to check and give a comment. And also, in case if your client NBFC is enjoying a status of CIC, CIC is a status given to some NBFC subject to fulfillment of conditions. So in, in case, if your client company is enjoying that status of CIC, core investment company, as an auditor, I need to check whether they are continuing to fulfill the criteria of a CIC. Like for example sake, if NBFC fulfills some 10 conditions, they will get the status of CIC. So if my client is enjoying that status of CIC, I need to check whether these 10 conditions are satisfied or not. Now after becoming CIC, if they fulfill some extra 5 conditions, say some, five, say some extra 5 conditions are satisfied, then they will get even more advanced status which we call it as exempted CIC or unregistered CIC. In case if my client is enjoying the status of this exempted CIC also, in addition to these 10 conditions, whether these 5 conditions are also satisfied or not, I need to check. Understood everybody? So that's what they try to say here, if I read it slowly here, whether the company is a core investment company as defined in regulations made by RBI, if yes, whether they fulfill the criteria, whether these 10 conditions are met or not. And in case if the company is exempted CIC, then whether it continue to fulfill additional criteria. If it is an exempted CIC, this 10 plus 5, 15 conditions are satisfied or not, I need to give a comment. And also, as a part of your client's entire group companies, is there only one CIC or more than one CIC? That means whether your client's group, con group companies contain more than one CIC, more than one of the group companies enjoying the status of CIC. If yes, how many number of that group companies are enjoying the status of CIC? That number of CICs also I need to mention in my report. Finally, uh, 17th point, cash losses, whether your client company has made cash losses in the current financial year as well as immediately preceding financial year, if yes, amount of cash losses are required to be reported. Did your client company make any cash loss? See, don't confuse cash loss with loss as per statement of P&L. Both are different. Cash losses have to be calculated from the loss as per statement of P&L, loss or profit as per statement of P&L. So you have to take the figure of profit or loss from the statement of P&L, add back all non-cash expenses, reduce all non-cash incomes, the resulting figure which you get will be called as cash loss. So find out whether your client has made any cash loss for the current year as well as last year. If yes, mention the amount of that cash losses. Next, 18th point, 18th point says that whether there has been any resignation of the statutory auditors. Did any statutory auditor resign during the year? If yes, find out because of what issues, what objections or what concerns the uh, statutory auditors have resigned and how they are affecting your audit that you need to give a comment. Just check whether any of the auditors resigned. If yes, find out what issues, what objections, what concerns are raised by them and how they are affecting your audit that you need to have a comment here. And then finally, 19th point in which they say that, I will give you a summary what they say in the 19th point. In the 19th point, they ask the auditor to tell his opinion whether company is able to pay the liabilities which fall due within a period of one year or is there any uncertainty existing. As an auditor, you need to tell your opinion is the company is having capability to pay all those liabilities which fall due within the next one year or are they having uncertainty? Are they having any doubtfulness? Is there any doubtfulness regarding the company's ability to pay? That opinion I have to express. See, because of this particular point in the caro, I need to comment on the future of the company. So just, but however, it is just an opinion, not a guarantee. So you should express your opinion. Is the company, so let me read this point in a detailed manner, whether the auditor is of the opinion that no material uncertainty exists. As on the date of audit report, that company is capable of meeting all its liabilities existing at the date of balance sheet as and when they fall due within a period of one year from the balance sheet date. 
So whatever liabilities are there, which fall due within one year from the balance sheet date, is the company in a position to pay all that liabilities or is there any material uncertainty existing that I need to comment here. And on what basis I have to give this opinion, sir? On the basis of doing, uh, on the basis of calculating financial ratios, on the basis of analyzing expected dates of realization of financial assets and payment of financial liabilities, on the basis of information accompanying the financial statements, and even on the basis of auditors' knowledge of board of directors and management's plans for the future. So you have to consider all this. So by calculating some ratios, by analyzing the dates of realization and payment to the assets and liabilities, by using the financial statements and by sitting with the management and discussing the plans with them, using all this information, you have to tell your opinion, is the company in a position to pay all their liabilities as on balance sheet date or is there any material uncertainty existing? Clear? Now, 20th point is regarding CSR expenditure. Let me try to summarize this, what they try to say here. Regarding CSR expenditure, they say two things. Two things. Assume 21-22 financial year, the company is required to spend some CSR expenditure. Assume 2% of average net profits of the last three years, that 2% comes to 2 crore rupees. In the first point, they ask me to check if the company is not able to plan how to spend this 2 crore rupees of money within 6 months from the end of financial year, that amount is required to be transferred to the fund specified under Schedule 7. Now, what does that mean? With the help with the help of example, we'll try to understand. Financial year 21-22, they calculated CSR expenditure, 2 crores they have to spend. Now, company is designing project. Out of this 2 crores, 50 lakhs they will give it as a donation to orphanage. Another 50 lakhs they will give it as a donation to old age home. Some 80 lakh rupees they will use it for the construction of school. A school they will construct. So, this is what they have decided. Within 6 months from the end of financial year, from 31st of March 2022 till 30th of September, they are able to decide these projects. But if you observe, the total projects which they have decided is amounting to only 1.8 crores. But how much amount they have to spend? 2 crores they have to spend. So they are unable to decide, they are unable to have a project for that excess 0.2 crore rupees, that 20 lakh rupees they are not able to decide any project. And six months from the end of financial year is over, but still they don't know how to spend this 20 lakh rupees. Now this 20 lakh rupees should be transferred to a fund specified under Schedule 7. Sir, examples of the funds specified under Schedule 7. So examples of the funds specified under Schedule 7 are, one is PM Cares Fund, other one is uh, Prime Minister's National Relief Fund. So like that, so many funds are there, which are given to the, which are prescribed under Schedule 7. You need to transfer that money to the fund. Which money? The money which you are not able to plan six months over from the end of the financial year, but still you are not able to plan how to spend that. So that money you have to say, uh, you have to give it to the fund. That means you are by transferring the fund, you are giving that money to the government. Government will take care of it. How to spend? If you are able to spend it on your own, come up with a project within six months. If you don't come up with a project within six months, transfer that money to the fund and that fund will be utilized by the government for public welfare. So that is what the first point in respect of other than ongoing projects. That means if you don't have any project, the company should have transferred that unspent amount to a fund specified under Schedule 7. If you are not able to have any project regarding the CSR expenditure, you should transfer that money to a fund within a period of six months of the expiry of the financial year. Within six months from the end of the financial year, you should have transferred that money to the fund. Once the money goes to the fund, once the money goes to the fund, company will lose control over it. Government will take care of it. Now, second point is regarding a project. You have a project ready, but you did not spend it. Take for example, you this example only we will take. Total 1.8 crore rupees, you have a plan ready. 20 lakhs, you have transferred it to government. So out of this 1.8 crores rupees, 50 lakhs you want to give it as a donation to orphanage. The company has written a check, given it immediately. 50 lakhs they want to give it as a donation to old age home. They have written a check, given it. And finally, they have 80 lakh rupees. They want to construct a school. But as we know, school construction will not happen in a day or two. It will take significant amount of time. So 80 lakh rupees, you have a project ready, but you, but you did not spend it. You will spend it. 80 lakh rupees, you will spend it on school construction only. But it will take some time. So that money which you did not spend relating to an ongoing project, that should be transferred to a special account. Nothing but a separate bank account you have to open and in that bank account you have to keep this money. See, when you transfer that money to the bank account, in the second case, company only will have control over it. Company only will spend it. For what purpose they will spend it? For social welfare only they will spend it. But just for segregating the normal funds with CSR funds, they are asking you to transfer this 80 lakh rupees to a separate bank account. So you have a project ready. 
but you did not spend the money yet you will spend it in the future slowly you will spend it but till the time you spend it keep it in a separate bank account but what is the first point you don't have a project at all since you don't have a project at all you have to transfer it to the fund that means you have to give it to the government clear so these two things i need to check if i read the b point now whether any amount remaining unspent relating to any ongoing project pursuant to any ongoing project that means you have a project ready but you did not spend it that money has to be transferred to a special account that money has to be kept in a separate bank account clear and then finally comes the 21st point this will come only in the audit report of consolidated financial statements here what they simply say is whatever company's uh, information which is getting included in the consolidated financial statements so as we know consolidated financial statements includes holding company subsidiary company associate company joint venture company you need to go through individual audit reports of all these companies which are included in the consolidated fin financial statements particularly you have to go through caro reports of all these companies and find out in any of this company's caro report is there a negative remark if yes i need to mention in the consolidated financial statements audit report which company contains that negative remark and which paragraph contains a negative remark that i have to mention so in while conducting audit of consolidated financial statements the auditor should go through individual audit reports of all those companies which are included in the consolidated financial statements find out whether there is any negative remark if yes in the consolidated financial statements audit report he should mention which particular company's audit report contains a negative remark and which paragraph contains a negative remark that needs to be mentioned in the audit report of consolidated financial statements so this is what point number 21 so whether there have been any qualification or adverse remark by the respective auditors in the caro reports of the companies which are included in consolidated financial statements if yes indicate the details of the companies along with the paragraph numbers of the caro report clear so this is what 21 clauses of the caro are understood everybody and one more thing here all this 21 matters are required to be reported whether or not you have positive responses or negative responses in all the cases you have to report on all the 21 matters so we are almost done with the not almost we are done with the audit reporting revision so till now we are done with revising uh, three chapters from again to auditing so number one we are done with introduction to audit in that basically we have understood what is the meaning of the term audit and we got to know about the meaning of the few fundamental terms which we are going to repeatedly use in the subject of audit that we all got to know in the chapter introduction to audit number two we have revised nature objective and scope of audit and along with that ethics of the auditor also we have covered so it is also one of the important chapter from the examination perspective and we had a lot of discussion we are we have understood various concepts associated with the audit related things so we revised the concept of nature objective and scope of audit along with ethics then we have uh, revised the most important chapter audit reporting which is actually a comprehensive chapter which is actually a bigger chapter and uh, important from the examination perspective and in this chapter we have actually revised four standard 700 we have revised 701 we have revised 705 we have revised 706 also we have revised along with that a few sections of the companies act also we have discussed 143 subsection 12 we have discussed 143 subsection 1 143 subsection 3 and 143 subsection 11 the reporting requirements under all these sections we have understood in addition to that a few specific concepts also we have understood we have understood the concept of branch audit we have understood the concept of joint audit we have understood the concept of internal audit along with that SA 610 also we have covered so till day uh, till now this is what actually we have revised so now the next thing the next chapter which we are going to take up for revision is audit documentation and audit evidence so now we are going to take up the revision of the chapter audit documentation and audit evidence so from the title itself you can identify this chapter is actually combination of two chapters this chapter audit documentation and evidence is actually a combination of two concepts actually so one concept is audit documentation and the another concept is audit evidence one concept is audit documentation and one concept is audit evidence in fact uh, in the study metal if you find you'll be able to find two different chapters but actually we have done some chapter rearrangement here two chapters we have combined audit documentation complete chapter we have taken from the audit evidence if you open the study material uh, and see audit material is a very big chapter in that whatever content relating to sa 500 is there so uh, i will come back to the standards later so a part of audit evidence chapter from the study material and complete audit documentation chapter both we have clubbed together and created this chapter audit documentation and audit evidence 
so like this we are going to have a discussion regarding two different topics but which are closely related with each other one is relating to audit documentation and the other one is relating to audit evidence and each of the concept is taken from specific standard audit documentation related discussion whatever we are going to have in this chapter that is actually taken from sa 230 whereas whatever discussion regarding audit evidence we are going to have in this chapter that is actually taken from sa 500 so when i say i am revising the chapter audit documentation and audit evidence we are actually trying to revise the content of two standards one is sa 230 and sa 500 so this chapter has been completely taken from two standards sa 230 and sa 500 that that's what we are going to revise see we will talk about audit documentation later first we will try to begin our discussion with audit evidence we will try to complete all the related discussion of the audit evidence so once we are done with the discussion of audit evidence then we will come back and try to understand the document uh, the discussion relating to audit documentation so we are going to begin with now audit evidence and when I say I'm going to revise this audit evidence, what in fact we are trying to revise? We are trying to revise the content from SA 500. So let us try to understand this. See, before I talk about this audit evidence, what is the meaning of audit evidence and all? First of all, let us try to understand, let us try to revise actually what is the overall process of the audit? What actually happens in the entire audit process? See, first of all, the first and basic thing which will happen in the entire audit process is auditor will get appointed. The first thing which auditor is going to do is the audit. The first thing which will happen in the entire audit process is auditor is going to get appointed. And we know what is the ultimate objective of the entire audit also. So what is the ultimate objective of the entire audit? The ultimate objective of the entire audit is auditor's opinion. The ultimate objective, the, the full and final outcome of the entire process of the audit is the auditor expressing an opinion. So the process of audit is going to commence with the auditor's appointment and the final step, the, the ultimate outcome in the entire process of the audit is the expression of opinion by the auditor. So you take any opinion, for example, if I am expressing your opinion on something, that opinion should be backed up by some information. That opinion should be supported by some information. Even in the audit also, if I am an auditor and if I am expressing an opinion, whatever opinion it could be, it could be unmodified opinion, it could be qualified, it could be adverse, it could be disclaimer. Any opinion should be backed up by some information. So that information in the audit terminology, we are going to call it as audit evidence. What we are going to call it audit evidence. If I put it in simple terms, audit evidence means nothing but the information which supports the auditor's opinion. Or alternatively, I can also say that the information which forms the basis for the auditor's opinion that I am going to call it as audit evidence. That I am going to call it as what? Audit evidence. So, the ultimate objective of the auditor is to express the opinion. But to express that opinion, auditor needs some supporting information which we are going to call it as audit evidence. So, in simple terms, the information which forms the basis or which supports the auditor's opinion. And how the auditor will get this evidence is so, See, just because you are appointed as an auditor, evidence will not automatically come and fall in your lap. So as an auditor, you need to put some efforts from your side in order to obtain that evidence and that efforts which auditor is going to put in order to get that audit evidence that we are going to call it as audit procedures. That we are going to call it as what? Audit procedures. So what overall happens in an entire audit process is first auditor will get appointed. Then he will perform something called audit procedures. Sir, what is the meaning of audit procedures? Audit procedures is actually a very broad term. It includes everything which auditor gets, auditor does in order to obtain the evidence that we call it as audit procedures. So audit procedures is actually a very broad term. It includes everything which auditor does to obtain the audit evidence. So first auditor will get appointed, then he will perform audit procedures. From that performance of audit procedures, he will get something called audit evidence. And on the basis of that audit evidence, auditor is going to express the opinion. By expression of opinion, the process of audit is going to come to an end. So this is what the entire process of audit. See, we have actually addressed the last part, how to express the opinion, what kind of opinions are there. So how to express that opinion in the form of an audit report that everything we have covered in the audit reporting chapter. Now our focus will be on these two important steps. This chapter is going to be on the, fo the focus of this chapter is going to be on two important steps. That is this audit procedures and audit evidence. So as I have told, first we are going to begin our discussion with audit evidence. But before we can understand the meaning of audit evidence in a detailed manner, first let us try to understand about this audit procedures. So to get a better understanding of audit evidence, we need to have first a better understanding of audit procedures. So let us try to understand audit procedures and also try to elaborate what are the different types of audit procedures that we will try to understand. Okay. So what are different kinds of audit procedures? First of all, meaning of audit procedure, as I have told, 
or any procedure which is performed by the auditor to obtain audit evidence that we call it as audit procedures and the term audit procedures is a very broad term it includes everything whatever auditor is doing to obtain the audit evidence and these audit procedures are broadly divided into two categories how many categories guys two categories audit procedures are broadly divided into two categories number one is risk assessment procedures and number two is further audit procedures so audit procedures are going to get divided into two categories one is risk assessment procedure and the other one is further audit procedure and this further audit procedure is further divided into two categories one is compliance procedure and the other one is substantive audit procedure so broadly two categories but when i talk in the specific terms audit audit procedures are divided into three specific categories risk assessment procedures compliance procedures and substantive audit procedures so let us try to understand what is the meaning of this term risk assessment procedure what is the meaning of this term compliance procedures and what actually happens in the substantive audit procedures first i will try to begin my discussion with risk assessment procedures let's take a typical scenario you have been appointed as auditor of some company uh, one fine day you have to go and start doing the audit of that entity so when you go and start doing the audit of the entity do you think you will directly go to the accounts department and start verifying books of accounts no so first thing when we as an auditor we have to start the audit of one particular client the first procedure which we do is risk assessment procedure sir what actually happens in the risk assessment procedures so it has been defined that risk assessment procedures are those procedures which are performed to obtain understanding of truth of three things risk assessment procedures are performed to obtain understanding of three things which three things is sir number one to obtain an understanding of entity to obtain an understanding of the environment in which your client is operating and also to obtain an understanding of the internal controls which your client is having so first thing what we do when we start doing the audit the first thing we'll try to uh, we'll try to perform procedures to obtain understanding of what to obtain understanding of three things entity environment and its internal control sir why do we need to obtain understanding of entity environment and its internal control for the purpose of identifying to find out and assess analyze risk of material misstatement to identify and assess that is to find out and analyze something called risk of material misstatement and those procedures we have given a name called risk assessment procedures so whatever i have told you now that is actually the meaning of the term risk assessment procedures so if they ask you what is the meaning of risk assessment procedures it involves understanding those are the procedures performed to obtain understanding of three things what are they to obtain an understanding of entity to obtain an understanding of client's environment to obtain an understanding of internal controls for what purpose to identify and assess the risk of material misstatement that procedures we are going to call it as risk assessment procedures the name itself says assessment of risk this procedures you are performing to analyze the risk so that we are going to call it as risk assessment procedure so that is what the first thing we will do okay so we understood entity environment and its internal control we understood where the risk is higher where the risk is lower that all we will do with that risk assessment procedure will get completed then what we will do so after performing risk assessment procedures the standards on audit says you need to perform something called compliance procedures sir what is the meaning of compliance procedures the meaning of compliance procedures is those procedures which are performed to obtain audit evidence regarding operating effectiveness of internal controls regarding what operating effectiveness of internal controls there is other name for compliance procedures we also call it as test of details sorry sorry test of controls sorry sorry so there is other name for compliance procedures we are going to call it as what test of controls the name itself says here you are going to verify the internal controls see in the risk assessment procedures we will just identify we'll just get to know what controls are there in the client's organization in the compliance procedures what we actually try to do is we try to perform audit procedures we try to obtain audit evidence whether the internal controls whatever i have understood in the risk assessment procedures whether they are operating effectively or there are some weaknesses in the internal controls so those procedures which i am performing to obtain in audit evidence regarding operating effectiveness of internal controls that i am going to call it as compliance procedures the name other name for this compliance procedures is test of controls other name for this compliance procedures is what test of controls the name itself says whether controls are working effectively or not okay so first i have done risk assessment procedures in which i have understood the entity identified the risk then i have performed compliance procedures in which in which i understood whether the internal controls are operating effectively or not now what you will do 
So now what we will do is we will try to actually go and verify the books of accounts. So we try to verify whether information, whether financial information is accurate and not misleading. That is whether the information in the books of accounts, whether the information in the financial statements, whether it is correct or not, whether the profit is correctly calculated or not, whether purchases figure is correct or not, whether the assets are correct or not. So this actual verification of the books of accounts and financial statements we will do at this stage. And those procedures, I am going to call it as substantive audit procedures. So what is the meaning of substantive audit procedures? It involves actual verification of books of accounts and financial statements, whether information in the financial statements and books of accounts is accurate, not misleading, whether it is reliable or not. So checking that information in the books of accounts, actual verification of the financial information, that procedures we are going to call it as substantive audit procedures. And whether the information in the books of accounts, whether the financial information is correct, accurate and reliable or not, that substantive audit procedures, we can do it by using two approaches. For that, we can either follow test of details or we can alternatively follow analytical procedures. So substantive analytical procedures can be done in two ways. So whether financial information is correct or not, that we can get it done in two ways. One is by doing something called test of details. Other one is by doing something called analytical procedures. Sir, what will happen in the test of details? See, if I ask you one simple question, if you want to know whether the financial information is correct or not, whether interest in the books of accounts is correct or not, what you will simply do? We will simply verify the supporting documents. So that verification of supporting documents only, I call it as test of details. So to know whether financial information is correct or not, we try to verify the supporting documents that we call it as test of details. And this test of details will be of further two categories. One is a test of transactions and the other one is test of balances. Nothing but if you try to verify the supporting documents of incomes and expenses that we call it as test of transactions. If you are trying to verify the supporting documents of assets and liabilities that we are going to call it as test of balances. Able to understand everybody. So, substantive audit procedures can be done in two ways. One is test of details, other one is analytical procedures. Test of details means verification of supporting documents. That is further divided into two categories. Test of transactions, test of balances. Test of transactions means verification of supporting documents of incomes and expenses. Test of balances means verification of supporting documents of assets and liabilities. See, uh, see there is one more way by which we can verify whether the financial information is correct or not, which approach we call it as analytical procedures. See, in the analytical procedures, what we do is we will not check the supporting documents documents to know whether financial information is correct or not we will not check supporting documents why because if we check the supporting documents for that we have already given a name called test of details so to check whether the financial information is correct or not instead of verifying supporting documents we do one more thing what is that one more thing is we try to study the relationship between financial and non-financial information what we try to do we try to study the relationship between financial and non-financial information by studying that uh, by studying that relationship we try to evaluate whether the financial information is correct or not so that procedure i am going to call it as analytical procedure so for the time being now you just remember what is the definition of analytical procedures we have a dedicated chapter and a standard talking about analytical procedures there we will get to know about this analytical procedures in a much more detailed manner for the time being now just remember the definition of analytical procedures what is the meaning of analytical procedures uh, evaluation of financial information through understanding the plausible, the acceptable relationship between financial and non-financial information, that procedures I am going to call it as analytical procedures. So this is what the complete audit procedures are. Once again, if I do one quick recap, broadly two categories, risk assessment procedure, substantive audit procedure. Substantive audit procedure further divided into two categories, compliance procedures, uh, further audit process further divided into two categories compliance procedures substantive audit procedures substantive audit procedures can be done in two ways one is test of details other one is analytical procedures test of details is further divided into two categories test of transactions and test of balances clear now there is one more thing which i would like to bring to your notice see between compliance procedures and substantive audit procedures there is one relationship so the thing is one is performed to determine the nature timing and extent of other so let me not beat around the bush. Let me directly come to the point. The standards say that practically we perform compliance procedures to determine the nature, timing and extent of the substantive audit procedures. So what kind of substantive audit procedures we have to perform? How much time we have to perform substantive audit procedures? What depth of substantive audit procedures we have to perform? That will be decided on the basis of compliance procedures. If I give you an example, see basically we perform compliance procedures to know whether internal controls are effective or not. 
for example we performed compliance procedures and we came to know that internal controls are effective internal controls are all operating effectively see i told actual verification we will not do 100 percent verification we will try to do sampling if we came to know internal controls are effective they are not having any weaknesses internal controls are working very effectively in the organization will we try to perform more substantive audit procedures or less substantive audit procedures See so if the controls are very effective, we will try to perform less substantive audit procedures. We become comfortable with verifying lesser number of entries. On the other hand, if you perform compliance procedures and you decided that internal controls are not effective in the client's organization, internal controls are not working effectively, then what we will do? There we will try to perform more substantive audit procedures. So if you pay the close attention here, we are determining how much amount, how much extent of substantive audit procedures we have to perform that we are determining on the basis of outcome of the compliance procedures. So this is very important from the examination perspective. They might, they might ask it in the true or false statements, etc. So one thing we have to remember, we are performing compliance procedures and on the basis of that compliance procedures, we are going to determine the nature, timing and extent of the substantive audit procedures. Clear everybody? So these are all the different kinds of audit procedures. Everybody comfortable till here? So we understood what is the meaning of audit procedures and what are the various types of audit procedures we have understood. Everybody comfortable till here? So by performing this audit procedures, what we are going to get? So by performing this audit procedures, we are going to get something called audit evidence. So what is the meaning of the term audit evidence? As I've already told you, information that supports the auditor's opinion. This is a simple way. But if you have to get the marks, you have to write the technical definition. So they say that audit evidence means the information which forms the basis for auditor's opinion. See this word you have to use. The information which forms the basis for auditor's opinion, that information we are going to call it as audit evidence. Okay. So now let us talk about this audit evidence in a detailed manner. We'll talk about this audit evidence in a detailed manner. So where do we get the audit evidence from? Where do we get the audit evidence from? See, I'm not asking you by doing what you will get audit evidence that is sorted by performing audit procedures. We are going to get the audit evidence. But now I'm talking about from where we are going to get the, get the audit evidence. See, majority of the audit evidence, whatever audit evidence that we get in the audit, majority of that audit evidence, actually we get it from accounting records. Actually, we get it from accounting records. Sir, what do you mean by accounting records? Nothing but our books of accounts. That could be journal entries, that could be ledgers, that could be the supporting documents, that could be the agreements, that could be the contracts. So whatever evidence which the auditor is going to get in the audit, one of the major source for getting all that evidence is accounting records or accounting information. Okay. But my question is, do you think accounting records is the only source from which auditor is going to get the audit evidence? The answer is no. It is agreed majority of the information comes from the accounting records, but it is wrong to say auditor will get evidence only from accounting records. So auditor is going to get evidence from one more source also, one more, uh, source also which we call it as other information. So majority of the audit evidence comes from accounting records, but accounting records is not the only source from which auditor is going to get the evidence. There is some portion of evidence which is coming from other information also. Sir, what is that other information from which auditor can get audit evidence? That could be incorporation documents like MOA, AOA of the client's organization. From that also auditor can gather evidence. There could be external confirmation. From that also auditor can gather evidence. So like that, audit evidence broadly comes from two sources. Majority comes from accounting records, but apart from accounting records, Records, auditor also can gather some evidence from other information also like MOA, AOA, electron, uh, ex external confirmation from all these sources also auditor can gather audit evidence. And one more thing guys, when I say audit evidence, do you think audit evidence includes information only which supports the information in the books of accounts? For example, if there is a purchase entry written for 1 lakh in the books of accounts, when I check the invoice, in the invoice also there is 1 lakh rupees. In the invoice also there is one lakh rupees yes this is evidence evidence because it is supporting the information in the books of accounts assume that a purchase entry was written for one lakh when i check the invoice in the invoice the amount is only ten thousand guys if you pay attention this is also evidence this is evidence that information in the financial records is wrong so when i say audit evidence audit evidence just doesn't include the information which is supporting the books of accounts it also includes the information which is contradicting with the books of accounts if you got supporting information, it means it is giving you satisfaction that information in the books of accounts is correct. If you got, uh, uh, if, you, if you get non-supporting information, that is also evidence. Evidence that information in the books of accounts is wrong. And in some extreme circumstances, not getting responses, not getting evidences, is not getting proper information is also a kind of implied evidence. 
So when I say audit evidence, it just doesn't include only the information which supports the information in the books of accounts. It includes the information which contradicts with the books of accounts. In some cases, not getting information is also a kind of implied audit evidence. Now let us talk about various types of audit evidences. Various types of audit evidences. See, on the basis of form or nature, on the basis of form or nature, evidence can be divided into three categories. One is oral evidence, other one is documentary evidence and the other one is visual evidence. So, on the basis of form or nature, evidence can be divided into how many categories? Three categories. Oral evidence, documentary evidence, visual evidence. See, you can understand the meaning from the names used itself. Oral evidence, the evidence which you are getting by way of words spoken. You ask the question, getting the oral responses, oral evidence. Documentary evidence, something which is there in the written format, either in paper form or electronic form. Visual evidence, you are looking at something and getting the evidence. For example, you look at the fixed asset and get the evidence. That is a visual evidence. So, like this, on the basis of form or nature, evidence can be divided into three categories. Next, on on the basis of source on the basis of source evidence can be divided into two categories number one is internal evidence and the other one is external evidence very very important from this uh, you might get a question so on the basis of source evidence is further divided into two categories one is internal evidence other one is external evidence sir what is internal evidence the evidence which is originated which is generated within the client's organization that we are going to call it as internal evidence Whereas the evidence which is originated, generated outside of the client's organization, that we call it as external evidence. Very simple definition, internal. If something is getting generated within the client's organization, if the, if the source, if the generating point of the evidence is within the client's organization, that we call it as internal evidence. If something is getting generated outside of the client's organization, that we call it as external evidence. Now, I'll ask you one question. Purchase invoice, internal or external? Purchase invoice is an external evidence, not internal. Why? Why? Because if you go and buy the item, uh, for example, you are conducting audit of some client. If that client has purchased item, he will get purchase invoice. Where that purchase invoice is generated? In the supplier's premises, not in your client's premises. So, purchase invoice is an external evidence. Why? Because it is generated outside of the organization. Sale invoice, internal evidence. External confirmation, confirmation from the debtor, external evidence. Bank statement, external evidence. Then uh, other uh, vouchers, vouchers are internal evidence. So like that, on the basis of source, we can divide the evidences into two categories. Clear everybody? Able to understand? So we have divided evidence on the basis of form and nature. We have also divided the evidence on the basis of source. See, whenever the term audit evidence is used in the subject audit, it is always preceded by two terms. One is sufficient and the other one is appropriate. So if you would have paid attention, these terms we have already used. When we revised the chapter audit reporting, in order to explain different kinds of opinions, always I was telling whether auditor has obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. So not just at that place, throughout the subject of the audit, when at various instances, whenever the term audit evidence is getting used, it is always preceded by two terms. They always will say the auditor should obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Now let us try to understand what is the meaning of sufficiency, what is the meaning of appropriateness. Sufficiency is a measure of quantity of audit evidence. Let me write it, you will get confused. So sufficiency is a measure of quantity, volume, number. Do I want 100 evidences, 200 evidences, 300 evidences? That measure of quantity, that measure of number or volume, we call it as quantity, sufficiency. Whereas appropriateness is a measure of quality of evidence. Appropriateness is a measure of how much qualitative the evidence is. So, sufficiency is a measure of quantity. Appropriateness is a measure of quality. But the standards always will say the auditor shall obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Sir, what quantity amounts to sufficient? What quality amounts to appropriate? We know sufficiency means quantity. But how much quantity can be called as sufficient? What quality can be called as appropriate? There is no hard and fast rule there. It all depends on the facts and circumstances of each and every case. If I put it in simple terms, the auditor should use his professional judgment. The auditor should use his knowledge, experience and training. And depending on client to client, audit to audit, he has to decide in this particular scenario, how much quantity will be sufficient, what quality will be appropriate. This has to be decided by the auditor himself using his professional judgment. There is no hard and fast rule anywhere stated. But however, in taking that decision, what quantity amounts to sufficient, what quality amounts to appropriate, auditor will consider some factors. 
auditor will consider some factors so for determining sufficiency also auditor will consider some factors for determining appropriateness also auditor will consider some factors sir what are the factors which auditor will consider in determining what quantity of evidence will be sufficient number one he will look at the size of the organization see if the size of the organization is very big he requires more quantity of audit evidence if the size of the organization is small he will require less quantity of audit evidence he will also consider risk of material misstatement if the risk of material misstatement is very high he will ask for more quantity if the risk of material misstatement is low he will ask for less quantity it also depends on effectiveness of internal controls if the internal controls are very effective he will verify less transactions less quantity of audit evidence will be sufficient if he determines internal controls are not effective more substantive audit procedures he will perform more quantity of audit evidence he is looking for it depends on it also depends on a few other factors like materiality if he finds that certain item is very much material certain item is very very material some item is very very significant for that item he will try to obtain more quantity of audit evidence if he finds certain item as immaterial not that significant enough for that item he will try to obtain less quantity of audit evidence and he will also consider something called characteristics of population he will also consider something called characteristics of population see if the population is homogeneous population sir what is homogeneous population if the items in the population contain similar transactions there the quantity of audit evidence required will be less on the other hand if the population is a heterogeneous population if the population is going to contain dissimilar characteristics of transactions there he will try to ask for more quantity of audit evidence if i give you a simple example assume i have placed before you two files so in both the files purchase invoices are there in file a there are total 1000 invoices in file b also there are total 1000 invoices but in file a all the 1000 invoices are made from a single supplier from single supplier all the 1000 invoices are there in file b also 1000 purchases invoices are there but those 1000 invoices are made from three different suppliers mr x mr y mr z so here file a is a homogeneous population why because it contains similar transactions file b is a heterogeneous population why because it is having dissimilar characteristics if i ask you practically in which file you will try to verify more number of invoices in file b why because it is having different characteristics you want to cover all the different characteristics so even auditor will also consider characteristics of the population so like this auditor is going to consider various factors then he is going to determine which uh, uh, which factor will give uh, which how much quantity will be sufficient that will be decided after consideration of all these factors now how the auditor will determine appropriateness sir appropriateness means quality quality uh, uh, how much quantity how much quality will be appropriate that auditor will be deciding on two factors one is reliability and the other one is relevance the auditor will consider two factors in determining the appropriateness of the audit evidence one is reliability sir what is reliability trustability relevance relevance means what relatability how much that evidence is related to the given item of the financial statement and this reliability further depends on source and nature reliability further depends on source and nature like between internal versus external which one is more reliable external is more reliable so external is more qualitative so between oral documentary visual which one is more uh, qualitative which one is more uh, which one is more reliable documentary so documentary will be more appropriate so the auditor is going to determine appropriateness on the basis of two factors one is reliability one is relevance reliability further depends on two factors one is source and the other one is nature clear everybody till here comfortable now so now we will talk about one more concept called what are the various audit methods or techniques what are the various audit methods or techniques to obtain audit evidence see take for example i told risk assessment procedure in the risk assessment procedure what we will try to do we will try to obtain an understanding of entity environment and its internal control to identify risk of material misstatement but how you will understand about this entity environment and its internal control you need to follow some techniques no so what techniques are available Similarly, in the compliance procedures, we perform, we try to obtain audit evidence whether internal controls are working effectively or not. But you need to follow some techniques to know whether internal controls are really working effectively or not. Similarly, substantive audit procedures, we try to verify whether the financial information is correct or not. To know whether financial information is correct or not, we need to follow some techniques. So, or we need to follow some methods. So, what are the various methods or techniques available for performing audit procedures? what different methods or techniques are available to achieve the outcome of audit procedures see any audit procedure you take there are broadly seven methods or techniques there are how many methods or techniques there are only seven methods or techniques which are available which auditor will choose any of them to achieve the outcome of the audit procedures that is to achieve the audit evidence okay so what are that seven methods or techniques which are available for the auditor to achieve the outcome of the audit procedures 
so if you see here so those seven methods are going to be number one is inspection number two is inquiry number three observation number four external confirmation number five recalculation number six reperformance and number seven is going to be analytical procedures so these are the seven different methods or techniques which are available for the auditor to perform audit procedures so what are the seven methods guys very very important discussion we are going to have once again very repeatedly tested question from this particular chapter so what are the seven methods list them out once inspection inquiry observation recalculation reperformance analytical procedures i think i missed out some one more thing yeah external confirmation so let us try to understand what actually happens in each of this method so first we will try to understand inspection sir what is the meaning of inspection 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 means examining the records or documents simply if i have to put it in other way around test of details for example if you want to know purchase is correct or not what you will do you will check the supporting document what will be that purchase invoice if you want to know rent paid by your client company is correct or not how you will verify by checking something called rental agreement if you want to know insurance premium paid is correct or not by checking the supporting document which is insurance policy so checking of the supporting documents that we call it as inspection or it also involves physical examination of an asset to know whether assert is really existing or not if you go and physically examine that assert that also fall under inspection only for example you want to know whether inventory is there or not so you are going and doing the physical verification that is also inspection so inspection involves two things it involves either documentary examination it also involves a physical examination of an assert so then what is inquiry inquiry means seeking information from the knowledgeable persons nothing but inquiry means you are asking the questions and getting the responses whoever you feel knowledgeable in the organization you go to them ask the questions and get the information that seeking of information from the knowledgeable persons that we call it as inquiry and that inquiry can be informal oral inquiry or it could be a formal written inquiry also like for example if you want to ask the questions you can do it in a more formal way whatever questions you need answers you can write it in a piece of paper give it to the client ask them to give the responses also in a written format that is a formal written inquiry or even you can do the inquiry in way of informal oral inquiries also no paper nothing just you will go and informally ask the questions and get the information so inquiries can range from formal written inquiries to informal oral inquiries see in the inquiries the most integral part is not asking the question whatever responses you have got analyzing that responses and coming to the conclusion is the most integral part of the inquiry so evaluation of the responses is the most integral part and by doing inquiry you can get three kinds of information by doing inquiry you can get uh, by doing any inquiry you can get three kinds of information number one new information which you are not at all aware of or information which supports the information which you already know or information which is contradicting with the information which you know so by doing any inquiry only these three kinds of information you will get altogether new information or information which supports the information which you already know or information which is contradicting with the information which you know so by doing inquiry you will get any of these three responses any of these three kinds of information but the problem with the inquiry is inquiry will give you the least persuasive evidence it will not give you con it will be giving you less convincing evidence then compared with any other method inquiry may not be the evidence which you are obtaining from inquiry may not be persuasive it will be least convincing evidence at least satisfactory evidence you will get it by following a method called inquiry then the third one is observation sir what is observation the name itself says if you are trying to get the evidence by looking at a process being performed by others if you are trying to get the evidence by looking at a process being performed by others that i am going to call it as observation for example i am sitting and observing the management's counting process management is doing inventory counting i am sitting and observing that is what uh, i am getting the evidence by way of observation i want to know whether control is working effectively or not i am sitting there observing whether internal control is getting performed properly or not this is also observation do you think evidence whatever you are going to get from observation is it reliable it is reliable but the problem is that evidence will be reliable only till the point of time that observation is taking place that means if you are observing someone will do the activity very sincerely what is the guarantee when you are not observing the same person will do the same activity in the same manner what is the guarantee so that is the main problem with the observance for that point of time evidence will be reliable but there is no guarantee the same activity will happen in the same way without your observance 
clear so that is the problem with observation now another method to obtain audit evidence is external confirmation sir what is external confirmation Di getting a direct written response from a third party for example in your client's books of accounts there is a data mr a and the client has shown that that data is required to pay to your client company one crore rupee you want to know whether that is correct or not what you can do directly send an email or send a letter to that debtor sir i am the auditor of the company i came to know that my client is uh, you are required to pay some amount of uh, amount to my client please confirm what is the amount you are required to pay and if you get the response from that third party that we simply call it as external confirmation so external confirmation is a direct written response to the auditor from a third party guys oral response will not be considered as external confirmation as per the standards on auditing only written responses will have a validity written response only will fall under external confirmation definition more we will discuss later when we take up the standard sa 505 next one recalculation recalculation means nothing but checking of arithmetical accuracy whether additions or deletions profit calculation assets totaling all that calculations are done properly or not checking that we call it as recalculation but these things are outdated why because today all the basic math will be done by the software itself so that's why recalculation is still no longer relevant today and reperformance sir what is reperformance it is auditors independent execution of a process which is already performed by the entity like for example, entities management or entities employees have already done some process, but you are doing it once again to know whether it is correct or not. That we call it as re-performance. If I give you a simple example, the management staff has already prepared the BRS. But you are telling, I also know how to prepare the BRS. You prepare the BRS once again on your own, then compared with the management's BRS. So you have independently executed a process which is already done by entity. This we call it as re-performance. And finally, we have next one called analytical procedures. As I have already told you, in the analytical procedures, we will not do something called checking of the supporting documents and all. We will try to study the relationship between financial and non-financial information. And on the basis of that, we are going to evaluate evaluate whether the financial information is correct or not so that we are going to call it as analytical procedure where we simply try to study the relationship and evaluate whether the financial information is correct or not so for achieving the objective of any audit procedure these are the only seven techniques which are available so what are the seven techniques inspection inquiry observation external confirmation uh, recalculation reperformance and finally analytical procedures so these are the seven methods relating to audit evidence understood everybody clear and comfortable so now we will try to discuss the next important concept from this uh, chapter relating to audit evidence which is relating to the term called assertion so now we are going to discuss a small concept relating to assertion and what are the various different kinds of assertions are there see this term is very very important from the examination perspective they might ask a true or false statement or a mcq relating to this concept of assertion so please listen carefully so this term we often come across this uh, subject audit the term assertion is used at various instances uh, throughout the course of the audit so now we will try to revise quickly what is this concept of assertion see assertion means simply the representation assertion means simply a representation made by management regarding the items of the financial statements so what is the simple meaning of the term assertion assertion means simply a representation conveyance of information whatever representations which the management is making regarding the items of the financial statements those representations which are made by the management regarding items of financial statements that i am going to simply call it as assertion and when i say representations made by the management those representations may be explicit uh, explicit representations or they might be implied representations also so when you take the financial statements of any entity, if you look at the items of the financial statements, there are so many representations which the management is making. Some representations they are making explicitly, some representations they are making implicitly. So let me give you one simple example to make you understand this concept of assertion in a detailed manner. Take for example, you have taken a balance sheet of some company. In the balance sheet of the company, you are able to find something called fixed assets amounting to 100 crores in the, in the balance sheet. In the balance sheet of the company, you are able to find the financial statement. In the financial statements, you are able to find that there are fixed assets which are shown as 100 crores were on the face of the balance sheet. See, who will prepare financial statements? Management. Now, the management, just by showing this fixed assets as 100 crores, they are trying to convey a lot of information, which they may not write, expli uh, which they may not write explicitly anywhere, but just by showing this fixed assets as 100 crores on the face of the balance sheet, they are trying to make a lot of implied representations. What are they? So by showing fixed assets as 100 crores, management is trying to convey that fixed assets worth 100 crores are in existence with the company as on the balance sheet date. 
they will not write it anywhere but just by showing fixed assets as 100 crores they are impliedly trying to convey that the fixed assets worth 100 crores are existing with the company as on balance sheet date that we are going to call it as existence assertion and by showing the fixed assets as 100 crores management is trying to convey that they have completely recorded all the fixed assets they did not miss out anything from the books of accounts then the total value came to 100 crores that we call it as completeness assertion and by showing this fixed assets as 100 crore rupees they are impliedly trying to convey that they are the owners of that assets we also call it as rights so management is trying to convey that they have ownership rights against that assets that's why only they have shown as uh, fixed crore, fixed assets in their balance sheet and also by showing that fixed assets as 100 crore rupees are even trying to convey that they have valued all the fixed assets properly then the correct value came to 100 crore rupees you could understand what i'm trying to say so by simply showing fixed assets as 100 crore rupees management is trying to make all these representations guys see here all these representations are not explicitly done all these are implied so these representations these conveyance of information which is done by the management regarding the items of the financial statements that we call it as assertion so when I say assert, for this assert, the assertions are existence, completeness, ownership, valuation. Similarly, if you take balance sheet, for example, in the liability side, there is a long-term borrowing. They have shown 50 crore rupees. Now the management, by showing this long-term borrowings as 50 crore rupees, here also they are trying to make a lot of representations. They are trying to convey that long-term borrowings worth 50 crore rupees are existing with the company as on the balance sheet date. They have recorded completely all the long-term borrowings that did not ignore anything from the books of accounts. They have an obligation. In case of assets, we say rights, but in case of borrowings, the, the company is trying to convey they are having an obligation to pay 50 crore rupees. And they also they are also trying to convey that they have valued all their long-term borrowings properly, then the correct value came to 50 crore rupees. So just by showing this long-term borrowings as 50 crores in their balance sheet, all these representations are implicitly made by the management. All this we call it as assertions. These are all assertions regarding liabilities. Similarly, if you take any PL item, for example, I will take now PL item. Now, in the PL item, for example, in the statement of PL, there is a revenue in the revenue 1000 crores was shown. Now, by showing this revenue as 1000 crore rupees, there are various assertions here also management is trying to make. So, by showing revenue as 1000 crore rupees, they are trying to convey that revenue transactions worth 100 crores have occurred, have taken place during the financial year. And they are also trying to convey that they have completely recorded all the revenue transactions. They did not miss out anything from the books of accounts. And also, they are trying to convey that these are relating to current year whatever transactions are there whatever revenue of thousand crores is there which has been recorded which has taken place in the current year none of the future years revenue has been recorded in the current year none of the past years revenue has been recorded in the current year that assertion we give a name called cutoff and also they are trying to give a con they are trying to convey you that they have measured this revenue properly nothing but they have calculated this revenue properly then the correct value came to then the correct amount came to thousand crore rupees and i can keep on adding they are also trying to say that classification they have classified the uh, they have classified this revenue in a proper manner so like this regarding the items of the p and l these are all the various assertions which are made by the management so like this whatever assertions which the management is making regarding the various items of the financial statements that we call it as assertion and if you pay close attention carefully here, as an auditor, when I say I'm trying to verify the financial statements, I will try to obtain audit evidence regarding these assertions only. For example, if I'm telling I want to verify the fixed assets and I want to verify the fixed assets and I want to obtain audit evidence regarding which matters you will try to obtain audit evidence, you will try to obtain audit evidence whether really fixed assets are in existence or not, whether really fixed assets are all completely recorded or not, company is the owner of that fixed assets, company has valued the fixed assets properly or not. So whatever representations which are made by the management regarding those assertions only auditor will try to obtain the audit evidence. The same thing with revenue also. For example, if I have to verify the revenue, what things I will try to verify regarding revenue? I will try to verify whether revenue has really occurred during the year, whether the company has completely recorded all the revenue related transactions, whether revenue belongs to current year only or not, whether the revenue has been measured properly or not, whether the PL items have been classified properly or not. So if I put it in other way around whatever assertions which are made by the management regarding that only auditor will always try to obtain audit evidence. So you will be able to find the definition here. So see the definition here. Assertion. Assertion refers to representations made by management. Who will make the representations? Management. Very important for true or false statements. They might ask you a question that a true or false statement they will ask. They will say assertions refer to representations made by auditor blah blah blah. 
so that is actually wrong assertions are always representations made by management they could be either explicit those assertions might be expressly stated or otherwise that means assertions could be implicit also they might not be stated anywhere they are implied like the way i have told you examples now all of that are implied assertions they are not expressly stated they are all implied that are embodied in the financial statements that are incorporated in the financial statements that means whatever representations which the management is making which are included which are embodied in the financial statements and the same things are used by the auditor to consider different types of potential misstatements nothing but whatever representations which the management is making regarding that only auditor will try to obtain audit evidence whether misstatements are there or not so this is the definition of the term assertion which you all guys have to remember and in case if they ask you to write the examples of the assertions these are the examples whatever we have included here these are the examples which you are supposed to write in your examination clear everybody able to understand so this is what relating to assertion understood so with this majority of the concepts relating to audit evidence we are done with sa 500 major discussion most important discussion from the examination perspective we are all done with now we will try to understand the concepts relating to audit documentation as i have told this chapter audit documentation and audit evidence it is actually a combination of two different concepts one is audit documentation one is audit evidence audit evidence related part of discussion we are done with now we are going to start our discussion regarding audit documentation and whatever content we are supposed to discuss in the audit documentation that has actually been taken from sa 230. first of all let us try to understand what is the meaning of audit documentation what is the meaning of the term audit documentation the term audit documentation has been defined as it is a record it is a storage of audit procedures performed by the auditor audit evidence which the auditor has gathered and whatever conclusions which the auditor has reached that recorded information regarding the audit we are going to call it as audit documentation very important definition so if they ask you what is the meaning of the term audit documentation what you are going to write so audit documentation is nothing but it is a record of it is a storage of whatever audit procedures you have performed whatever audit evidence you have gathered on the basis of that audit evidence whatever conclusions you have generated so what nothing but in, if i put it in simple terms whatever you have done in the audit what procedures you have performed by performing that procedures what evidences you have gathered on the basis of that uh, on the basis of that evidences what conclusions you have reached everything we have to store it that recorded information only we call it as audit document so audit documentation is very very important from the perspective of the audit why because if tomorrow something goes wrong in your audit and if someone makes an allegation against you so and so person has not done the audit effectively then you have to go and protect uh, then you have to go and prove in the court of law that as an auditor you have done the audit sincerely so the burden of proof will be on the auditor if tomorrow any allegation comes against the auditor that auditor did not do the work properly so auditor himself has to go and prove before the court that he has done the work properly without his mistake sir how he will prove if he go and swear sir sir mommy promised daddy promised i did the work sincerely please spare me no one is going to listen so at that point of time when you have to prove before the regulatory authorities that you have done the work sincerely there is no mistake from your side the only thing which will come to your rescue is audit documentation what will only come to your rescue audit documentation so that is what the main purpose of audit documentation and there are other names for audit documentation we also call it as working papers or work papers also we are going to call sometimes we also call it as audit file and audit documentation is the most important thing which every auditor must concentrate because if tomorrow something goes wrong the only thing which will come to your rescue is what audit documentation if i put it in simple terms from the beginning till the ending whatever you have done in the audit everything should form part of audit documentation like what is your audit team what is your audit plan how many engagement team members are there which person has carried out which work what uh, procedures you have performed in each area by performing that procedures what evidences you have gathered supporting documents you have verified the agreements you have seen and on the basis of that evidence how you have formed a conclusion on what basis you have decided which kind of opinion will be appropriate like what is the impact of the misstatement how you have decided whether the misstatement is material or material and pervasive what audit report you have given so like this from the beginning till the ending whatever we have done in the audit everything should be stored in the audit so that we call it as audit documentation sir what is the main purpose of the audit documentation so as i've already told you the main purpose of the audit documentation is it will act as a proof that you have performed the work as per the standards on audit so like as you could see audit documentation provides the evidence the evidence of auditors basis for conclusion if tomorrow someone is coming and asking you boss you have given so and so opinion on that company's financial statements on what basis you have given that opinion 
I should have something in my favor to prove that. No. So what will act as a evidence? Audit documentation is going to act as a evidence that there is a basis for the conclusion and one and on what basis you have given the conclusion that will be provided by audit documentation. And also audit documentation provides evidence that audit was planned and performed in accordance with the standards on audit. If tomorrow someone is coming and asking you, you have done the audit, did you do the audit as per your wishes or did you do the audit as per the standards on audit? I need some information to prove my point. Uh, to prove my point no. So at that point of time, if tomorrow someone is coming and asking you whether you have complied with the standards on audit or not, I can show to them my audit documentation. Sir, see the documentation in this clearly it was there. I have complied with all the standards on audit. So the main objective of audit documentation is to it will, it will act as a evidence for the basis of the auditor's opinion. It will also act as a evidence for uh, evidence that audit was planned and performed in accordance with standards. So that is the main objective. But apart from that main objective, there are various other purposes also which documentation is going to fulfill. So the main objective is it will act as evidence. But apart from that main objective, it will, it will also serve various other purposes. So what are the other purposes or what are the other advantages of audit documentation? Number one, if you have an audit documentation, it will assist the engagement team. It will benefit the engagement team. It will act as a guidance for the engagement team to plan and perform the audit. And it will assist the members of the engagement team to direct and supervise the audit work and to discharge their review responsibilities. That means if you have a proper documentation in place, you can betterly direct, you can give proper instructions to your engagement team members, even you can supervise them properly. And enabling engagement team to be accountable for its work. By maintaining audit documentation, you can make your engagement team members responsible for that work. Why? Because if tomorrow something goes wrong, I can, e I can easily find out that work was assigned to him. I can easily call that person and fix the responsibility on him. So if you have audit documentation in place, it will make the engagement team members accountable, responsible for their work. And retaining records of matters of continuous significance for future audits. Nothing but if you maintain the audit documentation of the current year, that will help you even to perform the audit of the subsequent years. And also by having audit documentation, you can conduct internal control quality reviews and inspections. If you want to review whether your engagement team members are doing work properly or not. If you have audit documentation, you can review. If there is no concept of audit documentation, there is no chance of reviewing the work. Not just internal reviews, if at all any external inspection has to happen, like for example, like a peer review has to happen. So even for external inspection to happen, if audit documentation is there, external inspection will happen. If audit documentation is not there, external inspection is not going to happen at all. So apart from the main objective, audit documentation will also serve all these purposes. Sir, what should be the contents of audit documentation? As I have told, from the beginning till the ending, whatever you have done in the audit, everything should form part of documentation. That could be your audit programs or plans. That could be whatever analysis you are doing. That could be issues, memorandum, nothing but whatever questions you are asking, whatever responses you are getting. And along with that, summaries of significant matters, what communications and representations you have got, checklist, correspondence, communication about the significant matters, who performed the audit work, when that work was completed, who reviewed the work, when that review was done. So like that from the beginning till the ending, whatever we do in the audit, everything should form part of my audit documentation. Then coming to the next question, what are the factors which affect the form, timing and extent of audit documentation? See three questions they are asking. How you are going to decide the form? Form in the sense format for maintaining audit documentation. What is the timing? At what time you have to obtain the audit documentation? And how much extent, how much volume of audit documentation you are going to maintain? So first I will talk about format. What should be the format of audit documentation? Guys, in the standards on auditing, there is no prescribed format which has been uh, mentioned. The standard did not say in this specific format you have to maintain audit documentation. Like that standard did not give you any specific format for audit documentation. Instead, what simply SA230 has told is, you maintain the documentation in such a manner that some other experienced auditor having no previous connection with this audit, he should be able to understand how you have planned and performed the audit by going through the audit documentation. Which means if I put it in simple terms, what they're trying to say is, for example, you are an auditor, you conducted the audit, uh, you conducted the audit of X limited company. Now the standard simply says that you should maintain documentation in such a manner that some other experienced auditor, some other experienced chartered accountant, even though he is not associated with this audit in any manner, he should be able to understand how you have done the audit, what procedures you have followed, what evidences you have gathered, what conclusions you have reached. He should be able to understand by just going through your audit documentation in such a manner you are supposed to maintain the audit documentation. That's all. 
they did not mention any format just to maintain the documentation in such a manner some other experienced auditor having no previous connection with this audit should be able to understand what we have done and what conclusions you have reached just by going through your documentation in such a manner you have to maintain the documentation there is no specific format they have given now coming to timing of audit documentation sir when you have to gather the audit documentation the standard says you have to gather audit documentation as in when the audit progresses so you should not be like first i will complete the entire audit then i will gather documentation no that will not be reliable so the documentation which you will gather as and when you perform the audit procedures will be more reliable than the documentation which you will get after the completion of the entire audit so you should not postpone the collection of the audit documentation as and when you are performing the audit procedures simultaneously have to gather audit documentation don't postpone it to a later point of time why because its reliability will get reduced then extent of documentation sir how much amount of audit documentation i have to maintain how much volume of audit documentation i have to maintain how much quantity of audit documentation i have to maintain that depends on various factors that depends on various factors so how much extent how much volume how much content of audit documentation you have to maintain that depends on various factors and those factors are size and complexity of the entity if your client size is very big if the if your client is engaged in very complex transactions then you might require large volume of audit documentation if the client is small in size if the client's operations are very simple not at all complex then you will have less quantity of audit documentation it depends on the nature of audit procedures you are performing what kind of audit procedures you are performing on that also the extent of documentation will rely and also identified risk of material misstatement if you find risk is very high you will perform more audit procedures you will have more evidence and that evidence will go inside in audit documentation that means audit documentation is going to get bulky when the risk of material misstatement is very high and also significance of the audit evidence you have obtained if you find certain certain evidence as very very significant that you will include it if you find an evidence as not that significant you will not include it so how much volume of documentation you are going to maintain that depends on significance of the evidences also importance of the evidences also it also depends on nature and extent of exceptions for the time being now exceptions you understand it as deviations whatever you have found out misstatements you have found out if you are finding more misstatements regarding that you want more documentation if you found less misstatements regarding that you want less documentation and it also depends on what audit methodology you are using and what tools you are using for conducting the audit so these are the various factors which auditor has to keep in mind while considering the extent of the audit documentation clear and comfortable everybody now so coming to the next question which is write about assembly of audit file its ownership and retention very very important most of the time the question comes from this chapter regarding this audit file only see i have told you audit documentation what is the meaning of audit documentation i have told the audit documentation also will be sometimes referred to as audit file audit documentation audit file both are actually very you know, very interchangeable terms but there is a slight difference when we look from the conceptual perspective there is a slight difference between audit documentation and audit evidence audit file so what is that difference between audit documentation and audit file let me try to explain it in a practical way for example assume that uh, abc and co an audit firm has got the audit of the client x limited now for conducting this audit some 10 engagement team members have gone and did the audit now in these 10 engagement team members every person will do a portion of work so the work will be divided among all the engagement team members each person will be doing certain kind of work for example this person has performed work relating to purchases now this person will have audit documentation relating to purchases for this person sales work has been assigned this person will have audit documentation relating to the area of sales for this person incomes was allocated now this person will have uh, audit documentation relating to incomes for another person fixed assets was allocated this person will have audit documentation relating to fixed assets so every person will have certain portion of documentation relating to whatever work we have done so this we call it as generally audit documentation nothing but what procedures you have performed what evidences you have gathered that you will store so this we generally call it as audit documentation see every person will have a portion of audit documentation but don't you think once the audit gets completed all the engagement team members should sit together gather all their audit documentation and they need to arrange it in a proper order and they have to create such a file that it will be useful for the future so that organized audit documentation that properly arranged audit documentation we call it as audit file that's all see in the audit documentation audit file same content will be there but audit documentation is in its very raw format unorganized content 
Now, generally what will happen is once the audit gets completed, all the engagement team members sit together, they will gather all the, they will compile all the documentation gathered by different engagement team members. They will arrange in one proper order. If they find any duplicate documents, they will delete it. They will stay, they will store in proper file format. They will organize it in a proper way so that it becomes useful in the future. So that organized, that properly arranged documentation, I'm going to call it as audit file. That's it. So in both content is going to remain the same, but in, in case of documentation, it is a very much unorganized or a raw format of the documentation. Whereas audit file is an organized audit file is an arranged properly fixed documentation that we call it as audit file. Able to understand. And this audit file, sir, is there any time limit within which this uh, assembly process should get completed? See, generally, this arrangement of raw format of documentation into audit file that we call it as assembly of audit file. See, whatever this raw documentation is there, compiling all that, creating one final file which is ready. So, that process we call it as assembly of final audit file. Do you think, should there be any time limit within which this assembly of the audit file should get completed? Yes. Why? Because if the standards did not give you any time limit, what will happen is the auditors will become very lazy. They will never arrange that final audit file. So that's why the standard has put some time limit. There is a maximum time within which this assembly of final audit file should get completed. Sir, what is that time limit? They say within 60 days. Within 60 days from the date of auditor's report or within 60 days from the completion of the audit, this assembly of audit file should get completed. This arrangement of the entire audit documentation into proper file, arranging in proper sequence, deleting the duplicate documents. So this process should get completed within 60 days from the date of auditor's report. So now you tell me, if during this assembly of the final audit file, that, uh, during the process of assembling of this final audit file, does it involve performing any new audit procedures? No. During the assembly process, we don't perform any new audit procedures. Will we form any new conclusions during the assembly of the final audit file? No. So during that assembly of final audit file, we will not perform any new audit procedures. We will not perform any new conclusions. We will just do some administrative work like giving the page numbers, deleting the duplicate documents, only this kind of administrative work we will do during that assembly process. We don't perform any new audit procedures. We don't perform any, we don't take any new conclusions. Clear and comfortable everybody. So within 60 days, you are supposed to complete and during that 60 days, no new work will be done. Only administrative work will be done. Okay, sir. Once audit file is ready, I have uh, or engagement team sat together, created one final audit file. What should be done with that final audit file? Should you go and throw it away? No, you should not throw away that audit file. What you, what you should do, sir, that audit file should be retained. What should be done? That audit file should be retained. How long that audit file has to be retained? So, they say audit file has to be retained for a period of seven years from the date of the auditor's report or the group's audit report, whichever is later. So simply you remember for seven years from the date of the completion of audit, this audit file has to be kept in a proper custody for seven years. You have to keep it safe. And then and one more thing said this audit file is whose property who is the owner of that audit file. See when I say audit file whose information is there? client's information is there. Who gathered it? Auditor gathered it. Now this audit file whatever is there that is whose property that is uh, that is uh, under the ownership of whom. Is it the property of auditor or is it the property of the client? The standard says audit documentation is always the property of the auditor. Audit documentation is always the property of auditor. Why? Because though it might contain the information relating to the client, but that information has been gathered by the auditor. That information has been gathered by performing the efforts of the auditor. So that's why audit documentation is always under the ownership of the auditor. Sir, if the management is requesting the auditor to share the copies of the audit documentation, is he under an obligation to do it? No, there is no obligation on the auditor to share the copies of audit documentation with the management. There is no compulsion. If he wants, he can share. If he doesn't want, he will not share. No one can compel him. So unless there is a legal or regulatory, uh, regulatory requirement, auditor is under no obligation to share the audit documentation. It is completely at his discretion. It is completely at his own choice. If he wants, he will share. If he doesn't want, he will not share. Now I have one more question to ask you guys. I explained you the concept of branch audit. Do you remember? See, in the case of branch audit, the branch auditor will complete the branch audit and submit his branch audit report to the principal auditor. Now, can the principal auditor demand the working papers of the branch auditor? Or if I put the question in the other way around, is the branch auditor under an obligation to share the copies of audit documentation with the principal auditor? The answer is no. 
even branch auditor is not under an obligation to share the copies of audit documentation with the principal auditor here also the branch auditor is at his own choice it is at his own discretion if the branch auditor wants he will share the copies with the principal auditor if the branch auditor doesn't want to do it he can't he will not do it even principal auditor can't compel the branch auditor to share the copies of audit documentation with him clear everybody so this is what regarding audit file its ownership and also its retention everybody able to understand till here clear and comfortable so since we understood about assembly of the audit file its retention and ownership let us proceed further and understand few more questions from this chapter audit documentation so we will have one small concept called audit notebook what is audit notebook and also state its contents see very simple concept guys and also important from the examination perspective see whenever you go for the audit as a member of the engagement team you are required to carry one notebook so in that notebook a variety of matters will be required to be recorded but mainly in the audit notebook see the notebook which generally engagement team members carry that we call it as audit notebook now what is the purpose of the audit notebook what things will be recorded in the notebook see in the audit notebook two things will be recorded number one the status of the work done by an engagement team member each day for example if you are an engagement team member you are conducting audit of some entity today you have started doing the audit today you have verified the purchases so by the end of the day in your audit notebook you have to record the status of the work so like that every engagement team member who is associated with the audit engagement he will given he will be given one notebook and in that audit notebook you are supposed to write the status of the work done each and every day and not just that during the course of the audit you will get across various queries you will have various doubts so if you don't record the doubts anywhere what would happen is as we humans have the natural tendency to forget whatever doubts which we got during the course of the audit if we don't make a note of that we also tend to forget our doubts so if you forget your doubts you will not be able to get the replies from uh, replies from the staff of the client's staff and then ultimately your audit effectiveness will be lost so that's why whatever doubts you have got during the course of the audit as and when you have as and when you have got the doubt you have to immediately record in that notebook whatever has been given to you so that is what the main purpose of this audit notebook so it is mainly used for recording two things number one status of the work done each and every day and also whatever queries whatever questions you have come across during the course of the audit that you need to record along with that status of disposal that is first you will record a list of all the doubts whatever you have got then you will record your response also is it resolved or is it not it resolved if it is resolved what response you have got as a part of resolution if it is not it resolved you will not forget it till the last moment of the audit you will keep on following with the following up with the client forgetting the responses so that is what the main purpose of the audit notebook sir why status of the work has to be recorded see we understood queries why it is important to note down the doubts that is uh, very much clear why because to improve the overall audit effectiveness now why it is required to note down the status of the work also why because sometimes what will happen is an engagement team member is required to be replaced for example we are conducting audit of some client x limited there used to be one article assistant mr a he came for two days of audit after that he becomes sick and his work has to be taken up by another engagement team member see assume that this work has to be taken by another engagement team member mr b see if mr b doesn't know where exactly did the person mr a stopped his work what will happen to mr b once again he has to start the work from the beginning on the other hand if mr b knows where exactly mr e has stopped doing the work he can take up the work he can resume the work exactly from the same point so it will unnecessarily avoid doing the work twice so sometimes concerned article assistants might be away from the work or sometimes audit will be stopped temporarily for example an engagement team has started doing audit of the client x limited they did the audit for five days because of some reason they have given the gap of 10 days after that they want to resume so if they don't know where exactly they have stopped the work previously once again here also what will happen you have to begin the you have to commence the audit once again from the beginning which will be a double work so in order to avoid that here in these circumstances uh, whenever the concerned assistant is away from the work or when the work has been stopped temporarily so if you want to resume the work once again you need that link of work you need to know where exactly the work has been stopped previously so that link of work will be provided by the audit notebook clear everybody so that is what the purpose here as you could see very very important question from the examination perspective guys audit notebooks helps in tracking the links of the work when the concerned assistants are away from the work and also it is used for recording various queries that you have come across during the course of audit and also what is their status 
are they disposed or not at disposed in case if the queries are already disposed that means if the queries are resolved you need to record what explanation you have got in case if some queries are unresolved then you need to do the follow-up so that is what going to be the main purpose of the audit notebook so then we have one more small concept called audit completion memorandum or audit documentation summary sir what is this audit completion memorandum or what is this audit documentation summary i will try to explain it in simple way see uh, generally when you perform audit of big big entities the audit documentation is going to become very bulky see i have practically been associated with audit of some clients where for one single client the audit documentation will run for 800 900 or even sometimes 1000 pages so i have been uh, a part of certain audits where we have prepared the audit documentation which is running for 800 to 1000 pages of audit documentation we will have some, we will have for a single client so generally in big big audits in large clients the, the volume of the audit documentation will be very bulky but out of all this bulky documentation uh, everything might not be as useful repeatedly see there will be a lot of bulky documentation but out of that bulky documentation we will not use each and every document again and again for example as i have told one of the main purpose of the audit documentation is we can use that documentation for the future years also no so but in case of this big big audits where the audit documentation is very bulky not every document is going to be important so what auditors generally will do is in these kind of big big audits where audit documentation is very bulky they will they will take out the significant matters from this audit documentation and prepare a separate summary which we generally call it as audit completion memorandum or audit documentation summary so this will be done only for big clients where audit documentation is very bulky all the documentation might not be equally important so what generally auditors will do is in big big audits out of that bulky documentation they will choose certain information whatever they feel it as significant and that significant information from the audit documentation they will pick out and prepare one summary that summarized doc documentation only we are going to call it as audit completion memorandum or audit documentation summary so if you kids uh, if you could see here the auditor may consider it helpful to prepare and retain as a part of the documentation a summary that describes what significant matters you have identified how they were addressed nothing but out of your entire bulky documentation we are going to identify the significant matters and how we have addressed them so that summary of the audit documentation we are going to keep it separate and where it will be generally main maintained it is particularly maintained for large and complex audits when you have done audit of very large entities very complex entities there you generally try to maintain that audit uh, documentation summary further the preparation of summary will assist the auditor in consideration of significant matters and also it will help the auditor whether objective of all the standards have been complied if you maintain the documentation summary it will help you to give you confidence that whether you have complied with all the objectives or not see i'm telling uh, see one of the most important thing which you have to include as a part of your audit documentation if you see here see one of the contents of the audit documentation if you see here uh where is it yeah correspondence regarding the significant matters See, we have seen that in the audit documentation, even you have to include significant matters. At various instances also, you will see that auditor has to pay more attention to significant matters. Auditor has to include in the documentation significant matters. But what are significant matters? What are significant matters? In audit, various matters will be there. But out of that, what are significant matters? How to decide which matter is a significant matter, which matter is not a significant matter? So, I will say it simply, the standard did not give you any hard and fast tool to know, okay, these matters will always be significant matters, these matters will not be significant matters, there is no such kind of guidance given in any standard. Sir, so then who will decide what is a significant matter, what is not a significant matter, auditor himself has to decide. Sir, how he will decide? Using his professional judgment, he will decide. Using his knowledge, experience and training, he is going to decide out of all the matters, which matters are significant matters that will be decided by the auditor himself on the basis of professional judgment however in this particular question they have given a few examples of the significant matters once again i am telling you these are just examples this is not a full and final list this is not a conclusive list so by the end of the day which matter is a significant matter which matter is not a significant matter that has to be decided by the auditor using his professional judgment but here for the sake of our convenience they have given a few illustrative examples of significant matters so if you see here significant matters arising during the course of audit are required to be included in audit documentation 
But judging whether a matter is a significant matter or not, it requires objective analysis of facts and circumstances. That means auditor will analyze the facts and circumstances of each and every case. Accordingly, he will decide, accordingly, he will judge whether a matter is significant matter or not. However, they have given us a few examples of the significant matters, which are if you have performed audit procedures and the results of the audit procedures indicate that, that the financial statements could be materially misstated. That means if you performed audit procedures and that audit procedures has given you indication that there is a chance of financial statements getting misstated don't you think that is a significant matter yes or you performed audit procedures which indicate that there is a need to revise the auditor's previous assessment of risk of material misstatement see initially when you perform risk assessment procedures you identified certain risk but after a certain point of time when you performed audit procedures your procedures indicated that whatever risk that you have already defined that you need to reassess it that means there is a chance of more risk of material misstatement so if you performed audit procedures and those audit procedures gave a hint that whatever risk that you have already identified that you that needs to be revised that could also be a significant matter and once again circumstances that cause the auditor significant difficulty in applying necessary audit procedure if you find any circumstances which is giving you difficulty in performing audit procedures you are facing difficulty because of some circumstances to perform the audit procedures and get the audit evidence even those circumstances also could be significant matters or you have some findings that could result in a modification of the auditor's opinion or you have certain findings which are required to be highlighted in the emphasis of matter paragraph that also could be considered as significant matter so once again, I'm telling you guys, this is not a full and final list of significant matter. These are just illustrative examples which have been given. But finally, whether a matter is significant matter or not a significant matter, that has to be decided by the auditor himself using his professional judgment. Clear? So next we have one more simple question, the concept of true and fair view. Guys, as we all know, the entire concept of audit is uh, turning around this concept called true and fair view. Why? Because as an auditor, we are ultimately required to express an opinion whether financial statements give it true and fair view or the financial statements does not give it true and fair view. So this we have been seeing from the introduction to the auditing chapter itself. But what exactly is the true and fair view? How to decide whether the financial statements are giving a true and fair view? Can we exhaustively define true and fair view? The answer is no. So we can't exactly define, we can't give a list of 10 points and say if these 10 points are satisfied, financial statements give true and fair view. If any of the point is violated, financial statements do not give true and fair view. These kind of exhaustive definition, we can't give it for true and fair view. Why? Because it is a subjective decision. So, what is a true and fair view? What is not true and fair view? We can't exhaustively define it. It all depends on facts and circumstances of each and every case. Clear everybody? So, that's what even the same thing they say there. So, the concept of true and fair view is very fundamental concept. Why? Because our opinion is revolving around that concept only. Whether financial statements give a true and fair view or not, our entire opinion is revolving around the true and fair view. So, that's why it is a very fundamental concept in audit. And what constitutes a true and fair view is a matter of auditor's judgment. We can't exhaustively define what is true and fair view. It all depends on auditor's professional judgment. Auditor himself has to use his knowledge, experience and training. He has to analyze the facts and circumstances of each and every case. And then he has to determine accordingly whether financial statements give true and fair view or not. However, if I specifically insist you, if I cash you and ask you, no, at least give me a few illustrative points which you will check whether financial uh, to determine whether financial statements give true and fair view or not. So if I insist you, if I'm calling you and if I'm insisting you, so don't give me exhaustive points, but at least you give me a few illustrative points, a few illustrative examples of the points which you will check to determine whether financial statements give true and fair view or not. Then what you will say, at least a few illustrative points. So I have to check that neither assets are overvalued or undervalued. That means they have to be stated at correct amount. No asset should have been omitted. If there is any charge on the asset, it should have been disclosed. Material liability should not be omitted. P&L and balance sheet should disclose all the matters which are required to be disclosed. Accounting policy should have been applied consistently and unusual, exceptional, non-recurring items should have been disclosed separately. So these are some illustrative examples which we will check to determine whether financial statements give a true and fair view or not clear everybody so once again these are also not uh, full and finalist these are just what illustrative examples a few illustrative examples which we will check to determine whether financial statements give true and fair view so then we have one more concept called audit trail which is actually newly added this question was newly added in the new scheme syllabus it was not there under old scheme so let us try to understand what is this concept of audit trail practically we will try to understand with the help of some examples See, what is this concept of audit trail? 
uh, if you have uh, knowledge of the Companies Act provisions, Companies Act 2013 has made it mandatory that from the financial year 2022-23, the companies are required to use such an accounting software which will have a feature of recording audit trail facility. Companies Act 2013 has made it mandatory that the company is going forward. Now they have to use such an accounting software which will have a feature of recording audit trail. Sir, what is this audit trail? We'll talk about it. But just let us try to understand what are uh, the requirements of Companies Act. So the Companies Act 2013 has told from the financial year 2022-23, the client has to use, every company should use such an accounting software which has the feature of recording audit trail facility. And if you remember the reporting requirements under 143 subsection 3 clause J in that also last point, sixth point, they have even put a responsibility on the auditor to comment whether the client company is using such an accounting software which is having the feature of recording <coughs> recording audit trail and that audit trail should not have been tampered with and that audit trail has been retained or not even as an auditor we are required to comment. So companies are first to put an obligation on the company to use only such accounting softwares which will have the feature of recording audit trail. Then they have even put an obligation on the auditor to check whether really the client company is using the accounting software which is having the feature of recording audit trail and that we need to check and give a comment. So the companies that has first put a responsibility on the company then they have even put an obligation on the auditor to check whether the company is fulfilling that requirement. So, okay, now we have seen what are the requirements, what is the obligation of the company, what is the obligation of the auditor regarding audit trail, we have understood. Now, let us try to understand what exactly is the meaning of audit trail. What exactly is the meaning of audit trail? Guys, as we all know, today the clients or today the companies are maintaining their books of accounts, not in the manual manner, they are trying to maintain the books of accounts in the accounting software. So today every kind of entity even if you take small sole proprietors even today the technology has so uh, has been advanced so much that even uh, small small traders also they can maintain their books of accounts in a software like a mobile app <coughs> so that much adopt <coughs> sorry that much technology has grown so today even the companies also they are maintaining their books of accounts not in manual manner manual books are manual books of accounts have gone manual books of accounts is a history now each and every company is trying to maintain the books of accounts in the accounting software and we have so many accounting softwares like we have tally we have sap we have oracle so we have finacle in case of banks and all so like this in the market we have so many accounting softwares which are available now the companies act is telling that the client should use such an accounting software which will have a feature of recording audit trail so going forward or now from already already most of the companies have adopted it so if now if you are using accounting software that accounting software in addition to recording the entries it should have one more feature called it should record an audit trail facility sir what is this audit trail facility take for example if in the software in the software i have to pass an entry for example i am using tally software in the tally a purchase entry has taken place for example i will i will make a entry in the tally purchase account debit 1 lakh rupees to so and so person to so and so supplier mr x account 1 lakh rupees so an accountant will write an entry even he will give the narration also an accountant will write this entry in the tally software now this entry will go and sit in the books of accounts it will be recorded in the books of accounts a journal entry will be there in the books of accounts of the software from there it will go to trial balance from there it will go to balance sheet and all now in addition to recording of this entry in addition to recording of this entry in the books of accounts the software should also record the history of this entry the software should also record the background of this entry for example the software the tally will record this entry in addition to that the tally should also record who passed this entry who passed the entry and at what time it has been passed for example, the tally will record this entry in the journal. Along with that, it will also record in the background. This entry was recorded by so and so person, Mr. A, who is an accountant. This entry was recorded on 
somewhere around 31st of january 2023 this entry was recorded and this entry was recorded at 9 am so like this a history the flow of transaction is also required to be recorded so not just the entry guys even the background of the entry who passed it at what time it was passed at what uh, date it was passed so all these things this background this history of the transaction is also required to be recorded this history of the transaction we are going to call it as audit trail okay so let us extend this example for example assume that the client is having such an accounting software where entry will be passed by accountant same entry we will take so purchase account debit purchase account debit 1 lakh to mr x account 1 lakh this entry was first recorded now the company is having a policy that first accountant will record this entry then it will be approved by the manager then it will be approved by the manager then only entry will be reflected in the books of accounts so company is following some strict control in the software so accountant will pass an entry manager will approve then only entry will go to books of accounts so when accountant has passed a entry assume manager has also approved then this entry will go and sit in the accounting software in the books of accounts but in the audit trail facility what will be recorded is the history of this entry take for example so and so date 31st of march 2023 morning 9 am Mr. A, who is an accountant, he passed an entry. So, the software will record entry has been recorded. Okay. On the same day, 31st of January 2023, morning 11 a.m., Mr. B, who is a manager, who is a manager, he approved it. Entry was approved. Okay. Now, after a certain period of time, after five days, the accountant has realized that he made a wrong entry. He made a what? Wrong entry. The amount should have been credited to Mr. Y. The supplier is actually Mr. Y, but it, by mistake, he has recorded as Mr. X. So, what he has done is, on 5th of February, he made this change. He changed that accounting entry. Now, in the audit trail, even that also will be recorded. So, on 5th of February, 2023, so somewhere around afternoon, 2 p.m., accountant, once again, the same person, Mr. A, accountant, what he has done? Entry amended. What he is writing? Entry amended and what changes were made that also should be recorded. Earlier it was created to Mr. X. Now it was created to Mr. Y. So what change has been made that amendment of the entry also will be recorded. Now assume that after few more days the management thought this entry is irrelevant and the accountant deleted this entry. What accountant did? He deleted this entry. On 10th of February entry was deleted. Now this entry is not there in the books of accounts. But in the background, it should be recorded that on 10th of February 2023, somewhere around evening 4 p.m., so and so person, Mr. A, accountant, what he has done? He has deleted the entry. He has deleted the entry. Guys, if you pay attention here, entry is not there in the books of accounts, but history of the entry will always be there. Entry is not there. What is there? History of the entry should be recorded. So, this we call it as audit trail facility. So, nothing but the flow of a transaction. How a, how a source document has been converted into entry in the books of accounts. So, you will have a purchase invoice. How that purchase invoice has converted into an entry in the books of accounts. In that process, who and all are involved. At what activities have been taken place. At what time they have taken place. This history of the transaction should be recorded. That only we call it as audit trail facility. Able to understand, and the Companies Act 2013 has made it mandatory that the companies going forward they have to use only such accounting software which will have the feature of recording this audit trail facility. If the client is using accounting software which is not having this feature of recording audit trail, they are doing the violation of the Companies Act. And even as an auditor, we are supposed to verify the client's accounting software and check that whether they are using this audit, whether they are using only such accounting softwares which will have a feature of recording audit trail facility. And this audit trail facility should be preserved. Like the way the company is having an obligation to preserve their books of accounts, to retain their books of accounts. Along with that, this audit trail facility also should be retained. Clear everybody? So, this is what simply the concept of audit trail. So, with this background discussion, if you read this uh, content, you will be able to understand. So, what is audit trail? Audit trail is a documented flow of transaction. That means how the transaction is flowing. That documentation we will do, that documentation only we call it as audit trail. It is used to investigate how a source document was translated into accounting entry and from there how it was inserted to the 
financial statements nothing but if you have done one transaction how it is getting converted into entry that entire history of the transaction if we record that only we call it as audit trail so it is used as audit evidence to establish authenticity and integrity to know whether a transaction is genuine or not to know whether a transaction has been passed by the authorized person only or not if you want to know it then the audit trail is going to come to your rescue now what are the advantages of audit trail if this audit trail facility is there what will be the advantages see, see they mainly talk about advantages to the management number one audit trail will help in maintaining a record of system and user activity which user has done which activity which user has uh, done which transaction that you can know if you have audit trail it is a step-by-step -step record by which accounting trade details or other financial data can be traced to their source using the audit trail we can go back to the source uh, from the entry from where it has started we can trace it to the source it will enhance the internal controls even by maintaining this audit trail facility it will improve the internal control and security in the organization and you can also fix responsibility if something goes wrong tomorrow by referring to the audit trail you can find out the exact person who committed the mistake so it will help in fixing the responsibility and audit trail analysis can also specify the, re the problem the reason of the problem what is the root cause for the problem that also you can find out if you have the audit trail facility and it will it is also helpful in ensuring operation of system whatever systems the management has planned whether they are working as expected expected or not that also we can find out by audit trail and it will help the entities in their regular system operations so these are all the advantages by maintaining an audit trail but implementation of audit trail involves some cost if you have to implement internal if you have to implement this audit trail you have to incur some extra cost for example if you want to buy a software today which will have a feature of recording audit trail facility you will have to pay some extra cost and the cost is not only in terms of money even the cost is in terms of time also see just having audit trail facility will not be enough even the employees of the organization the management of the organization should allocate some amount of time for analysis of the audit trail also so if you have just implemented the audit trail facility and no one is doing the analysis there will not be any use of it so you should not uh, the, uh, for implementing audit trail facility the cost will be incurred the cost is not just in terms of money the cost is also in terms of the time which you have to spend in that analysis and even today auditors can make use of some audit softwares audit tools they can use to analyze this audit trail not today auditors are not just verifying books of accounts even the auditor can verify the audit trail to find out the frauds and errors also uh, but if you look at the audit trail data that will be very bulky see having books of accounts only for big big companies those the books of account itself will be very bulky now if you add the background of that entry audit trail is even much bulkier so but auditors need not worry today today there are some accounting softwares which are available in the market which auditors can use to analyze that audit trail and find out the chances of happening of frauds and errors the same thing they try to say here so the auditors can make use of automated tools to analyze large volume of data thrown by audit trails and also systems which, which will have a audit trail inspires the confidence of auditors if you came to know your client is using accounting software which is having audit trail your confidence also will get increased and also uh, it will help the auditor in verifying whether controls were operating as expected and it will also aid in verification of whether a transaction was indeed performed by a person authorized really the transaction was in uh, really the transaction was executed by the person who is having the power to do it or not we want to know how we can get to know that is whether a transaction has been passed by a genuine person or not you want to know how you can get to know by verifying the audit trail you can get to know and it will also increase the reliability of audit evidence so these are all the advantages of auditor because of audit trail so most important question guys high chance of getting tested in the examination why because this is a question which has been newly added under the new scheme this question was not there under old scheme clear everybody so this is what regarding audit trail so guys with this the concept of the chapter of audit documentation and audit evidence from our material we have covered hope you guys have understood this concept in a detailed manner this chapter is relatively very simple very easy but important from the examination perspective so now we are going to start revising the chapter risk assessment and internal control so the previous chapter which we have revised is audit documentation and audit evidence so now the chapter which we are going to revise is risk assessment and internal control so as you could see in the title of the chapter itself this chapter is going to talk about two concepts one is regarding risk assessment and the other one is regarding internal control and whatever content that we are going to have a discussion in this particular chapter whatever content we are going to discuss in this particular chapter risk assessment and internal control so this has actually been taken from sk 315 
this content has actually taken from SA 300, SA 315 and also a few content has been taken from SA 330 as well. So when I say I am revising the chapter risk assessment and internal control, we are actually trying to revise the two standards on auditing. One is SA 315 and the other one is SA 330. So without any delay further, let us try to have a quick revision of the chapter risk assessment and internal control. See first we will be talking about the concept relating to risk assessment. First, we will discuss about risk assessment. So, once we are comfortably done with revising the concepts relating to risk assessment, then we will talk about internal control. See, the term risk assessment is not something which is first time we are listening now. We have already heard about this risk assessment term earlier. So, if you remember, when we discussed about audit procedures, I have told you that audit procedures can be broadly divided into two categories. One is risk assessment procedure and the other one is further audit procedure. And the further audit procedures are further divided into two categories. One is test of controls or compliance procedures and the other one is substantive and uh, substantive audit procedures. So, in the audit procedures concept itself, we have understood what is the meaning of risk assessment procedure. What is the meaning of risk assessment procedures guys? Those procedures which have been performed to obtain an understanding of entity, environment and its internal control to identify the risk of material misstatement. So the first and foremost procedure which we are going to perform in the audit is risk assessment procedure. So a part of this chapter is also talking about assessment of the risk, analysis of the risk in your client's premises. So when you have been appointed as auditor of some client X limited or Y limited, Z limited, whatever it is, the first step which you have to do in audit of in conducting audit of that particular client is you have to make an assessment of risk. You have to make an analysis of risk. So now we are going to understand in a detailed manner what is the concept of risk from the audit perspective? What is the meaning of the audit risk? How we can actually perform this risk assessment procedures and uh, various other things we are going to have a discussion now. So first, before we can understand how to do the analysis of the risk, first we need to understand what is the risk in the audit. Or in simple terms, first we need to understand what is the meaning of the audit risk. So understanding the meaning of this term audit risk is very, very important. See, the standards have defined the term audit risk in such a manner that the risk of expressing inappropriate opinion. So how the standards have defined the term audit risk? Risk of expressing an inappropriate opinion when the financial statements are materially misstated. So financial statements are materially misstated, but you are giving an inappropriate opinion in that circumstances that we actually call it as audit risk. So if you keep the, uh, if you keep this technical definition aside, if I tell you simple meaning of the term audit risk, if there is a chance of your opinion going wrong, the possibility of giving a wrong opinion on the financial statements, that risk we call it as audit risk. See this concept, we have already seen it in the chapter Nature, Objective and Scope of Audit. The risk of giving an inappropriate opinion, the risk that there is a possibility of your opinion going wrong, that in the audit terminology, we call it as audit risk, simply. But the same thing, they are trying to give it in the complex definition. They have defined the term audit risk. And the, and the definition says that risk of expressing inappropriate opinion when the financial statements are materially misstated. So if we try to analyze this definition, see, assume that financial statements are materially misstated. Financial statements contain a material misstatement see if the financial statements contain a material misstatement which opinion will be appropriate modified opinion will be appropriate financial statements are actually containing a material misstatement then what opinion will be appropriate modified opinion but in this case you are giving an inappropriate opinion so financial statements when they contain a material misstatement appropriate opinion is modified that could be either qualified adverse disclaimer whatever it is but instead of giving a uh, but instead of giving a appropriate opinion you are giving an inappropriate opinion that means you are giving a unmodified opinion here what you are giving you are giving an unmodified opinion so when modified opinion is appropriate but instead of giving a modified opinion the auditor is giving what unmodified opinion this we call it as audit risk this we call it as what audit risk so when modified opinion is appropriate if the auditor is giving unmodified opinion that case we are going to call it as audit risk let, let, let me talk about another scenario assume that financial statements are not materially misstated financial statements do not contain any material misstatement in that case what will be the appropriate opinion in this case auditor should give modified opinion in this case what opinion auditor should give modified opinion but instead of giving modified opinion auditor is giving inappropriate opinion so he is giving a modified opinion so financial statements is not uh, containing any material misstatement you are supposed to give unmodified opinion but you are giving an inappropriate opinion in this case you are giving modified opinion can this also be called as audit risk no this cannot come under audit risk why because if you pay the close look at the definition so if i take you through the definition so just a moment
Just give me a moment, guys. Yes, this one. So if I literally take you through the definition of the term uh, audit risk from the standard. So whatever uh, definition we are reading, that is from the standard. So the standard says that audit risk means the risk that auditor gives an inappropriate opinion when the financial statements are materially misstated. That means financial statements contain a material misstatement. And in that case, you are giving inappropriate opinion that only will come under audit risk. So this audit risk definition is only taking into perspective one part when the financial statements contain a material misstatement you are supposed to give modified but instead of that you are giving inappropriate opinion that means you are giving unmodified opinion this will come under audit risk whereas the other way around will not come under audit risk. If the financial statements are not materially misstated you are supposed to give unmodified but in that case you are giving inappropriate opinion you are giving a modified opinion this can't come under audit risk. Audit risk covers only this case audit risk covers only this particular case first case when you are giving uh, when you are giving a unmodified opinion when modified opinion is appropriate see not just from the definition perspective even if you look from the practical perspective also the second case will not lead to any risk for example financial statements do not contain a material misstatement for example you are conducting audit of the client x limited in that client x limited you found a small misstatement of 5 lakh rupees it is not material we need not consider it as a material misstatement but as an auditor you still consider it as material misstatement and you gave a modified opinion so you can give unmodified but you are giving modified opinion in this case will the auditor face any consequences legally will the auditor face any consequences will the regulatory authority will call him and punish him no in this case no there is no risk from the risk for the auditor from the legal perspective see even if tomorrow that misstatement turned out to be very material no one is going to come and punish you why because you will say boss i have already given a modified opinion why are you coming and punishing me now so from the legal perspective not just from the definition perspective even if you look from the legal perspective also in the second case there is no risk for the auditor see when i say you might say sir in the second case legally he might not face risk but the client will become unhappy no financial statements are not containing material misstatement auditor should have given unmodified but if the auditor gives a modified opinion client will become unhappy no let him be unhappy who is worried sir if he is becoming unhappy he will not reappoint us in the next year no we will lose our appointment no but when i say audit risk i am talking about risk which you will face legal perspective see losing a client is not the risk which you are facing from the legal perspective losing a client is a business risk losing a client is a what business risk when i say audit risk i am talking about the risk from the legal perspective from law or regulatory perspective i am talking in the in the second case there will not be any audit risk that losing of the client will be a business risk clear everybody so sometimes i might ask you a question what will not be included in the audit risk then you have to write in case auditor is giving a modified opinion when unmodified opinion is appropriate that will not come under audit risk and also audit risk does not include business risk business risk faced by the auditor like loss of clients loss of reputation not receiving the fees from the client these are all business risk which will not fall under audit risk when i say audit risk i'm exclusively talking in terms of the risk which auditor is going to face from the laws and regulations perspective clear everybody now so since we understood the meaning of the audit risk now let us try to understand the components of the audit risk see audit risk is basically made up of two components audit risk is basically made up of two components one is risk of material misstatement and the other one is detection risk sir what is this risk of material misstatement what is this detection risk risk of material misstatement means the susceptibility of item of a financial statements to a material misstatement even prior to the audit even prior to audit so the risk that there is a chance of the risk that there is a possibility of happening of misstatement in the financial statements even prior to the audit for example if in the client premises when i went to the warehouse i came to know that in the warehouse there are no internal controls there is no cctv camera there is no store in charge there is no uh, security guard nothing is there now you tell me is there a possibility of happening of misstatement in the warehouse yes this is risk of material misstatement this risk will be there even prior to audit if i put it in other way around whether audit happens or doesn't happen this risk is always going to be there whether audit is going to happen or audit is not going to happen this risk is always going to be there able to understand everybody so that risk we are going to call it as risk of material misstatement the risk of happening of misstatement in the financial statements even prior to audit that means whether audit happens or not it doesn't matter that risk will always be there that is completely if i put it in other way around risk of material misstatement is something which is created by the management auditor will not 
create risk of material misstatement it is something which is management's risk it is the risk which is created by the management whether audit happens or not this risk is always going to be there clear then this risk of material misstatement can be further happen because of two reasons one is inherent risk and the other one is control risk risk of material misstatement is going to have two components one is what inherent risk and the other one is control risk sir what is inherent risk what is control risk let us try to understand it see this i will try to explain it with the help of one simple example which i always use it very frequently in my lectures so assume that there is a organization this circle is an organization just imagine this organization is protected by three internal controls internal control one internal control two internal control three now in this organization three misstatements happen misstatement one and misstatement two so now what difference you are able to find between the misstatement one and misstatement two don't say one misstatement is happening from uh, top one state one misstatement is happening from bottom no that is not what i am expecting so if you see here misstatement one happened because there is a absence of internal control so if you see this area there is a absence of internal control in this area because of that misstatement has happened there is a absence of risk uh, absence of internal control that means there is no internal control in the organization to prevent a misstatement from happening that's why misstatement one happened this i call it as inherent risk absence of internal control system if there is no internal control or the control which is required to prevent detect or correct the misstatement on a timely basis is missing so that absence of internal control i am calling i am going to call it as inherent risk and if you see misstatement two misstatement two happened even after there is a internal control which means internal control is there to prevent the misstatement from happening but that internal control is suffering from some weaknesses or deficiencies because of which it is unable to prevent detect or correct the misstatement so that we are going to call it as control risk so if i put it in other way around if i put it in simple terms failure of the internal control to prevent detect or correct a misstatement that i am going to call it as a control risk so uh, audit risk arises because of two components one is risk of material misstatement and that risk of material misstatement can further happen because of two reasons inherent risk and control risk the other component is detection risk this is something which is exclusively in the control of the auditor see when it comes to risk of material misstatement as i have told whether audit happens or doesn't happen that risk will always be there auditor cannot control risk of material misstatement he can only perform risk assessment procedures to identify the risk of material misstatement but when it comes to detection risk that is something which will be in the control of the auditor so detection risk means the audit procedures which are performed by the auditor may not be able to detect a material misstatement which has already happened in the financial statements see generally auditor will perform audit procedures to find out audit evidence regarding material misstatement but whatever audit procedures are there which are performed by the auditor they might not be able to detect a material misstatement so that means there is already a misstatement in the financial statements auditor has performed audit procedures whatever may be the reason either because of inherent limitations or because of his negligence whatever procedures performed by the auditor they might not be able to identify a material misstatement which is already there in the financial statements that risk we are going to call it as detection risk so detection risk is something which is in the auditor's control but both risk of material misstatement and detection risk both collectively will lead to auditor's risk able to understand and one more thing we have to understand we need to understand the relationship between the components of the risk of material misstatement between risk of material misstatement and between detection and between risk of material misstatement and detection risk what kind of relationship exists they say that between risk of material misstatement and detection risk there exists an inverse relationship which means if the auditor identifies the risk of material misstatement as very high if the auditor identifies risk of material misstatement as very high he will try to perform more audit procedures he will try to detect more misstatements and he should try to keep his detection risk at a low level so if the risk of material misstatement is high the auditor should try to plan the detection risk at a very low level so that's why there exists a what what kind of relationship between the components of audit risk there exists an inverse relationship between the components of audit risk so if the risk of material misstatement is high auditor should try to keep his detection risk at a very low level so in this way there is a inverse relationship clear everybody so this is what the meaning of risk assess this is what the meaning of audit risk and its components one of the most important from the examination perspective from this chapter now let us try to understand what is included in the audit risk 
what is included in the audit risk that we will try to understand what is included in the sorry not what is included in the audit risk what is included in the risk assessment procedures we will try to understand see as i have told the first and foremost audit procedure which we will do it in the audit is risk assessment procedure now in the risk assessment procedure we try to obtain an understanding of entity environment and its internal control now how you can get to obtain that understanding understood risk assessment procedures we will try to obtain an understanding by understanding of entity environment and its internal control but just if you go inside the client's premises and declare i am trying to obtain an understanding of entity environment and its internal control will you get to know automatically about all that information no so now in order to get that understanding of entity environment and its internal control and in order to identify that risk of material misstatement what we will do what you will exactly do nothing bad if i put it in other way around we have seven methods or techniques for performing audit procedures no so out of that seven methods or techniques which uh, particular techniques will be suitable to perform the risk assessment procedure so if they ask you the question what is included in the risk assessment procedure their intention is out of the seven methods or techniques whatever we have out of that seven methods or techniques which methods will help you to achieve the objective of risk assessment procedure first of all what are the seven methods which we have discussed in the risk uh, which have discussed in the audit documentation evidence chapter number one we have inspection number two we have inquiry number three external confirmation number four observation then we have recalculation then we have reperformance then we have analytical procedures so any procedure you take we have only these seven methods to perform now we have to analyze out of the seven methods which methods will help us in achieving the objective of risk assessment procedure number two number one can we do inspection yes can we read the documents and get to know about the entity yes what documents you can read you can read the incorporation documents like moa eoa you can read the legal agreements you can read the hierarchy you can read the internal control manuals yes by reading some documents we can get to know about entity environment and its internal control can we do inquiry yes we can do inquiry with whom you can inquire with the management and various other people in the organization you can inquire and get information regarding entity environment and its internal control can you do external confirmation to know about your clients and today can you get the confirmation from a third party no external confirmation is not suitable can you do observation yes plant visit we can observe the manufacturing process we can observe the production process by that we can get to know about our entity environment and its internal control so observation also i can do can i do recalculation by doing some mathematical calculations can i get to know about entity environment and its internal control no can i do reperformance will you do the entire business once again to know about the entity environment and its internal control no can you do analytical procedures yes we can try to study the relationship between financial information and non financial information from that we can actually get to know the risk of material misstatement so yes we can even perform analytical procedures to identify and assess the risk of material misstatement so out of seven methods which i have which we have the techniques which will be included in the risk assessment procedures will be four only number one is inspection inquiry observation and analytical procedures and specifically one particular concept which has a high chance of getting tested in the examination is inquiries of management i told we can do inquiry to obtain an understanding of entity and its environment no so with whom and all you can inquire see one thing is we can we will definitely inquire from the management the first category of persons with whom we will conduct the inquiry to extract the information is management so we are going to definitely conduct the inquiry of the management to get the relevant information but do you think management is the only person with whom we can inquire no there are various other persons with whom we can conduct inquiries sir who are that various other persons with whom we may inquire number one you can inquire with those charged with garments you can inquire with internal audit personnel you can inquire with employees of the company you can inquire with in-house legal counsel that is internal lawyers if there are any you can inquire with marketing or sales personnel you can inquire with risk management function you can inquire with it persons in the organization so these are all the different persons in the organization with whom you can inquire and get the required information so only this part they can ask you as a question so even there are some exam uh, even there are uh, some questions uh, which i have given here for the examples yeah this question number one so if you read this question much of the information obtained by auditors inquiries is obtained from management and those responsible for financial reporting however the auditor may also obtain information 
or a different perspective in identifying risk of material misstatement through inquiries of others within the entity and other employees with the different levels. Explain with the help of examples. See, if you pay close attention to the question, they are telling auditor will definitely inquire with the management. But not just the management, he will also try to obtain information by inquiring with various other persons, various other employees. They are asking you to give the examples of those others in the organization from whom auditor can inquire and get the information. So what you will do? What you will do? You will write these cases with whom the auditor is going to inquire okay so a few more things i would like to talk here few more important points from the examination perspective see as an auditor first we will perform risk assessment procedure then we will perform compliance procedures then we will perform substantive audit procedures you tell me by performing audit procedures will we get all the evidence required for expression of opinion by performing risk assessment procedures will you get all the evidence required for performing risk uh, required for required for expression of opinion on the financial statements the answer is no see by performing risk assessment procedures you will only get to know understanding of entity environment and its internal control and you can only identify the risk of material misstatement where the risk is higher where the risk is lower that only you will be able to identify don't be of a wrong notion that just by performing risk assessment procedures you will be able to obtain all the evidence required for expression of opinion no you are not going to get it then compliance procedures do you think by performing compliance procedures alone will we be able to get all the evidence required from expression of opinion no even by performing compliance procedures we will get to know only whether internal controls are working effectively or not and frankly speaking we perform compliance procedures to determine nature timing and extent of substantive audit procedures so one more thing is clear by performing compliance procedures alone also we will not be able to get all the evidence required for expression of opinion so the point which i want to say here is we get all the evidence required for expression of opinion only by performing substantive audit procedures we will not get it by performing risk assessment procedures we will also not get it by performing compliance procedures we are going to get it ultimately only by performing substantive audit procedures clear and comfortable everybody so this one point you have to remember and few more points to clarify here see by performing risk assessment procedures we will try to identify risk of material misstatement no and as per the SA 315, this risk of material misstatement has to be identified at two levels. We will identify risk of material misstatement by performing risk assessment procedures, but that risk has to be identified at two levels. Risk of material misstatement at the financial statement level, risk of material misstatement at the assertion level. At two levels, we have to identify the risk of material misstatement. Sir, what is risk of material misstatement at the financial statement level? Nothing but if the risk is having a potential to cause a misstatement in the entire financial statements that we call it as risk of material misstatement at the financial statement level like for example i came to know that the person who is required to prepare the financial statements he doesn't have a knowledge of schedule 3 and accounting standards is that a risk yes is this risk having a potential to cause a misstatement in the entire financial statements or only one item that is having a potential to cause a misstatement in the entire financial statements so that risk will be a risk of material misstatement at the financial statement level on the other hand risk of material misstatement at the assertion level means that risk which is having a potential to cause a misstatement in one or two specific items of the financial statements for example uh, if I say internal controls in the sales area only are, on, are not working fine. This risk is having a potential to cause a misstatement only in the area of sales. So this risk I am going to call it as risk of material misstatement at assertion level. So we know by performing risk assessment procedure we have to identify risk of material misstatement. Now I am adding to that information you have to identify the risk at two levels. Risk of material misstatement at the financial statement level. Risk of material misstatement at the assertion level. Clear everybody? Able to understand now? Let us try to proceed further with various other concepts. Now, they might ask a question something like this. Understanding an entity is a continuous process. See, risk assessment procedures, in the risk assessment procedures, we try to obtain an understanding of entity, environment and its internal control. Now, they say a statement that understanding an entity is not just a one-time activity. It is going to be a continuous process. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. When I agree with the statement, what do I mean? Throughout the audit, we'll be doing only understanding of entity. No. See, the meaning of the sentence is, at the beginning of the audit, we try to obtain an understanding of the entity. Throughout the course of the audit, if at all we come across any circumstances which requires to make a change in our understanding, we should be ready to change our understanding. So generally, at the beginning of the audit, we try to obtain an understanding. But it is not that whatever understanding you have to you have obtained, you have to stick with that. You should not change it. No. 
during the course of the audit if we get to know about any extra information if we need to update our understanding regarding the client we should be ready to adopt and we should be flexible to change our understanding and make sufficient changes to our nature timing and extent of audit procedures that is what the simple meaning of that sentence yes obtaining an understanding of an entity and its environment it is a continuous and a dynamic process of nl of gathering updating and analyzing the information throughout the audit and if you obtain that understanding how it will help the auditor as an auditor if you try to obtain the understanding of the of the client how it is going to help you it is going to help the auditor in multiple ways number one it will help you to identify risk of material misstatement obvious reason you will come to know in which area risk is higher in which area risk is lower that will even help you to determine materiality how to determine materiality that we will see it in sa 320 and also that will help you to determine whether the selection and application of accounting policies is appropriate whatever accounting policies that the client has selected and uh, applied whether they are suitable whether they are consistent or not that also we can comment and also by understanding the client's entity we can come to know which areas of the client require special consideration nothing but where i have to pay more attention where i have to pay less attention and also obtaining an understanding of an entity will help you to evaluate whatever evidence that you have gathered whether it is sufficient whether it is appropriate that decision also you can take by obtaining an understanding of the entity and its environment so understanding of entity is a continuous process and if you get that understanding that will help the auditor in these many ways clear everybody and one more thing see by performing risk assessment procedures we will try to identify the risk is there any requirement to document that risk what risk you have identified in which area risk is high in which area risk is low do you think there is a requirement to include the outcome of risk assessment procedures in the audit documentation the answer is 100 percent yes so whatever risk you have identified whatever understanding you have got regarding the clients of business all that should be included in the documentation that is what the question number four is about yes as an auditor you are required to document certain information regarding risk so what things you are required to document see at the risk assessment procedure whatever discussion you had among the engagement team and what decisions you have reached that needs to be documented and also key elements of the understanding obtained regarding each of the aspect of the entity nothing but out of whatever understanding you have obtained regarding entity environment and its internal control whatever important aspects regarding the understanding are there that has to be included now by understanding that entity what risk you have identified and what is the analysis of that risk that also you have to document and that risk also you have to document what risk is at financial statement level what risk is at assertion level that you need to document separate separately and risk identified what related controls are there you identified certain risk to control that risk what controls the uh, to control that risk what internal controls client has implemented that also you need to document so simply whatever your outcome of the risk assessment procedures are there all that outcomes of the risk assessment procedures must be included in your documentation clear about it till here right so we have discussed something uh, some important content relating to risk assessment part now we will try to proceed further and try to understand the discussion relating to internal control as i have told this chapter is going to contain two parts one is risk assessment other one is internal control the discussion relating to risk assessment we are done with successfully now we will try to extend our discussion to understand about this concept of internal control shall we do it everybody let us do it now so when it comes to internal control first we will try to begin with understanding what is the meaning of internal control see i have already explained you earlier in the nature objective and scope chapter itself what is the meaning of internal control so tell me guys what is the meaning of internal control so the meaning of any internal control is any process or any policy which is designed implemented or maintained by whom by the management or those charged with the governance or other personnel for what purpose to achieve a reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of entities objectives or if I put it in simple terms, any policy, any procedure which has been designed, implemented, maintained by the top level management of the organization to ensure that they will achieve their objectives with whatever objectives they have started the organization to make sure that they are going to achieve that objectives. So in that process, whatever policies, whatever procedures which have been implemented, designed, maintained by the management, those charged with governance or other personnel, that policies and procedures, we are going to call it as internal controls. If you remember in the nature objective and scope of audit chapter, I gave you a lot of examples like having a CCTV camera, allowing the authorization, allowing the people to enter inside the company only by showing their identity card and biometric. That is also an internal control. 
entry passed by accountant should be approved by the manager that is also an internal control cashier should be uh, cashier the person whoever is making the payments collecting the receipt should be separate should be separate from the person whoever is passing the cash entries nothing but segregation of duties so like this any policy any procedure any uh, any methodology which has been designed by the top level management to ensure that mistakes are prevented in the organization that we are going to call it as internal control now what will be the specific objectives of internal control see if you take any internal control any internal control will try to achieve specifically four objectives any internal control will try to specifically cover four objectives number one most of the internal controls will try to protect the will try to achieve the objective of safeguarding the assets protecting the assets of the entity one of the most important objective which most of the internal controls will try to achieve is what safeguarding the assets protecting of the assets like cctv camera security guard so one of the major objective of many internal control is safeguarding of assets the second objective some internal controls will be working with the objective of increasing the reliability of financial information some internal controls will work exclusively with the objective of making the financial information more reliable like segregation of duties uh, passing of entry after approval by the manager so these are some internal controls which are working towards increasing the reliability of financial information information some internal controls will work with the objective of increasing the efficiency and eff effectiveness of the operations some internal controls will be exclusively working with the objective of increasing efficiency and effectiveness of operations to make the operations of the entity more efficient more effective like for example some it companies will have a policy that access to the company's internet will be restricted employees will be able to use the company's internet only for use only for accessing the useful website why sir if there is no restriction the people will uh, watch the social media content and all unnecessarily waste the time ultimately effectiveness of the employees will get reduced so to protect that effectiveness of the employees what it companies will do is they will restrict the access of the internet to only certain websites so some internal controls will be implemented with the objective of increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of employees or operations and some internal controls will be implemented with the objective of ensuring compliances with the laws and regulations so some internal controls will be will be implemented even with this objectives as well so like this internal controls whatever have been appointed they try to fulfill at least one of these four objectives some internal control will try to fulfill even all the four objectives also clear everybody now coming to the next concept if you uh, if you assume a typical scenario where an organization has implemented internal control in a perfect manner they have implemented a strong internal control system so if any organization has implemented a strong internal control system can that be a guarantee that no misstatement will happen no fraud will happen no error will happen can you give that guarantee no no matter how effectively an organization will implement internal control there is always a chance of misstatement happening so if i rephrase my sentence once again no matter how effectively an organization will try to implement internal control there is a there is always a chance of internal control failing that means even after effective implementation of internal controls also still there is a chance of fraud or error happening why sir why because like the way audit is suffering from some inherent limitations which can't be avoided even the internal controls of the organizations also will suffer from some limitations which can't be avoided no matter whatever you do some limitations are there for internal controls which cannot be avoided so what are those inherent limitations of internal control because of which no matter how effectively you implement internal control still there is always a chance of some internal controls failing so what are that inherent limitations of internal control number one human error in decision making see by the end of the day internal controls will always be designed by human beings and we humans tend to make mistakes so because of human errors in the process of designing of internal control some internal controls might fail and one more thing we humans can implement internal control only of the only to overcome the scenarios which we imagine but a person who wants to commit a fraud or error can always come up with a new way or technique which we might not have predicted and that can't be prevented by internal control. So that's why number one, the first inherent limitation because of which internal control will have a chance of failing is the internal controls are designed by humans and there will be a possibility of human error. Number two, lack of understanding of purpose. See, those people who are required to oversee that internal controls are working effectively, they might not understand the basic purpose of the internal control. That's, that is the reason why some internal controls will fail. I will tell you one simple example. Assume that there will be a security guard. 
if you have visited any supermarket there will be security guard who will be standing at the exit gate so once you are all done with the shopping what the security guard will do he will check the items which are there in your trolley whether they are included in the bill or not able to understand so this is what the supervisor this is what the security guard is supposed to do but what he has done is at the time when the training was given he slept he did not listen to that training properly he understood only one thing i have to compare bills and items i have to compare bills and items in the trolley and this security guard what he is doing is he is stopping every customer going out of the store he is taking the bill from the customer and whatever items which are there in the bill whether they are in the trolley or not he is checking what the security guard is doing he is taking the bill of each and every customer and he is checking whatever items that are there in the bill whether they are in the trolley or not if he is satisfied he is sending the customer out you tell me is the internal control working effectively here no why because what the security guard is supposed to do is he has to have a he needs to have a look at the items which are there in the trolley and check whether they are included in the bill or not able to understand able to understand what i am trying to say so he should not check whatever items which are there in the bill which are included in the trolley or not why because a person whoever has bought the item he will definitely take it out no why the security guard is appointed there to make sure that no customer is taking out the item out of the store without getting it built if he wants to know that what he should do first he should check the items which are there in the trolley randomly check whether those items are there in the bill or not but what he is doing since he did not attend to the training properly he is checking the items which are there in the bill whether they are in the trolley or not so like this sometimes the persons who are required to implement internal controls they might not understand the basic purpose of the internal control that's why also most of the internal controls will fail number 3 internal controls might also fail because of collusion see organization with a very good intention to prevent the misstatements they will divide the duties for example management told that cashier will only make cash payments and collect the receipts accounting entry should be passed by separate accountant now what could happen is the cashier and accountant both could collude with each other and create a misstatement and create a fraud so collusion can always happen to make which can make the internal control fail and sometimes the top level management who themselves have designed the internal control they themselves may override the controls for their own advantages that's why also internal controls can fail and number 4 internal controls also will fail because cost will exceed benefit sometimes sometimes the whatever cost which will be incurred for implementing internal control that will be much higher than the benefits which we get so that could also be one of the reason why internal controls fail so organizations what they will do is first they will implement internal control but looking at the cost which they are incurring for implementing internal control they might not implement it properly and number 5 in the case of small entities the chances of internal control failing are very very high in the case of small small entities the chances of internal control failing are very very high why because in case of small entities the owner himself will manage the business the owner will have better control over the entire organization so that's why he will not uh, show interest in recruiting more people when there is a limitation on staff there will not be proper segregation of the duties as well so that's why in case of small entities due to lack of employees due to owner having better control over the organization the chances of internal control failing are much higher in the case of small all entities so these are all the various limitations because of which internal control will have a chance of failing these are all the various reasons because of which no matter how effectively you implement internal controls there is always a possibility of fraud error or misstatement still continuing to happen clear everybody so this is what regarding inherent limitations clear and comfortable everybody now let us go to one more scenario one more question one more concept what are the methods for evaluation of internal control what are the methods for evaluation of internal control so if you want to evaluate the internal controls in the client's organization what methods are available so practically speaking for the purpose of evaluation of internal controls we have broadly four methods which are available number 1 is narrative record number 2 is checklist number 3 is internal control questionnaire and number 4 is flow chart number 4 is what flow chart so these are all the four methods which are available for evaluation of internal controls so what are the four methods for evaluation of internal control number 1 is narrative record number 2 is checklist number 3 is internal control questionnaire and number 4 is flow chart let us try to understand what happens in each of the method first talking about narrative record see in the narrative record what will happen is first auditor will try to understand the process of the internal control then whatever understanding that he has obtained regarding the internal control he is going to exhaustively describe it 
so if i put it in simple terms exhaustive description of internal control as found in operation by the auditor that we are going to call it as a narrative record so first you will try to observe how the controls are functioning then he will try to develop one exhaustive record one detailed description he will try to do that we call it as narrative record so then what is flowchart in the flowchart what will happen is here also auditor will try to understand the internal control and whatever understanding that he got regarding internal control he will try to do it in a pictorial presentation nothing but he try to present it in a diagrammatic format so that diagrammatic presentation of internal control we are going to call it as flowchart see when we do a comparative study between narrative record and flowchart which one is going to take a lot of time narrative record is going to take a lot of time which one will give you better overview of entire internal control flowchart will give you better overview of entire internal control where errors can be easily spotted in the flowchart errors can be easily spotted clear and comfortable everybody and generally narrative record will be suitable for small organizations not for big organizations because it is a very much time consuming activity now Coming to the two most widely used methods for evaluation of internal control, one is checklist and the other one is internal control questionnaire. Sir, what is this checklist and what is this internal control questionnaire? See, in both checklist and internal control questionnaire, there are going to be a series of questions. In both checklist and internal control questionnaire, there will be what? Series of questions, which will be prepared by auditor. And that questions will be prepared regarding internal control. In both the checklist and internal control questionnaire, the auditor is going to prepare the series of questions relating to desirable elements of internal control. And those questions will be drafted in such a manner that answer will be either yes, no or not applicable. And the questions will be drafted in what manner? Not descriptive questions. The questions will be drafted in such a manner that the answers are going to be either yes, no or not applicable. So whatever it is, in both checklist and internal control questionnaire, auditor is going to draft a series of questions regarding the elements of internal control. And the questions will be drafted in such a way that answers are going to be either yes, no or not applicable. Clear and comfortable everybody. Then what is the difference sir? You are telling in both the cases series of questions will be there, will be prepared by the auditor and questions will be drafted in such a manner as no or not applicable. Then what is the difference between the two? The difference between the two is in the case of checklist, the questions prepared by the auditor will be answered by auditor's staff only will be answered by auditor staff only whereas in the case of internal control questionnaire whatever questions which are prepared by the auditor that i will go and give it to the clients management they will be answered either by clients management or clients staff they are going to give the answers to me that is going to be the point of difference in the case of checklist and internal control questionnaire so in both the cases both are going to contain series of questions prepared by auditor regarding internal controls in both the cases questions will be drafted in the uh, as a yes no or not applicable but the difference between the two is in the case of checklist the questions will be answered by auditor staff in the case of internal control questionnaire the questions are going to be answered by the clients management or clients staff so these four are very widely used methods for evaluation of internal control but for this uh, new scheme i would suggest you to do one thing see in in my material at the end of the chapter i have included some examples here so what kind of questions will be drafted in different areas like in the area of purchases what kind of questions you can draft in checklist or internal control questionnaire in the area of creators what kind of questions you can draft how the questions can be drafted in the area of creators how the questions will be drafted in the area of inventories so like that i have added a few examples at the end of the chapter please 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 refer to these examples why because in the exam instead of asking you to write about internal control questionnaire they might ask you a question in a practical way they might ask you write a series of questions write an example of questions which auditor uh, may draft in the area of purchases write examples of questions which the auditor may draft in the case of creditors so like that they might ask you a practical question so i suggest you to please 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 go through this examples once they have a high chance of getting tested in the examination so we have understood even methods of evaluation of internal control now we will talk about one more important thing from the examination perspective sir what will be the benefits of internal control if i evaluate if i try to understand the client's internal control how the auditor is going to get benefited what advantages will be there for the auditor by understanding the client's internal control so this question they might ask you for the examination so what will be the advantages very simple simple advantages guys if you understand inter client's internal control what will happen number one we will come to know about client's effectiveness of the internal control system whether the client's internal controls are working effectively or not working effectively that we can come to know and on that basis we can determine in which area we have to spend more time and in which area we have to spend less time 
so if you see fifth point so by understanding internal control we will come to know whether internal controls are working properly or not on that basis we can determine how much depth of audit procedures we have to perform in each area like if i came to know in one certain area internal controls are not working effectively there i will try to spend more time there i will try to perform more in-depth audit procedures if i came to know in certain area internal controls are all working effectively there i will try to spend less time so you will come to know whether internal controls are working effectively or not and on that basis you can determine in which area you need to perform how much extent of the audit procedures and by understanding internal controls even you will come to know whether the client is having an effective internal audit department whether internal audit department of your client is working effectively or not that also you will come to know and you will get to know how far the entity's assets are safeguarded how far the entity's assets are protected that you will come to know and you will also get to know how the management is discharging its function how the management is trying to fulfill its function that also you will come to know you will even get to know how reliable the reports given by the management to you are and you can be in a better position to determine which audit technique will be suitable for which item of financial statements you will also come to know in which area internal controls are going to be weak and even if you want you can even give suggestions to the management to improve their overall internal control system if you find any weakness even you can give the suggestions to the management how they can make the improvement of their internal control system so that in that way management is also going to get benefited so if you try to evaluate internal control system of your client this is how you are going to get benefited clear everybody so now we will talk about uh, a concept called components of internal control now we will talk about a concept called components of internal control system but before that i will also try to explain one more concept which is internal financial control first we will try to cover this see i explained you what is the meaning of internal control now there is one more term which will be very frequently used in the audit which is internal financial controls we understood what is internal control but we have to understand what is internal financial control if you ask me i will say internal control and internal financial control both are actually one and the same in the standards on audit they have defined that internal control is a policy and procedure which will achieve some objectives the same definition has even been given under companies act but instead of calling it as internal control they have called it as internal financial control instead of calling it as internal control they have called it as what internal financial control so practically speaking the term internal control and the term internal financial control both are actually same but one term internal control is used in the standards on audit the same definition has been given to the term internal financial control under the companies act if you don't trust me even you can read the definition of financial internal financial control as as given under companies act they say that internal financial controls are policies and procedures adopted by whom adopted by the company for what purpose for ensuring orderly and efficient conduct of business and they achieve certain objectives like they will try to safeguard the assets they will try to prevent and detect the frauds and errors they will try to achieve the accuracy and completeness of accounting records nothing but this only i call it as reliability of financial information they help the they help in timely preparation of reliable financial information once again both the points convey the same meaning and they will even help you to comply with the laws and regulations same whatever objectives they have told for internal controls more or less the same objectives they are even telling it for internal financial controls also only one more point gets added here they say prevention of frauds and errors here they don't say prevention of frauds and errors which is actually one of the implied objective of internal controls only so if we look from the concept perspective whether they ask you the question internal control whether they ask you the internal financial control we can write the same answer what i will suggest you is instead of remembering four objectives for internal control remember five objectives right safeguarding of assets right increase reliability of financial information uh, ensuring proper conduct of business efficiency and effectiveness of operations that you can remember and also you can remember compliance with the laws and regulations add one more point prevention and detection of frauds and errors so if they ask you a question regarding internal control then also write the same answer if they ask you the question regarding internal financial control then also write the same answer so practically speaking both are actually the same concepts but the different different terms have been used under different regulations the term internal control was used in the standards for these terms the same definition has been given but the term used in the company's act is internal financial controls but the same term they have used is internal financial control clear everybody so conceptually both are same now there is one more thing which we have to understand they uh, in one question there will be a difference they will ask you what is the difference between internal financial controls and internal financial controls over financial reporting so there is one question actually very important from the examination perspective uh, so if you see here this one so write about internal financial controls 
and internal financial controls over financial reporting. So this is very important. Listen carefully. So they are asking us the difference between what is internal financial control and what is internal financial controls over financial reporting. See, just now we have seen what is internal financial control. Just now we have seen what is internal financial control. So I told that internal financial control means those policies and procedures which are adopted by the management to achieve different different objectives. Some internal financial control will work with the objective of safeguarding of assets. Some internal financial controls will work with the objective of complying with the laws and regulations. Some internal controls will work with the objective of increasing the reliability of financial reporting. Some internal controls will work with the objective of preventing frauds and errors. So like this internal financial controls are various policies and procedures which will try to achieve different different objectives. Out of that those internal financial controls which are exclusively related to increasing the reliability of financial reporting that we call it as internal financial controls over financial reporting. So if I put it in other way around internal financial controls over financial reporting are actually a subset of internal financial controls. So internal financial controls is a very broad term which includes controls with a different different objectives. There will be internal financial controls which safeguard the assets. There will be internal financial controls which will ensure the compliances with the laws and regulations. There will be internal financial controls which will prevent the frauds and errors. There will be internal financial controls which will increase the reliability of financial reporting. So those internal financial controls which are exclusively related to financial reporting and financial statements that we call it as internal financial controls over financial reporting. Able to understand everybody. So internal financial control over financial reporting is actually a subset of internal financial controls only. Internal financial controls is a very broader term which includes different different types of internal financial controls. But out of that one specific internal financial out of that specific internal financial controls which are exclusively related to the financial information and financial statements that we are going to call it as internal financial control over financial reporting. So internal financial control over financial reporting is actually a subset of internal financial controls only. And as per 143 subsection 3 clause I the auditor is required to report on internal internal financial controls over financial reporting. So as per 143 subsection 3 clause I auditor is not required to report on entire financial controls. The auditor is required to report only on internal financial controls over financial reporting only. Clear everybody? Comfortable? So this is what the meaning of internal financial controls over financial reporting. So here you could see this meaning here very very important from the examination perspective. So internal financial controls over financial reporting are those controls which are relating to maintenance of financial records, which are relating to authorization of transactions in accordance with the gap, which are relating to safeguarding of assets of the company. See sometimes some internal financial controls will have multiple objectives. Take for example, if you take segregation of duties. See I told that cashier cashier should make only cash payments and collect cash receipts whereas cash entries should be passed by accountant this we call it as segregation of duty now this internal control is safeguarding the asset also it is trying to protect the asset also at the same time it is even trying to increase the reliability of financial reporting also so like this sometimes some internal financial controls over financial reporting in addition to increasing the reliability of financial statements, they will also try to safeguard the assets as well. So this is going to be the important uh, equation once again. So internal financial controls are nothing but internal financial control is a very broader term which includes internal financial controls for financial reporting also. It includes operational controls also. It includes anti-fraud controls also. Nothing but whatever I, I presented it in the form of a diagram the same thing they are telling internal financial controls is a very broad term. It includes internal financial controls over financial reporting also. It includes operational controls also. Operational means this uh, safeguarding of asserts, safeguarding of asserts, compliance with the laws and regulations etc. And it will also include anti-fraud controls. Nothing but prevention of frauds and errors clear important from the examination perspective if you want a detailed video uh, this is this is just a summary this is just a revision of the concept if you want to have a much more deeper understanding of this concept of internal financial controls sir or financial reporting we already have one detailed video explained in our uh, youtube channel you can refer to that video so that you can get better understanding regarding internal financial controls over financial reporting clear so this is what the revision now 
okay so we have understood about internal controls as well internal control internal financial control we have understood even in that process we have understood internal financial controls over financial reporting also now we will try to cover one more important concept called what are the components of internal control what are the components of internal control this also we will try to understand so if you want if any organization wants to implement internal control in their organization the implementation of internal control process involves a five steps the implementation of internal control process involves five steps we can also call them as components if you want to implement internal control in the organization it takes uh, it uh, the implementation phase will take five steps or we can also call it as the implementation phase is going to take five components so what are that five components number one control environment okay let me read it from the material itself So this one, what are the components of internal control? So if an organization is looking for components of internal control, if organization wants to implement internal control, so that internal control implementation requires a five components. Number one, control environment. Number two, entities risk assessment process. Number three, information systems, including related business process. Number four is control activities. And number five is monitoring of controls. So repeat everybody along with me. So if you want to implement internal controls in an organization, it should have five components. So what are that five components? Number one, control environment. Number two, entities risk assessment process. Number three, information system. Number four, control activities. And number five, monitoring of controls. Let me try to explain what actually happens in each of this component. First, I will talk about control environment. Sir, what is control environment? Control environment means if you want to implement a internal control in the organization, the first step is you have to create a good culture in the organization. You have to create a culture of honesty and ethical behavior. See, if you don't have a good culture of honesty and ethical behavior, if you don't have your employees or management who are not honest, who are not ethical, no matter how effectively you implement internal control, those internal controls will always fail. So that's why as an organization, if you want to implement internal control, the first step is you need to have a good control environment. You need to create such a good culture of honesty and ethical behavior uh, so that where all your employees are honest all your employees are ethical so if you don't have a good control environment if you don't have a good culture in the organization no matter how effectively you implement internal control those internal controls will not function effectively sir now who is responsible for creating the good culture in the organization management sir how they can create a good culture by way of communication they have to communicate how important it is to maintain honesty just a communication alone will not be enough they have to implement it they have to enforce it now, those charged with governance, they have to frequently participate in the business. They have to review the activities of the low-level employees. The more those charged with governance participate, the better control environment will be created. Management should have good attitude. So they should not hide anything from the shareholder. If whatever risk they are facing, they are openly, they should be openly able to communicate it. So it depends on management's behavior as well. And also it depends on organization structure. So like this, on all these factors, the management, first they have to create a good culture, good environment in the organization. First you create it. If you create a good culture in the organization, automatically good internal controls can be implemented. So that is the first step. Second step, entities risk assessment process. See, if an organization has to implement internal control, see generally why internal controls will be implemented? To tackle the risk, to prevent the risk from materializing. So if an organization has to implement internal control, first they have to study their own organization and find out where there is a chance of happening of misstatement. Agreed? No. So generally we implement internal control to prevent the risk from materializing. So if an organization wants to implement control, first the management has to study their own organization, find out in which area there is a chance of happening of misstatement, then they can implement internal control in that area. So once the management has created a good culture of honesty and ethical behavior, the second step is they have to study their own organization. They have to identify the risk in their organization. Number three. So once they have identified the risk in the organization, now they have to go for third phase, which is information system. Now you have to identify the uh, resources which you want, which you require. You have identified internal control. You have designed internal control. Now to, now to implement that internal control, you need that resources. No, you need some labor resources. You need capital resources. You need softwares. You need hardware. So you have to start procuring all that resources. So that procurement phase, we call it as information system. So once you have procured all the resources, once you have all the labor and all, what you should do? You have to actually implement it. You have to design the control and then implement it. So that actual designing and implementation of internal control phase, that we are going to call it as control control activities 
so what is control activities actual designing and implementation of internal control and finally once you have implemented internal control that's all will the management responsibility will get over no just by implementing internal control management responsibility will not get over they have to even monitor continuously how far the internal controls are working effectively whatever internal controls they have implemented whether they are achieving the objective is there any requirement to update any internal control is there any requirement to add any internal control is there any requirement to delete any internal control so this continuous monitoring is also required so these are all the components these are all the five components of internal control what are they control environment entities risk assessment process information system control activities and even monitoring of the controls clear and comfortable everybody so these are the various components of internal control so a few more questions i will try to explain from this chapter with that we will end the discussion so i would like to cover this one which question this one yeah what will be the functions of internal auditor with regard to internal control so sometimes as we have seen in the audit reporting chapter some companies are mandatorily required to appoint internal auditor so if in the organization there is already a internal auditor what different functions he will be required to perform so generally they are asking what will be the functions of the internal auditor with regard to internal control what internal auditor is supposed to do with regard to internal controls so even though the question is what functions internal auditor will perform with regard to internal controls but the answer will talk about overall responsibilities of internal auditor they will not just talk about functions of internal auditor with regard to internal controls they will talk about overall responsibilities of internal auditor in general so one of the major objective of internal control is he has to evaluate internal control he has to study the internal controls of the client's organization he has to find the weaknesses he will report it to the management but the responsibility of internal auditor will not end with reporting to the management the deficiencies he should also recommend improvements he should also give suggestions how they can overcome that weaknesses so that is where internal audit will differ from statutory audit if you are a statutory auditor you will only tell what deficiencies are there you have no responsibility to tell the improvements you have no obligation to recommend the suggestions but internal audit is not like that the internal auditor will not just stop with the, uh, will not just stop with the telling what deficiencies are there he, should, he is also responsible for giving recommendations or suggestions for overcoming that weaknesses also so that is the first responsibility evaluation of internal control then the second one as an as an internal auditor you will verify financial information like a statutory auditor is doing even internal auditor also will try to verify financial information but internal auditor will not just verify financial information he will even verify operating information like he will even verify the production he will even try to verify the manufacturing activities he will he will even try to verify hr activities so he will even review operating activities as well so he's going to verify financial and operating information as well he is also trying to verify operating activities and finally internal auditor will also try to verify the compliances with laws and regulations internal auditor will even try to check the compliances with the laws and regulations so these are all broadly the functions of internal auditor clear everybody so he will evaluate internal controls he will check the financial and operating information he will even verify the operating effectiveness operating information and even he will try to check the compliances with the laws and regulations see one more important point one more important question i will tell you with that i will wind up this chapter the question is yes this question number 12 very important this question is actually from sa 330 so what are factors which are required to be considered by an auditor in determining whether it is appropriate to use audit evidence about the effectiveness of controls obtained in the previous year's audit see what is the meaning of this question is assume you are an auditor you are appointed as auditor of the year 21 22 that is the first time you have been appointed as the auditor of the client so in that financial year 21 22 while conducting the audit you will perform risk assessment procedures you will perform compliance procedures you will perform substantive audit procedures you will obtain audit evidence and you would have expressed your opinion now the same entity is appointing you as an auditor for the year 2022 23 as well now while conducting the audit of the current year see if you pay attention in the last year the auditor has already performed the compliance procedures and if you look at the general perspective year after year internal controls will not undergo drastic changes it will happen very rarely so generally whatever internal controls are there in the last year the same internal controls will be there in the current year also with minute changes it will not always happen that all together internal controls of the last year will be scrapped and new internal controls will be uh, implemented in the in the current year like that in very few circumstances it will happen so since internal controls year after year since they are going to remain the same 
can the auditor use the audit evidence can the auditor use the compliance the audit evidence whatever he obtained regarding internal controls in the previous year can he use that information in the current year's audit since year after year internal controls will not undergo major changes last year he would have verified internal controls in a detailed matter and he would have got audit evidence regarding the internal control can he use that audit evidence regarding operating effectiveness of internal controls of the previous year in the current year's audit yes the standards will give you that permission the standards are permitting yes if you want to make use of audit evidence relating to the operating effectiveness of internal controls which you have obtained in the previous year if you want to use that evidence in the current year use it standards are giving you that permission but there are certain factors which you will consider so in if in order to determine whether it is appropriate to use the audit evidence regarding operating effectiveness of controls which have obtained in the previous year whether it is appropriate to use it or not in deciding that the auditor will consider some factors like effectiveness of elements of internal control just now we have seen five components of internal controls now is there any change happened in that five components of internal control that he will consider no there is no bigger change in the components of internal control yes you can rely on inter you can rely on evidence of the previous year if you find any significant and changes have taken place in any of the components then don't use the last year's information try to obtain the fresh evidence and also the risk arising from characteristics of the control including whether it is manual or automated sometimes some new risk might happen because of automation of the client sometimes the client what he will do is from manual he will try to shift to automated controls in that circumstances some new risk will arise in those circumstances it might not be paul it might not be feasible to use the last year's evidence regarding internal control try to use the try to get the evidence once again freshly in the current year and also it depends on effectiveness of general IT controls see what are these general IT controls what are the application controls this we will talk about it in a detailed manner in our, in our subsequent chapter when we take up audit in an automated environment see practically in the study material audit in automated environment has been integrated with the risk assessment only but since it is altogether a different topic what I have done is I have separated that into two different chapters so we will get to know what is this general IT controls in our subsequent topics and also the auditor should consider the effectiveness of control and its application by the entity including nature and extent of deviation in application of control noted in the previous audits see last year the management had made some deviations see in the current year has the management taken any steps to overcome that so if the management has taken steps to overcome it you will try to perform uh, you will try to perform extra procedures only regarding that extra steps are taken by the management balance you can use the previous year's information so even you have to consider is there any deviation of the previous year deviations in the previous year and what measures were taken by the management to overcome that deviations and also whether lack of change sometime last year i have done the audit i have told the management there is a change required one internal control check in the current year whether they made that change or they did not make that change so if they made the change i will only verify the change if they did not make the change i will try to re-verify the internal control whether because of the last year's deviation in the current year even more deviations have happened which could lead to an even bigger fraud. So check is there any lack of change which is required. And also check whether there is any new risk of material misstatement which has come. If there is any new risk of material misstatement, then it might not be possible to use the evidence of the previous year. In those circumstances, you might be required to obtain the evidence freshly. Clear everybody? So in determining whether it will be appropriate for the auditor to use the audit evidence of the previous year, the auditor has to consider these factors and then he has to take the decision. Clear everybody? So with this, uh, I will wind up the discussion regarding risk assessment and internal control. See, actually risk assessment and internal control is a very bigger topic and it is a very complex topic. So I have revised the most important content or the more conceptual discussion which is there in the risk assessment and internal control that I have revised. Clear? Okay guys, so with this we are done with risk assessment and internal control as well. See, the YouTube will permit me to upload video only up to 12 hours. So I want to do the entire marathon in a single video, but uh, the YouTube will not permit me to do it. So with this uh, recording, I guess with this risk assessment and internal control, I guess uh, we would have reached close to 12 hours. So this I will upload it as marathon part one. Soon we will try, soon we will upload marathon part two also covering the remaining chapters. So I am not doing it in a single video. Why? Because as per the YouTube norms, they will allow a YouTube video only up to 12 hours of time. So that's why I'm winding up the part one here. 
the balance topics like standards on audit one of the most important topic we have standards on audit we have that standards on audit i will come in sir i will begin in the next part and apart from standards on audit we have various other chapters like audit strategy planning and program then we have something called audit uh, in an automated environment audit sampling analytical procedures audit of banks still we have so many other things to cover that we will try to do it in our part two hope you guys have uh, enjoyed this part one and if you would have uh, liked the content from this part one of the marathon please do share it with your share it with your friends and do a favor on them thank you guys thank you so much